headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Your man's in the front row, in the middle there. Thanks. Big line? Yeah, about 22. I'll see you later. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Martin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. How are you? Just fine. Been here long? Uh, not long, no. Do you think you've got any of the men? Uh, no way of being sure until you point them out. We picked up three or four on suspicion, past records and close to your description. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call off the number. Please be prompt with your questions or identification. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers, as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn face front, hands to your side. When I call out your name and number, step out, face the room, talk up so everybody can hear you. All right, number one, Louis Foster, robbery. Where do you live, Louis? Hundred and eight and a half North Lincoln Boulevard. What's your business? A cabby. You drive a cab? Ah, I used to. How long ago did you used to? I used to a year ago. I got canned. I can't jockey cabs no more. Lousy company black for me. You own a car? Uh, no, sir. Any weapons on you when you were arrested? No, sir. Anybody with you? Yeah. Guy named uh, Bernie or something. Bernie what? Bernie, uh, I'm even sure of that. I don't know his last name. He, he's standing right back there. Bernie King, number four. How long you known him? I met him uh, uh, three, four days. A bar. We got drinking, and that's when we cooked up the job. Okay, step back. Number two, William Small, assault. Where do you live, Bill? 333 South 103rd Street. What's your business? Bartender. Where do you work? The Domino, over on Jefferson, 46 West. He beat up a customer pretty bad. Yeah, he got out of line. I asked him to shut up. He don't shut up. I take it for about an hour, and then I don't take it no more. You ask him to leave? Sure, like always. Guys get tanked up. First, I ask him to leave. I'm pretty big. Usually, they don't give me no lip. This guy, he's pretty big, too. He didn't want to leave? No. Nah, he gets very insulted. Starts calling me names he ain't gotten around to until then. I try to hustle him. Gentle, but I mean it, see? He don't hustle. Instead, he clobbers me one with his elbow. Right in the kisser, he clobbers me. So what else? I go to work. I rough him up good. I'm mad now, see. I rarely rough him up. You hit him with the table. Well, he had a bar stool. I had to hit him with something or he brains me for keeps. Okay, step back. Sure. A soft yet. He don't get nothing, huh? Just a concussion. Number three, Homer Miller, robbery. Any of the men up there? Uh, Where do you no, live, no, Homer? No, no. 3.9 South sure. Hill. What's your business? I ain't been working lately. I used to be a steeplejack. How long have you lived here? Uh, six, seven years. I come from Detroit. Hi, boy. 
No, man. That coffee hot? Yeah. Martin didn't make an identification, huh? Uh Uh-uh. He's down looking at the mug pile again. Yes. Thanks. Well, you'd sure think with four men to find, he ought to be able to spot one of them. I don't know. Maybe they haven't got any records. They, They were pretty professional about it. We didn't even get a print. Yeah. And but look at the M.O. Four guys go into a theater, stick it up. One lookout. The other three guys go up to the manager's office. And we've had theater hold up, sure, but not four guys working like this. Young guys. Yeah, Martin says the three who came into his office couldn't have been over 22 or 3. And nobody in our files even comes close to the descriptions. Out of town? Mm, maybe. Maybe their first job. They acted like cowboys and Indians. Martin says he thought they were kidding until he saw the guns. Well, what have you done? Staked out the theaters. Uh, Guthrie. Yeah? Yeah? The Lincoln? Okay. Let's go. Something Those four guys just held up the Lincoln Theater. Fitch was on stakeout, tried to stop him. Tried? He downed one, but got shot up doing it. He's on the way to the hospital. How bad? Pretty bad. How's Fitch? No report yet. He's in the operating room. Who was the doctor? Gerson. Fitch caught one in the chest and one in the right leg. Family been... Uh... Yeah, they're in this room. What about the other one? No identification on him. Before he passed out, he said his name was Martinelli. Fitch really blew him up. Slug went in the right hand, up the arm, right through his body. Funny, huh? Up the arm like that and right through? Oh, uh, uh, here's Dr. Lundigan. He operated on Martinelli. Gentlemen... I uh, suppose you're the police. That's right, Doctor. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Grant. Hi, Doctor. How do you do? How's Martinelli? I can't say just yet. He hasn't regained consciousness since we removed the bullet. We were hoping to question him. Well, you can wait in the room if you like. It's uh, 304, right there. Well, let's go in. Well, hmm? I just came from the theater to cash. Uh, you come on in the room and tell me. Huh? Uh, we're police, nurse. Doctor Lundigan said we could wait in here. Well, all right, if he said so. I'll get another chair. Thanks. Please try to talk quiet. Okay. He's working pretty hard at it. Yeah. What do you got, Quine? Now the cashier at the theater saw the car, and all she knew was it's blue sedan. Not much, but I put on an APB, and descriptions tell it all the way around. It has to be the same bunch you know. How's Fitch? He's still out, too. Uh, you want me to stick around? Yeah, yeah, for a while. Why, you got a date? No, no, I got nothing to do. Here you are. Thanks. You better call the doctor. Ask Dr. Lundigan to come to 304. That's that, huh? Yes. Coyne, stay and get fingerprints on him. If anything comes up, you can get me at home. Let's go, man. Got the lawn looking good. Oh, not bad for just Sunday labor. Well, good night. I'll see you in the morning. Want me to pick you up? No, uh, I want to leave the car to be serviced. Say hello to Molly. Right. Night. Night. Uh, Johnny, douse these lights. Get the car started. Come on. Let's get him out of here. Heavy, ain't he? 
there's a new Dollar Day on CBS. Mystery fans know that can mean only one thing. Edmund O'Brien as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The insurance sleuth with a dynamite-loaded expense account, formerly heard Saturdays, now will be heard Wednesday nights on most of these same CBS stations. Johnny Dollar celebrates his move tomorrow night by solving the Malcolm Wish matter, a startling disappearance case. Don't see nobody. Okay, drag him out. <coughs> hey, but nobody ever kidnapped no cop before. All right, all right. Get him down to the shed. Okay. Where do you want him? Just dump him. All right. He's coming around. Give him time. Sap him pretty good. Go to the car. Yeah. Don't feel so good, huh, Cap? You want us to get some water or something and dump it on him? Or one you should just go sit down and shut your face. I'll take care of the cop. Okay, okay. Big deal. How about it, Cap? Feel like sitting up? Uh, oh, sure, you can sit up, so sit up. <laughs> he don't look so good. You messed him up. He needed messing. Come on, Cap. <laughs> Take it easy. What? Wake up. Okay, okay. I'll sit there. What's going on? You got bean. No. <laughs> you got bean good. Shut up. Okay, okay. Here, cop. Have a drink of water. No, thanks. <laughs> well, you should have. Oh, you got yourself all wet. You punk, who do you think you're talking to? You! You I'm talking to any way I want to. <laughs> he just don't get it. Big, stupid cop. Just don't get it. Like to know about it, big, stupid cop. Want to know why you got your skull split, huh? Who are you? Martinelli. Oh. Tony Martinelli. One of your stinking cops shot my brother. You get it now? Yeah. Anybody ever kidnapped a cop before, huh? Anybody ever kidnapped a lieutenant, a big, dumb lieutenant, huh? <laughs> you got to learn to answer when I ask you something. That theater job, your first stick up, Tony? What makes you think so? Because you pulled another one three days later. So what? Amateur. Smart hood would figure we'd stake out the theaters. I'm not smart, huh? Not a bit. Smart enough to get 3,000. I told you to keep your face shut. All right. Ditch. He's with us, huh? The boys are making a big mistake. Tell us how we're making a big mistake, huh? None of us got records in this town. Who's going to find us? They'll find you. Know the penalty for kidnapping in this state? They ain't going to find us, cop. My brother ain't going to say nothing. And if we got you along, even if they do find us, they ain't going to do nothing. I'm getting hungry. I'll go out and get them sandwiches. Okay, what do you want? Hey, liver wood. Just get some step on us. Okay. Yeah, how about the copper? Oh, he ain't hungry. Get me some hamburgers. Okay. You know what we're going to do, Lieutenant? What? We're going to wait right here to see if my brother's going to be all right. Then we'll leave in the state. You're going to be sitting right in the front seat all the way. What if your brother doesn't get all right? You still sit in the front seat. Until we get clear. Hi. Hi, where's Ben? He's not in yet. I was just swiping some coffee. Well, swipe me some. What, uh, what'd you find out on Martinelli? Here. Oh, thanks. Uh, we ran down the fingerprints. We got him through the Army. Full name, Julio Martinelli. 26 years old. Born in this country, Detroit. Don't know how long he's lived here. No record at all. What's Detroit say? I'm waiting on it now. Just heard from the Army an hour ago. 
He's got a brother, Tony Martinelli. Family deceased. What kind of an army record does he have? Lousy. Both he and his brother are always in trouble. No overseas duty. Stationed in California. I wonder where Ben is. Oh, you're supposed to pick him up? No, no. Oh, he's probably still having his car service. Hey, here's a report from Detroit. Both the Martinellis have records. Minor offenses, but habitual. Both serve small-time raps a dozen times. Any report on the blue sedan? No, and here's something else. Detroit sent back these covering the descriptions of the other two guys with the Martinellis. Martinelli's brother, Tony, is essentially to be the guy who ran the stick-ups, and these two guys have been picked up with him a couple of times. Luke Johnson, Charlie Wren. Yeah, according to their records, they never pulled off anything this big, just petty stuff in the past. Well, you better have these circulated. Right. And where's Ben? I don't know. He sure is late. I sent cargo over. Here, it's 3.30 and no word yet. Ben's never stayed away without at least checking in. He didn't even go into the garage. Uh, to check the hospital. Oh, we would have gotten some word by now. I covered the morgue. Oh, nothing like that. Well, how do you know? I at least got a... Grab. What's the address? Okay. Asher thinks maybe he's got an identification on one of the men. Cafe down on River Street, 105 East. You want me to come along? No. No, you'd uh, you'd better stay here until Carger checks in about Ben. Let me know as soon as you hear anything, huh? Identified this one, Luke Johnston. Positive? He's pretty sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. This guy in the picture came in this morning and got some sandwiches. To take out? To take out, yeah. Liverwurst and six hamburgers. I remember because I ain't had too many customers today. Do you notice whether he was in a car or not? Uh, no. Well, I mean, I noticed. I seen him walk away across the street that way. You see, we stay open all night, and he was my first customer. He walked that way right down there. See, what's he doing? He's a killer, maybe? The river's down that way. Well, sure, probably lived down there by it. He kind of looked funny. I thought it looked funny when he first came in, like he was a gangster, maybe. Hmm. Looks just like a kid in this picture. Oh, sure, yeah. He's young. He's about my boy's age, maybe. But, oh, it looked tough and shifty. Oh, you know the type. He got coffee and sandwiches. Now, where's your phone? It's right there. It's a nickel. <laughs> Yeah, 
Professor. Professional secret. This is Greb. Let me talk to Waldo. Hello, Captain. We got an identification on Luke Johnson. I'll need every available man to cover this area, at least 15. It's my guess Johnson is holed up somewhere within walking distance of the river. Yes, sir, I'll keep in touch. Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, the address is 105 East River. Right. Asher, you work with me. Right. There's something big, huh? Yeah? Those guys that stuck up the theaters? Yeah, I read about that. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Froelein. Uh, four line. Like on a golf course. Four. Ain't it dark enough yet, Tony? It's plenty dark, huh, Tony? All right, all right. Which way's the car? In the alley behind the charter house. Uh, look, Tony, do we have to take this guy along? Can't you knock him off here? Knuckle had his insurance. Come on, little tanner on you, please. Move. Ah, uh, Tony, don't hit no more. We'll have to carry him again. Go out the back way. So help me, cop one fancy move and I'll blow you apart. Hey, Lieutenant, you look awful. Thanks. Shut up. We only got about a half a tank of gas, Tony. That'll get us to the state line and more. Hey, we should have brought some food if we ain't gonna stop, Tony. There's your car. Hold it. I saw something more. Down, oh, Barry! Get to me, Ben, Ben, you hit? No. Where'd he go? There he is. In between those buildings. Ben, we'll get him. Ben, come back here. Who? He's lying back there next to Charlie, tough boy. Now, come here. Ah, I got no gun, Tom. I don't shoot. I got no gun. I know you haven't, Tony. He can't get away, Ben. Go back to the car. He's calling. He sure is. All right, Tony, come on out. Okay. Okay, come on, don't you? I don't have a gun, Tony. Come here. All right. Take it easy now, Lieutenant. Come here. No gun. You win, take it. You win. Take it easy, huh? Don't do it. Ben. Get up, Tony. Please, get up. Come on, get up. I don't think he's going to, Ben. Now, wouldn't you know it? I'd like to beat Take that it easy, boy. Well, that's what happens when you lose your temper. I should have saved the Sunday punch for last. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? <laughs> you people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call out for number, then name and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, is written by Blake Edwards and Dick Quine, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Tony Barrett, Dick Ryan, Ted DeCorsia, Peter Leeds, Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, and Clayton Post. The lineup is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Elation and syncopation are the main elements of tomorrow night's Bing Crosby show over most of these same CBS stations. And no wonder the groaner himself vocalizes and informalizes. And Bing's guests include Tommy Dorsey with some fancy licks on his slide trombone, hot violinist Joe Venuti, and that equally torrid songbird Teresa Brewer. Tomorrow night on the Bing Crosby show.
Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Sit right here, Mr. Hunter. Uh, how many men will we look at? Mm, 31 altogether. Our man probably won't be any of these, but may we want to cover every possibility. Please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I ask mm. your attention? Thank you, my name is Grab. Sergeant Matt Grab, I'll explain the latter. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, then name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, Please remember the number assigned to the prisoner, as I call his name. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get an actual tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right. Come on. Move it up to the end of the stage. Right on up to the end. That's right. Now turn and face front hands to your sides and look straight ahead. Now, when I ask you questions, talk up so the people in the back can hear you. All right, number one, John Nathan, robbery, face front, talk up. Where do you live, John? 66 in River Street. What's that? Siemens Hotel. Don't look at me. Look right out front so the people can see you. What do you do, John? Ship's cook. Anybody arrested with you? No. Any weapons? Yes, sir. Pistol, wasn't it? Yes, sir. What kind of pistol? Uh, 32, I think. 38, I know. Yes. Do you have a car? Yeah, a Chrysler. Well, sedan, a coupe or what? Sedan. What color? Black. Okay. Number two, David Moore, so. Where do you live, David? 205 South Newton. Can't hear him, Matt. Now, look, I don't want to tell you boys again. It's a long way to the back of the room, so you got to talk up. Come on, now. Where do you work, Dave? Fisher and Science. What do you do? What's your work? Tom. Your landlady says you hit her. Yes, sir. With what? A hot plate. Something you cook on? Uh, yes, sir. I was cooking. She said I was smelling up the building. Why did you get it? Oh, it's a long story, Sergeant. You'd have to know my landlady. Okay, number three, Ivan Cyberling, drunk and disorderly. Any of these men, Mr. Hunter? No. no. Great Park, 644 North Orchard, Great Park. Don't tell me. Tell the people out there. What do you do, Ivan? Construction engineer. You were pretty drunk. Yes, sir. The arresting officer said he's had complaints before. Yes, sir. She has complained for a week. Who's she? My wife. You live at 644 in North Hudson? Yes, sir. The report says you broke a window at that address. The door was locked. I broke one other night, too, when she locked me out. I will keep right on breaking them until she leaves door unlocked. Maybe you'd better stop drinking. Yes, sir. Any questions or identifications from the audience? How about it, Mr. Hunter? Number two was picked up in your neighborhood. No. Any questions or identifications from the audience? Okay. We'll look at the next bunch. Nothing, Matt. All right. All right, run them off. Bring on the next line. Have a coffee, Mr. Hunter? Thank you. Now, yeah, we won't keep you much longer. There you are. Thank you. Sergeant Greb should be here any minute now. I... Hi. Uh, this is Mr. Hunter, man. Sergeant Greb. Well, how do you do, Mr. Hunter? Sergeant Greb, a chairman. Thanks. Hey, I voted for you in the last election, Mr. Hunter. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, didn't you spot anybody in the line at all? No, I didn't. Coffee, man? Uh, no, no, thanks. Mr. Hunter can't think of anybody who'd want to kill him. 
And you can't remember seeing anybody suspicious hanging around your house? No, no, I, I can't, Sergeant. Well, none of your neighbors saw anybody either. Uh, here's a report from the lab. The bomb was a time bomb. Found pieces of an old alarm clock. From the size of the explosion, must have been about eight or ten sticks of dynamite. <laughs> sure lucky you and the family were in the back of the house. Very lucky. Now, we'll do our best to catch whoever it was, sir. Well, probably just a crank. A man like myself, politics. Big figure makes a lot of enemies for one reason or another. Maybe this one didn't vote for me last election, Sergeant. <laughs> Come to think of it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, we may want to talk to you again, sir. And... Oh, pardon me. Guthrie. Yeah. Oh, yeah? How long ago? Anyone hurt? Right, sure. Another bombing. What? Friend of yours, Councilman Adams. Well, was he hurt? Yeah, both he and his wife. They're in the hospital. They've got a child. No, the child's all right. Ruined the house. Were Adams and his wife hurt badly? Well, I don't know. Ambulance took him away. I'll have to check with the hospital. I, this is awful. Everybody should certainly be warned. Well, they will be, including the mayor. We'll put a man with you and your family, Mr. Hunter. In the meanwhile, we'll go and look at Mr. Adams' house. Fine. I got a man over here who thinks maybe he saw the guy who planted the bomb. Oh, well, let's go talk to him. Now, go over and talk to Chief Anderson, Matt. See what he's got to say about the damage. Sure. This man's a neighbor. His name's Crump. Uh, Mr. Crump. Hey, yes, Sergeant? Uh, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh, hiya, Mr. Crump. Oh, glad to meet you, Lieutenant. Uh, let's move over here where we can talk. All right. All right. Now, uh, tell the lieutenant just what you told me, Mr. Crump. Well, at about 4.30, I was working in my backyard mowing the lawn, and I, I saw Mrs. Adams get into her car and drive out of the garage. Well, about a, an hour later, I went around front to get the hose, and I, I saw an old truck pull up across the street. I saw a man get out, kind of a, an old man, you know, old clothes. Mm -hmm. He went around the, the back of the truck and took out something that looked like a box. It was about, uh, oh, about this big, I guess. Yeah. Then he headed for the Adams' house. A couple hours later, I was sitting in my living room, and I, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Adams pull up in front of their house and go in. A little while later, my wife and I were having dinner, and the, uh, the explosion happened. Busted most of the windows in our house. I didn't think about the old guy with the box until I found out what had happened tonight. I remembered reading about this other bombing yesterday. Figured that box the old guy was carrying might have been the bomb. Yeah, I see. Um... Can you remember what this old guy looked like? Well, uh, uh, maybe if I, uh, if I saw him again. Mm -hmm. And what kind of a truck was he driving? Oh, it's a real old one, really beat up at an old Ford or Chevy. You know, one of those uh, pickups. Well, what did you say? I said you didn't get the license number. Oh, no. Why would I get it? I didn't even think anything about it until after the explosion. Well, um... If you saw him again, do you think you might recognize him? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Crump. We'll keep in touch with you. Oh, glad to help. Glad Fine. To help. Get Mr. Crump's phone number and anything we might need. All right. I'll be up with Matt. Okay. Ben. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Guthrie. What a mess, huh? Yeah. Bomb do all that? Bomb and the fire. Used more dynamite than the last time. Blew this room sky high. Oh, oh watch out for the glare. Yeah. The center of the explosion was right about here. Uh-huh. Probably walked up to the side of the house, stuck the bomb into that opening in the foundation. Surprised nobody saw him. Well, somebody thinks he did. Well, you better catch this boy. He hasn't killed anybody yet. He's trying pretty hard. Paper says snow. How'd you make out with Crump? Nothing. He looked through the whole mug file, not a thing. Hmm. I talked to the hospital this morning. The Adams is it going to be all right. No luck on that old Ford pickup? Uh-uh. Why don't you turn up the heat? Oh, okay. Hey, I'll bet we get a blizzard. We're due, you know. Hmm. Guthrie? Oh, that's fine. Yeah? 
And what was he wearing? Uh-huh, well, that sounds like him. We'll be right down. Well, maybe we got the bomber. Yeah? Twenty minutes ago, picked up a man wearing old coveralls and a dirty leather jacket coming out of the state building. Spotted him. Followed him three blocks before the grambling. He's climbing into an old Ford pickup with 30 sticks of dynamite in the back of the truck. <laughs> All set, man? Yeah, Ben. I got Crump sitting out front. How many men are you going to show? Three besides the suspect. Oh, okay. I'll go sit with Crump. Hello, Mr. Crump? Hello. Oh, oh Lieutenant Guthrie, I couldn't see. Yeah, well, uh, we want you to look at some suspects. Oh, that's that's what Sergeant Grab said. Yeah, we think one of them might be the man who planted the bombs. Well, I hope I can help. All right, Ben, run them on. Yes, sir. Lights. Bring them on, Frank. Take a good look. All right, now, ten... The man in the end, Lieutenant. Yeah, what about him? Yeah, that's the man, no doubt about it. I, I remember right, better than I thought I would. He's the one that got out of the truck, all right, the, the one with the box. All right, Matt, run him off. Yes, sir. that's all. I'm off. Well, we'll need a statement from you, Mr. Crump. Oh, sure. Um, what were the others arrested for? They weren't, Mr. Crump. Three others were police officers. <laughs> Edmund O'Brien, who plays the title role in yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be on his latest case tomorrow night over most of these same CBS stations. In one of his most thrilling investigations, Johnny Dollar goes to London to join forces with the men from Scotland Yard in the hatchet house theft matter. How that London trip had Johnny Dollar's famous old expense account. Don't miss Johnny Dollar on Wednesdays. <laughs> be a tough nut. Arresting officers couldn't get a thing out of him. We've got men over there talking with people in the state building. So far, nobody remembers seeing him come in. Yeah. Name's Lewis Black, huh? Yeah, driver's license gave his address at 1910 East Flower. Ash is over there now checking. I wonder what he was doing in the state building. Yeah, I'm worried, too. I wonder if... Oh, no. No, he couldn't have. A big building. I hope you're right. Hello, Lewis. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Grimm. Quinn? Yeah. We'll see you upstairs. Right. Sit down, Lewis. I want to talk to you about these bombings. We know you made those bombs. The man saw you walk up to the Adams house with one of them. It's sheer cold in here. Isn't it? Yeah, it started to snow. That's right. That's right. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, I made him. Sure. Why? I mean, I don't have to tell you why. You put one of them on the George Hunter's house. Do you know him? No, he is. But you don't know him personally? No. Did you know Adams? No. Well, then why try to kill him? Isn't there a heater in here or something? I've been out of work. Been out of work long? Yeah. Hunter or Adams have something to do with it? <laughs> you sure want to know why I made those bombs, don't you? We'd like to know. It's no fun being out of work. I've been out of work for a long time. You ever been out of work? Yeah. Well, then you know it's no fun. You trying to get a job? Oh, sure, I couldn't. I kept trying. Just couldn't get one. Look, do we have to sit in here? It's really getting kind of cold. We'll get out of here as soon as you tell us about but it. Don't try to push me. I don't like being pushed around. I can stand it down here just as long as you can. We're not trying to push you. No? No. We don't like this any better than you do. It was just a job. If it weren't us, it would be somebody else. Okay. If you had a job, you'd try to do it the best you could, wouldn't you? Well, sure. I used to have jobs all the time. I always did the best I could. What kind of jobs did you have? Oh, all kinds. I was a miner once. I worked in Pennsylvania. Is that where you're from, Pennsylvania? Yeah, I did all kinds of jobs once, then I couldn't get it to nobody would give me a job. That's the trouble. It's not enough jobs. I got to do something about getting jobs for 
people. Ah, a bunch of dirty politicians. They don't worry about guys like me. They make speeches, sure. Yeah, they get elected. They don't do nothing. Like Adams and Hunter. You're darn right. Adams, Hunter, the whole bunch. Even the mayor. But sure, the mayor. And the governor. He's the worst one of the bunch. He's the biggest. He could do something if he wanted to, but he don't. Gee, I ain't had a job in three years. You'd like to take care of him like you did Adams and Hunter, wouldn't you? Uh, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything. You think I'm going to tell you something, don't you? But I'm not. What were you doing in the state building? Why don't you try and find out? Look, Lewis, we don't want you to get into any more trouble than you're already I in, I don't so... want to talk anymore. I want to go back to my cell. I'm cold. You can go back to your cell as soon as you talk. Oh, Lieutenant, can I see you a minute? Yeah, come on. Sergeant, can we have some heat in here? I'm cold. Then we've got a janitor upstairs from the state building. He remembers seeing Lewis Black come into the building by the side entrance. He says Black was carrying a big box. Holy... Look... See that the state building's cleared as fast as possible. Rope off the street. Step on it. Right. Lewis, I just found out that you planted a bomb in the state building. I don't care what you found out. I'm not going to tell you. I'm tired of playing with you. Where's that bomb? Where did you put it? Oh, sugar, you can do anything you want. Get rough. Beat me. I won't tell you where I put that bomb. Well, at least tell us when it's set to go off. What time is it? It's uh, six minutes to five. <laughs> you won't find it. How much time? Mm, about 40 minutes, I guess. Hey, everybody's out of the building. You find out where he put it? No, he wants it to go off. We got him over in the car with Walter and Asher. They'll keep working on him. Uh, it's Army car. Captain Phillips, demolition expert. I'm Phillips. Thank God for you. Hope we can use you. Know what kind of a bomb it is? Quiet, I'll tell you all we know. We've got to get into that building and try to find it. Uh, Thirty men are there now covering every floor. Who's in charge? Harrison. He's in the basement. Come on, man. What time is it? We've got about 25 minutes, more or less. Any luck? Lieutenant. Harrison's still in the basement? Yeah, yeah, he's down those stairs. Thanks. Come on. All right, all right, they'll be sure to check you out. Yeah. Okay, we're looking at the now. Harrison. Yeah, over here, Ben. Well, any luck? No. How much time we got? Less than 25 minutes. What orders did you give? Well, if the bomb's found, it's to be taken directly to the street. If we've still got any time left, the car will drive it to a safe place. That army man get here? Yeah. Well, this is the way I want it to go. It's, uh, 5.13 by my watch. I set your watch. Right. Now, at exactly 5.25, order your men out of here. Tell them they've got ten minutes to get clear. We'll go tell the rest on the other floors. All right, Ben. All right, men. Come on. Let's come to the stairs. Can you run an elevator, man? Well, sure. I'll take the second floor. I'll take the ordinance, third, fifth, and so on. Be sure they set their watches with yours. Right, Ben. Sergeant. Yes, sir? You got a watch? Yes, sir. Set it with mine. Five seconds, it'll be 5.14.35. Now. Okay. Have all your men off this floor by 5.25. 5.25, yes, sir. Everybody's out. Yeah. Well, what do we do? That's a good question. Black wasn't lying. We've got something like ten minutes. Man. Yeah? Go out to the car and get Black. Huh? Go out and get Black. Maybe the last thing I do, but I'm going to find out where that bomb is. Find out where the bomb is. Who's going to watch Black while you get it? I'll worry about that when I get to it. Uh-uh, I'm staying. Okay, I can't argue. How about it, Black? You want to tell us where it is? You never find it. What time is it? 528. Ah, oh, you can't scare me. You think if you keep me here, i tell you where the bomb is. Eh? About five minutes, sir. I guess so. You're not very smart, are you? I said 40 minutes. 
Well, maybe 40, but maybe not. I can't be sure. Might go off in a second. I guess so. Ah, who are you kidding? You won't stay in here. You're scared. Listen, Black. You're down right with scared. But so help me, you're going to tell us where that bomb is or it's going to blow all of us sky high. Now, shut up unless you want to tell us. I'm not afraid to die. But you're going to have a chance. Eight stories in this building. Yeah. If it's too far away, we may not have time anyway. Let me out of here. Reverend, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here until you tell us where it is. I'll tell you, I won't. Well, I shut won't. up. Five twenty-nine. Black, you're not doing anything but wrecking a building and killing yourself. You can't get the governor. He's been taken out. That made me tell you. Okay, okay. How much dynamite's in that bomb, Lewis? Fifty sticks. Hope you guessed right about the time. Then. Told you, but you know. Oh, gonna be a big one. Lewis, why don't you tell us? I can stand it if you can. 5.30. All right, all right, all right. I'll tell you, it's in the beach. Show us. All right. Step on it. How much time is it? Not much. Can you stop it? Yeah, yeah. Now, now, where, where? It's up there. Uh, on top of the big flat. You see in the back? How did you get up there? Here with the ladder. Uh, where's the ladder? Everything's been moved. Forget the ladder. Show us the spot. Right about here. Give him a booster. Come on, come on. Put your foot in my hand. No wonder we couldn't find it. You see it? Yes, yes. Well, grab it. All right. All right, hand it down. Okay. Let's get out of here. We might not have time to stop. Can I tear off these boards without setting it yeah, off? Yeah, yeah. Well, explain it to me while I rip them off. I don't know. I don't remember. Please, let's get out of here. If you want to get out of here alive, yeah. you better remember. Well, this is dynamite. It's an old alarm yeah. clock. It's batteries and breakers. Yeah. The alarm goes off and causes the circuit with batteries. <sighs> okay. Now take it apart. No, 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 no. Let me get out of here. You're going to stay right here. Oh, all right. You. Now you settle down. Come on, Lewis. Tell me. Tell me what to do. Please? Yes, yes, yes. Go. Okay. Now, you sure that does it? Yes. All right. Let's get it out to the street. Can you make it all right, then? Yeah. All right, let's go. All right, Lewis. What's that? What is it? That's the alarm clock. Those wires are getting that thing. Put it. It's water. Oh. I may be late to the station in the morning. I'm going to take my alarm clock and throw it as far as I can. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief... The Murderer. Listen again an hour earlier, a week from next Thursday, when we will again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? Starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb is written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Howard McNear was heard as Louis Black. Featured in tonight's cast were Jim Backus, High Everback, Sidney Miller, Peter Leeds, Joe Duval, and Harry Lang. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Beginning next week, the lineup will be heard on a new day at a new hour, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time. This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us July 5th, a week from next Thursday, when we will again bring you The Lineup.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment the Line Up. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in the great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Take any one of these seats, David. All right. You think you found the man, Lieutenant? Well, it's hard to say. We picked up a couple of men who were seen in that area. One of them knows Dr. Simpson. Who is he? Well, I want you to identify him. Tell me if he's the same man you saw walking up and down in front of the house. Oh, I hope you got him. Dr. Simpson was such a fine man. Well, I'm sure he was. I worked for him for 15 years. I don't think he had an enemy in the world. Well, he must have had one. Somebody killed him. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the line. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or at play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. We now return you to Sergeant Matt Grab and... The lineup. I'll call off a number, then name and charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get an actual tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, keep it moving, boys. Right over here to the end of the stage. That's it. Now turn and face front, hands to your side. Now when I call you, step out and talk up so everybody in the room can hear you. Okay, number one, Robert Mockler, robbery. Where do you live, Robert? 1745 Tent. What's your business? Well, pipe fitting. Who do you work for? I'm not working. I used to work for Acme. Do you have a car? I don't own one. Did you use a car on the job? Yeah. Well, what kind? The Henry J. New one. Where'd you get it? Used car lot, so let me take it out for a demonstration. Job only took me 20 minutes. I had the car back in 30. What color was it? Light green. Good car. I'm thinking about getting one. Fred, you have to wait a few years. Yeah. All right, number two. Yusuf Letter. Assault. Where do you live, Yusuf? I didn't mean to hit him. He's my friend. Tell the people where you live, Yusuf. First Avenue, 66, 54, one quarter with my wife. She tell you I didn't mean to hit him. Where do you work? Steel mill. Open house. He's job for a strong man. You had a fight in the bar. You yeah, have a first one in three weeks, Sergeant. You broke a man's jaw in three places. Yeah, I hit him. 
But he was my friend. What did you hit him with? Hit him with? My hand I hit him with. What do you think? My feet. Well, if he was your friend, why... I'm sure he's my friend, but we, we got drunk a little. That seems to be a habit with you. Just after work. What's the matter with that, Sergeant? Couple drinks after the work. The drinks we don't care about, it's the broken jaw that makes us a little unhappy. It ain't yours. Could have been. I could have been in that bar. I gonna hit you? I don't even know you. Why I gonna hit you? All right, all right, Houston. Number three, Thomas Wilson, drunk at the Sorderly. Where do you live, Tom? Yeah, hotel, some joint on Fifth Street. I don't know the name, just moved in yesterday. It says here you live at uh, 409 West Adams. I lived there the day before yesterday, moved out. Why? My wife, she made too much noise. Your wife says you hit her? Big deal. Sure I belted her. You should have to listen to the racket she makes. You beat her up pretty bad. Ah, she just got sore because I moved out. Four years, the same sloppy kimono. Hair up and curlers. Always up and curlers. Looks like she just landed in a saucer. <laughs> Were you drinking? I always drink when I'm home. Yap, yap all the time. I got to get oil so I don't hear it. And she hides the bottle and I got to tear the joint apart. And she yaps. So I belted it. Big deal. All right. <laughs> Number four, Everett Sweezy. Loitering in suspicion. Where do you live, Everett? Lieutenant. My yeah, sister. is that the man? Uh, you'll yeah, have to that, talk yeah. up, Everett. That's Where the man that sister? was in front of the house. Sergeant Graham. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Hold number four for interrogation. You hungry? Oh, a little. Well, when we finish with this guy, let's get some dinner. Oh, sure. Hi, Matt. Hello, Quack. <laughs> Get a load of that tie, Ben. What's the matter with it? Are you kidding? Easter's a long way off, pal. I think it's very colorful. Ah, come <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, Sweezy. Uh, just like his name sounds. Funny little guy. Reminds me of a rabbit. Well, we'll have a talk with him. Are we going to need me? No. Why not, Ben? That tie would scare Rasputin into a confession. <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> Go get yourself some dinner. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Sweezy. Hello, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Why am I here? You think I've done something? We just want to ask you a few questions. I was just out walking and a policeman arrested me. Why did I get arrested? I haven't done anything. Do you always take walks at four o'clock in the morning? I like to think. I take walks and I can think. I'm all alone and walking helps. It's peaceful early in the morning. You do it often? Oh, yes. There's nothing the matter with that. What's wrong with that? Do you know a Dr. Simpson? Hmm? Dr. Simpson, do you know him? A Dr. Simpson. No, I don't know him. Well, he was the doctor who operated on your wife. My wife? She's dead. Yes. We're sorry. I live with my sister now. I couldn't live in the house anymore. Jeanette's dresses hanging in the closet. Dr. Simpson? Yes. You were arrested five blocks away from the doctor's house. I don't know. But he operated on your wife. My wife's dead. Could I have a glass of water? Sure, ma'am. Sure. I don't feel very well. I haven't been well for a long time. Now what's been the trouble? Headaches. My stomach's been upset, too. Haven't been able to sleep. I don't know. I guess I'm sick. There you are. Thank you. Is it a clean glass? Well, sure it is. So many germs. I'm very careful. I have so many colds. Thank you. Water tastes funny. If you haven't been feeling so well, Mr. Sweezy, uh, why don't you go to see a doctor? Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'll clean it up. You're liable to cut yourself. Be careful. It's okay. I'm terribly sorry. Don't worry about it. Mr. Sweezy, Dr. Simpson was killed this morning around 3.30... I feel just terrible. Uh, Couldn't I lie down for a while, please? I've got a bad headache. I'll just dump this in the way. You can lie down as soon as we finish talking to you. But I don't know anything. I haven't done anything. Dr. Simpson's servant saw you hanging around the neighborhood yesterday afternoon. I don't know where I was yesterday afternoon. I went walking. Dr. Simpson was killed in his car in front of his house at 3.30 the next morning. I've got such a bad headache. Could I have another drink, please? No glass. The doctor was shot through the head with a thirty-two caliber automatic. I'm just too tired to talk anymore. I feel so bad. My back aches. Well, why don't you tell us about it? 
Then you can sleep. I can't tell you anything. I uh, just want to lie down for a while. Uh, I'll be all right then, and you uh, can talk to me. Look, Dr. Simpson operated on your wife. You were at the hospital. We checked. I'm going to be sick. Catch him. <coughs> oh, I guess he really is sick. Yeah? Everett's sister, Miss Sweezy. Okay. We'll go right in, Miss Sweezy. Uh, how do you do, Miss Sweezy? Hello. Sit down, please. This is Sergeant Graham. How do you do? How do you do? How is Everett? He's in the infirmary. He said he was sick. Why was he arrested, Lieutenant? Suspicion. What does that mean? Did you know Dr. Simpson? Yes. Yes, I knew him. When Sergeant Quine talked to you this afternoon, you said that Dr. Simpson operated on your brother's wife. Yes. Mr. Klein said Dr. Simpson had been killed. Is that why you arrested Everett? Your brother was seen loitering in front of the doctor's house. Everett takes walks. Yes, we know that. He was probably just walking. Well, uh, tell us something about your brother. Well, there's nothing much to tell. He's always been sensitive. He paints. He's never really been well since he was a child, but he's a gentle person. You don't think he'd kill anyone? Oh, of course not. He was very fond of his wife? Oh, yes, yes. They'd been married for some time. He really hasn't been the same since she died. She uh, died of cancer, didn't she? Yes. Oh, it was a terrible thing. Everett suffered almost as much as she did. And then when she died, well, it was almost too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, he moved in with you? Yes. He put his house up for sale. Or rather, I should say, I did. Everett just wouldn't think about it. Did he ever say anything about Dr. Simpson? Say what? Well, maybe that he might have felt that the doctor was responsible for his wife's death. Oh, no, 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 most certainly not. Everett wouldn't do anything. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, can I see you? Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, certainly. And yeah, what is it? Everett Sweezy. He just tried to hang himself. Talk no, I think so, but you've got yourself a problem. Oh, what do you mean? He needs mental therapy. Well, that was obvious right after we picked him up. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I say it was very definitely paranoia. If he did kill someone, I don't think he was responsible. Well, we have to find out if he did first. Mm -hmm. Then what? Mm, that's a good question. Hi, Ben. Hi. Any statement? No, hasn't said two words. Everett? Everett? Mm-hmm. Lieutenant Guthrie wants to talk to you. Mm -mm. No, I'm too tired. Everett. I don't want him in here. He means Quine. He wants to write down what I say. I don't want him in here. Quine. Okay. I don't want him listening outside, writing down what I say. If I go to sleep, I might say things. What things, Everett? I don't want him listening. Well, he, he's not. He's He's gone. I want the doctor. Where's the doctor? Uh, right here. I don't feel good. I'm sick. Give me something that will make me sleep. No, certainly. What's the matter with me? I've got such bad headaches. I ache all over. You'll be all right, Everett. Doctor. Yes, I'm coming. There. You'll sleep now. Uh, thank you. Lieutenant. Yeah? I don't care now. It doesn't really make any difference. What doesn't? That I killed Dr. Simpson. I killed him. He killed Jeanette and I killed him. Oh, I feel so terrible. I'm glad I'm going to sleep now. Refreshment while you work for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. 
So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Get some sleep? You know it, like I was dead. Oh, me too. They moved Everett this morning, County Hospital. Psychiatric warrant? Yeah, about an hour ago. Whew. Glad that's over with. Yeah. Well, I'll have some breakfast and make out a report. You eat at home? Just coffee. Molly had to take the kids to the park, some kind of a carnival or something. Sunday school's throwing it. Uh-huh. Hey, Eddie. Hey. How about two in the water, four minutes and some sausages? Right, man. Double it, Eddie. Double it. Uh, will you give me some coffee now? Right, man. A cigarette? Thanks. No, I smoked enough last night to give the city a smog puff on. <laughs> Hi, Quine. Have some coffee? Well, he changed the tower. I hate to do it, boys. Oh, now, look. This is too hot. We haven't even had our coffee. Find us in a half an hour. It's huh? ever Sweezy. Yeah, what about him? They were just taking him into the county hospital. He slugged the guard. Got away. Who thinks up the names for streets? You are one of the strangest things sometimes. What's that number again? Two twenty-four. It's the next block. You think Everett just came home and went to bed? I doubt if he's that far off his rocker. Poor sister sounded scared to death on the phone. Everybody's scared of cops. I can't understand it. I'm such a nice fellow, really. Ha! Huh. Lights are out. Now. Maybe she's watching television. Let's try the bank. Yeah, there's a light in there. See anything? Yeah. Fine way to treat your sister. Come on. Huh? Better bust a window. All right. Give me a boost. All right. Come in. I'll untie her. You take a look around. Right. I'll have you loosen a minute, Miss Squeezy. Yeah. There, there we are. Oh, oh. Now, don't try to talk just yet. Just oh. let me get your arms and legs free. Yeah, he's, he's gone mad. You've got to now, there, help there. him, please. Here, let, oh. let me help you up. All right. All right, sit here. Now, Miss Sweezy, where's your brother? I don't know. I don't know. He was here when you called, but I couldn't tell you. He was like a crazy man. man. He... Now, just tell us what happened. He was here when you called. He was standing right over me with a gun. I was so frightened. Did he say where he was going? I'd have told you he was here, but I was so frightened. He was standing right beside me with a gun. That's why he came here, to get his son. Now, please, do you know where he went? Yes, yes, I'm trying to tell you. He went to kill Dr. Hanley. That's why he came for the gun. I wanted to tell you on the phone. Well, who's Dr. Hanley? What's his first name? His first name is John. John Hanley. He said he was going to kill him. Get on the phone. Uh, where's your phone? In the hall. Uh, call when Dr. Call John Hanley. To... Tell him not to leave the house. Get the address and tell him we'll be right there. Right. Oh, please, don't leave me. What if he comes back? What'll I do if he comes back? He won't come back, Miss Sweezy. Now, department. please, try to calm down. I'll send one of our men over to stay with you. I've seen it coming ever since Jeanette died. I could hear him crying. Did Dr. Oh, Hanley uh, take care of Everett's wife? Oh, he did everything Hello. he could for Jeanette. He Hello. took care of her the did best Dr. he Hanley. could. I tried to tell Everett right. when he came for the gun. Well, we'll please stop him, Miss Wheezy. Now, please, oh, please Dr. take... Oh, Hanley's a fine doctor. Huh? He's taken care of me much. for years. Uh, well, the doctor's out of the call, Ben. His wife said, though, we better get going. But I'm alone here. And if they took my car, he might come back. What'll I do if he comes back? There'll be a policeman here in five minutes. And now, look, don't worry. We'll stop Everett before he does any more harm. Oh, yes. Please. But don't hurt him. Try not to hurt him. Please. Yes? 
Yes. We're the police, Mrs. Hanley. You're the police? Why, I... Oh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Have you been able to locate your husband? Why, yes. I just told one of your men where to find him. You did what? Please tell me what's wrong. This is all very disturbing. Mrs. Hanley, we're the ones who called you. But a man came to the door just a few minutes ago. Did he say he was from the police? Well, I just assumed it. Well, that is, I, I asked him if he was the officer that called, and he said yes. What did he look like? Oh, he was small and slender. That's ever... Uh, where's your husband, Mrs. Hanley? He's making a call on Arden Road, 1456 Arden. Do you know the phone number there? Well, they have no phone. You've got to tell me. Is John in trouble? Who was that man? Well, it's nothing serious, Mrs. Hanley. We're just checking on the next patient of the doctor's. Oh, I see. But who was the man who came here? The ex-patient. Come on, Matt, let's go. KQRA from 13J. KQRA. Code 5 at 1456 Arden Road. Suspect armed and dangerous. KQRA, Roger. I wish I felt luckier tonight. That timing's off, man. Yeah, yeah. How much further? A few blocks. You know, doctors sure lead a rough life. Molly's uncle's a doctor. Poor guy never gets any rest. We go over there for dinner once in a while, and he's never made it through his dessert yet. Always gets called away. I don't know how to keep going. Got a cigarette? Yeah. I'll light it. You know, it's nice having a doctor in the family. When Molly was sick last year, her uncle took care of her. It didn't cost me a nickel. Except for the medicine. Uh, here we are. All oh, relax, will you? That's fine. Glad you're here. Oh, this is a pip. We were already on our way here when we got your call. Please, you got to do something. you got to get him out of there. Uh, this is Mr. Stafford. He put in a call for us. That guy in there is crazy. He says he's going to kill the doc. you got to get him out of there. He's got a gun. My kid is awful sick and that lunatic in there in there's with a gun. Now, take it easy, Mr. Stafford. What happened? Well, my kid took sick tonight and I called Dr. Hanley. A few minutes after he got here, this, this crazy guy comes to the door and says he's looking for the doc. I, I told him the doc was with my kid, so he pulls out a gun and goes on in. I ran to the corner gas station and called the cops. I see. Well, now, is there anyone else in the house? Well, no, there's just my kid and me. Get that guy out of there, will you? Now, which room is it? Uh, that one there on the ground floor where the light is. All right, now, you stay out here, Mr. Stafford. We'll get him out. Come on, man. you got to do something. You think we'd better go in? This guy's liable to keep it quiet. Okay. Please, listen to reason. Yeah, this very ill. I, I, I've got to get him to a hospital. What for, Dr. Henley? So you can let him die? Oh, please, Everett. Try to understand. How come you're so anxious to make people live, Doctor? How come you care whether he lives or not? I wasn't responsible for Jeanette's death, Everett, any more than Dr. Simpson was. Th there was nothing any of us could do. You, you must believe me. You told me you could save her. Dr. Simpson said the operation would save her. Why did you let her die? Why did you tell me you wouldn't let her die? Oh, Everett, please. I, I, I'll try to explain to you about your wife. I, I, I'll try to make you see that there was no way to save her. But don't let this boy die. Let me take him to the hospital. Then you and I can talk. I don't want to talk about Jeanette anymore. I don't want to see her face anymore. I don't want to hate you anymore. I'm going to kill you, Doctor. Jeanette wants me to kill you. What do we do? All right. See if there's another door into this room. Maybe uh, from the room down the hall. I can to the boy. Give me just a few minutes. Okay. But don't do anything wrong to him. Be sure you do the right thing. Go ahead. Help him. I'll need my bag. Where are you going, Doctor? You're not leaving here. It's right here on the chair. Yes, Captain, what have you got in that there's needle? another way in. The oh, bathroom connects this bedroom and the other one. What's Good. the matter with it? You him? go around through the bathroom. Count ten from the time you leave here, Let then open the door and cover me. His condition right. is very acute. Now, now. Go ahead. One, one, Give him the shot. Two, three, I'm not going to wait four, much longer. Five. Ever at six. Take me out of here before you. Eight. At, at least nine, take me to a phone. Let me call. Drop it, Everett. Stop that. Thank the Lord. Call an ambulance, man. Let's get him to the hospital. He's on the third floor, Ben. 312. Okay. 
Did uh, Gerson do the operation? Yeah. Said we didn't get him here any too soon. Hmm. Laura, please. Uh, three, please. He was on the table for two hours. Yeah? Well, if he pulls through this, it'll be one for the books. Mm-hmm. Well, if Dr. Hanley hadn't been there, he wouldn't have had a prayer. Third floor. I hope he's conscious. Yeah. Wonder what he'll have to say. Yes? That police, miss. Is he awake? Yes, but he's not too strong. We'll only be a minute. Hello, Everett. Hello, Lieutenant. Tell me, please. Am I going to live? Did you talk to the doctor? You've got a good chance. The doctor did a good job. Is this the same hospital Jeanette was in? Well, I don't know, Everett. Uh, find out for me, will you? I have to know. I'm scared. Okay, I'll find out. If it is the same, I don't want to stay here. Now, look, you better not talk anymore. Lieutenant, how's the kid? The little boy, is he still sick? No, no, he's fine, Everett. The doctor removed his appendix and he's going to be fine. I'm glad. I didn't want him to die. But, uh, Lieutenant, uh, come closer, please. Yes, sir. He still may die. If Dr. Hanley takes care of him, you mustn't let Dr. Hanley take care of him. Dr. Hanley killed my wife, you know. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or at play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? <coughs> You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of a suspect, have him held. The officer took your name. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Bear as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by Charles E. Israel and edited by Blake Edwards and Richard Quine, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Parley Bayer, I Averbeck, Jay Novello, Peter Leeds, Junius Matthews, Virginia Gregg, Jean Bates, and Mary Jane Croft. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Speaking, this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Your man's in the front row, in the middle there. Thanks. Big line? Yeah, about 22. I'll see you later. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Martin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. How are you? Just fine. Been here long? Uh, not long, no. Do you think you've got any of the men? Uh, no way being sure until you point them out. We picked up three or four on suspicion, past records, and close to your description. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call off the number. Please be prompt with your questions or identification. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers, as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn face front, hands to your side. When I call out your name and number, step out, face the room, talk up so everybody can hear you. All right, number one, Louis Foster, robbery. Where do you live, Louis? Hundred and eight and a half North Lincoln Boulevard. What's your business? A carry. You drive a cab? Ah, I used to. How long ago did you used to? I used to a year ago. I got cans. I can't jockey cabs no more. Lousy company black for me. You own a car? Uh, no, sir. Any weapons on you when you were arrested? No, sir. Anybody with you? Yeah. A guy named uh, Bernie or something. Bernie what? Bernie, uh, I'm not even sure of that. I don't know his last name. He, he's standing right back there. Bernie King, number four. How long you known him? I met him uh, uh, three, four days. The bar. We got drinking, and that's when we cooked up the job. Okay, step back. Number two, William Small, assault. Where do you live, Bill? 333 South 103rd Street. What's your business? Bartender. Where do you work? The Domino over on Jefferson, 46 West. He beat up a customer pretty bad. Yeah, he got out of line. I asked him to shut up. He don't shut up. Take it for about an hour, and then I don't take it no more. You ask him to leave? Sure, like always. Guys get tanked up. First, I ask him to leave. I'm pretty big. Usually, they don't give me no lip. This guy, he's pretty big, too. He didn't want to leave? Nah. He gets very insulted. Starts calling me names he ain't gotten around to until then. I try to hustle him. Gentle, but I mean it, see? He don't hustle. Instead, he clobbers me one with his elbow. Right in the kisser, he clobbers me. So what else? I go to work, I rough him up good. I'm mad now, see. I really rough him up. You hit him with the table. Well, he had a bar stool. I had to hit him with something or he brains me for keeps. Okay, step back. Sure. A soft, yeah. He don't get nothing, huh? Just a concussion. Number three, Homer Miller, robbery. Any of the men up there? Uh, Where do you no, no, no. Three point nine South Mill. What's your business? I ain't been working lately. I used to be a steeplejack. How long have you lived here? Well, uh, six, seven years. I come from Detroit. Hi, boy. No, man. That coffee hot? Yeah. Martin didn't make an identification, huh? Uh-uh. He's down looking at the mug file again. Yeah. Thanks. Well, you'd sure think with four men to find, he ought to be able to spot one of them. I don't know. Maybe they haven't got any records. They, they were pretty professional about it. We didn't even get a print. Yeah. And but look at the M.O. Four guys go into a theater, stick it up, one lookout. The other three guys go up to the manager's office. And we've had theater hold up, sure, but not four guys working like this. Young guys. Yeah, Martin says the three who came into his office couldn't have been over 22 or 3. And nobody in our files even comes close to the descriptions. Out of town? 
Mm, maybe. Maybe the first John. They acted like cowboys and Indians. Martin says he thought they were kidding until he saw the guns. Well, what have you done? Staked out the theaters. That... Guthrie. Yeah? Yeah? The Lincoln? Okay. Let's go. Something hot. Those four guys just held up the Lincoln Theater. Fitch was on stakeout, tried to stop him. Tried? He downed one, but got shot up doing it. He's on the way to the hospital. How bad? Pretty bad. How's Fitch? No report yet. He's in the operating room. Who was the doctor? Of course. Fitch caught one in the chest and one in the right leg. Family been in uh... Yeah, they're in this room. What about the other one? No identification on him. Before he passed out, he said his name was Martinelli. Fitch really blew him up. Slug went in the right hand, up the arm, right through his body. Funny, huh? Up the arm like that, right through? Oh, uh, uh, here's Dr. Lundigan. He operated on Martinelli. Gentlemen. I, um, suppose you're the police. That's right, Doctor. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Gray. Hi, Doc. How do you do? How's Martinelli? I can't say just yet. He hasn't regained consciousness since we removed the bullet. We were hoping to question him. Well, you can wait in the room if you like. Thanks. It's, uh, 304, right there. Well, let's go in. Well. Hmm? I just came from the theater to cash. Uh, so come on in the room and tell me, huh? Uh, we're police, nurse. Dr. Lundigan said we could wait in here. Well, all right, if he said so. I'll get another chair. Thanks. Please try to talk quiet. Okay. He's working pretty hard at it. Yeah. What do you got, Quine? Now the cashier at the theater saw the car, and all she knew was it's blue sedan. Not much, but I put on an APB, and descriptions tell it all the way around. Has to be the same bunch you mm-hmm. How's Fitch? He's still out, too. Uh, you want me to stick around? Yeah, yeah, for a while. Why, you got a date? No, no, I got nothing to do. Here you are. Thanks. You better call a doctor. Ask Dr. Lundigan to come to 304. That's that, huh? Yes. Coyne, stay and get fingerprints on him. If anything comes up, you can get me at home. Let's go, man. Got the lawn looking good. Oh, not bad for just Sunday labor. Well, good night. I'll see you in the morning. Want me to pick you up? No, uh, I want to leave the car to be serviced. Say hello to Molly. Right. Night. Night. Johnny, dulce his lights. Get the car started. Come on. Let's get him out of here. Heavy, ain't he? There's a new dollar day on CBS. Mystery fans know that can mean only one thing. Edmund O'Brien as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The insurance sleuth with a dynamite-loaded expense account, formerly heard Saturdays, now will be heard Wednesday nights on most of these same CBS stations. Johnny Dollar celebrates his move tomorrow night by solving the Malcolm Wish matter, a startling disappearance case. Don't see nobody. 
Okay, drag him out. <laughs> hey, bet nobody ever kidnapped no cop before. All right, all right. Get him down the shaft. Okay. Where do you want him? Just dump him. All right. He's coming around. Give him time. This happened pretty good. Go to check. Uh, yeah. Don't feel so good, huh, Cap? You want us to get some water or something and dump it on him? Or well, you should just go sit down and shut your face. I'll take care of the cop. Okay, okay. Big deal. How about it, Cap? Feel like sitting up? Uh, oh, sure, you can sit up, so I'll sit up. He <laughs> don't look so good. You messed him up. You needed messing. Come on, Cap. <laughs> take it easy. What? <laughs> Wake up. Okay, okay. I'll sit there. What's going on? You got bean. No. <laughs> you got bean good. Shut up. Okay, okay. Here, cop. Have a drink of water. No, thanks. <laughs> well, you should have. Now you got yourself all wet. You punk. Who do you think you're talking to? You. <laughs> You, I'm talking to any way I want to. <laughs> he just don't get it. Big, stupid cop. Just don't get it. Like to know about it, big, stupid cop. Want to know why you got your skull split, huh? Who are you? Martinelli. Oh. Tony Martinelli. One of your stinking cops shot my brother. You get it now? Yeah. Anybody ever kidnapped a cop before, huh? Anybody ever kidnapped a lieutenant, a big, dumb lieutenant, huh? <laughs> You gotta learn to answer when I ask you something. That theater job, your first stick up, Tony? What makes you think so? Because you pulled another one three days later. So what? Amateur. Smart hood would figure we'd stake out the theaters. I'm not smart, huh? Not a bit. Smart enough to get 3,000. I told you to keep your face shut. All right. Of course, Ditch. He's with us, huh? Boys are making a big mistake. Tell us how we're making a big mistake, huh? None of us got records in this town. Who's going to find us? They'll find you. Know the penalty for kidnapping in this state? They ain't going to find us, cop. My brother ain't going to say nothing. If we got you along, even if they do find us, they ain't going to do nothing. I'm getting hungry. I'll go out and get some sandwiches. Okay, what do you want? Hey, liver wash. Just get some step on us. Okay. Yeah, how about the copper? Oh, he ain't hungry. Get me some hamburgers. Okay. You know what we're going to do, Lieutenant? What? We're going to wait right here to see if my brother's going to be all right. Then we'll leave in a state. You're going to be sitting right in the front seat all the way. What if your brother doesn't get all right? You still sit in the front seat until we get clear. Hi. Hi, where's Ben? He's not in yet. I was just swiping some coffee. Well, swipe me some. What, uh, what'd you find out on Martinelli? Here. Oh, thanks. Uh, we ran down the fingerprints. We got him through the army. Full name, Julio Martinelli. 26 years old. Born in this country, Detroit. Don't know how long he's lived here. No record at all. What's Detroit say? I'm waiting on it now. Just heard from the army an hour ago. He's got a brother, Tony Martinelli. Family deceased. What kind of an army record does he have? Lousy. Both he and his brother were always in trouble. No overseas duty. Stationed in California. I wonder where Ben is. Oh, are you supposed to pick him up? No, no. Oh, he's probably still having his car service. Uh, here's the report from Detroit. Both the Martinellis have records. Minor offenses, but habitual. Both serve small time raps a dozen times. Any report on the blue sedan? No, and here's something else. Detroit sent back these covering the descriptions of the other two guys with the Martinellis. Martinelli's brother, Tony, is essentially to be the guy who ran the stick-ups, and these two guys have been picked up with him a couple of times. Luke Johnson, 
Charlie Wren. Yeah, according to their records, they never pulled off anything this big, just petty stuff in the past. Well, you better have these circulated. Right. Hey, where's Ben? I don't know. He sure is late. and no word yet. Ben's never stayed away without at least checking in. He didn't even go into the garage. Uh, to check the hospital. Oh, we would have gotten some word by now. I covered the morgue. Oh, nothing like that. Well, how do you know? I at least got a... Fu- Grab. What's the address? Okay. Asher thinks maybe he's got an identification on one of the men. Cafe down on River Street. 105 East. Do you want me to come along? No. No, you'd uh, you'd better stay here until Carter checks in about Ben. Let me know as soon as you hear anything, huh? Identified this one, Luke Johnston. Positive? He's pretty sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. This guy in the picture came in this morning and got some sandwiches. To take out? To take out, yeah. Liverwurst and six hamburgers. I remember because I ain't had too many customers today. Did you notice whether he was in a car or not? Oh, no. Well, I mean, I noticed. I seen him walk away across the street that way. You see, we stay open all night, and he was my first customer. He walked that way right down there. See, what's he doing? He's a killer, maybe? The river's down that way. Well, sure, probably lived down there by it. He kind of looked funny. I thought it looked funny when he first came in, like he was a gangster, maybe. <laughs> Looks just like a kid in this picture. Oh, sure, yeah. He's young. He's about my boy's age, maybe, but... Oh, it looked tough and shifty. Oh, you know the type. He got coffee and sandwiches. Now, where's your phone? Uh, it's right there. It's a nickel. <laughs> This is Greb. Let me talk to Waldo. Hello, Captain. We got an identification on Luke Johnson. I'll need every available man to cover this area, at least 15. It's my guess Johnson is holed up somewhere within walking distance of the river. Yes, sir. I'll keep in touch. Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, the address is 105 East River. Right. Asher, 
you work with me. Right. Well, something big, huh? Yeah? Those guys that stuck up the theaters? Yeah, I read about that. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Froline. Uh, four line. Like on a golf course. Four. <laughs> Enough yet, Tony? It's plenty dark, huh, Tony? All right, all right. Which way's the car? In the alley behind the charter house. Uh, look, Tony, do we have to take this guy along? Can't you knock him off here? You knucklehead, he's insurance. Come on, little tanner on your please. Move. Ah, uh, Tony, don't hit no more. We'll have to carry him again. Go out the back way. So help me cop one fancy move and I'll blow you apart. Hey, Lieutenant, you look awful. Thanks. Shut up. Well, they got about a half a tank of gas, Tony. That'll get us to the state line and more. Yeah, we should have brought some food if we ain't going to stop, Tony. There's your car. Hold it. I thought I saw something move. Stop, hey, hey, hey. Get to me, Inspector! you hit? No. Where'd he go? There he is. In between those buildings. There, we'll get him. Hey, come back here. Who? He's lying back there next to Charlie, tough boy. Now, come here. I got no gun, Tom. I don't shoot. I got no gun. I know you haven't, Tony. He can't get away, Ben. Go back to the car. He's calling. He sure is. All right, Tony. Come on out. Okay. Okay, come on. Don't shoot. I don't have a gun, Tony. Come here. All right. Take it easy now, Lieutenant. Come here. I got no gun. You win, Tony. You win. Take it easy, huh? Don't do it. Get up, Tony. Please, get up. Come on, get up. I don't think he's going to, Ben. Well, wouldn't you know it? I'd like to beat Take that. Take it easy, boy. Well, that's what happens when you lose your temper. I should have saved the Sunday punch for last. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call out for number, then name and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, is written by Blake Edwards and Dick Quine, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Tony Barrett, Dick Ryan, Ted DeCorsia, Peter Leeds, Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, and Clayton Post. The lineup is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Elation and syncopation are the main elements of tomorrow night's Bing Crosby show over most of these same CBS stations. And no wonder the groaner himself vocalizes and informalizes. And Bing's guests include Tommy Dorsey with some fancy licks on his slide trombone, hot violinist Joe Venuti, and that equally torrid songbird Teresa Brewer. Tomorrow night on the Bing Crosby show. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. We can sit right here, Mr. Becker. Oh, um, uh, here? Sure, sure, that's all right. Uh, uh, thank you. Is it all right if I smoke? Sure, sure, go ahead. <clears throat> you think you have the man? We have no idea. Do mm-hmm. you smoke? Uh, no, thanks, not right now. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, if you do, if you've caught the man, I'll know him. I hope so. Like I told you... His face pressed this close, maybe a foot away from where I was looking through the curtains. Mm-hmm. And you never saw him before? Oh, no, no, I never saw him before. Like the guy across the hall, the guy that was killed, mm. I never saw him before. And he lived right across the hall from me. You may think that may sound funny, but I don't know. No, no, it's very possible. Mm-hmm. Oh, I lived there for at least, I don't know, about seven months. Oh, there's Sergeant Greb. Yeah, he interrogates the line. Oh, he's a nice guy. He sure is. I like may him. I have your attention, please? <laughs> Yeah. You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner, as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, keep it moving right over here to the end of the stage. Come on, come on, come on. Now turn and face front hands to your sides. Now when I call your number, step out and face the audience. Keep your head up and look straight ahead. Talk up so everybody can hear you. All right, number one, George Hadley, robbery. Where do you live, George? Here, in town here I live. You got an address? Yeah, sure, North 23rd. 1040 North 23rd. For how long? Last. How long have you lived at that address? A long time. What's a long time? A couple of years, I guess. That long I lived there at least, yeah. That's a long time, ain't it? Where are you from? Pittsburgh. What's your business? Baker. That was back in Pittsburgh, though. I don't have too many baking jobs since I come here. There's too many bakers. What were you doing over at uh, Madison Terrace last night? I was walking. You always take a walk at 11 o'clock at night? Not always. Last night I took one. There's something the matter with that. These times when you do take walks, do you always carry a flashlight and a screwdriver under your shirt? Oh, I just happened to have them with me last night. There's something the matter with that? No. Unless you try to break into a house. I wasn't trying to break in. You had the window open. Yeah, sure, I was breaking in. How about that? Okay, George, step back. Number two, Harry Saunders, disturbing the peace. Oh, oh yes, there's the man. Up there. Tell yeah, the which one? Live, the next one no in line. Uh, well, uh, let's wait till he's questioned. Sure, wherever I can. Well, where was it last night? Oh, uh, somewhere over on Lake or uh, Lake Street or uh, something like that, something like that. In the park, wasn't it? Yeah. The arresting officer said you were trying to catch a swan. Catch it? I was feeding the thing. I was trying to get the thing over so I could pet it. You didn't want to eat it? A swan? You had a big club on the ground beside you. It wasn't my club. It was just laying there. I happened along, see the swan swimming around, so I start throwing the thing some lousy crumbs. I didn't notice no club on the ground. Eat a swan? Your story doesn't quite fit with the story we got from the arresting officer. Arresting officer? Arresting officer? What did he say? What did he say? Don't tell me. Tell the people. All right. What did the arresting officer say? I was feeding the stupid bird some breadcrumbs. What's the matter with that? 
Where am I going to eat a swan, eh? Where am I going to eat it? That's a lot of bird. I'm going to start a fire right in the middle of the park, eh? Okay, Harry, okay, step back. Eat a swan. Where am I going to get a pot that big, eh? Where? That's enough, Harry. It's all Nick. Number three, Tom Pearson. Uh, 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 that's charge. him. That looks like him. Yeah, make sure. Uh, yes, that's the man. Yes, I'm sure. Okay. Uh -huh. Sergeant Graham. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Number three, hold for interrogation. Okay. Just sit in that chair, Pearson. Okay. Well, figured out where you were yesterday afternoon? I told you. Watching the chess players in Jackson Park. Watching the chess players in Jackson Park. Showed you pictures around over there this afternoon. Yeah? Yeah. Funny nobody remembered seeing you. Real funny, because that's where I was. You like chess, huh? I got interested. How does a bishop move? Huh? Yeah. How does a bishop move on a chessboard? I just watch. I don't know the rules. Well, doesn't it get pretty dull if you don't know what's going on? I got nothing else to do. It's a nice day, so I watch some old duffers playing chess. You gonna throw me in jail for that? You were identified in the line. Yeah? Yeah. The man who identified you said you were climbing down a fire escape. I told you I was in the park. Watching a chess game. Watching a chess game. You know Michael Hunter? Yeah. You know someone killed him? No, but I can't say I'm unhappy about it. You threatened Michael Hunter once, didn't you? If I did, it was a long time ago. But you threatened him. Yeah, yeah, I threatened him. If you want to call it that, I threatened a lot of people if you want to call it that. What were you doing at Hunter's apartment yesterday? I was in Jackson Park. You've been identified as the man who sneaked down the fire escape. I was watching the chess players, remember? You were booked back in 47 for assaulting Michael Hunter. Is that right? That right. He kept bothering my kid sister. You didn't like him, huh? No, I didn't like him, would you? I didn't know him. That story about Jackson Park won't sell for us. I didn't kill Hunter. What do you want me to do, lie? You want me to lie, huh? I was in Jackson Park. How long have you known Michael Hunter? Four years, five years. Where'd you meet him? My sister was in some play with him, but I didn't kill him. But you really worked him over. Sure, what do you want? He made it tough on the kid, I made it tough on him. He deserved it. You used a tire chain on him, didn't you? Something like that. How long has Hunter lived at his present address? How should I know? In your neighborhood, isn't it? Yeah, so what? You can't take no murder on me. I didn't kill him. Nobody said you did. What? Then what's this all? Hunter isn't dead. He isn't dead? He's in a coma. He may not make it. We just want the man who stabbed him. Well, I'm not it. Hunter had some kind of an acting school, didn't he? Yeah, that's how my sister got to know him. The whole setup was a phony. How do you know? I know. He was a lousy actor. Looked good. Told dames he could do something for him. Uh, Lieutenant, can I uh, see you for a minute? Okay. <clears throat> We've located the girl along that scarf. Got her down the hall. Yeah, okay. Uh, Matt, take Pearson downstairs. I'll be right back. Right. Asher turned her up. Wasn't easy. He checked all of Hunter's previous so-called students. Uh -huh. She was one of them. He just showed her the scarf, and she admitted it belonged to her. This is Miss Helen Roberts. Hi. This is Lieutenant Guthrie, Miss Roberts. Glad to know you. How do you do, Miss Roberts? Uh, just keep your seat. Sure. How long have you known Michael Hunter? Who's he? Don't you know Michael Hunter? No. Who's he? Well, your scarf was found in his apartment. Oh, him. Oh. Oh, then you do know him. Sure. I forgot his name. I haven't known him very long. How long? A couple of days since Friday. Yeah, Friday. Good-looking guy. Said I got sex appeal. Where'd you meet him? Where I work. When I went on the night shift. I work at the White Spot. It's a 24-hour restaurant on Mariposa Street. Yeah, food there. ain't bad. You eaten there? Yeah, ain't bad. I went on the night shift and I met this guy, this hunter. Spotted him right off, real cute. Asked me if I'd ever done any acting. Said I had sex appeal. When was the last time you saw Mr. Hunter? Oh, I only saw him once. I only known him for a couple of days. When was it? Yesterday afternoon. What time? Oh, like around four. Why, what's he done? Someone tried to kill him. You're kidding? No. Gosh, he was going to make an actress out of me. He was going to teach me how to act so I could get a job, another job, out of that beanery. Mm -hmm. Did you give him any money? I sure did, 20 bucks for lessons. Where's the scarf? Here. This is your scarf, isn't it? Yeah. 
What time did you leave Hunter's apartment? Right after the lesson. About a half hour later, I guess. What time did I say I was there? Four o'clock. Yeah, I got a bad memory. Four o'clock. Well, I guess I left about 4.30 then. Was anybody else there? Sure. Who? Mr. Hunter. He was giving me a lesson. I mean anybody else besides Mr. Hunter. Me. Did he say he was expecting anyone? Not to the best of my knowledge. Have any ideas who might have stabbed him? I know. No, we had any enemies. Look, mister, all I know is he said with my sex appeal I should be in Hollywood pictures and I gave him $20 for acting lessons. I don't know none of his friends and I don't know none of his enemies. Okay. Thank you, Miss Roberts. To be sure. Can I go now? Yes. Yeah, but don't try to leave town. We may want to talk to you again. Leave town? On what? I gave Mr. Hunter my last 20 bucks. And you say don't leave town. Goodbye, Miss Roberts. Yeah. What was your name? Uh, Quine. To be sure. You're cute. Uh, uh... You stop in the white spot sometime. Night. I'm working the night shift. Yeah, I'll try to get around. My scarf, please? We'll have to keep it as evidence. Okay. Well, bye. Au revoir. <laughs> you better put a man on her. <laughs> Are you kidding? Come on in. Hi, Doc. Oh, hello, boys. Have a seat. Thanks. Your cigarettes on the desk. Yeah. I got one. Well, suppose you want to know about Hunter. Huh? Yeah, yeah. What's the latest? Oh, it's pretty bad. Still in a coma. Just making out a report here. Think you'll make it? Maybe. But I doubt it. Ruptured lung. Right hemothorax and pneumothorax. His response to treatment has been very poor. How are his chances of regaining consciousness? Practically none. Well, if he did regain consciousness, uh, could he recognize anyone? Probably not. In a case like this, where the patient has gone into coma due to lack of oxygen, the damage to the brain tissue is usually too extensive. Mm -hmm. Tissues of the brain are especially sensitive to lack of oxygen. And the damage done is permanent. Then, uh, if he did come out of it, he wouldn't be able to point out the man who stabbed him, huh? Nope. Well, how about the wound? Long, sharp implement. Knife, probably. Mm. Could a woman do it? Sure. Well, thanks, Doc. You bet. I'll let you know the minute anything happens. Tomorrow night, another big show joins the fall lineup. James Hilton introduces Deborah Carr in James M. Barry's Quality Street to open another star-studded season of outstanding dramas on most of these same CBS radio stations. Listen to for Lucille Watson in Ladies of the Jury tomorrow night on your Broadway Playhouse. We're covering every inch, Ben. If it's here in Hunter's apartment, we'll find it. Yeah. Now, how about the garbage cans in the alley? Ah, she's going through them now. Doesn't seem to care for it. <laughs> we ran a small weighted cardboard box down the incinerator chute to make sure nothing was stuck in it. And where is it? With the chute? Yeah. Now I'll show you. It's in the hall closet. Oh. Chute's in there. One of these on each floor. Yeah. How about the incinerator itself? Mm, cleaning it out right now. Well, who's this? Hmm? Oh, it's Becker's. Oh, uh, hello, uh, Lieutenant. Um, hello, Mr. Becker. Uh, this is Mrs. Becker, uh, Lieutenant Guthrie. Hello, Mrs. Becker. Hello, Lieutenant. This is Sergeant Quine, Mr. and Mrs. Becker. Hello, hello Sergeant Quine. Hey, what's all the confusion about? Uh, why all the policemen? They're looking for the weapon. Oh, well. You think it might be in the building? Uh, it could be. We know it's probably a knife, and a long one. Might have thrown it away or tried to hide it before he went back to the street. Pearson? Mm, maybe. That's the man you identified, isn't it? Yes, dear. Yes. Uh, how well did you know Mr. Hunter, Mrs. Becker? Oh, he was just a neighbor. 
I didn't know him well at all. Just saw him a few times. Mm. Ever talked to him? A few times, yes. And when was the last time? Three or four days ago, I imagine. Just hello and how are you? Mm -hmm. Ever notice anybody with him? No. Doesn't have any friends you know of? No. Well, he had a young lady in his apartment yesterday. He did? That's right. Neither of you saw her? No, I didn't see her. Oh, no, 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 I didn't. Uh, ben. Oh, excuse me, please. The janitor just came on duty. Yeah? We showed him a picture of Pearson. He remembers him. Oh, from where? Here. He says Pearson was here yesterday and asked for Hunter's apartment number. out of his mind. The janitor identified you from your picture. He's crazy. But he identified you. He says you were in that building yesterday. Well, I wasn't. He says you asked for Hunter's room number. He's mistaken, I tell you. He made a mistake. It wasn't me. A jury sure going to think it was. Guthrie. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Well, we can tell the boys to stop looking for that knife. It's been found? Yep. In the silverware we took out of Hunter's apartment. One of the butcher knives has his blood on it. Somebody tried to clean it, but there was enough rust pits to leave a little blood for the spectrograph. What does that mean? It means you're still in a lot of trouble. You were identified by two people who swear they saw you in that building. Okay. What? I was there, but I didn't kill him. Well, he's not dead yet. Well, I didn't stab him. If you think I went up there to knife hunter, would I have gone in by the front, talked to the janitor, and let somebody else see me? Well, might not have been premeditated. It was Hunter's butcher knife. That kind of indicates that it wasn't premeditated. I didn't go up there to stab him. He was already stabbed when I got there. Well, then why did you leave by the fire escape? Because Hunter was on the floor bleeding. When? When I got there. How did you get in? I walked in. The door was open. Why didn't you call the hospital? You got scared, you blame me. Besides, he looked good bleeding. Why didn't you tell us this when we brought you in? Are you serious? What do you think? What time did you arrive at Hunter's? Around 5, 5.15. See anybody? Just a janitor. How long did you stay in the apartment? Just long enough to look, and then I beat it out on a fire escape. You expect us to believe that? Look, it's a truth. I tell you, I walk... Guthrie? Yeah? Well... Uh-huh. uh-huh. Well, keep with her. Yeah, Ben. Uh, come on in here and get Pearson. Right. We'll have another talk later, Pearson. Okay, but I didn't stab Hunter. You're in a spot. you got to admit that. Yeah. Okay, take him down. Let's go, Pearson. Okay. Matt and I are going out for a while. We'll check in. Okay. Say, that last phone call. Uh-huh, Crockett. He's been tailing Helen Roberts. Yeah, she got in touch with some man at 665 North Lincoln. Yeah? Crockett talked to him. He's been running an advertisement for people to drive to California with him. Told Crockett that Helen Roberts paid him $20. Supposed to leave with him tomorrow morning. You think maybe... I don't know. She told us she gave Hunter her last $20. What if she doesn't go to work? You'd like that, huh? Don't be silly. Helen's a nice-looking doll. I don't mind keeping her company. Well, just make sure she doesn't come back to her apartment before we get a chance to go over it good. I still say, what if she doesn't leave? Oh, she will. The manager told me he owes her a week's salary. She'll go down there and collect it and tell him... Hey, she... Here she comes. Okay. Now, look, Quine. She probably won't stay there long. Just collect the money and tell her boss she's going to quit. How long do you want? A couple of hours, anyway. Three, if you can give it to us. Yeah, I might even give you more. But now, don't make it look official. Just tell her you thought she'd stop in and say hello. You're telling me how to operate. <laughs> Don one quiet. Get going. Get yeah, going. Pleasure. <laughs> All right. Now, what do we do? Get in her apartment and check everything, including her toothbrush. simpler if we knew what she had on that day. Now, collect everything. Shoes, dresses. Hey, hey. Huh? <laughs> how, uh, how about these? <laughs> Lovely. Match my eyes, don't they? Oh, come on, come on. 
What's all that stuff? You look like you've been to a sale. Yeah, how long will it take you to go over these clothes, Evans? For what? Blood. Michael Hunter's blood. Go through all this? Yeah. Uh, check the shoes first. Hunter bled a lot, and she just might have stepped in some. Who's she? A blonde named Helen Roberts was in the apartment. Well, Ben, there's a lot of stuff. How long? Maybe an hour, maybe more. Okay. <laughs> these would look nice on you, Matt. That's what I said. Match your eyes. <laughs> See, Ben? Uh, want some more coffee? <laughs> Gee, thanks, Dick, but I really got to get home. Hey, how come you're quitting your job? I got tired of it. I I'm going to get something else, something that suits my talents more, you know. Yeah. Do you still want to be an actress? Well, I don't know. I guess maybe I'd still like to be one, but I don't know. I'm still pretty upset about Mr. Hunter's dying. I don't know anybody else in the acting business. Oh, well, uh, I know a few people. You do? Gosh, that would be wonderful. Mr. Hunter always said I had a lot of sex appeal and things, and I don't know why I shouldn't try to be an actress. I know I got the talent for it. Uh, uh, why don't we get out of here? Uh, go somewhere and talk some more. Well, I really should be getting home. I gotta start looking for another job tomorrow. Well, it's early. Well, I don't really think... Besides, I should... you don't want to go looking for another job until we see what I can do for you with my friends. Okay. When do you have to be on duty again? Oh, whenever I feel like it. Yeah? Sure, the department doesn't make a move without me. Nothing on these. Well, here's another pair. You know, I was just thinking, if Quine didn't do so well and Helen went home, she'd probably call robbery and we'd get arrested. <laughs> what makes you think this Roberts girl has anything to do with this? Well, I don't, uh... Just checking every possibility. I think Pearson's our boy. No, I don't think so. He had a good point when he said he'd... He'd have been foolish to walk in the front door. Well, he could have figured that one out ahead of time. Well, if he's going to be that smart, he wouldn't have left the knife around. Oh, I don't think that was so stupid. If we just examined those knives on chance, we didn't expect to find anything. Yeah, but we did. Yeah, but it's still smart. Walk in the front door, use the guy's own butcher knife, and put it back in the drawer. That's smart? You don't think he did it? Well, I'll just bet you... How much? You name it. Dinner? Bet. Think you better work up a good appetite, Ben. Now, you find something? Mm -hmm. On the heel of these pumps. Here, take a look. I'll get it. Here's a sample of Hunter's blood. Uh-huh. Yeah? This is off the heel. It's the same type. Well, well how yeah, you doing? I see. <laughs> Where? Well, I... Okay, just a minute. Ben. Yeah? It's Quine. He's in some Chinese restaurant. With a girl? Yeah. Well, uh, tell him to bring her in. Right. Bring her in, Quine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he says he'll be glad to. She's been trying to show him how to eat with chopsticks. You're a swell one, you are. A swell one. Pretending you wanted the date. I'm sorry, but the lieutenant the here... The lieutenant, huh? You're the lieutenant, aren't you? That's right. Sit down, please. We met before, haven't we not? Yeah. Uh, please have a seat. Who's he? That's Sergeant... What's this all about? Why did this guy bring me down here? Wanted a date. Wanted to help me meet some people that could help me get a job. I told him to bring you in. Well, I ain't sure about that. I'm sure about him playing up to me. He said he wasn't even on duty. Miss Roberts. Yeah. Why did you kill Mr. Hunter? Me? Are you nuts, me? I didn't have nothing to do with it. Your scarf was in his apartment? I don't know you. I'm sure so my scarf was in his apartment. You found it there, I left it there, so what? You think I killed him with my scarf? He was stabbed. You think I... He's dead? Died a half hour ago. But you said he... We found some of his blood on one of your shoes. On one of my shoes? What are you doing with one of my shoes? How did you get it? He wasn't wounded. Stabbed by a knife when you last saw him? Say, who are you, anyway? I told you, no, I'm sorry. No, he wasn't stabbed or nothing like that. He was walking around and he wasn't doing it with no knife in his back. How'd you know he was stabbed in the back? Well, I guessed. Wasn't he? How'd you get blood on your shoes if he wasn't stabbed? I don't know. 
I cut my finger a couple of days ago, see? It was his blood on your shoes. You killed him with a butcher knife from his kitchen drawer. I did not. And besides, who are you? Sergeant Grubb. You killed him with it and wiped it off. Well, if I did that, how did you find any blood how, huh? Spectrograph. Spectra what? Don't come on like Dick Tracy with me. You could have washed it with soap and water and the spectrograph would still find it. I don't believe it. Then explain the blood on your shoes. Well, actually, Mr. Hunter was stabbed when I got there. I got scared and ran. You can understand why I didn't tell you about it. I was scared. You can understand, Lieutenant. A man named Pearson was there after he was stabbed, too. Did you run into each other? Well, I didn't know his name. But there was a man there. He didn't see you. He didn't? Why did you kill Hunter? <sighs> because he said he couldn't do nothing with me no more. He said he couldn't help me, and I asked him for my money back. How much money had you given him? Lots. A couple of hundred. We were going to get married. To... <gasps> he broke my heart. So you stabbed him with that kitchen knife? Yes. He was pouring some beer, and I couldn't stand it. He said we was going to drink to our parting. And I wasn't going to be parted by no guy what had 200 clams of mine. <laughs> Will I get the chair? Take her out, Queen. Come on. And you, Richard. You're all alike. Just the man. Yeah, uh, let's go. Lieutenant. Yeah? Will the reporters want to talk to me? Probably. I'll see them. I'm on the ragged edge of disaster, but I'll see them. Au revoir. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye, Mr. Greb. To be sure. Oh, holy cow. Well, you owe me a dinner. Yeah, yeah. You know something? What? Better she never became an actress. <laughs> Lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next Wednesday when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call up a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number of The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by Harvey Easton and edited by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Howard McNear, Victor Perrin, Peter Leeds, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Two heavyweight contenders climb through the ropes tonight when CBS Radio brings you another fast and furious boxing exclusive. It's Archie Moore versus Emberl Davidson in what promises to be one of the slugfests of the new season. Don't miss a single exchange of blows when Davidson and Moore fight it out ten rounds of heavyweight boxing exclusive tonight on most of these same CBS stations. To say it with music... B. CBS. B. For the best... Yes, yes, yes. The stars that dress is CBS. And remember, mystery fans can't miss when it's the FBI in Peace and War Thursdays on the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, 
the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Jennings, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Now, how do you do, Mrs. Jennings? Hello, Lieutenant. I'll see you later then, Ben. Yeah. Oh. Uh... Oh, d- don't worry. I'll, I'll drive you back home when you're finished. I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you, Sergeant. I hope I can be of some help, Lieutenant. He's been so nice to me. He drove me over on the ferry instead of the bridge. I told him I like to see ships up close. <laughs> well, so do I. Uh, Mrs. Jennings, our man probably won't be any of these, but we have to cover every possibility. Of course, Lieutenant. How is that poor girl? Oh, about the same. Oh, such a terrible thing. Is he a criminal? <laughs> None of the suspects are down here, Mrs. Jennings. They'll all be up on the stage. Yeah, That's Captain Devereaux in the Codex Squad. Oh, you be glad there in the sun right, in the audience room. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, then name in charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. Sergeant looks like a nice man. All Is right, he? Graham? Come on, oh, yes. Family man? Yes. I thought so. That's right, all the way down. Now turn face front, hands to your sides, and look straight ahead. Now don't be afraid to talk right up so the people in the back of the room can hear you. All right, number one, Roswell Brennan, robbery. Where do you live, Roswell? Here. Here, on this stage of the county jail in town, where? In town, I don't know the address. I just moved in yesterday. Got picked up before it gets settled. Turn to each side. Can you people hear him back there? No, I can. No. All right, a little louder, Roswell. Now, where did you live before you moved to the east side of town yesterday? Here. Yeah. Come on, speak up. Here, here in town, right here in this stinking town. Where? I lived at the White Hotel for a while. And before that? I lived out of town. You married? Not anymore. Ever served time? You heard the question? Yeah. Well, when, where, what for? It was a couple of years ago. I did nine months in the county jail in Cheyenne, Wyoming, for robbery. Okay. Number two, Frank Sundell, disturbing the peace. Where do you live, Frank? Hi, 32, Logan Street. Is that your permanent residence? Permanent is any. Been there almost three months now. According to the report, you threw a brick at a laundry truck and smashed the windshield. Well, they wouldn't make good on the three shirts of mine they ruined. I don't take that lying down. It's a felony to throw a missile at a moving vehicle. Did you know that? I told you that criminal laundry wouldn't make good on them shirts of mine. The driver was pretty badly cut up. He's in the hospital. Oh, that's tough. Yeah, well, they should have paid me. They did pay you something. Oh, sure, yeah, five bucks. Well, if you weren't satisfied with that settlement, you should have gone to the small claims court. I've been out of work for six months. I can't afford no lawyer. No lawyers are allowed in small claims court. You plead your own case. Now you'll have to get a lawyer, Frank. All right, number three, Jules Carabello, assault. What's your line of work, Jules? Cook. Don't look at me. Look right out front so the people can see you. Where do you cook? In a restaurant downtown. What restaurant? Uh, the one where it happened. What restaurant? All restaurants have names. Tell us which one you work at. Oh, you got it on your books. My brother-in-law owns the place. Your brother-in-law's name, Angelo Capelli? Yeah. You went after him with a meat cleaver last night. Well, I was upset. I didn't feel good. All right, Jules. All right. Number four, John Smith. Vacancy. Hi. Hi. Oh. Got anything the matter? Mm, just tired again. I keep telling you to try a massage, Ben. Those guys... Not me. Well, then let Quine... No, thanks. Now, look, I, I'll, let, I'll let him do it to me, see, and show you how easy it is. Yeah. Mrs. Jennings, spot anyone? No. He's coming back tomorrow and try again. 
That's too bad she didn't get the license number of the car. Only just passed a window and parked out of a range of vision. She thinks it was a 50 Buick. It was dark out last night. No oh, moon. She has a, a face pretty clear in her mind. She says he wasn't two feet from her window when he walked back to his car. And besides, there's a street light on a corner in that helps. Yeah. Uh, how's Asher doing? Any identification on our Jane Doe yet? Uh, he's looking under the clothes labels and laundry marks. Put her prints on the wire. Well, maybe she'll regain consciousness long enough to tell us who she is. Uh, Dr. Gordon said he let me know if there was any change. She was sure shot up. Ash is checking on that coat she was wearing. You should get something. It was expensive. Mink. You know, Molly says she could never stand to wear a mink coat. Ah, man, man. Ah. Oh, fine, fine. Just the guy I want to see. Ben needs a neck job. Yeah? No, I didn't say I did. Now, look, Ben, look. He can take your head and twist it just right so your neck cracks. Relax it in half a second. Go ahead, Quine. Go ahead, Uh, uh, You don't show me. What's the matter? You scared? (laughs) Come on, Quine. Come on, come on. Do it to me. Show him. Okay. Sit sit over here, man. All right. right, Sit down and relax. I'm relaxed. Relax, man. That's it. That's it. Uh, Relax now. I'm relaxed. Uh, Yeah. How's that? Oh, great. See? Now the other way. Watch this, Ben. I'm watching. Uh, you, you see, you got to get a hold of him just right, Ben. Uh, it's elaborate. Now relax, Matt. Uh, just loosen up. Now uh, hold it. I tell yeah. you, Ben, this is exactly what you should do. You, you feel better right away. Hold oh, still, William. Oh, sorry. All right. Yeah. I got to get you set just right. Oh. Uh, it's important. You know. Yeah. The big secret is, is to, John relax, Guthrie. to relax all yeah. over. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Let oh, me take that, that down. good. Real good. 3041 no, Albion Street. Turn your head Street. the other way, will you, yeah. Matt? Yeah. Like okay. That. There we are. Yeah. Hey, come on. Let him do it to you, Ben. I tell you, it makes you feel 10 years younger in 10 seconds. Does it really work? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, well, what do you say, Ben? Well, uh, maybe later. Uh, that was Asher. Huh? He came up with an identification on our Jane Doe. She worked in a defense plant for a while. Prince one file with the Bureau. Her name's Lorraine Oberhauser. Asher's over to her apartment now. <clears throat> okay. Ben, yet? Uh, I want to think about it. Come on, then. Oh, Asher. Oh, hi. Hi. We haven't picked up much here yet. No family? Nothing, not even a letter. But Crockett should get something at the defense plant. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, the apartment house manager, Clarence Dillon, is waiting to talk to you. Oh, sure. Uh, in here. Right. Uh, Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Grab, Miss Dillon. Hello, Miss Dillon. Hello. Hello. I couldn't believe it when they told me about poor Lorraine. I, I still can't believe it. Uh, was she a friend of yours, Miss Dillon? When she quit her job three months ago, we, we sort of got acquainted. We'd have coffee together late in the morning. She ever speak to you about her family? Never. Although I, I think she was married once. What about her friends? I never met any of them. Uh, what about the man who drove the Buick? He used to come by and pick her up, didn't he? Oh. You know about Claude. Claude who? Oh, I, I never met him. She, she just called him Claude when she talked about him. Uh, what'd she say about Claude? Well, you know, I have to meet him or I'm going to see him tonight. A mm-hmm. few times I saw him in the hall. Oh, what'd he look like? Tall. Sort of getting bald. Uh, how old? Well, maybe 40. How old's Lorraine? 25. She had a birthday a week ago. She have a party? Sort of. Didn't Claude come? No. It it was just Lorraine and myself. We had a drink or two and then went out to dinner and a movie. Uh, Did Claude come by here last night? I couldn't say. I was out last night. He does drive a Buick. Yes. What kind? Uh, Riviera. Blue. Trimmed in black. You know where we can get hold of him? Heavens, no. Well, did Lorraine ever mention what kind of work he does? No. Well, how'd he strike you the few times you saw him? Quiet man. Very quiet. Have money? Seemed to. Did he buy Lorraine that fur coat? I suppose so. He bought her a lot of things. Mm. Uh, where's your apartment? Across the hall. Did you ever hear them arguing? No, I, I don't think they saw enough of each other to argue. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, he only saw her once or twice a week. Always during the week, too. They hardly ever went out. But Claude had money. Seemed to, yes. Lorraine pays all her bills on time, does she? Her rent? Oh, yes, always. But she hasn't been working for three weeks. Do you think Claude was helping her out? Uh, I don't know. Is Claude a married man? 
Yes. Uh, get that, Asher. Right, then. Now, those times you had coffee with Lorraine, she ever ask your advice? No. Never mentioned she was in love with a married man? Just once. She was unhappy about it. She didn't like it. Claude's wife wouldn't give him a divorce. Uh-huh. Anything else? Well, she said she knew she'd have to break it off. It was no good. Uh, when did she tell you then? Yesterday morning. Uh, this picture was found in one of the drawers, Miss Dillon. Do you uh, recognize this man? Well? That's him. That's Claude. Ninety-eight, a three ninety W at Crossroads and Fifth. Uh, how do you feel? Drugstore manager oh, holding her for you. Oh, you should have let Quine fix you up. Well, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, I am. Thirteen J, make a ten twenty-one. Yeah, that's up. Yeah. Thirteen J, make a ten twenty-one. Thirteen J, Roger. We can phone from this restaurant. Where's the telephone, miss? Around the side. I'll do it, Vic. No, I want to make another call, too. Got some nickels? Yeah. Now order me some coffee. Okay. Two coffees. Black. Sure. Sandwich or something? Uh, let me see the menu. It's up there. Oh. Mm, I guess not. Good pie. Oh? What kind? Apple, huckleberry, boysenberry, black bottom. I'll try the black bottom. <laughs> Good, huh? Yeah. It's swell. Where do you buy your pies? Oh, lady. Just pedals to certain places around town. Well, it's sure good. Hey, the other fellow making the call. He a plain clothesman? Mm-hmm. I had a hunch. It doesn't look like one. More like a banker. <laughs> Never can tell. <laughs> you sure can. A napkin? Here you are. What uh, what was it, Ben? Gurdon at the hospital. The girl's coming around. How are you, Ben? Oh, fine, Doc. Remember Sergeant Grimm? Oh, sure. Hi, Sergeant. Hello, Doctor. Maybe I shouldn't have bothered getting in touch with you. She hasn't died. No, not yet. But she's about two inches away. Hard to do anything with a patient in her condition. She's under oxygen. Oh. Uh, know who she is yet? Her name's Lorraine Oberhauser. The, the priest? She was wearing a scapular medal. Oh. Excuse us, Father. Ben... Sometimes, just before it comes, they regain consciousness long enough to say a few words. Sorry, Ben. Your trip over here was for nothing. Beginning next week, the lineup will move to Thursday evenings. So listen to the lineup Thursday nights over most of these same stations. Also, a week from tonight, plan to help CBS Radio celebrate the return of the great Bing Crosby show, starting another year with Bing songs, music, guests, and merriment. Join us when most of these stations welcome back the Bing Crosby show. a surprise. Hello, Mr. Jennings. Uh, this is Sergeant Graham. Good afternoon. Well, come in. Come in. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant Quine didn't come with you? No, no. He's on duty at the precinct station. Oh. Uh, we don't want to take up too much of your time, Mrs. Jennings. We'd uh, just like to have you look at a few pictures. Of course. Oh, uh, sit down, Sergeant. Thank you. 
Now, uh, you recognize this man? No. This one? No. How about this one? No. This? Mm-mm. This? This? Oh, wait. Let me see that one. Yes. That one. I believe that's the man I saw take that poor girl out of his car the other night. Uh-huh. Is that him? Yeah, we're pretty sure. Have you arrested him yet? No. We only know his first name. Oh. How is the girl? She died a couple of hours ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's about all for now. When we get him, we'll ask you to come downtown again. Will Sergeant Quine come and get me? Mm, Possibly. Oh, he's such a nice man. You know, this morning when he came to get me, I told him I didn't feel too well. And he made me feel good just like that. (laughs) Well, Quine's quite a kidder. Oh, no, that isn't what I mean. He cracked my neck. It felt wonderful. What? Yes, oh, he's very good at it. So I've heard. (laughs) Come on, Sergeant. Uh, uh, Yes, sir. Well, you call me? Uh, Certainly. Bye. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Jennings. Bye. Goodbye. Well, uh, you going to see Quine when we get back? Oh, shut up. Jennings? Yeah. She's got quite a case on you. <laughs> Where's man? Uh, down the hall will be along in a minute. 36G, code 7, report 7. Now you still feel bad? Well, about the same. Got a match? Yeah. Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Hey, uh, Michigan State takes some Michigan this week. Ought to be a freaking. Yeah. Has hey, State in the conference yet? Well, uh, this year or next, darn if I remember. Mm, they play ball both places. Mm, you said it. Hi, Ben. How did it come off? Uh, Claude's our boy, all right. Whoever and wherever he is. Well, Crockett found out the Hanson girl didn't have a family of any kind, but her ex lives in town. They were married in 46, divorced in 48. You pick him up yet? No, I thought I'd leave that up to you and Matt. His name's Claude. Claude Oberhauser. Police, did you say? That's right, Mr. Oberhauser. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Grimm. Oh, how do you do? Well, sit down, gentlemen. I'm just getting ready to leave the office. Thanks. <clears throat> well, what is it? Uh, you were once married to a girl named Lorraine Hanson? Oh, yes, once. We've been divorced almost three years now. Is Lorraine in trouble? She was shot to death last night, Mr. Oberhauser. Uh, you sure it's Lorraine? Well, we checked her prints with the FBI. She worked in the defense plant and was on file. Oh, poor kid. The poor mixed-up little kid. Have you been seeing her? Oh, yes, occasionally. We have a drink together. We even talked of trying out marriage again. You married now? Uh, yes, more or less. When did you last see her? Oh, a week or so ago. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Friendly? Oh, yes. We were just kids when we got married. We knew we'd made a mistake, and then we separated her. Guess we both grew up a little in the meanwhile. We kind of needed each other. Uh, we'd like to have you come along with us. Hmm? Oh, well, all right. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll get my hat. Matt, hmm? tell Asher to take his boys off the front and back entrance. This isn't the right Claude. <laughs> Feel all right, Mr. Oberhauser? Yes, I'm all right, Lieutenant. Hmm. All right, Charlie. Yeah, that's Lorraine. You're positive? That's Lorraine. I'm positive. Okay. 
Let's go out front. Have you talked to anyone else yet? Uh, just a landlady. Mm. Uh, what about Claude? Claude? Claude Onright. Uh, sit down, Mr. Oberhauser. Sergeant Grell will be along in a minute. Uh, tell me, is this Claude Onright? Yes. Yes, that is. Well, what can you tell me about him? Oh, just about everything. Yeah? Well, Lorraine's been seeing him for the last year. I knew that, of course. At the same time she's been seeing you? Uh-huh. I checked on him, wanted to see what kind of man he was. I didn't want her to do something foolish, make any rash moves. Uh, did Lorraine know he was married? No. No, not at first. Not, not until I told her. Uh, where can we get in touch with him? Well, I don't remember his address. I know it is in the book, so... Well, what about where he works? Well, I don't know where that is, but I... I've got his address for my... Oh, my <laughs> Oh, come on, man. Let's wait outside. Hello. Hello. Who are you? My name's Guthrie. Who are you? I'm Tommy Armrack. Oh, uh, is your daddy home? No. Your mother? She hasn't been home for three days. She's out of town. I'm hungry. I don't know why my daddy's so late. He's usually home when I come home from school. Uh, Matt! Matt! Go, come on around. Who's he? Oh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, we're policemen, Tommy. No, you're not. You don't even have a uniform. <laughs> we saw it in the garage. He tried... Oh. Uh, this is Tommy Arnwright. Oh, hi, Tommy. Uh, take a look around, man. She's out of town. He hasn't been here all afternoon. Right. What's he looking around my house for? Oh, just looking. Mm. I'm sure glad you came. I was getting lonesome. And I'm still hungry. Where's your phone? It's out in the hall. Uh, you stay here, Tommy. I'll be right back. Sergeant Asher, please. Asher, anything new? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we won't take any chances. Now, look, on your way back, uh, stop in a drive-in and pick up a half dozen hamburgers and french fries, huh? Well, just a moment. You like onions, Tommy? Yeah. With, and uh, three malts, too. Right. We wait here for Onright. He didn't pack anything, Ben. Empty suitcases in the closet. Uh, Asher says Onright uh, sold his Buick two hours ago to a used car dealer. Oh, he's getting some money together. Yeah. Let's see if he wants to take the kid with him. Didn't know anything? Yeah, he was asleep when the matron took him down to juvenile hall. Oh, it's, it's after 10.30, Ben. Do you think Arnwright might have beat it already? Mm, I don't know. Oh. Hard to say. <sighs> it's been a long day. I hope it doesn't get any longer. Yeah? How long? Yeah, okay. Turn off the light, man. Cargo says a yellow Merc's been circling the block, thinks it's on right driving. Better get your car warmed up. You might not stop. Right. Quine. Quine. Yeah, but... Notice a yellow Mercury circling the block? Yeah, that him? Think so. Here it comes again. Now get down. Yeah, he spotted us. Matt, bring it around. Klein, call Asher to block the boulevard. Right. Let's go, Matt. 13J, code 3, suspect proceeding west on Kenilworth. 
Yellow Mercury sedan, license number 80, Robert 1135. Over. KQAR. Attention all units in area G for George. Code 3. Suspect proceeding west on Kenilworth. Yellow Mercury sedan. 80, Robert 1135. He's going into the park. 13J, suspect heading for the park. KQRA. Code 3, suspect heading toward park area. Asher's ahead of him. He's got the street block. He isn't going to stop. He's trying to go around Asher's car. There he goes. Shoot in the air, Matt. Okay, let him have it. Yeah, that did it. He's down. Watch it now. He's had it, Ben. Yeah. You get him all right, Ben? Yeah. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. My car's a mess. I guess so. I better call in, Asher. Right. Well, that's that. It's been a long one, huh? Yeah. Oh. Nick still body? Yeah. Quine around. Back at the house. I guess I'll let him try. Just this once. The lineup. Where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen next Thursday when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number of their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions, are I... The Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Jeanette Nolan, Harry Lang, Howard McNear, Peter Leeds, Lee Patrick, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Beginning next week, listen for The Lineup Thursday nights on most of these same stations. And at this time on Wednesdays, be sure to be on hand for the hectic arrival of the Red Skelton Show. To say it with music... CBS, CBS, the star's address, the star's address, where you always hear the best at CBS, CBS, the star's address, the star's address, CBS, CBS, the star's address, the star's address. Stay tuned now for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Ben. You a victim show yet? Still waiting. Smoke? Yeah. Uh. May I have your attention, please? You people Thanks. out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. No sense of me sticking I'll around here. Uh, well, what do you know? Chadwick? Do you have any uh -huh. questions or identification? Uh, just in time, Mr. Chadwick. Sit down. This is Sergeant Asher. Hello, Hello, Sergeant. At the end of each line, Phew. I ask for questions or identification. Park and Cedar Avenue. Well, you could have used the jail line. If you sure forgot that card sure you gave me. Oh. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, all the way to the end of the stage. Come on, all the way to the end, that's right. Now turn and face front, hands out of your pockets, down at your sides, and look straight ahead. That's the ticket. Now I'm going to ask each of you some questions. I want you to stand out, talk up so the people in the back of the room can hear you. It's a long way back there, so talk up. Number one, Foley O'Mahony, narcotics. What is it, Foley? O'Mahony or O'Mahony? O'Mahony, Sergeant. Well, speak up. Come on. What's the address you gave? Uh, the search is in Kyrton, South Africa. And that's my room, sir. That's my address. Where's the last place you slept? Right aboard my ship, sir. The Emerald Queen. She's at Pier 14. You're a merchant seaman, right? Uh, yes, sir. How long you been in town? Uh, two days, sir. Those are the clothes you were in when you were arrested? Oh, yes, sir. These are my shore clothes, sir. That's my best, my very best, sir. Stand up straight. Anyone arrested with you? Here he is, sir. A top name, uh, Megan, sir. Megan. That's number uh, 17. He an American? Here, no, sir. Australian. How long you known him? Well, all my life, sir. We shipped together. What are you using now, Foley? Heroin? Cocaine? Morphine? What? Oh, sir, I, I'm not using anything, sir. All right, Number two, Edward Bible, Grand Theft Auto. Where do you live, Edward? Oh, me? Yes, you. I live with my sister-in-law. They can't hear him, Sergeant. Lafayette they can't hear you out there, Edward. You'll have to speak louder. Tell him where you live again. 1550 Lafayette, Lafayette Street. When the two officers signaled you to pull over to the side of the road, why didn't you stop instead of making them chase you? Well, like I told the old boy upstairs, I, I didn't know they were, they were policemen. You didn't recognize their uniforms, prowl cars? I, I have trouble with my eyes. They, they go back on me just, just like that sometimes. Yes, Edward. I ain't never been in no trouble, never. <laughs> Except once, once. Arrested on suspicious. That's all, just on suspicious. Suspicious, huh? That's right. What about your conviction? When? June 7, 1948, two years for burglary. Oh, hey, you know, Sergeant, I, I forgot all about that. All right. <laughs> Number three. I just John... borrowed that automobile from that man, Sergeant. When I know it was a master, my dog on the top all of All right, all right. That's enough, Edward. Slide down to the end of the line. Uh, yes, sir. Just one of these folks you know, you know. Yes, all sir. All right. Number three, John Tynan robbery. Where do you live, John? 4200 Larimer Street. What's that? The Silver Moon Motel. How long you live there? Three days. Where'd you live before? Topeka, Kansas. Keep your hands at your sides. How long you been in town? Got in last Sunday. Come by bus, train, plane, or what? I drove in with a man from Kansas City. We shared expenses and split the driving. What's your work, John? Electrician. Were you carrying a weapon when the officers arrested you? Yeah, a revolver. What kind? 38. Blue steel? Plated? What? Nickel plated. How long have you had it? Well, I bought it for the trip. I didn't know the man I was traveling with, and I thought I ought to have something to protect myself with. Where'd you buy it? From a man in Topeka. Okay, John. Number four, Carl Powers of Soap. Face front and speak up, Carl. You live at 1601 Cherry Street? Yeah. How long you live there? Year. The report says you were breaking furniture at that address. They ganged up on me. Who? Mike and his wife. Mike? Who's Mike? Mike Bullock. Bullock. Ah, uh, some double-jointed name I never could say. Mike Bolinisky? He's here, too, you know. I know. Mike's got quite a shiner, Carl. So is his wife. So have I. Maybe all of you better lay off the hooch the next time you play cards. Any questions or identifications from the audience? How about it, Mr. Chadwick? 
Number three fits the general description you gave. Yeah. Any questions three. or identifications no, no, from I, the audience, I just don't please. think so, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant? Nothing, Sergeant. Okay, run them off. Bring on the next line. Thirty-two, thirty-five, thirty-seven, and A.W.D. Park Norris Building, Street 901, Street. Hi, Crockett. Oh, good. <laughs> Number sixteen. Yeah, isn't that the payoff? Yeah, who knows? You got anything yet? All right, let me know. Hi. Hi. You finished already? Yeah, not many today. Uh, Chadwick didn't come through, huh? No. Here, take a look at this. All these places? Yep. M.O.'s exactly the same. Pick out a little neighborhood jewelry store. She stays on the outside. He goes inside and cleans the place. They hit once and scram to the next town. Ben, these descriptions are all pretty much alike, including the one we got from Chadwick. Hey, what about that? I thought sure Tynan was our boy. Well, let's keep hauling them in. Okay. Well, how'd you come out? Sixteen. How about you? <laughs> Thirty-three. I'll have to wait two more years for another exam. Unless thirty-two sergeants quit the force. <laughs> you, you get a chance. Oh, not much. I've never made more than 14 appointments in a two-year period. Ah, that's the way it goes with civil service. Well, at least the waiting's over, huh? That's something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, ha -ha, some game, huh? What do you mean, some game? Oh, hoo -hoo, sore head. <laughs> Gathering. Yeah. Denver? Mm-hmm. Well, hold on. Matt, what about Tynan? Back at the city jail. Going to be arraigned on concealed weapons this afternoon. It's okay. Thanks, Ryan. Tannen may still be our boy, Matt. Chief of police in Denver wants us to hold. Jewelry store man there identified the picture we put on the wire last night. Get Chadwick up here. He's down looking through the mug file. <laughs> Lieutenant, I've been away from my store all morning. It won't take too long, Mr. Chadwick. We just want to clarify a few matters. You want us to get the man and woman who held up your store, don't you? Why, yes, of course. Then why have you been wasting my time, your time, the department's time, Mr. Chadwick? What? Last Saturday morning, a man and woman stuck up your jewelry store. Happened approximately 11.30 in the morning, before you went to the bank. Now, just a minute, Lieutenant. Let me it. finish, and then you can talk. Besides a sizable amount of jewelry stock, you also reported that over $800 in cash was taken from your safe. As a matter of routine, our robbery division found out that you haven't deposited more than $400 in cash on any Saturday morning within the last eight months. But we gave you the benefit of the doubt. You seemed in good faith and anxious to cooperate with us. Matt, hand me that. Here you are, Ben. Thanks. This is a picture that went out over the wire last night. It's the man you saw in the lineup this morning. His name's John Tynan. A victim in Denver, Denver identified this picture of the man working with an unidentified woman who held up his store. We're pretty certain he's the same man who held you up. Well, what have you got to say? Well, right. I guess I've caused you an awful lot of trouble. Well, it isn't the first time a victim hasn't identified a thief because of the money he hoped to collect on his casualty policy. Well, Mr. Chadwick? Oh, yes. Yes, he's the man who held me up. Will I be booked or something? How much cash did he actually get? $360. How much did you claim? 800 plus. Give him a form, Matt, so we can verify this identification. Right. I don't understand people sometimes. They hoop and holler and cry for law and order and protection. When they have an opportunity to do something active in the way of apprehending criminals, they pass it up. Sign here, Mr. Chadwick. Yeah. And this copy, too. 
Now what? You better call your lawyer, Mr. Chadwick. Insurance companies don't like to be lied to either. I got it, too, and there's a couple of retirements coming up next month. <clears throat> yeah. Congratulations, Payne. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Boy, I sure have been sweating it out. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> okay, Herb. What's that book number again? 22689. Hmm. Didn't we let him out for your lineup today? Uh-huh. How's Molly? Uh, Good. Hey, 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 Sergeant. Hey, hey, Sergeant. I got to see him in just a minute. I got something to later, tell you. Later, Ed, later. Hey, no, but it's important, Sergeant. Later, Ed. Oh, don't forget. Hey, don't forget. Hi, Carl. Well, Guthrie. How you been, Lieutenant? Fine, thanks. Yourself? Good. Hey, Lieutenant. Why don't you get him to put radios in these places? At least while the series is on. Yeah, <laughs> All right. All right. Knock it off, you guys. Knock it off. Some people want to get some sleep around here, you know. Tynan? Yeah? Come on. Now what? This way. There's no phone in here, Ben. No, we won't need one. Thanks, Ben. Sure. Sit down, John. Smoke? Sure. <sighs> Why the visit? You're identified, John. Denver police want you for the same thing we picked you up on here. And Mr. Chadwick here in town's identified you, too. Matt, show him. Here. Look him over. Well, son? What's it mean? That depends on you. Ever been in trouble before? No. How old are you? Twenty-three. Well, with or without a statement, you'll be indicted for grand theft and robbery. They can also throw in transporting stolen property, carrying concealed weapons. Be easier if you cooperate with us. How long? Hmm? It's up to the judge of the Superior Court. But we'll be there to tell him how much you helped us or how much you didn't. Her name's Irene Oldham. You can pick her up at the Albany Hotel. She's registered under the name of Mrs. Dick McBride. Get a stenographer, man. This Saturday night, CBS Radio catches up with the wandering caravan of Vaughn Monroe. After a one-month vacation, Vaughn, the Moon Maids, the Moon Man, and singing comic Ziggy Talent will again make music in the Monroe Manor over most of these same stations. CBS Radio beams their season's premiere out to you this Saturday night. Don't miss it. Here, Hildy. You can use my desk. Smoke, John? Thanks. We'll get some facts first. Uh, you can take these, Hildy. Wait a minute. Did they pick up Irene yet? They're doing it now. Oh, I don't want to see her when they bring her in, Lieutenant. You'll have to see her when you're arraigned. But I don't want to see her now. Mm, okay. Well, let's go ahead. How long have you known Irene Oldham? I met her two months ago. Where? In my hometown, Topeka. Go on, John. We liked each other, Irene and me, and we decided to pull some jobs together. Now, was it her idea or your idea? Both of us, I guess. But she figured out a way to do it. The idea was to hit and run. So we took her car and went on the road. We'd go in a jewelry store and pretend like we were going to get married and wanted to pick out a ring. We'd wait until the store cleared if there were customers in there. Nobody suspected us. Even though Irene's almost 30, we both looked the same age, I guess. Well, when we had our chance, I'd gun the storm and Irene keep a lookout in front. That's the way we planned it all the time. 
We'd stay in different places each town. Where were you last Saturday morning at 11.30? I was with Irene at a jewelry store on Eastern Avenue in this city. Name the store. Um, the Elite Jewelry Company. We robbed it. I used a gun. A 32 revolver that I bought in Topeka, Kansas. My accomplice, accomplice in robbing, in this robbery, was Irene Olden. She looked out the front while I stuck with the man inside. I took everything in the open cases in the store that looked valuable to me, and then I forced the man to open the safe. I remember it was $360 because the man had it already deposited in the bank. I went outside yeah. then and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, hold it, Tim. Well, checked out an hour ago. Just missed her. Hotel manager reported a big, nice-looking guy came and got her bag and baggage. Drove a cab, a 51. Dorman thinks 62R first on the license numbers. Heard her call him Frank. Hmm. Well, see what you can do at license registration, Quine, and get out an APB on him. It can't get too far. Right. All right. Go ahead, John. Well, I, I gave the money and the jewelry to Irene, like I'd been doing in all the jobs. Irene was saving it all for us. This was our last stop. We were going to get married and go to South America when we finished. <laughs> The moniker file on that Frank. Anything? Well, about 16 possibilities from the description being worked out. Prints in her room matched up. She's a hometown girl. Where'd she fall from? This county. First time, January 1941. Automobile theft. R and I came up with this. Her name's Irene Kingston, alias Irene King, Irene Kensington, Irene Bradley, Helen Diamond. Got a mother living here, Mrs. Edith Kingston. Mm. You get a making one on this Irene yet? Mm-hmm. Ash is holding it for you downstairs. She's got a red flag since 1948. Murder. Mrs. Kingston? Yes? Police. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Grimm. We'd like to talk to you. About Irene? Yes. Come in. Sit down. Just a minute, I'll turn this thing off. What is it this time? Irene's in town, Mrs. Kingston. Well, I haven't seen her. She hasn't contacted you at all? She hasn't contacted me since she was 16, Sergeant. You mean you haven't seen your daughter since she was 16, Mrs. Kingston? I mean... Yes, I've seen her. She's lived here with me at different times when she wasn't running around... Or in prison. And when was the last time you saw her? Three years ago. She hasn't contacted you in all this time? I said no before, Lieutenant. I can't help you. Yeah, maybe you can, Mrs. Kingston. Do you know any of Irene's friends here in town? I told you I haven't seen her for three years. Well, we mean some old friends she might have known when you were seeing her, when she lived here with you. I don't know any of them. They'd come here now and then. I I never wanted them in the apartment. Some I remember, some I don't, I guess. Well, this is our job, Mrs. Kingston. If it weren't us, it'd be somebody else. Your daughter's wanted for robbery and murder. We're trying to get a line on anyone she knew at all. Anyone she might see while she's in town. Any place she might stay. Uh, have you got the list, ma? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's several names in her file downtown of people she associated with here. Maybe you know some of them or can tell us where we can locate them. I told you I can't help you. Well, let's try anyhow. A man named uh, Al Ames? No. I don't even recognize that name. Louis Weinberg? No. William Doyle? Rosetta Mays? Paul Frank? Rosetta Mays. Hmm? She went to high school with Irene. 
She died last year in childbirth. <clears throat> John Eby. Leonard Ipwich. You don't recognize any of those names, huh? No, no, no. I'm not good at names at all. Maybe if I saw the faces, I could tell you something about them. Mrs. Kingston, Irene came in town last weekend with a boy named John Tynan. We have him in custody already. She was staying at the Albany Hotel, calling herself Mrs. Dick McBride. She checked out just before we got there. A man she called Frank picked her up. Do you know anybody she used to call Frank? No. Our description says he's a big man, over six feet, around 200 pounds or better. Dark hair. Uh... I... I can't help you a bit. I've never been able to help the police. I've never been able to help Irene. She got a taste of the gutter once, and she liked it. And that's that. Don't you understand? Don't you understand? Well, thanks, Mr. Kingston. Come on, then. Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, let's get some men on this place 24 hours a day. now, Matt. Yep. I wish we'd get something. We will. We had that APB out on her and that Frank less than an hour after they started. We got all the roads covered, airports, bus stations, harbors. And don't forget her mother's apartment. Don't forget that. Yeah. I hate to keep so many men tied up. Hey there. Hi, Matt. Ben, how are you? Fine, Joe. 13J in? Yeah, you want it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sign here. All right. Okay. It's parked about halfway down the line. I see you. Thanks, Joe. See you, Joe. Yeah. You know, this baby could stand a paint job. <laughs> you say... Yeah, hold it, man. Joe's waving. What do you want, Joe? Oh, well, Quine's on the phone, Ben. I thought it'd save time instead of a 1041. Right. Guthrie. Hmm? When? Okay. Thanks, Joe. Sure, Ben. Twine's picked up Frank out at the airport. Let's go, man. Any trouble, Quine? No, like a lamb. Bought two tickets for the five o'clock plane. He used the name Mr. and Mrs. Frank Peterson. That was on his license, too, Frank Peterson. Bring any luggage? Checked it through already. What'd he say? Not a word. Asher's got him in here. Hiya, Matt. Ben? Hi. Hi. Are you Frank Peterson? Well, let me tell you. Yeah, Frank Peterson. You've already bought two tickets and checked your luggage. You're going to meet Irene Kingston here. Now, look, we'd rather pick her up where she's staying. Someone might get hurt around here. Where is she, Frank? Where's Irene Kingston? All right, take him down and book him. Asher and Quine are covering the main entrance. Murphy and Carger, the parking lot. Hughes at the cab stand, and Blaker went over to the other terminal just in case she might have made a mistake. Uh, uh, ten minutes to five. Something should happen pretty soon. If it's going to happen. You know, she might have been counting on a call from Frank or something. She ran out on time and when he didn't call. Yeah, it's a chance. Some gal, huh? <laughs> yeah. Out front. Yeah. 
She came in on a cab. I tagged her right after she pulled up, but she had a gun. You all right? Ah, my leg. I was lucky. She kicked off her shoes and ran for the field. Asher took out after her. That way? Yeah. Hey, you. You there. Call an ambulance. Come on, man. Right. Through the parking lot, Ben. All right. There's Asher. Yeah, he got her. I can't figure why she was running for that field. You still alive? Uh-huh. How's Quine? Nick, you okay? Yeah. I'll get an ambulance out here. Yeah. Well, it's five o'clock. That must be their plane. Wonder where they were going. South America. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb. Sergeant Matt Greb, I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, I ask the question to write the The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Peter Leeds, High Averback, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, Gil Stratton Jr., Ray Hartman, and Jeanette Nolan. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This Saturday, Joan Crawford stars in I Knew This Woman, a poignant drama of family life when stars over Hollywood launches its 11th big season of dramatic hits on CBS radio. Stars over Hollywood is heard every Saturday in the daytime hours on most of these same CBS radio stations. Dan Coverly speaking, and remember, it's two hours of music, the nation's favorite songs, every Friday evening on the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, by transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Things like this, really, I do. 
You ever been in a lineup before, Miss Larkin? I should say not. But I feel like such a fool, Lieutenant. How long will it take? Well, that'll depend on which line the suspect appears. Well, heavens, can't they put him in the first line or something? Well, maybe they will. I want you to tell me. Oh. Well, is that disinfectant I smell? Mm Mm-hmm. Certainly strong. Be glad when this whole thing's over. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, keep it moving, boys, right over to the end of the stage. Come on, that's right, all the way over to the end. Take your hands out of your pockets, turn and face the front. When I call your number, I want you to step out and talk up. Stand up straight. Answer my questions in a good, loud voice so the people in the back of the room can hear you. When I ask you where you live, I want the address you slept at last night. Okay? All right, number one, Connie Bush. Burglary. Where do you live? 417 West 99. For how long? Since Tuesday. Where'd you live before that? The White Plains, New York. What do you do for a living, Connie? I'm a wood finisher. You have a car? Yeah. Well, what kind? What color? A 49 Chevy convertible, blue. Anyone with you when you were arrested? Yeah, Vivian Johnson. Have any weapons on you? No. All right, number two, Dale Gagan, murder. Where do you live, Dale? I live at the darkest. That, that Come old on, speak up, Dale. Where do you live? Yeah. The darkest. Well, I What's that? never. A place on Second Street where they have rooms. What's the number, Dale? Well, I don't know. I just know the place when I see it. It's a sort of a white building. How long you lived there? On and off, maybe three years. Where'd you live before that? Prison. State correction home, Bonneville. Okay, Dale. Number three, Cliff Barry, open charge. Where do you live, Cliff? Did you hear the question? I heard it, Sergeant. I understand that I'm not compelled to answer your questions. I'm not compelling you. I'm asking you to cooperate. The questions you ask might intimidate me. Look, the public defender happens to be standing in the back of this room. If I get out of line, he'll let me know, Cliff. Now, come on. Tell the folks where you live. I can't see anything out there. Take my word for it. Now, I want to know where you live, what kind of work you do, who you were arrested with, if anybody, whether you had any weapons or whether you own a car. Okay? I'd rather not answer you, Sergeant. Okay, number four. Florian Barth, forgery. We're 1647 Ray Street, apartment three. I'm a salesman. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> no guns, no car, okay? Anything else you'd like to volunteer? No, nope, I got my rights. <laughs> Haven't we all? Any questions or identifications? Hold number three up for me, Sergeant. Number three. Number four. That's him, I think. Florian Barth. I'm not sure, but I think... Anyone else? Uh, hold number four, Sergeant. Yes, Lieutenant. That all? Okay, Barth and Gagan, stay here. The rest of you are back where you came from. I'm not exactly sure, but it certainly looks like it. Well, we'll find out. All right, up to the center, Florian. Come on, right out into the light. That's it, now do a quarter turn. Now a full quarter turn. Uh, Hold it, hold it. Sure looks like him from the side, too. Mm -hmm. Could you ask him to say Chesapeake? Have him say Chesapeake, Matt. All right, Florian. They want you to say Chesapeake. Yeah, that's Chesapeake. About say it louder. Chesapeake! What is this, anyhow? Never mind. Could I hear him say, I've got to be in Cedar Rapids tomorrow night? Have him say, I've got to be in Cedar Rapids tomorrow night. Say, I've got to be in Cedar Rapids tomorrow night. Well, I've got to be in Cedar Rapids tomorrow night. Once more. I've got to be in Cedar Rapids tomorrow night. Any marks or scars on him, Sergeant? Well, there's a mole on his left cheek, sir. 
Turn your head here. That's about it, Lieutenant. Well, Miss Larkin? That's him, Lieutenant. That's the man who gave me that bum check. Well, I thought I was all finished. Well, you are, practically. Just want you to fill out a verification card. Yeah, here they are. Do you like it? Hmm? Do you like being a policeman? Oh, yeah. Now just fill out your name and address, the date and the time. Okay. Yeah, I think this has some ink in it. This about, uh, am I willing to appear in court? Yes, in case there's a preliminary hearing. You'd be asked to appear before a magistrate and testify at the same time we present the complaint. Chances are you won't be called at all. Oh. He'll probably waive his right and plead guilty. From there on, it'll go straight to Superior Court for decision. Well, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Here. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming down tonight, Miss Larkin. I knew you took time off from your work to do it, and we certainly appreciate it. Oh, it wasn't so bad. As a matter of fact, very interesting... Besides, I should have my head examined for letting that guy give me a bad check. Well, don't feel too badly. A lot of people have been taken in just like you in the last three months. It's been passing bad checks all over town. Something like $4,200 worth last month alone. Were they all as dumb as I was? <laughs> well, nicely dressed man runs up a bill and wants to pay for it with a legitimate-looking payroll check. He has what seems to be proper identification and... Well, that's about it. <laughs> you forgot that smile he flashed around. Oh, well. Want me to call your cab? No, no, I've got my own car in the lot. Uh, you know, that old man in the lineup tonight, the one up for murder, I'm curious, who'd he kill? Another old man. How? Beat him to death with a shovel. He got in an argument over a game of checkers. Some world. <laughs> Some world. Good night. Good night. Hi, Matt. Hi. Got a report from handwriting. Mm-hmm. Checks, huh? Mm-hmm. Hey, Ben. Molly's sister's going to be in town this weekend. Which sister? Nellie, her youngest one. You've never met her, Ben. Is she from Muncie, too? Mm-hmm. She's been living in Detroit. Works for an advertising agency. She's on her way to New York on business. A cogger single. Oh, Ben, Molly asked me to ask you. Nellie's a real nice girl, Ben. You'll like her. Honest. You ever met her? Mm, no, but I've seen pictures of her, and Molly says she's... Uh... Gloria Bartholz, huh? Ah, just in time. Okay, boy. Hi, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Hello, Barth. Grab a chair. Thank you. Well, Florian, you've been identified. You want to make a statement and get this over with in a hurry? Oh, you kidding? Your handwriting's been identified and your face has been identified. So you can see I'm not kidding, Florian. I can explain anything you want to explain. Just ask me. Okay, let's start with that nice apartment of yours. I'm a good salesman. Not according to that sewing machine company. They say you hardly turn over one machine a month. Yeah, I got other sources. I do a mail order business, too. How much do you make? Oh, enough. How much is that? Oh, sometimes four, five, maybe six hundred a month. Depends on how hard I work. Who printed up your checks? What checks? The checks you've been passing all over town. Wrong guy. Where were you the night before you were arrested? What time? Say about uh, 10.30. Home? Doing what? Reading a book. What book? From here to eternity. How far you get? Oh, maybe a hundred pages. Where'd you get the book? What do you mean, where'd I get the book? I bought it. Where? Some bookshop downtown. That night? A couple of months ago. How late did you read? Oh, almost midnight, I guess. I don't know. And then you went to bed? Yeah. Now, it doesn't exactly check. Miss Larkin, the cashier at the Peacock Restaurant, says you were in there from 10.30 to 12, handing her a bad check. Miss Larkin's a liar. I don't even know where the Peacock is. It's out on Federal Boulevard. A nice place. Your kind of place, Florian. Well, I'll drop out sometime and look it over. Thank you. How about a smoke? No. Okay, I'll get along without it. What do you think of Jones' book? Huh? From Here to Eternity. A man named Jones wrote it. Huh. Yeah. That seems okay. Do you like Sergeant Pruitt? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
How about Private Warden? What do you want me to do? Give you a book review? No. Just correct me, Florian. Pruitt's a private, and Warden's a sergeant in that book. A detail. What, uh... What did you have for dinner that night? Oh, how would I know? If you don't, who would? I don't. They have a specialty of the peacock, cracked crab. Everybody gets uh, it. I hate crab. Miss Larkin said you had crab that night. You already know what I think of what Miss Larkin says. Got to make a statement? Gee, if I didn't have a sense of humor, I'd be yelling for a lawyer. Now, you better start yelling. Huh? huh? I'm presenting a complaint first thing in the morning. You've got five days to get a lawyer. Take him away, man. Hello, Bill. Relax. Yeah. I'm holding this complaint on Florian Barth you sent upstairs this morning. Well, wasn't there enough stuff with the handwriting and identification? Well, it seemed to be Ben, but I just want to make sure we can get an indictment. Well, this bird's been passing wallpaper all over town. What's the kick? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, excuse me, Ben. Captain Waldo. Yeah, put him on. Okay. 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 All right, send it over to Ben Guthrie's office. Bye-bye. Uh, that's it, Ben. Handwriting just verified a new check turned in this morning by a victim named Caristi. They say it's Florian Barth's signature. You've had him in custody almost a week, haven't you? Yeah. The check was passed last night. What do you think? Beats me. <laughs> It's time for everyone to do some important fall house cleaning. House cleaning which may save your home and the lives of your family. You can eliminate the causes of home fires by cleaning out all debris, by repairing all worn or frayed electric wiring immediately, and by putting matches out of the reach of children. And be sure to do your cleaning with non-inflammable fluids. <laughs> J, a metal case at 2837 Clyde Place. See the woman. 33, a 586 Why the still questioning Barth? Curtis. Yeah. See the man. 1516. There it is, Ben. Hey. I've been here before. They used to have a pretty good piano player, Harry, uh, uh, Harry something. Can you see anything? Not much. Me neither. Coming out of the sun. <laughs> Hello, boys. What's it going to be? Uh, we're looking for a Mr. Caristi. Carista, I'm uh, Benito Carista. You the police? Yeah, this is Sergeant Greb. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. Glad to meet you. Uh, come on down to this end. It's much quieter. Do you like something? Uh, no, thanks. No, thanks. Yeah, me neither. Can't stand to drink in the daytime. But what, what about a smoke? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I don't know whether I have much to tell you or not. You see, he came in a couple of nights ago. He seemed like a nice fellow. Said he was in the insurance business. How long was he here? Almost an hour. Well, then you got a good look at him. Good look? Sure I did. He sat right there on that stool. Well, uh, tell us about the check. Well, when he asked me to cash a check, I told him I don't cash personal checks for anybody. He said there was a commission check, and he pulled it out of his pocket. Well, it was issued by some insurance company on a local bank. It had his name on it, his social security and deductions. They looked uh, good to me. They looked good to a lot of people. Did you ask him for any further identification? No, no, I didn't. Mm. Did he endorse the check right here? Uh, yeah. Are you sure? No, no, come to think of it. Uh, Do you think it was already endorsed when he took it out of his pocket? Well, it could have been. Tell us what he looked like. He was nice looking, as I said. Uh, tall, maybe six feet or better. How old? Oh, 35. How much would you say he weighed? Well, not over 160. 
Mm, what was the color of his hair? I couldn't say for sure. He kept his head on all the time. I imagine it was dark brown or black. He, he was the dark complexion. What color were his eyes? Dark, I guess. Any marks or scars? No. Anything else? Jewelry? Cufflinks? A watch? A ring? He might have been wearing all of those, but... Uh, hey, Benny. How's about it? Uh, oh, I'll be right back, fellas. All, all right. right. <clears throat> well, that could be Barth. But it's a cinch he wasn't here drinking a scotch two nights ago. Mm, sounds like a sister act. Maybe the handwriting guys are wrong. Well, I'll stick with them. Mm, so will I. Sorry I kept you waiting. Uh, now, is there anything more I can tell you? Well, uh, this is a picture of a man we're holding now. Ever see him before? Mm, no, no, that isn't him. But it could be him, sort of. That's what we thought. Can you get away from here for a while? Well, you, you mean right now? Yeah. Well, I guess I can call my brother and let him take over this afternoon. Call him. Hi. Too early? No, three more just came in. That makes 12 men. Couldn't get a hold of any more. Oh, 12 will be enough. This is Mr. Caristi, Sergeant Quine. Hello. How do you do? Mr. Caristi's number 13. You aren't superstitious, are you? Uh, no, no. You can just grab a chair there anyway, Mr. Caristi. This won't take long. Okay. I thought Matt was with you, Pat. He's across the hall with Asher. Oh, there. Hi, Tom. Oh, hello, Ben Quine. Hi. Here we got ourselves a problem. Looks like it, Tom. You ready to go to work? Yep. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen... I'm sorry to bother all you people by having you come down here again, but uh, you've all been stung with bad checks, and we want to bring you up to date on what's happening. We're holding a man now who's been identified as a check passer. Our handwriting department has confirmed it. He's the same man some of you were unable to identify when we asked you to pick him out of the line this week. However, we're pretty sure there's more than one man involved. The general description of both men is just about the same. That's why Mr. Thompson's here. Uh, this is Mr. Thompson. I suppose all of you know that a composite picture is drawn from detailed information about the facial characteristics of a person. Well, that's Mr. Thompson's job in our department. He's pretty good at it, too. But he needs the cooperation of every one of you. He'll sit and listen for hours to what you have to say about the man who gave you those bad checks. That right, Tommy? That's about it, Lieutenant. Okay. All yours. Now, Come all of you people who saw the suspect within the last two weeks, raise your hands. All of those who saw him within the last month. Coffee, Ben? Uh, let's go in here first. Okay. We know you've been working with someone else, Bart. Now, come on, come on. Who is this other guy? Oh, you're all wet. Now, nah. oh, you want something, Ben? No. Did you make the checks up in batches and then take turns passing them? What checks? These checks, these checks right here in my hand. I never saw them before in my life. Who's the other guy? There isn't any other guy. Look, I haven't had a drink of water for two hours. Neither have I. Come on, tell us about the other guy. I can last as long as you two or anybody else you got down here in this crummy place. How much did you pay for that apartment? One eighty-five. How long have you two lived Two years. Okay, How let's go, Quinn. I worked it's been going on all day. You know, I don't think that guy's going to say much. I'm afraid not. Well, maybe it won't make any difference. Hi. Well, she gets in tonight. Who? Nellie. Molly's sister. Oh. Ben. Uh, this is my night for the fights. Oh, look, Ben. She's only going to be in town one night. You might like her. <clears throat> Tommy finish yet? Yeah, he said he'd call me. Uh, Barth isn't making things very easy. You look beat. Three hours with that guy and I was asking myself questions. He's not going to be easy, Ben. Well, that's why we're doing things the hard way. All that we have now, Ben? Yeah, Quine. Well, Crockett pinned down the type of machine used on those checks. Good. Turned out to be a local manufacturing outfit called the Make Peace Printing Company. You talked to him yet? Uh-huh. I was out there this morning. They make all sorts of printing equipment. The general manager's quite an expert. He says those checks were all done up on what he calls a, a A41 model. What's that, Quine? Well, it's a little portable check-making machine. 
They made them for about two years now. They sell them to firms that have small payrolls. Say, it might be somebody in an accounting department who could do it, Ben. No, no, no. At least it'd be pretty hard, Matt. The make piece people set them up for the individual firm, type and all. It'd be hard to change the type, and every one of those checks has a different company name on it. Mm. Did you get a list of all the people in town who bought those machines? Uh huh. 108 firms. Hi, Asher. You finished? Mm hmm. Just got them out of photographic. Well, this is what they say he looks like. Hmm. Gosh. Think it's dream stuff? No. Hmm. You sure got it all over Bath, wouldn't you say, Ben? Maybe. Let's get him and find out. It's a very handy little outfit. It saves a lot of time. I would have bought the big model, but well, right in here, gentlemen. But the little one's good enough for my office. And we just want a sample off the machine. We're glad to help in any way. Oh, uh, Mr. Blair. Yes, Mr. Hastings. Uh, these two gentlemen are from the police department. Lieutenant Guthrie, Sergeant Greb, isn't it? Yes, Greb. Uh, w- would you mind showing them our checking machine? Well, this is it right here. Uh, would you mind running one off for us? Oh, it's all right, Mr. Blair. Just cancel the number when it comes out, you know. All right, sir. Well, it's it's electric, and all you do is set the amount here like this. And then you uh, run it off like this. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Mm. Uh, may we keep that sample? Oh, sure, sure. Anything else I can do? Do you have a man working for you who looks something like this? No. Uh, B- Mr. Blair, does he resemble anyone you know? No. Anyone who might have worked here, Mr. Hastings, at one time or another? No, no, no. No, no. sir. All right, thanks for your cooperation. Ma'am. Yeah, Klein. Uh, Mr. Kendrick's in your office. That the man from the printing company? Uh huh. He's been working with us all day looking at samples from those machines. Mr. Kendricks, this is Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Greb. Hello. Glad to meet you both. It's nice of you to give us a hand, Mr. Kendricks. Glad to do it. My company feels a little abashed that one of our machines is involved in all this. Did you see all the samples we brought in, Mr. Kendricks? Yes, I did, Sergeant. I was just explaining to Sergeant Quine that I don't think any of those bad checks were printed on any of the machines in town. Oh? Of course, that's just after a hasty survey of the situation... But there's nothing outstanding on any of the samples brought in to tie them up with the same machine that printed the bad checks. Hmm. You've gone over all of them? Every one. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I wish I had better news for you. I'll go over them again if you like. Well, we want to be sure. Of course. There were only 108 of them sold in this city? We rechecked our sales department on that, yes. Uh Uh-huh. And no others that you might not have a record on? No others, Sergeant. What about samples? Samples? Well, you know, salesmen have samples, don't they? Uh, when you first put them on the market, you... I just happen to think there is one machine that's not accounted for. We had a man on our sales staff two or three years ago, name of Fisher, Ed Fisher. Seemed like a nice chap, but he didn't work out. He got in an argument with a customer, and we had to let him go. He never did return the sample machine we issued to him. Man. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mr. Kendricks, would you remember the salesman if you saw him? Oh, I think so. Well, uh, is this him, Mr. Kendricks? Why, why, yes. Yes, that's him. (sighs) Yes, Mr. Fisher? That's right. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie, police. Oh. Well, uh, yes. We've had quite a time finding you. I I, I suppose so. Yes. Did Florian tell you... Florian didn't say a word about you. You want to get a coat? Yes. Come in. I'm sort of surprised if Florian didn't say anything. We'll tell you all about it. Will I have an opportunity to come back here before... I mean... Well, to close my house and take care of some personal matters. You'll probably get out on bail. Well, I... I guess I'm ready. Okay. 
Okay, in there. I really never thought I'd be caught. Didn't you? No, I, I didn't. I really didn't. Well, now you know. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? <coughs> you people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. <coughs> Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Hi Everback, Herb Butterfield, Gil Stratton Jr., Howard McNear, Peter Leeds, Ray Hartman, and Jay Novello. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Almost three and a half million young men in our armed forces have given up a lot for you. They've given up a way of life they enjoyed so you could remain safe. You can back them up by sharing in the defense effort, by investing regularly in United States defense bonds. Defense bonds do two things for you. First, they help defend the freedoms you cherish. Second, they ensure your own personal future. Start now to invest regularly in United States defense bonds. <laughs> Bon Monroe's back from vacation. Yes, on most of these same CBS radio stations, you can again make the Bon Monroe Show a singing, dancing date every Saturday night. Bon, the Moon Maids, the Moon Man, and Ziggy Talent, plus singing guests, will be very truly yours this Saturday night on CBS Radio. Don't miss them. Dan Coverly speaking, and remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny time, Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. <laughs> Lieutenant. Yeah? Here's Mr. Bomash. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Bomash? Still a little nervous, Lieutenant. Why, sure you are. Uh, and we can sit right here. This isn't exactly the kind of day I want to remember. Need me, Lieutenant? Uh, no, thanks. I'll see you then. 
Goodbye, Mr. Bomash. Oh, uh, goodbye, Sergeant. I wish you had been at my place this afternoon when it happened. Oh, so do I. Uh, Mr. Bomash, we picked up a couple of men in the neighborhood that you might recognize. Now, uh, just take your time and look them over. I do my best, but you, you know how it was. Yes, sure. Room. May I have your attention, please? Isn't that the officer Thank that you, was Mr. with you? Gray. Yeah, yeah, Sergeant, Sergeant Gray. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number the name in charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back in their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, come on. All the way over to the end of the stage. That's it. Keep it moving all the way. All right, turn now. Face front. Hands to your sides and look straight ahead. All right, number one, Joseph Schmidt's robbery. Tell us where you live, Joseph. Dallas, Texas. Louder. I mean here in town. Speak up so the folks can hear you. How about it, Mr. Bowman? No, he is too tall. You want a car? No. Were you carrying a gun when you were arrested? Yeah. Well, tell us the make and caliber. Smith and Wesson, 38 revolver. You guys got it. A 38 Smith and Wesson. What are you Now, that's Joe. the kind of gun you described, Mr. Bowman. Something Bonner. else? Yeah, I know, Something but that isn't him. Red, I guess. Pinky. How about Orchid? Anyone ever call you Orchid? I'd punch him if they did. Okay, number two, Saul Green, Grand Theft Auto. Where do you live, Saul? I live at 318 North Columbine, apartment 10. How long have you lived there? Four hours, Sergeant. Well, it's a pretty nice place, Saul. Didn't you like it? I liked it a lot better than that cell block I've been in for seven years. When were you released? Yesterday afternoon. That's tough, Saul, but you know how the state feels about auto theft? Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, number three, Kenneth Pritchard, armed robbery. Where do you live, Kenneth? Cloud 63, Curtis Street. How, about How that long have you been in the city? No, that Three isn't him either. Last November. Were you arrested with anybody, Kenneth? No. What do your friends call you? What? What do people call you? Kenny. Anything else? You mean, do they call me Orchid? No. They want you pretty bad in Spokane. They can come and get me, can't they? When we finish with you, yes. Where'd you get the gun? The pawn shop. Lieutenant. Here in town. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Didn't you say these same Answer men had yes held up no. another loan yes. office? Yeah, the day before right, yesterday. Four, Why is it the other man who has robbed isn't here tonight? Where live, John? He was killed, Mr. Bowman. I want all of you to pay attention. Hi, man. Oh, morning, Ben. I just going upstairs. I had to be in court pretty soon. Oh, that brushery case you told me about, huh? Well, Bomish didn't do us any good last night, huh? Nothing. Those guys sure know what they're doing. Turn around and face the wall before anybody gets a peek. Hmm. Two medium-sized guys in dark suits. Ha! That's something to go on. Hmm. Well, one of them's called Orkin. They've robbed two loan officers and killed one man. We've got to stop him, Matt. Twelve hundred and eighty bucks in four a day. <laughs> hey, you want one? No, no, thanks. Hoo-hoo, boy. <laughs> if I weren't a married man... Oh, you always say that, Matt. Oh, good morning, Lieutenant. Hi, Mary. <laughs> I'm in, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> this is a list of every small loan office in the city. These two birds seem to like that kind of pickings best, so... Let's lay it out and have the cars keep an eye on them. Okay. Anything else? Nothing till I finished at court. Got time for coffee? Uh, no, thanks. I want to go down the hall for a minute. Okay. What time? Oh, noon. District 47. All right, I'll pick you up there. Fine, man. Hey, that new suit? Yeah. You like it? Yeah, sure good looking. I'll see you, Ben. Hey, Mary. Mary, wait a minute. I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Wait a minute, honey. What's new, Ben? Hi, Ted. 
I wonder if oh, you'd hold look... it, Ben. Hold it. All right. Uh, just fill this out right here. Last name first. Oh, wait. <laughs> It's pencil, all right? You better use this pen. Oh. I'm sorry. What was it, Ben? Uh, turn up anything in the Monica files for me? That was Orchid, wasn't it? Yeah. Hold on. Frank worked on it last night. Sure. <laughs> it was Guthrie, ain't it? Yeah. Oh. Auto theft. Ed Nixon, isn't it? Yeah, Bill Nixon, Sergeant. Well, it's lieutenant now. Oh, well, congratulations. Thanks. When'd you get out, Bill? Uh, two weeks ago. Just came in to register like the law says all of us felons got to do. Oh, getting along all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing okay. Got a job? Oh, I'm looking around three years away, and a guy's got to look around a little bit, you know. He can kind of get used to things again, you know. About four possibilities, Ben. Here they are. Frank pulled a 510 on all of them for you. Mm. Oh, that's good. I'll take them upstairs later. Look, um, I'd like a make and want on these ten guys here. The loan office jobs? Yeah. I'd just like to check and... See what they're up to these days. Is this afternoon okay? Yeah, that's fine. I have to be in Judge Barr's court right away. Okay, Ben, I'll get someone right on it. Thanks. Right. <laughs> How's Grib these days? Oh, he's good. Oh, well, say hello for me when you see him. Sure, I'll do that. Well, keep your nose clean, Bill. <laughs> sure, you and Grib taught me how to do that, <laughs> Lieutenant. Court directs that fact to be entered in the records of the court and declares bail hereby forfeited. Mr. Hawes? Your Honor. If Mr. Bruchery appears at any time within 90 days in this court and can satisfactorily excuse his neglect to appear today, the court may vacate the order of forfeiture. I understand. However, the payment of any expense which may have been necessitated by reason of the failure of the accused to appear will be liable with him. If such forfeiture is not vacated within this 90-day period, summary judgment for the amount of the bond is entered against the sureties and enforced in the same manner as a civil judgment. Ben. Your Honor, my yeah. client presented Finished a property yet. bond. Mm, Brochery, Jim Quayle. Please to transfer Haven't been called to yet. surety bond. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Hawes. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes, Your Honor. I don't see any reason for you to remain here, do you, Mr. Hawes? No, Your Honor. Sorry to have tied you up this long. You can go. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Hawes. Yes, uh, in regard to that uh, property bond, I see no reason why... Hot shot came through five minutes ago. A loan company in Bellwood got picked off. Same pair? Sounds like him. There was some shooting again. Oh? Uh-huh. The office manager killed one of them. Wine's already here. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Matt. Hi. Over here. Happened about 12.45. The guy who owns the company was out getting a haircut, and the office manager was in the place alone. Rest out to lunch. Hey, mm-hmm. officer. Officer, get these people back off the sidewalk and about their business. Huh? The whole street's clogging up. Come Hi, on. Lieutenant. Oh, hello, Doc. Hi, Doc. Matt, how are you? Smoke? Yeah, thanks. It's a pretty good shot. Shattered his spine, lodged in his heart. Office manager learned to shoot in the army. Huh? Anything on him? Bill Fole says John McCall, 218 West 7th, this city. Crager and Murphy went over. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. He's all yours, Doc. Thanks, Ben. All right, Sam, come on. Let's go. All right. Bring him on. This is Mr. Dodge, the office manager. Lieutenant Guthrie, Sergeant Grab. Hello. Hello, Mr. Dodge. All right. I never shot a man, not even in the war. Some water around here. I'll get it. Is this the gun? Yes. Have a permit for it? Well, somewhere as I do, yes. Mm. Where'd you get it, Mr. Dodd? Is somebody calling my wife? Well, I, I picked the gun up in Italy when I was there. You have a couch or something in here? Uh-huh. In the back there. You want to lie down? Yeah, I think I do. Hey, get his other arm, man. Yeah, sure. Well, I never shot anyone. I suppose I should have called you people right away. Well, how's that, Mr. Don? Well, I saw them both out in front before Mr. Rutherford went out. Something just told me they were stick-up men. 
So that's why I looked around the office <coughs> for the gun. Here you are, Mr. Dodge. Oh. Well, thank you, Sergeant. <clears throat> thank you. Then you got a good look at the other man? Well, not too good a look, really. He made me turn facing the wall as soon as he came in. He was a dark, medium-sized fellow, wore a dark suit. I, mm -hmm. I did what they told me while they went through the safe, but as soon as I heard them leave, I got my gun and I ran out on the street. They fire back at you? Yeah, well, one of them did, but I, I hit the one and he screamed and he ran a while and then he fell oh. It was terrible. The other one didn't even look back. He just kept running down the alley. I, I saw him jump in a car, but I didn't get the license. Told me it was a dark sedan, Chevy, year or two old. I put it on the wire. Five cars are working the area. It was pretty awful. That man screaming like that, even if he was a thief, I just... Yeah. Well, you relax, Mr. Dodge. Did somebody call my wife? She's on the way. Find a gun on McCall? Yeah, 32. Hmm. And the guy with a 38 still running around loose? Yeah. Edmund O'Brien, one of Hollywood's most popular stars, comes from the screen to your radio each Saturday night appearing in the title role of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Join Edmund O'Brien as America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator relates his experiences in the CBS radio account of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Thanks, man. Boy, I'm getting hungry. I haven't eaten since breakfast. Yeah, me too. Here it is, Ben. The whole work's on my call. Oh, good. I'll ring the bell if you want. Okay. Here, Matt. You take some. Yeah. Be careful. I got it. I got it. <sighs> Let's see. I never used an alias. Oh, yeah, yeah. One. Johnston McCall. Well, that's original. <laughs> three arrests, three convictions. He wasn't very good. Hey, watch out for your cigar. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, not much here. Just released six months ago. Uh, give me some of those. Here. There. Now, what's today? Uh, the 18th. Hmm. He'd have been 42 years old tomorrow. Say, uh, you know any of these offhand, Matt? Frank Kerr, James Kerr. Frank, uh, Mapelli? No, not offhand. They were convicted with McCall last time he was sent up. Might be working together again. Oh. Kennedy and Blake made out the last arrest sheet on McCall. 1949. Oh, those guys. What? They never finish out a report. Maybe we should get in touch with them. They'd rather talk than write. I think Kennedy's at the business office now. I'm not sure. Hey, Ben. Huh? Then they called him Orchid. Huh? 1942 arrest, nickname Orchid McCall. <laughs> Wonder why that didn't get in the Monica file. Huh? I don't know. Well, I guess this is about all we can do here. Oh, hi, Quine. Thought you might be eating. Garga and Murphy followed through on that address in McCall's wallet. It was a rooming house. Anything? A wife. When they phoned her from the place, I told them to bring her on down. Nobody's asked her anything yet. She doesn't know what happened at the loan office. She's downstairs in 107. Juvenile department? Yeah. She's only 15 years old. Are you Lieutenant Guthrie? Well, that's right. Uh, this is Sergeant Graham. Well, they said you wanted to talk to me. Uh, what do you want to talk to me about? Uh, about your husband, Mrs. McCall. Uh, wouldn't you be more comfortable if you sat down? Uh, am I uh, arrested? No, no. Oh. Just want to ask you some questions. Here. Here, try this. Oh, thanks. 
I want a cigarette. Can I have one? Cigarette? Oh. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. If, uh, if you have him here, I have a right to see him and talk to him. I- I'm his wife. Uh, how long have you been his wife? Almost a month. And you can't make me testify against him. You only give testimony in a courtroom. We just want information. Well, I won't give you that either. I, I want to see him. Uh, he told me all about you, about what you police do. What did he tell you? How you're always picking on him and other people. Have you been picked on? No. Where were you married? Here in town at a justice of the peace. Oh, we had a nice wedding. Did your mother and father consent to it? Uh, no. You're supposed to be 18 in this state to get a license. Did you lie about your age? Yes. But do they put you in jail for being in love? Golly. Where's your home? 401 Firestone Street, St. Louis. And what was your maiden name? Judy Hodges. Parents' names? Mr. and Mrs. Albert Hodges. Well, let me see John here. Uh, how did you meet John McCall? At a dance. At a dance here in town someplace? At a dance hall. How long ago? Two months ago. Meet many of his friends? Some. Well? There was a man he called Sam and another one he called Bill. Sam and Bill who? Sam Granger, and I don't know Bill's last name. Well, golly, I, I don't know him at all. What does Sam Granger look like, Mrs. McCall? Just a man, sort of tall and thin. And what about Bill? I only met him once. He came by one day last week with his girlfriend. Well, was he tall, short, thin, what? Well, I don't know. Golly, it's just average, about your height. Mm-hmm. Did Bill drive a car? No. Sam? No, but Bill's girl did. She had a car. Uh, last week when it was raining, Bill came by, and then they drove Johnny and I downtown to a movie in it. What kind of a car? I, I think it was a Chevrolet. Black sedan? Black or dark blue, I don't know. Oh, look, uh, all I know is uh, I want to Thank you, see... Mrs. McCall. Uh, are you sure you never heard Bill's last name? It was just Bill. We got in the car, and Johnny said, this is Bill and Lena. Hmm. No last name on her either? No. Where does Bill live? Oh, how would I know? I just saw him that once when Johnny and I went to the movie. Uh, what does Lena look like? Oh, I didn't like her. She was almost 35, I think, sort of dumpy and funny looking. But uh, Bill's a pretty nice looking guy, huh? I thought he could do better than her. Hmm. Not very friendly, huh? No. Was Bill? No. Did your husband ever tell you that he'd been in prison? Of course he told me. He told me everything about himself. What did he tell you? He said he'd been in prison for a while because of trouble with his draft board. He was in prison for stealing an automobile. Why, well, you're lying to me. Well, we have it on our records here, Mrs. McCall. We have no reason to lie to you. Tell me, has Johnny been working in any place since you've been married? No. Well, how have you been living? Oh, he had some saved up from his job. Oh, he had been working, huh? Yes. You know where? No, he's a, a business representative. He represents people. Mm-hmm. Do you know any of the people he represents? No. Well, did he have an office here in town? He, he told me he closed it. You know where it was located? No. Then he really hasn't worked since you've been married. Uh, no, look, look, we're on our honeymoon. We're going to Detroit next week. Johnny doesn't like living here anymore. He, he's going to open up an office there. With Bill? Yes, he said he and Bill were in business. He told you Bill's a business representative, too? Yes. I'm afraid your husband's been lying to you, Mrs. McCall. He's never been engaged in any legitimate business here in town. You're the one who's lying. John McCall has a police record as a hold-up man. Been arrested several times in the last 20 years. We think he's been working with another man recently, holding up loan offices around town. Oh, no. Three days ago, Johnny and his partner killed a man in a loan office. We know it was him. He he wouldn't do anything like that. Well, think about it, Mrs. McCall. The record, the way he's conducted himself, his friends, and the information about him we've just given you. He's lied to you from the very first. Look, I want to see him. I want to talk to him and tell him I don't believe anything you've told me. Uh, Judy. I won't talk to you anymore, not until I've seen him. He's... Johnny was trying to hold up a loan office today. He was shot to death. He 
Matt, put yeah. it. Oh, Hold on to me, kid. Johnny. Now, come on, take it easy. Oh, Hold on, kid. Hold on. Oh, no. Quine. Yeah, Ben. Why are her parents yet? Yeah, they called back long distance and I talked to them. Told me she ran away about six weeks ago. They're flying here tonight. Sounded like nice people. Well, let's hope they are nice people. I guess I fell off. Yeah, I guess you did. Oh. No sense of you sticking around any longer. Why don't you go on home? Oh, Molly's night out with her folks. You want to go to a movie? Uh-uh. Oh. Oh, oh, gee, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Keep it. I'll use this one. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have the stew? Yeah. That's what I had. Benny sure does something to it. He sure does. Anything from auto theft? Oh. Yeah, they, uh... I got out a supplementary on that Chevy sedan, sent this up. 7249s, 3250s, 2451s. All reported stolen in the last month. Oh. It may not be a stolen car after all, man. R and I got those addresses on Frank and James Kerr and Mapelli. Mm-hmm. Crockett's out looking for him now. And they didn't have anything on Sam Granger. Still looking. You wire the penitentiary? Yeah, won't hear anything from them until morning. Go ahead, you're the closest. Sergeant Grip. It sure is. Hold on. Ben. Guthrie. I, I, I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Oh? Huh? Yeah, all right. I'll let you know. Grantland, University Division. I picked up a drunken woman named Lena Roberts. She was all upset because a friend of hers named Bill Chambers borrowed a car and didn't bring it back. He's at the Westover Hotel. One twenty eight. There it is. Uh, take it in here, man. Nobody. Hmm. And try the bell. Some place. Yeah. Try it again. You want your room, fellas? Uh, Bill Chambers live here. Chambers? Just a minute. I was eating my supper. <laughs> And see, uh, see, I just came on after being off more than a month. Uh, chambers, uh, yeah, she's in, uh, 228. Is key in? What? Police. Oh. Nope. Key's out. Okay. Is he in trouble or something? Uh, tell you about it later. Whew. Somebody had cabbage. I thought you couldn't cook in these hotels. <laughs> you don't have to cook it to smell it. Delicatessen across the street. Mm, it must be at the end of the hall. Yeah. Come on, Chambers. Open up, it's the police. He's out the window. Come on, let's break it down. Right, just... There he goes up on the roof. Uh, watch it, Matt. He's used that 38 before. Now look, you keep him busy here. I'll take the fire escape at the end of the hall. Right. Chambers? Chambers, you can't get away. Come all right. Now. Go on now, all of you. Go back to your rooms. We'll take care of this. Back to your rooms. Come on, Chambers, come on, use your head. You haven't got... How about that, Chubber? 
Drop your gun, Chambers. Uh, no, you don't cover! Benny, uh, you okay, Ben? Yeah. Uh, he's done, Ben. Yeah. Say, this is Ed Nixon. We pulled him in. No, for... man. It's Bill Nixon. Huh? He was asking for you today at registration. Said to tell you hello. The lineup. Where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Grab, Sergeant Matt Grab. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Clayton Post, Parley Bear, Stacey Harris, Herb Butterfield, Sammy Hill, Bob Sweeney, and Howard McNear. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Almost three and a half million young men in our armed forces have given up a lot for you. They've given up a way of life they enjoyed so you could remain safe. Back them up by sharing in the defense effort. Invest regularly in United States defense bonds. Defense bonds do two things for you. First, they help defend the freedoms you cherish. Second, they ensure your own personal future. Start now to invest regularly in United States defense bonds. <laughs> Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Mr. Guthrie? Oh, I mean, Lieutenant Guthrie. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Don't apologize. Smoke? Yeah, I got my pipe, thanks. Mm -hmm. We uh, think we might have the man you saw going into Mr. Frankly's house this afternoon. Well, say, that's quick work. You fellas really go after everything, don't you? <laughs> we try to. Yeah, I only saw him for a minute, but I think I can remember him by the pants and the jacket he was wearing. I hope you can remember his face, May too, Mr. I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? 
Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, move it right along, all the way over to the end of the street. Uh, Lieutenant, hmm? uh, right, there's the man right, right up there. Oh, oh which one? Uh, that Turn tall the the fella. Mm. Well, uh, let's wait till he's questioned. You, number ten, face the front. The front. <laughs> all right, keep your eyes straight ahead. When I call your number, step out to the circle, answer the question so the people out there can hear you. Okay, number one, Jack Hanley, burglary. Where do you live? Bayview, Oregon. Come on, you'll have to speak up, Jack. I live in Bayview, Oregon. Now, look, I've told you what every officer you've met around here has told you. When we ask you where you live, we want the address you slept at the night before you were arrested. Is that clear? The rest of you understand it? Okay, Jack. I don't remember. Some flea bag on East Arapaho Street. Who remembers that kind of an address? Were you alone when you were arrested? I was drinking beer with a friend. What was his name? His name's Lorraine Price. Have a gun on you, Jack? Uh, when? When you were arrested. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, what kind? A Webley Fosbury automatic. V8 shot? Yes, yeah, right at 38. Hey, I'll be here a few days. Drop in, say hello. We can talk about guns. Thanks. I'll do that. Okay, number two, Frederick Hammer, assault. Come on, come on. Hustle it up, Frederick. Where do you live? 5162 South Central. Louder so the people can hear you, Freddy. I ain't got nothing to say. Well, you had quite a bit to say at dinner time tonight. Every cook in the jail kitchen heard you. I don't like a job. You'll get used to it. The address again. 5162 South Central. Stand up straight. Take your hands out of your pockets. I was looking for my lighter. It's in the property room. What do you do for a living? Truck driver. How much do you weigh? 218. Do you know a man named Frank Yacino? Yeah, I know him. Do you know how much Frank weighs? How much? 132. He may not weigh much, but he's got an awful big mouth on him, I tell you that. We heard all about it, Freddy. Can I help it if he falls down and cuts his lip? Concussion. Concussion, percussion, who cares? Okay, step back. He ought to be here stuck. That's me. enough, that's enough. Number three, Rex Gilman, open charge. Where do you live, Rex? 36, uh, 17, that Plymouth Avenue. Like right right take your time. Long you live there? Yes, but I think... Uh, since 47. What's your business? Mechanic. Own a car? I have a 41. Yeah, yeah, that's him, Lieutenant. Yes, I, I've what been certain of it ever room? since he you walked out on that stage. Okay. <laughs> Sergeant Graham. Uh, yes, sir. Number three, hold for interrogation. Hi. How's Mr. Frankly? Uh, about the same. My phone's pretty bad. A lot of internal bleeding, three transfusions so far. Oh. Uh, any luck with Frankly's wife? Uh, divorced in 1948 and after 23 years of marriage. She's remarried, living in San Francisco now, a wired. Ed Carger's at the hospital sweating it out now. I relieve him at midnight. Nash will follow up about four. Frankly has anything to say, we'll get it done. Good. No prints on the kitchen knife that make any sense. We're still hoping on some they picked up on a glass. What about Gilman? Uh, Borton identified him. Hey, uh, Claude Abrams is in your office. He's Frankly's attorney. He advised Frankly on how to handle the thing with Gilman. Met him at the hospital. Oh. Mr. Abrams, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh, glad to meet you, Lieutenant. Now, how do you do? Uh, keep your seat, Mr. Abrams. Oh. I understand you advised Mr. Frankly about this matter with Gilman, Mr. Abrams. Yes, I explained that he could take it to court, but I tried to talk him out of taking action because of the expense involved. However, he insisted... I even called on Gilman at his garage and explained what Mr. Frankly was going to do. Hoping Gilman might rectify his mistake or refund the money. Now, what was Gilman's attitude? Persecuted. Called Mr. Frankly several names. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Frankly have plenty of money? Almost a quarter of a million dollars. Still got it? 
All except what Lillian, his wife, took from him. Seems funny he'd create so much ruckus over a small matter like this with the garage men if he has all that money. Well, I uh, won't keep you any longer, Mr. Abrams. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Mr. Frankly ever mentioned someone named uh, Fay? Oh, not that I recall. We didn't mix socially. He mentioned the name several times in coma. A lieutenant, do you think that garage man did this to Mr. Franklin? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Abrams. Okay. Just sit in that chair, Gilman. Okay. No, 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 no. That one. Hi. Okay. My name's Ben Guthrie. You know Sergeant Greb. You know why you're here? Something about Frankly. He's in pretty serious condition, Gilman. He was beaten up and stabbed. We picked you up because we learned that you had words with Frankly about some work you did for him. What about it? Well, I did what he asked me to do. I put white sidewalls on his tires, and I told him I couldn't guarantee the job. When it didn't work out and they turned yellow, he got nasty about it. I told him to stay away from my garage. Did you threaten Mr. Frankly? No, I didn't threaten him. I just told him he better not try to take me to court over it, a little thing like that. What did you mean when you told him that? Well, I meant that he better not do it, that's all. Well, what I want to know is uh, what alternative action did you have in mind? None. I, I just didn't want him to do it. It's kind of hot in here. Can I... No, you were talking about the tire business. You must have had something in mind. I suppose I did. I don't know. What? I don't know. And what's the matter with your hand? I was reaching for the light switch in the dark, and the back of my hand touched the wall. It's rough plaster. Well, it seems to me you'd put the palm of your hand against the wall to feel for the switch. There's an extra wall by my switch. It's just a little office they built in when I leased the joint. You have to go in sort of like, like this, and that's the wall I brush. With the back of your hand? Yeah. I, I don't quite get the picture there. What is it, a little partition or what that comes out by the switch? It's just part of the wall in a little area. And you hit it with the back of your hand, reaching for the light switch? Look, if you don't believe me, mister, go down and look for yourself. Or send one of your sergeants down there. Maybe one of them's got brains enough to figure out how it could happen. Well, maybe. You know, you guys make me sick with your questions. If, if the answer you get doesn't ring the bell, you're going to be real tough about it. Real tough. Don't sit there. Sit here. Don't take off your coat. Don't raise the window. Don't smoke. Nuts. You guys make me sick. Sergeant, lieutenant. But I'll laugh. Just like those wonder boys I ran into in the army. They didn't know how to do anything but keep their pants pressed and their shaving gear two inches from their toothbrushes and field inspection. I've seen enough of you cops today to last me all my life. You really make me sick. Anything else, Gilman? Yeah. When you're out pounding around waiting for that 30 years to end so you can get your rocking chair money, I'll be able to buy and sell both of you and all the rest of these guys around here. <laughs> when Sergeant Asher and Sergeant Quine questioned you earlier, did they ask you if you had seen Mr. Frankly today? Yeah. What did you tell him? I told him no. Did they ask you if you'd gone over to his house today? Sure. Well? I told him no. Doesn't quite check, Gilman. Mr. Borden lives right across the street from Mr. Frankly's house. He picked you out of the lineup tonight and identified you as the man who went up the walk to Mr. Frankly's house about 1.30 today. Okay. Okay, I was there. Where? At Frankly's house. At 1.30? Yeah, but he wasn't there. I didn't see him. I... Now, look, you guys, I went over there to see him about the attachment and the summons. He sued me for that lousy little bill. He wasn't home. I tied up my bank account this morning with some kind of a writ night. Well, he wasn't there. Look, do you think I beat him up and stick a knife in him for that? When you went to his house, did you ring the bell? No. Did you knock? No. Look, I was pretty hot about the attachment and the summons. When I got to the house, I thought maybe he'd see me coming up the walk from his window or something and wouldn't answer the door. So I just opened it and, and walked in. I wanted to see him. I could say things to him in his house that I 
Couldn't say to him in a courtroom. The things about the white side walls? Yeah. What'd you see in his house? What'd I see? Nothing. He, he wasn't around. I yelled his name a couple of times and then left. Did you go through the house? No. Not even to the kitchen? No. After you left his house, where'd you go? Back to my garage. The boy at your garage told Sergeant Asher you didn't get back until after 3 o'clock. Well, I, I stopped and had lunch. I forgot. Well, what'd you have for lunch? Well, I stopped at some beanery on Tremont Street. I found a parking place, and then I had a sandwich and a couple of beers. Uh-huh. Uh, we asked you earlier if you'd been to Frankly's house this afternoon. You said you hadn't. Why did you deny that you'd been there? What do you mean? Well, what are we supposed to think, Rex? We're trying to find out what happened to Mr. Frankly. You tried to hide that part of it from us. We'll have to hold you. Check into your story more thoroughly. Well, how are you going to check what I've told you? I didn't have anyone around to prove he wasn't there in the house when I went in. Oh, you're wrong. There's one witness, Gilman. Who? Lawrence Frankly. Tomorrow night, most of these same stations bring you Earl Wrightson and Alfredo Antonini's orchestra with Jimmy Carroll and a fine singing cast in a musical salute to Rogers and Hart. Hear composer Richard Rogers himself and hear the wonderful show tunes Rogers and Hart penned for unforgettable Broadway productions. That's tomorrow night, part of your Friday night family music parade on CBS Radio. Scrub these places with ether? <laughs> I don't think they even use it anymore. It always smells the same. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Matt. Hi. Hi. Right. Just in time. Down here. Make you make it. I'll keep trying. Don't take too long. He's awfully weak. I'll want to put him under sedative as soon as you're finished. Okay, Dan. Now, look. When we get in the room, Gilman, you just keep your mouth shut and do what you're told. Uh, better put your cigarette in that. Oh. Okay. okay, now remember what I said. Yeah, I know, yeah. Ash is in with him now. Please state your full name. Up close to the bed, Gilman. All right. Lawrence J. Franklin. Where do you live? 32, 32... Humboldt Street. How old are you, Mr. Franklin? I'm 53. I understand that you're seriously hurt. Is that true? Well, that's what the doctors tell me. Are you willing to make a true and full statement of how and in what manner you came to the injury from which you're suffering? Closer, Gilman. Closer. Right under the light. Can you hear me, Mr. Franklin? Who caused the injury from which you're suffering? Was it this man? Do you recognize him? Yes. Gilman, the man at the garage. Did he cause you these injuries? I did. Shut up. Mr. Frankly? What? Is Rex Gilman the man who beat you up and attacked you with a knife in your home today? Mr. Frankly... We have good reason to believe this man attacked you. Will you please tell us if he's the one? Mr. Franklin. No. Rex Gilman did not attack you? No. Hey, what did I tell I you? I told you to shut up. Well, who did attack you, Mr. Franklin? Who did this to you? It was a woman. Well, what was her name, Mr. Franklin? Where can we find her? Well, I, I... You've been repeating the name Faye in your delirium. Uh, was it Faye? Say who? Go away. I, I don't want to have anything done about it. Mr. Frankly, I... Doc. That's all, Ben. 
guys. I told you. Get him out of here, Matt. Come on. I told you. You guys are going to look pretty silly, boy. Oh, I'll wait till you up. I'll not be newspaper. I can find it. Let's get the floor orderly and notify the morgue. Sure, he knew what he was saying. Well, you heard him answer everything else. Yeah. Well, here's everything we could dig up then. Okay. Frankly, he's been having a time for himself ever since his divorce three years ago. Advertised in the papers and joined a Lonely Hearts Club. Met several women. Mm. A man like Frankly using that means to meet a woman. <laughs> Sound funny to you, Ben? Yeah. Well, maybe he had something definite in mind about the kind of woman he wanted to meet. Well, he saw three of them pretty regularly, all fairly young for him. <laughs> Ellen Bennett, age 29, a city stenographer. Madge Givens, age 29, a city waitress. Laura Vickers, age 31, the city, also waitress. No one named Faye. Second names? Mm, Helen May, Madge Diana, Laura Christine. Well, we have enough suspects. Yeah, and more coming. He was having all sorts of fun. Carger and Murphy are trying to locate the Givens woman. Laura Vickers, married eight months ago, lives out on the coast. Helen Bennett's in the interrogation room with Patterson and Carter. She says, frankly, asked her to marry him last month. She turned him down. They're still talking to her. Mm. Hey, Billy and Grant came up with something. Oh? Been re-questioning people in the neighborhood. Woman came to see Frankly twice last week. Saw him often. Drove a new CAD convertible, blue. Well, that doesn't sound like a waitress or stenographer. Well, what about these? Uh, nothing like them. This one's in early 40s. Blonde, nice-looking, well-groomed. Three different people who remember seeing her said she was one of those kind you could give 10 or 12 more years and still not tell the difference. Anything on the car? No license number. Man named Masterson was pretty sure he's noticed a Cherry Hills plate frame on it. No cab dealers in Cherry Hills. We're checking dealers all over town. I uh, put some in on auto supply stores, too. If she bought the plate frames, one of them might have put them on for her. Mm -hmm. Better call Park Hill Division. That's nearest to Cherry Hills. Mm -hmm. Give them the stuff you have. Blue cad convertibles aren't too plentiful even there. Okay. Oh, I talked to your witness, Borden, again. You remember her? Yeah. Said she always wore nice sport clothes. When the weather was nicer, saw her come by one day with some golf clubs stacked in the back of her car. Mm -hmm. Guthrie. Uh, Carger just called in. Tracked down Frankly's landlady. Name's Faye Seelig. Good. What's the address? 2479 Vista, Cherry Hills. Right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Guthrie, police. Miss Sergeant Greb. May we come in, please? Well, yes. May I have your coats? Well, that won't be necessary. I'm only going to stay a minute. Uh, we'd like to get a little information from you, if possible, about Lawrence Franklin. Oh? Uh, yes, we understand you were his landlady. I own the house on Humboldt Street. Larry rented it from me, but I dislike the title landlady. Oh, sorry. I uh, suppose you read about his death in the papers. Yes, of course. I was very upset over it. I've known Larry for a long time. Well, uh, maybe you can tell us something that'll give us a hint as to what actually happened at his home last Tuesday afternoon. Well, I'm sure I don't know. In his coma, Mr. Frankly mentioned the name Faye several times. Now, that's your name, isn't it? Yes. Do you have any idea why he'd mention your name? No, no idea. Well, according to people our men have talked to in the neighborhood, you drop by to see Mr. Frankly quite often. What people? Oh, just people in the neighborhood. Was he a good friend of yours? He was an old friend of Doug's, my late husband. Why would these people talk to you about me? Well, they didn't talk about you, Mrs. Seeley. They just remembered you and the car you drove and that you saw Mr. Frankly quite often. That's why you're here? That's right. When was the last time you visited Mr. Frankly? Oh, last month, I think. Do you know Helen Bennett? Should I? Mr. Frankly was intending to marry her at one time not so long ago. Thought he might have mentioned it to you. No. 
Larry contemplating a second marriage, I'm surprised. Well, he was in good health, had money, no responsibilities. Seemed good marriage material. Oh, you misunderstand me. I've always thought of Larry as a wonderful catch, but he often mentioned to me that he'd never trust another woman and that he'd never marry again. When did he tell you that? Many times. Last week, in fact. Well, a moment ago, you said you hadn't seen him for over a month. Did you forget? Yes, I suppose I did. We had dinner together last week. Are you trying to confuse me? Now, uh, this is a personal question, Mrs. Seely, but we'd appreciate an honest answer to it. Did you ever think of marrying Mr. Frankly yourself? I suppose so. Did you ever talk about it? I suppose we did, yes. But I've explained how he felt, and I've been quite aware of his feelings for some time. Well, what you say about Mr. Frankly's attitude toward women puzzles me, Mrs. Seely. We've learned that he had correspondence with several... Saw two or three regularly, besides the woman named Helen Bennett. You're talking about that silly, lonely hearts thing, aren't you? Yes. Larry had an obtuse sense of humor. Writing all those women and meeting them. A man with his education and social background and connections, honestly. I know all about it. It's been going on ever since Lillian left him. Well, we'd like to hear what you have to say about it, if you don't mind, Mrs. Seeley. Oh, dear, I'm late now. I have an appointment for lunch could, downtown. Uh, could you cancel it? I certainly could not. Mrs. Seelig, we're investigating a homicide. We've got to check into everything. You may be able to help us a great deal. Well, I'll... I'll try and telephone my friend. Excuse me, please. Uh, certainly. No. What do you think, then? Nice woman. Very attractive. Yeah. Boy, look at this. I'll bet this living room set cost two grand if it cost a bit. Hey, what was that? Well, it isn't a telephone. The bathroom? Yeah. It's locked. Okay, Matt. Yeah. Oh, she's taking something. No, no. What did you take, Mrs. Seeley? I won't hear it, man. Oh, Lysol. Uh, the kitchen must be in the back somewhere. Eggs or milk should do it. Yeah, right, then. I want to die. Now lie quiet, Mrs. Seeley, and no, don't talk. Can I have a second? What are you doing? Quiet. Now, here. Drink it. No. Drink it. Here. Here we are, Ben. Okay. I'll get her head. All right, come on now. Try this. No. No. Go away. Oh. Anything I can do. Just a minute. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, it got down. I hit him with my handbag. It started his ear to bleeding. When I hit him again, he stumbled and started toward me. I became very frightened. This all happened in the kitchen? Yes. All right, go on. He didn't try to hit me back. But he did try to hold my arms. I saw the knife laying there on the board, and I used it. I thought he was dead when I left. You have no idea what it's like knowing he was with her. Are you talking about Helen Bennett? No, the others, too. I would have made Larry a good wife. We were perfectly matched. I told him. I'd have been a wife he could take to his club and introduce to people. One he'd have been proud to do things with, travel and things. Yes, we'd have made a nice couple. But Mr. Frankly didn't want it that way. Is that it? He wanted something else. Them. Waitresses. Stenographers. Do I look 46 years old, Lieutenant? No, I wouldn't say so. My friends tell me I could pass for 35. Larry was nearly 50. Maybe past it. I could have made him happy. Certainly given him more than Lillian ever gave him. 
She let herself put on weight and didn't watch her clothes. A woman should keep herself up. Don't you think? Yes. Yes. We'd have made a nice couple. We could have had a wonderful life together. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Averback, Howard McNear, Lou Krugman, Dave Young, Bob Sweeney, Sidney Miller, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Company hope you'll all be on hand to join them this Saturday evening when songbird Betty Cox drops in to sing. They'll all be heard on CBS radio as usual, and you're invited to help yourself to the Monroe style rhythm this Saturday evening on most of these same stations. Coverly speaking, and remember, you'll enjoy Theater of Today every Saturday in the daytime hours on the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Got himself a job. Boys pulled in 52 suspects today, and 13 more came in from the other divisions. Mm, good. Uh, Steve's girl's up front. Talbot girl's on the left there. Ash was bringing in the Serafini girl, and Barbara Patton's over on the side. Oh, yeah, I see her. Well, I'll tell Murph to sit with the Talbot girl. You take Steve, and I'll take care of Patton. Okay. I'll see you later, Ben. Hey. Oh, Barbara. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Have you caught him? Uh, we don't know. We're hoping. Feeling all right now? Oh, I feel fine. Real fine. He, he didn't hurt me much, really. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, tell me, uh, you know those other girls, Barbara? Well, just from their pictures in the paper. 
When you first came in, I thought you were going to sit with one of them instead of me. Did you? Those men with them are only sergeants, aren't they? Hmm? May I have your uh, They're only sergeants. Please? Not a full lieutenant uh, like you. You people oh, out there yeah. at the side of the wire of the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Yes. Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Come on, all the way over, boys. That's right. Is that what they look like? I'm afraid so. Golly, I thought they'd be older or bigger or something. When I call your name, step out to the circle. When I ask the questions, talk up so the people in the back of the room can hear you. All right. Number one, William Green, vagrancy. Tell the people where you live, William. No place. Come on, talk up, William. Talk up. It's a long way to the back of the room. Don't live no place. Where'd you sleep last night? In a parked car on Ferro Boulevard. What do you do? What's your work? I get along. You ever think of getting a steady job, William? Yeah, with the world coming to an end any day now, I should spend my free time working on some stupid job. Lots of people in the same world with you. They all work. Dummies. All of them dummies. I'm playing it smart. You were in the county jail ten months this past year? Eight months the year before? Well... Yeah, you're playing it smart, all right. Okay, step back. Number two, Theodore Swan, 290, failing to register. I just got in town. How am I going to register if I just got in town? You were in town long enough to get soused up. What do you want a guy to do? Come right down here first thing and tell everybody he just got out of the clink? That's what the law says you have to do. Why didn't you do it? I was busy. Where do you live? 890 South Hooker Street. Any weapons? No. Well, what about the knife? What knife? The one in the property room. Oh, that. I use it for my fingernails. A knife with an eight-inch spring blade? Oh, yeah. I got long fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> that knife's just about three inches too long to be legal. What? I suppose my fingernails are too long, too. Well, we'll look into it. Number three, Gilbert Farrell, theft. Where do you live, Gilbert? Uh, uh, 45, 56 and a half of uh, Franklin Street. Well, what's that? Hotel, apartment house, room, what? Uh, uh, sort of a, a motel in court. How long you live there? Uh, six months, uh, uh, maybe seven. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm looking for a job. What kind of a job? Uh, well, uh, uh, something around gym, or maybe uh, uh, training boxers or something. Is that your profession? Yeah, well, I, I know I know some about it. That's why you hang around the 12th Street gym? Yeah, yeah, that's why. Any harm in that? There is if you happen to walk off with four sets of boxing gloves. Oh, I, I just do anything like that. I don't have to do anything like that. Oh, you have a source of income even though you aren't working? Well, sure, I get calm. Compensation? You mean unemployment compensation? Yeah, the greatest thing I've, I've ever done in this country. It gives you a man time to relax and take a blow and look things over. All right, Gilbert, all right. Slide down the end of the line. Number four, Howard Berry. Man? Huh? Oh, hello, Ben. You know Barbara Patton, man? Oh, sure. Hello, Sergeant. Well, I'm sorry you couldn't identify one of those men. So am I. Now, Matt, take Barbara down and show her the mug pile. Maybe she can spot him there. Okay. Ash and Quine have the other girls there, too. You still feel all right, Barbara? Not tired? Oh, fine, Lieutenant. Honest. Okay, man. I'll be with Captain Waldo if you want me. Right. Let's go, Barbara. Hope I'll see you later, Lieutenant. You will. Night. Hi, Bill. Uh-uh. Ran through 65 tonight. Nothing. Oh, relax, Brad. Yeah. You're going to 
think any of these four girls would recognize him if they did see him? Well, it's hard to say. He's quick and it's always late at night. None of them saw his face, just his back and only for a second. Descriptions don't jibe. He was tall, he was medium, he was heavy, he was slender. Well, I'll have the boys keep hauling them in. We can't pass up any possibility. Majestic Theater Manager called me again a little while ago. Well, I've still got three men in and around the theater every night. His help looks okay. None of them get off before 12.30, and these jobs have all happened between 10.30 and 12. Each of these girls went to a late movie at the Majestic Theater alone. After the show, they came out, waited for a bus or streetcar, and someone passed them on the street and jabbed them with an ice pick. We're lucky none of them have been seriously injured. Well, our luck can't hold out. He's going to hurt someone bad one of these days. We've got to get him, Ben. Complaints are piling up by the hour. I want you to drop everything else you've been working on. Same goes for Matt, Asher, and Quine, Murphy, anybody else you need. Okay. I want plain clothesmen covering that entire area and as many auxiliary cars as we can spare. Maybe if we put the heat on, he'll hang up his ice pick for the season. You know, Bill, I don't think this bird cares one way or another what we do. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. <laughs> Ben. Too early? No, Matt, come on in. I think you both met Dr. Rock one time or another. Doctor, Sergeant Graham. Nice to see you again, Doctor. Same here, Sergeant. Sergeant Quine. Oh, I remember you on that book salesman thing, Sergeant. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Captain Waldo can't get down for this, so grab some chairs, boys, and make yourselves comfortable. Okay, well, we've picked up over 300 suspects in these ice pick stabbings. No identifications. We haven't had any luck in the mug files. What's more, I don't think we're going to have any luck. So Dr. Rock's here to give us some of his ideas. Uh, I hope I can do you some good, Lieutenant. Okay? Sure, go ahead. <clears throat> Two questions here, gentlemen. What kind of man would accost a young girl on a crowded street, jab her with an ice pick, then flee? And the other, why would he do it? Well, we know it isn't for money. The girls haven't been robbed. And they aren't attack cases. No. And there's only one other conclusion about him. He's pathological. An overt sadist. I've gone over the complaint reports and I've interviewed all the girls. Well, these kids have been mighty lucky. None of them have been struck in a vital place. The fleshy part of the arm or leg or thigh. In one case, the calf of the leg. Well, all of the victims have been about the same age, between 19 and 23. Do you think this has a bearing on it? Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. I doubt if he'd attack an older woman... There are indications that he might select his victims beforehand in some manner or another and actually talk with them and know something about them. You mean long enough so they'd appeal to him in this way? Well, that's about it. Another point. He always operates under the cover of darkness on a crowded street. Lieutenant Guthrie has suggested we look for a man whose working hours fit into this schedule. I agree with him. Uh, maybe he works someplace where he meets these girls. Well, they couldn't be in their neighborhoods. They live uh, in different parts of the city. So it must be where he works or hangs out. Mm, could be. Now, um, I have here some other points that you can think over. I believe your suspect will be agile, possibly indicating he's young. He may be a frustrated artist or sculptor or medical student. His tastes will probably be aesthetic. He'll be the first to tell you he doesn't belong where he is, that he's meant for something much better. Any questions? But do you think he'd admit these things, Doctor, if we get him? Well, that depends entirely on his particular personality makeup. He might. On the other hand, he might claim an hysterical fugue and remember nothing about his actions at the time of commission. Any more questions? Okay, Doctor, that's about it. Well, when you get him, we've got a place all reserved for him at the county hospital. Nice and awesome. 89 of 518 at the corner of Madison and Colfax. Hey, that's some sign, huh? QAR yeah. 1045. How did they get the smoke to come out in rings? 27 <laughs> of 211. Some kind of and blower, I guess. At yeah. all night market, 14th Sheridan. Molly's still with the cold? Five, oh, you said it. Half the night last night. Couldn't breathe. 
think I'm coming down, too. Oh, yeah, that's so always the way. The I was going to ask Rourke about Sheridan. that. Life Maybe it's psychosomatic. Car, think so? Mm, everything Frank. else is. Why not? Frank. Probably right. Dark blue or black. Late model Chevrolet. Take it around here, man. Three, five, Frank. This park looks pretty Dark in the daytime, but it gives a guy a lot of running space at night. Occupants unknown. All units, area H, ADW, 16th and Curtis. Ambulance is on the way. Yeah, there's one street over. All units, area H, ADW, 16th and Curtis. Is that them ahead? Yeah, by the bus stop. Asher's on. Yeah. Hello, Ben. We've got another one. Name is Virginia Plunkett. You call in? Yeah, the whole area's covered. All right, let's take a look. All right, yep. all right, all you people, let's get back. Keep it back. I wasn't doing anything, honest. I was... Uh, yeah, now we know, we know it's going to be all right. Why would he do that to me? Why? Why? Any of you people with us see anything? Moving, will you? Does it hurt pretty bad, Virginia? No, not so bad. I mean, I didn't even know it happened for a minute or two, and then it hurt. Did you see him? Did you get a good look at him? I didn't see anybody. Why? Why? Why did he do it to me? Hi, Doc. Hello, Ben. Hello, little lady. Now, uh, let's have a look. What's the matter? Is that? Uh, lie still, please. Ed, hand me that. What are you going to do? We don't want anything serious to happen to you. Here. Oh, Oh, uh, wasn't so bad, was it? No. All right, Ed. Where are you taking me? What about my mother? Are you going to tell my mother? I wasn't supposed to go to the show tonight. No, no, no. It'll be all right, little lady. It'll be all right. We'll take care of you. Ed, keep that end down. Uh, when can we come and talk to her, Don? Maybe tomorrow afternoon or next day. Is that the soonest? Yeah. She's the first one who's folded up. Oh. Afraid it touched her spinal cord, Ben. This kid may never walk again. Got any plans this Saturday night? Don't make any that don't include yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and Gangbusters on CBS Radio. You'll want the full details when Edmund O'Brien, as insurance sleuth Johnny Dollar, looks into the case of a policyholder who liked to feed birds. And you'll want to hear Gangbusters chase some speeding bank robbers plaguing Maryland State Police. Enjoy both these mystery shows this Saturday on most of these same CBS radio stations. <laughs> Still in surgery. Her mother came over. Told us Virginia won the Charleston contest last week. Ain't that something? Yeah. Uh, do they have any money? Just what Virginia makes working in the dime store. There's an army doctor working with Gerson. Maybe the two of them can straighten it out. Pick up anybody? Uh, yeah. Witness. Some coffee before you meet him? No. Uh, how about you, man? No, no. No, he's in your office, Ben. Uh, Crockett's with him. His uh, name's Edmund Patrick. Sells papers at 16th in California. Uh, hi. Hello, Mr. Patrick. My name's Guthrie. This is Sergeant Greb. Uh, glad to know you. Uh, Mr. Patrick, would you mind telling Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Greb what you told me? Sure. Why not? I understand you saw the whole thing. Things right. What this man's been going around doing? Against the will of God. It certainly is. Against the laws of nature. Uh, what did against... you see, Mr. Patrick? Uh, I was selling my papers and praying tonight when it happened. The girl was uh, very pretty when I saw her come over toward the bus stop. I prayed for that girl's body and for her soul. And I prayed we now... We know that... you did all that, Mr. Patrick. Uh, could you tell us exactly what you saw? And he crossed from in back of me. As the girl came toward me, he went toward her. Tall, big, husky fellow he was. The image of a god with a devil all around him. He passed her. Quick, he was close. He passed her, and I saw his hand go out, and there was a pick in it. It came down quick. Oh, quick he was. 
The girl I was praying for kept walking for maybe another ten feet. Then she screamed and fell. And I prayed for her. I prayed for her. Can you describe the man's face, Mr. Pasha? I saw it. He didn't run away when it happened. He, he, he turned and waited for her to fall. And I saw his face. Well, what kind of a face is it? Dark, light, mustache, what? The devil's face. What do you mean? He walks the earth with... Are you do any better, Quine? I never... Well, I thought I'd lay off till you came around. You understand That's about that the way he gave it to me. Mm. This man well, at least he's sure he saw that something. Yeah. I'll get Ash and we'll keep working on it. I'll pray for him. His face! What? Uh, uh, do you want it? Yes. Uh, Where is it, Mr. Patchy? I've seen him across from the theater in a white jacket. White. White. The color of evil. White? Where I go for my soup. A bus boy in a white jacket. Which one, Mr. Patchy? Yeah, a uh, Gaylord's cafeteria. Be closed this time of night. Uh, hmm. Any of you fellas got a smoke for me? I'm Jim Gaylord. Looking for me? Yes, I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Graham. How do you do? We can talk better in my office, Lieutenant. Okay. Uh, Matt, uh, better stay down here. Keep an eye on Patcher. Right, Ben. Uh, this way, Lieutenant. When you called me this morning, I could hardly believe it, Lieutenant. Well, we aren't certain of anything yet, Mr. Gaylord, but this is the best lead we've had so far in these cases. Oh, I understand. Terrible things. What kind of a man would do it? What kind of a man? Well, let's assume he's a pretty sick man, Mr. Gaylord. And his actions are prompted by a stimulus that you and I have never known. Hard to look at it that way. But you, a police officer, I suppose you uh, have to? Yeah, I suppose I have to. After you? Thanks. I have all the information you asked for right here. And here we are. All in all, we have 30 bus boys. Some work full-time and some only four-hour shifts. Uh, could you break that down? Well, we open at 6 in the morning. Crew of 12 come on at that time, and they all stay until 3 in the afternoon. Now, here. Mm, all right. The next crew comes on at 11, and they go off 4. Uh, how many on that ship? 12. That means during the heavy lunch hour, we have 24 men on the floor clearing up. And uh, when does the next shift come on? 4 o'clock. Six men working from 4 to 10. That's when we close. Our evening business is small. People prefer the cocktail lounge. Uh, can I see that list, too, please? Of course, uh, do you know any of these men, Mr. Galen? I know who they are, and I recognize their faces. Well, do you know anything about them? Straight, I can't help you there, Lieutenant. I really don't. Some are kids in school. Some of them hold other part-time jobs. A bus boy is a bus boy around here, and we have a pretty fast turnover. Mm. Will anyone quit in the last week or two? No, I haven't lost a boy for two months now. Keeping my fingers crossed. Mm. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to have these names and addresses for a couple of hours. Now, you can keep it, Lieutenant. I have duplicates. Well, thanks. Anything else I can do? Uh, not right now, thanks. Well, maybe there is. Oh? Our witness is sitting downstairs having a bowl of soup right now. He'll probably be here most of the day. He may try to eat everything in sight. <laughs> I've noticed that old man before. I'm glad to see him getting a good meal for a change. <laughs> well, uh, give me the bill. I'll pick you... up the tab, Lieutenant. I'm as anxious for you to get your man as anybody. Okay. My men will be in the waiting room downstairs and at all doors. If you run across anything, you think might help, I'd appreciate it if you go directly to them. I will, of course. I have a daughter myself, just 19. And I read about that poor child last night. Terrible thing, Lieutenant. Something like that happened to Mary Jane. I I don't know what I'd do. Well, and you have a pretty good idea how bad we want to get this man. Oh, uh, one thing more. Do you use ice picks here? All the time, for chipping ice. Now, where do you keep them, Mr. Galen? Why, every busboy carries his own. Hi. Uh, the second ship come on yet? Yeah. Patchak's not doing so well. Nothing, man. Nothing. All those lists you got from Gaylord. No records on any of them. Ash talked to all the girls again. They all had something to eat here before they went to the movie. Well, that helps. I was beginning to worry about Patchak. Uh, you think maybe he told us a story to get something to eat? Or a warm place to pray. What about bringing the girls down here to look things over? No, let's wait. 
<sighs> None of them really saw much but his back. Patrick saw his face. And... No, he's still our best friend. Oh, hi. Hi, man. I'm your relief. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> How do people stand it in a cafeteria for eight hours every day? Beat? The noise. Come on, let's get out of here, Ben. Find a quiet place and have some lunch. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Patrick spotted somebody. What? Oh, no. Well, sure he has. Look at him. He's standing up. I've been watching him for three hours, Ben. He does that every time they put something new on the menu. Sure, Mr. Gaylord. Oh, I'm positive. This is the last crew, and every one of them's here today. And they're all out on the floor, Ben. What do you think? Well, he's had time to look at all of them. I've been hoping that he was wrong about it being one of my employees. He's always struck me as a very confused old man. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, Ben. Hi. Anything from downtown? Yeah, rundowns and some of the men working this shift. Uh, Ryan's from McAllister, Oklahoma. He'd been here a couple months. Told his landlady he plans on going to university next semester. Medical school? Didn't say. Steele's 24, married, couple of kids, lives in Arvada, has a filling station job when he isn't here. He's trying to buy a house. Uh, Servi, nothing. Lives in the boarding house, works with weights. Cargo's over at the gym talking to people. Mm. Well, what about the others? Yeah, I'm waiting for a phone call now. Okay. Look, uh, tell him to keep on that anatomy angle. I think it's the best. Right. Come on, man. Anything more, Lieutenant? No, we'll call you if anything comes up, Mr. Galon. All right, you have my number. Hi. Yes. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Mind if we sit down? No, no. <laughs> well, it's 3.30, Mr. Patrick. You've been here all day long. Uh, true. true. Got to get to my papers and my friends soon. <clears throat> way behind with all this commotion today. Well, we're all way behind, Mr. Patrick. Yeah, we didn't ask you to come here just to oh, eat. wait a minute. I remember why I'm here. Well, Mr. Patrick, you've seen all of the men who work here. Yes. Strong men, most of them. Some weak and doomed. You looked them over carefully? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We've been hoping you'd recognize one of them. Huh? You remember what you told us last night about the man you knew in the white jacket? Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Patchett? I'll pray for him. Well, have you seen the man we're looking for today? Yeah, must have. He works here. <clears throat> you don't remember him now, is that it? It's a hard thing you ask of me, to find one face in all these faces. Are you sure that's it? Would you know the face? I know the face, Lieutenant. Well? Ever since the face appeared, I've been wondering how to say this thing to you, Lieutenant Guthrie. You mean the man's here now, in this place? Oh, well, what'll happen to him? Will he be punished? He'll be examined. I can't say what'll happen after that. Tell us who he is, Mr. Patcher. Should I? You told us yourself he's acted against God's will and the law of nature. I think you should. Should I? If you believe what you say about the violation of these laws, Mr. Patchett. One man on the balcony. That is the face I saw with the pointed steel. Which one is he? By the water glasses. That's Ryan. Ray Ryan. Worked here a couple of months. Okay, I did right. Man. I did right. I, I, I didn't kill myself doing this. Patrick, come through? Yeah, take care of him. My man's up there. Okay. He's some witness. Yeah. Ryan? Huh? We'd like to talk to you, son. Huh? What about? We're police officers. Police officers? Yeah. You have a coat? We want you to come downtown with us. Well, why should I? I haven't done anything. You've been identified as the man who's been using a nice pick on several women in town. Oh, I, I read about that. Well, why, why would I do a thing like that? Don't you know? No, no, I don't. I don't know. Well, we'll talk it over downtown. Wait a minute. Now, wait, now, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, didn't, I don't have to go down there. Give me the pick, Ray. Don't come near me. Ben? Sure. A revolver's a much better weapon than an ice pick, Ray. I'll use it if I have to. Right here. Well? 
It is a better weapon. Your right wrist. Okay, come on. Don't you have to have some proof to take me into custody? We just said we had a witness. One of those girls saw my face? No, just someone who prays for you. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb. Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call out the Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Barbara Whiting, Junius Matthews, Virginia Gregg, Harry Lang, Herb Butterfield, and Sidney Miller. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. the best fun making from Arthur Godfrey's daytime shows on CBS Radio. That's what you hear every Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS Radio stations when King Arthur Godfrey and his round table holds court. Dan Coverly speaking, and remember... You enjoy Grand Central Station every Saturday in the daytime hours on the CBS Radio Network. you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Said she caught a cold today. That doesn't think she should come out in the night air. Uh, Want to know if she could come down tomorrow sometime. Uh, it's the third time she's had some excuse for not coming down. Uh, we can't hold that suspect forever. Hey, uh, you got a smoke on you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Tell me, why is it people will holler and yell for protection and law until they're blue in the face and... Then when they have a chance to do something about apprehending and convicting a criminal, they just can't get in the car and drive down to the police station and identify a suspect. Just can't do it. You tell me, Ben. How about Kiefer? Is he here? Who said he'd be here this morning? Well, he's late now. You want him to look at that 459 came in this afternoon on extradition? Yeah. 
So Rigo's the guy's name, number 34. He'll be in the last runoff. Uh, May I have Well, I better hold it down by the door in case he comes in. Okay, I'll see you. You can yeah. out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room. May I have your attention, please? Thank you, my name is Greb. Hi, Ben, what's up? I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the light. All right, boys, keep it moving right over to the end of the stage. That's it, come on. Now turn and face front hands to your sides. You, take your hands out of your pockets. Now step out to the circle when I call your name and number. When you answer my questions, talk up so the people in the back of the room can hear what you have to say. Okay, number one, William Yola, Grand Theft Auto. Where do you live, William? Here. In town. I live here. You got an address? Sure. Palmyra Street, 132 Palmyra Street. What's your business? Well, I work for Warner Gear, loading in the B&O yard. Anyone arrested with you, William? Yeah. Jim Barnes is in the next room. I seen him when I came up. Jim Barnes, number uh, 16. Any weapons, William? No. Sergeant Grab. Yes. Ask him to say, fill it up and check the oil. Okay. You hear him? Yeah. Well, say it. Fill it up and check the oil. Say it like you meant it, like you were in a filling station. I wish I was. Never mind that. Fill it up and check the oil. Okay, Sergeant, we'll want to see him. All right. Over on that side of the stage, William. Next, number two, Robert Dawson, failing to register. Tell us where you live, Robert. Here. Yeah, right here in the stinking jail. Before your arrest. A stinking jail upstate. The state penitentiary? Yeah. Where'd you fall from? Uh, Vada County, 1949, burglar. How long you been out? Three days. Don't look at me. Look out there. Anyone arrested with you? Sylvia. She's my wife. Do you have a gun? No. Did she? No. Well, then we got an extra 32 automatic around the place. A nickel-plated one, Robert, and Ivor Johnson. You sure you didn't have it? Oh, sure, I'm sure. And your wife didn't have it either? No. You own a car? <laughs> Three days out, yes. Just but... answer it. No, no, I don't own a car. I ain't got a gun. I ain't got nothing. I ain't done nothing. Why, you got me up here in this lineup anyway. I'd... Failing to register for one oh, thing. Oh, so I'll register. Bring out your little green book and I'll register a couple of times if you want me to. But why all this? Besides the gun, the officers found the jimmy, a pinch bar, a glass cutter, screen cutter, and a lock jam, all in your possession at the time of your arrest. That's why. <laughs> What's that prove? Nothing. Well, you did a little time for second story. Second story work well, once? Hmm? I now, tell us what are you supposed to say, Rob. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, my victim okay, shows take care of him. Here's the sheet. Okay, right, man. Okay, I'm in Walter's office. Answer the question. Okay. If you haven't done anything, you haven't got anything that we want. Two eighty six A at Downing and Seven. See the man. Seventy three. A three fifteen to see. Come in. Oh, hi, Ben. Come on in. Hi. Uh, this is uh, George McCadden, Lieutenant Guthrie. How do you do? How do you do? Hey, grab some chairs, boy. About six months ago, Mr. McCadden met a girl named Vivian Harmon, hostess at a restaurant over on Fifth, Downing. Yeah, I know the place. Well, I'm in the advertising business. My office is in the Park Norton building right across the street. Suppose you tell Lieutenant Guthrie what you told me. All right. I think something's happened to Vivian. Uh, start at the beginning, please. Oh. Well, uh, Vivian is a pretty girl and always very pleasant and nice. I began seeing her now and then. We've had dinner and we went to a few shows together. She lived by herself in a little apartment over on Maragani Street. A couple of months ago, I went over there to pick her up and an older woman answered the door. A Mrs. Kennevock. She said she was Vivian's mother. When Vivian came into the room, there was quite a scene. 
Mrs. Kennebunk was pretty upset about Vivian going out with me and kept repeating that Vivian was a married woman. Well, when we got outside, Vivian told me that she had been married once, but it hadn't worked out, and she'd been divorced more than a year. The guy's name was Bob Harmon. He lives in New Orleans now. She said her mother had tried to talk her out of divorcing this guy and never really accepted the fact that the marriage didn't exist anymore. Well, it seems her mother was going to live with her at the apartment from then on. When I brought Vivian home that night, the old lady was waiting up, and she had some pretty strong things to say, accusing Vivian of all sorts of things and ordered me to get out and never come back. She hit Vivian in the mouth and cut her lip before it was all over with. Well, after that, I wouldn't go to the apartment to pick up Viv. I met her downtown or someplace else. She quit at the restaurant and got a job in a defense plant. She wanted some more money so she could buy herself a car. Well, I was out with Viv two weeks ago. We went to a movie. My phone was ringing when I got home. It was Mrs. Kenova telling me that I'd never see Vivian again. And she was pretty mad. She said she knew that I'd been meeting Viv all this time. Now, how old is Vivian? 27, Lieutenant. Sure old enough to do what she wants, don't you think? Yeah. Go on. Well, Viv didn't call me the next day or the next. And I finally took a chance and called the apartment. I called three days. I didn't get an answer. So I drove by a couple of times and saw Viv's car in the garage. You didn't want to go up to the apartment on account of Mrs. Kennebec, huh? That's right. I didn't want to stir up things. But I did want to see Viv. Well, couldn't you call her at work? Oh, I tried to get her, but uh, I got the personnel office. And I was surprised when they told me she was taking an extended leave of absence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what else did they say? Well, that's all the information they gave me. It didn't seem right, and I, I worried about it a lot. Because I like Viv. Uh, you mean it seemed funny that she'd do this without telling you, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So I finally just went out to the apartment and camped on the doorstep until the old woman showed up. She told me that Vivian was out of town on a vacation. And she didn't know where, and she didn't know when she'd be back. She said there was no place I could write her either. Mm-hmm. And that's all the explanation you got? Yeah. And I thought about it a lot before I came down here. Well, what do you mean, Mr. McCann? Well, Viv told me that her mother had been beating her up all her life, since she was 13 or 14, and always accusing her of things. She said she married this Harmon guy just to get away from home. Well, I tried to get Viv to kick the old lady out or move away herself. I even offered to help her out financially, but she wouldn't listen to that. It was a lousy situation for a nice kid like that to be in. The old lady just couldn't do anything but complain. Well, um, do you think that something violent might have happened between Vivian and her mother, Mr. McCadden? That's exactly it. Now, if Viv was taking any kind of a trip, going anywhere, I'm sure she'd have told me. And I'm sure she'd have taken that little old 47 Ford with her. Now, what makes you say that? Well, she was crazy about that little car. She used to get out every Saturday and polish it up and take care of it and look after it. She didn't have any money for a train ticket or a plane ticket. Viv lived it pretty close to the bone. Mm-hmm. And the car's still there. Still there in the garage. You say you saw her last two weeks ago, huh? Two weeks ago, Tuesday. The night the old lady called me up and told me I'd never see her again. Now, this may be nothing. I, I might be yakking for no reason at all. But I'm worried sick. I think that old lady'd kill Vivian. If she had half a chance. <laughs> Seventy-two. Seems like spring instead of winter. Mm-hmm. Cold last night, though. Matt, come in here. Yeah? Yes, in your office. Okay. Anything from Murph or Crockett yet? Yeah, I'm still out to the fence plant. I'll let you know. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hey, we're going to have to get a new hot plate, Ben. It took me an hour to make up a pot. Mm-hmm. Any uh, sugar left? Yeah. Here you go. Oh, thanks. Did you let go of that McCadden complaint? Yep. Nasher's out with Shelley checking on McCadden. Seems okay so far. Good family, good business, no trouble. Uh, how about the girl? Nothing down here on her. Klein said he'd stop by the restaurant and ask around. But they don't open till noon. I see. Uh, boy, I could stand a lot of this weather. Yeah, me too. Hey, you got a match? Yeah, here, catch. Right. How about Mrs. Kenovac? Nothing on her either. Well, I'll have to wait and... Uh, Murph just phoned in from the defense plant. Or anything? Yeah, personnel told him Vivian Harmon's on an extended leave of absence. Did she give any reason? She didn't give anything. The mother called and told him Vivian had to leave town unexpectedly two weeks ago. Is 
Lieutenant Gosfish? That's right, Mr. Knovak. And this is Sergeant Graham. How do? What is, please? Well, we'd like to talk to you a few minutes, if you can spare the time, Mrs. Kennebec. I'm cleaning house. Is he important? Oh, well, we won't take too long. Come. I hate small apartments. Always so dirty is. Small places get this way. In Europa, I live in big house. Clean. Mm-hmm. Is uh, Vivian around today? Vivian? My daughter? Yes. Why you are here? Oh, just a routine check, Mrs. Kennebec. A friend of Vivian's complained that he tried to see her a couple of times, and when he talked to you, you told him Vivian had left town. He didn't think your information about it was very satisfactory. That McCabin man, George, he went to you. That's right. The people at the defense plant tell us you phoned them and said Vivian had left town rather suddenly. It's true. We'd like to know where she went, Mrs. Kennebec. Do not know that. That seems rather strange. She's your daughter. You live with her. Didn't she tell you where she was going? No. Well, did she tell you why she was leaving town? She talks to me little, Vivian does. She said it was job singing with band. Vivian always wanted to sing with band all her life. What band? What's the name of it? I do not know. Did she ever do that kind of work before? Once, when she was 19, she met her husband in band. Mr. Harmon, her ex-husband? Her husband... Well, they were divorced over a year ago, weren't they? Still her husband. She cannot change it. I see. Well, uh, when exactly did uh, Vivian leave town? It's two weeks now. Did she take a plane or a train? I do not know. A taxi picked her up early in the morning. She left in pretty much of a hurry, didn't she? Yes. Has she written you? Yes, twice she has written. Uh, Do you have the letters here? No, I burned them. Never keep letters. Well, what did she say in the letters, Mrs. Kennebec? That she was well and happy and getting along good. Do you happen to remember where they were written from? Uh, oh, Phoenix and a New Mexico place. You say she's traveling with a band. Yes. When did these letters come? It was Saturday. Last Saturday. Both of them on the same day? Yes. Did she give you an address you could write back to? No. I tell you once before. Uh, yes, sir. Did you happen to notice if the letters were written on hotel stationery? No. I did not notice this. That George should not have come to you. No, he was worried about Vivian, Mrs. Kennebec. She's all right. No need to worry about Vivian. She is not his to worry about. She belongs to another man. You mean Robert Harmon? He's her husband. Mm-hmm. You, uh... You don't like Mr. McCadden much, do you? I not like. You no worry. She fine. I do not worry. Now you go. I finish my housework. Could we look at her room first? This is her room. Bed comes down out of the wall. Bathroom there. What about the closet where she kept her clothes? Same place where bed comes from. Well, do you mind if we look at that for a second? Well? I am citizen of this country. Is there law? Well, we'd just like to look at it, Mrs. Kennaway. See what clothes she took with her. We can get a search warrant. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Mr. Look. I show you. It's closet. See? Uh, yeah. These all her clothes? All mine. Look a little small for you, Mrs. Kennebec. Some are Vivian's. Now you go. Does she take many clothes with her, Mrs. Kennebec? Yes, she leaves some here. Well, all right, Mrs. Kennebec. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Goodbye. Oh, uh, if Vivian writes to you again, would you mind letting us know, please? Why? I'd just like to know where she is, what town. All right. You go now. Here. Here's my card. Just call me there. All right. Goodbye. Bye. She's lovely. Truly lovely. Yeah. Uh. Ash and I went over the car. Yeah? Brand new shovel in the back. Stick around it from a hardware store downtown. Some mud on the end. We took samples for the crime lab. Oh? Huh? Yeah, there was dried blood on the floor mat.
The time, February 1st, 1945. The place, a battlefield in Western Europe. An American infantry company was crossing a stretch of open ground in a night attack on Hecosite. Suddenly, the group was pinned down by a vicious burst of machine gun fire from a house on the outskirts of town. Private Edward A. Bennett started to crawl toward the edge of the field in order to flank the house. Even though a machine gunner spotted him and tried to cut him down, Bennett managed to reach the protection of a few trees. Under the cover of the trees, he worked his way to the rear of the building which harbored the gunners. Disposing of the sentry with his trench knife, the young infantryman charged into the darkened house. There he was set upon by seven men. In a furious hand-to-hand battle, he silenced all of them. Now his company could move on and sweep all resistance from the town. The fearless initiative and stalwart combat ability of Edward A. Bennett brought him the Medal of Honor. Edward Bennett, who asked not what his country could do for him, but what he could do for his country. Gonzalez is staying there to keep an eye on it today, and Murph and Crockett will take over at four. Now, look, uh, I'll need four more men. Yeah. Well, all right. Uh, we're at the post office substation now. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. Waldo's sending some men out to question Harmon. Rock and Abbott are checking into the musicians' union and booking agencies around town to see about the band. Well, look, it's almost two, Ben. That mail carrier should be in by now. Yeah. He said he'd have him wait for us. Good. How long are they going to take at the crime lab? Well, they should have something in an hour. Uh, this is it here. Okay, get my back right. Oh, are you the two policemen looking for me? Uh, I'm James Henry. That's right. My name's Guthrie. This is Sergeant Graham. Oh, I'm pleased to know you. Well, I hope you can help us on this. The postmaster tells us that you handled the route on the 900 block on Maragani Street. Oh, yes. I've been carrying there for about 18 years. What's that? I'm just checking. You know an apartment building at 910? Oh. Oh, the Sherwood. Yes. Yeah. Well, what about that? Well, a woman by the name of Kenovac lives there. Has a daughter named Vivian Harmon. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mrs. Kenovac tells us that she had a couple of letters last Saturday. One from Phoenix, another from New Mexico. Do you happen to remember delivering them? Well, offhand, no. Are you sure you know the place? Oh, yes, yes. It's a big two-story job. It's kind of a court affair. All the boxes are set in front in a little sort of a uh, ante room. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't even recognize those names you gave me. I, and I remember names of the people on my route, too. Or well, haven't you ever delivered mail to Mrs. Kennebec before? Well, not that I know of. How about uh, Vivian Harmon? No, no, hurry. Let's see, there's 16 units in that building. Now, offhand, I could name 14 families there that I deliver mail to. <laughs> you see, I got a pretty good memory. Well, then you're sure you didn't deliver two letters there last Saturday? Oh, I'm positive. Hmm. Well, maybe Friday or Thursday, something like that. Now, Lieutenant, I've never delivered mail to either one of those names. I just, I'm sure. Uh, how long they lived there? Oh, over a year, I guess. No, no, I never delivered it. Well, what's up? Is there anything wrong? Uh, just check it. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Oh, sure. I'm glad to help you. Ah, uh, hey. Yeah? A uh, special delivery might be able to help you. They might have taken something out there. Of course, I wouldn't be able to tell you about that. We already checked them. They haven't made a delivery to that apartment house in four weeks. <laughs> picked up a band here in town. I went on the road with him the last month. He did his own booking. He didn't tell the union about it. Oh? Anything else? Well, it'll take a while on the trains, the planes, and the buses. Cab company's being checked, too. Mm-hmm. Asher and I worked a building all day long. Only three people in the place who know Vivian and her mother. The Mrs. Desmond lives right below them. Didn't have much to say. Didn't even notice Vivian hadn't been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Man who lives across the hall's hard of hearing, so he wasn't much help either. Manager Merton Blackler is waiting in your office. Oh? Yeah, he had quite a bit to say when we talked to him. I thought you'd want to see him. Sure. Was the mat knocked off? Yeah, he's in the crime lab working with Sam. Oh. 
Uh, Mr. Blackler, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Hi, you. Uh, hello, Mr. Blackler. Sergeant Quine tells me you might be able to help us. Well, I don't know about that. I hope so. Uh, Mr. Blackler's around the apartment house all the time, Lieutenant. He thinks he saw Mrs. Konovac put something in the backseat of the Ford one night. No? Yeah, last Wednesday night. It was very late, and I was just about to go to bed when I saw her outside my window. Uh, Mr. Blackler says it looked like a rug or something. Isn't that right? Yeah, uh... As a matter of fact, I got thinking about it the next day, and I went up to the apartment, and sure enough, the living room rug was gone. I asked Mrs. Kennevac about it when I saw her again, and she said she'd just taken it out to be clean. Well, the rug was there when I saw the place this morning. It was funny she'd take it herself, huh? That time of night, too. Yeah. Mr. Blackler, do you happen to know what time Mrs. Kennevac came back that night? Oh, gosh, I, I went right to sleep. But I know she was back bright and early the next morning. Well, how do you know that? Well... I get up early to empty the garbage cans and sweep the halls. And she was in front of her place with a mop. I guess she spilled something or was cleaning it up. Did you see what it was? No. Funny thing her doing that. Why? Why, that's my job, Lieutenant. It came in ten minutes ago. Good. Hardware store man remembers selling the shovel. His description fits Mrs. Kennevac. Car still there? On his way in. Well, Matt's going from the lab. He's waiting for you in the garage. Blood stains on the floor mat checked out. About two to three weeks old, according to the doc. Uh -huh. Says the dirt on the shovel could have come from anywhere around. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Guthrie's off. Well, yeah. yeah just a minute. Mrs. Kennevac on the phone, then. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Yeah, yes. Yes, Miss Kennebec. When? I say, well, I, I'd like to see them if I may. Well, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Hmm. What now? She says she got another letter from Vivian in this afternoon's mail. See the letter, please. Read if you want. No. She's in Tucson, huh? Eh? In Arizona, yes. Uh, do you have the envelope that came in, Mrs. Kennevac? Throw it away. Just the letter. Go ahead, read. I do not mind. All right. Uh-huh. Here, Matt. Thanks. You see? The session's all right. Everything's fine. Yeah. But she doesn't give an address, Mrs. Kennevac. Just Tucson is enough, huh? It's fine. Did you write this letter, Mrs. Kennevac? Huh? No. Vivian, she writes it. We talked with your postman after he finished today's deliveries. This letter couldn't have come today. It did? It came in this afternoon mail? There is no afternoon mail. I tell you, it came in this mail. The postman told us he's never delivered any mail to you at this address. I get letters from Vivian like I tell you. Would you mind writing your name for us? Why? Just to compare your handwriting with the handwriting in this letter. I not write for you. I show you a letter. Now you go. We'd like to ask you about the shovel in the car. In Vivian's car? Mm-hmm. I understand you bought the shovel last Wednesday afternoon at the Central Hardware Store. I did not tell you that. Well, we looked into it. That was the day Vivian left town with the band, wasn't it? Yes. What did you use the shovel for, Mrs. Kennebank? Where were you digging? There were blood stains in the car. Were they Vivian's? This is a warrant for your arrest. Arrest? On suspicion of murder. She was not a good girl. All my life I tell her to stay away from men who will harm her. But she not believe me. She not respect her mother. When she marries, she marry a man who love her. But she not love him. It's not right for a girl to marry a man then leave him. He's still married. Has no right to see other men. This all I tell her. Where is she? I take you where I bury her. I take you myself. I bury her deep. Very deep so I can forget her. 
so deep that I can forget her forever. Yeah. Want to get your coat? I have it. All right. I hate small place. Always get so dirty. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief. The Murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? Right, thank you, sir. You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Uh, thank you. My name is Greb. Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identification, Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. They deserve a good audience. Uh, are we uh, still going to play Tuesday? Yeah, as far as I know. Your house? Yeah. Now, uh, look, uh, this time, let's settle on a limit and stick to it, huh? Yeah, it starts getting out of hand. Yeah, it know. sure does, and it's that stupid partner of yours, that stupid Irish luck. <laughs> he gets real courageous when he wins a few bucks. Diamond Jim Grab. You think he's been taking grab? No, I'm kidding. Let's stay away from some of those wild things he gets on. Low ball with Jack Swild. Oh, uh, what is that, really? Oh, now, come on. Oh, well, it's almost that bad. He had something wild and low. Oh, he didn't play it. He was just kidding. With my money, he was kidding. <laughs> May I have your attention, please? <laughs> you people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room. May I have your attention, please? Okay, I'll see you later. Right. Bye. Thank you. My name is Greb. Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Okay, bring on the line. All right, boys, come on, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn and face front. Hands to your sides. Look straight ahead. When I call your name and number, step out and talk up. It's a big room, so let the people in the back hear you. All right, number one, Jules Simpson, robbery. You always wear glasses, Jules? Well, no, not always. Uh, I go to bed at night. I don't wear them, man. <laughs> well, that's real bright of you. Take them off. Well, I can't see. You could see pretty good the night of the 23rd. Night of the 23rd? Well, I had the glasses on then all night. Take them off. Okay. Don't look at me. Look at the audience. Well, I can't look at nothing. I can't see. Pretend you can. Face front. Okay. Where do you live? 
446 North River Street. Well, is that a house, a hotel, or what? Or what? What? Well, it's supposed to be a hotel, but I just wouldn't swear to that. It's been called a lot of things. Where do you work? Well, I ain't been. For how long? Well, a year, maybe. How do you pay your rent? Who says I did? The manager of the hotel? He says you paid your rent. Well, not regularly. Well, he says that too, but he says you paid it. Well, I've been getting compensation. From what? Well, I worked a year ago. Oh, I had lots of jobs. I made enough to get a social security number. Five to three to me, 70, 57. You ever can? What kind of a car were you driving when you were picked up? Well, it was a Buick, you see, man. What color? Well, I just don't remember that. Where'd you get it? Well, I borrowed it. Who'd you borrow it from? Well, I just don't remember that, either. Your memory's weaker than your eyes. Well, I guess it is. Have any weapons on you? Oh, no, no. The arresting officer found a thirty-two automatic in the glove compartment. Well, it's not mine. Oh, the guy who owned the car, he must have put it there. I'm clean on that hat. Okay, step back. Oh, well, can I put my glasses on? Put them on. Oh, yes, the guy could break a leg up here. He sure could. Now, step back. Okay, number two, John Stillman. Where do you live, John? East side. Chalk up. East side. And your people hear him out there? Oh, I told you when you walked out here to talk up. Now, come on, do it. You scare me. East side. I don't want to scare you, John. Just tell the people what you do. I'm not working. Did you ever? Well, sure, sometimes when I was a kid. Not much future in it. You arrested with anybody? Oh, just Bob and Trav. Bob and Travis Stillman, number three and four. Any weapons? 38 Cole Automatic, 38 Smith and Wesson revolver, two rifles, one single shot, and a 30-30. Going hunting? That's a funny remark. Hold your head up. Sure. Take your hands out of your pockets. Okay, okay. Now. Now, where do you live? I told you. Where are on the east side? 78... 108th Street. Step back. There you father. What? Nothing. Number three, Travis Stillman. Come on, Trav. Come on, come on. Move it. I'm tired. Yeah, you're looking. Where do you live? Same place as John. 78, 108th Street? I said, Bob don't live with us, though. He's married. I'll ask Bob. Okay. Tell the people when you were arrested. Now, where you were arrested? In the alley. In an alley where? Uh, I was in a crate. A uh, patent crate. What were you doing in there? Trying to give me an arson. <laughs> <laughs> what are you wearing? Yeah, oh, so there now. Okay. Well, John isn't working anywhere. That's what I mean. How old are you? I should got a call from Mr. Ralph Fisher, manager of the Parkway Hotel in Lexington. How much, eh? Yeah. Found the body of one of his tenants stuffed in the trunk in the basement. Over here, Ben. How long you been here? Oh, about ten minutes. Hello, boys. Hi, Doc. Just with a minor examination, I'd say she'd been dead about a week. In the trunk? Yeah, looks like strangulation. It's a little hard to tell right now, but I'll do an autopsy as soon as we get her downtown. Okay, I'll see you down there. Right. Okay, boys, clear it up. Where's the manager? In his room. Name's Fisher. Let's go talk to him. We haven't had one in the trunk in a long time. Any identification? One of the tenants. Fisher said her name was Green. Look with her husband. Where's her husband? This way. Can't locate the husband. They left in 311, but the husband hasn't shown up. Fisher says he hasn't seen him for about a week. This is it. The woman's been dead about a week. You got somebody looking over 311? Yeah, our cargo's up there. We talked with Fisher, saw the body, and cargo went up to... Who? Oh, Come in. Oh, Mr. Fisher, this is uh, Tom Guthrie. How's he do? How are you, Mr. Fisher? Sit down. Sit down, please. Thank you. 
I understand the woman was one of your tenants. Yes. Uh, can I get you something? Some coffee or something? No, no, no thank you. Pardon me, thanks. It's turning cold out. I put some coffee on the boil. Yes, uh, the woman is Mrs. Green. She lives... Uh, maybe I should say lived in 311. With her husband? Uh, Mr. Green, yes. He hasn't been around for about a week. I'll bet he did it. Uh, with both of them gone for a week, didn't you miss him? When Green left, he said he and his wife were planning a short trip. I didn't think anything until I opened that trunk. Boy, that was the most awful thing I've ever seen. I'll think about that the rest of my life. Did the Greens argue much? Not too much. They had a couple of good ones, but who don't? Wait till my wife gets home. She never did like Green. Told me I should get rid of them. Why'd she want that? She didn't like them. Green told her to mind her business one day, and she didn't like him after that. Not much reason, though. Between you and me, I wish more people would tell my wife to mind her business. Uh, what do you know about the Greens? Uh, where'd they come from? Well, they told me Kansas City. Missouri? Missouri? Oh, yeah, there's a Kansas City. Kansas, isn't it? No, they didn't tell me which, just Kansas City. Hmm. And what was his first name? Joe. Hers was Louise. What day did he leave? Um, six days, uh, about uh, Tuesday, I think. Gotta make sure. Well, I'm pretty sure it was Tuesday. Mm. How long have they left him? About three months. What did Joe Green do? Well, I don't know. He paid his rent. I never asked him what he did. We weren't very friendly. Didn't go out much. We want a good description. Oh, I can give you that. You know, I never thought I'd get mixed up in nothing like this. You read about things like this, but you never think you're going to get mixed up in them. Oh, the coffee is boiling over. Excuse me. Sure. What do you think, Ben? Uh, I don't know. Her husband? Sure looks like it. If it isn't, he better have a good story. Somebody killed a woman and stuffed her in a trunk. Yeah, I heard. Everybody's making coffee. I was getting tired. You want some? Yeah, I'll take a cup. Any uh, suspects? Well, the husband. He disappeared about the same time the woman was killed. The manager gave us a pretty good description. The lab boys got some clear prints from the room. We're running a check on him now. Strong, isn't it? Well, it probably is. I didn't measure. Got any identifications on the Stillman boys? Six. Oh, great. Had a little trouble, too. You missed a good show. Bob Stillman got sore at his kid brother. We nearly had a family fight on the stage. Oh, you made better coffee. <clears throat> yeah. Bob Stillman's close. I think maybe he's going to tell us all about it. You need me? He likes you. Okay, we'll be down. Can I come? Yeah. Hey, maybe you should bring some of that coffee. Huh? You could give it to Stillman. One swallow of that stuff and you confess to anything. You're sure getting grouchy in your old age. Well, you'd think after being married 11 years, you'd at least have learned how to make a good cup of coffee. Molly's neglected my education. Oh, now, don't blame your faults on that, sweet little girl. Ah, you're prejudiced because you teach. <laughs> Say, uh, what about the woman in the trunk? How long? Well, Dave says about a week. He's doing an autopsy now. I hope the lab comes up with something on those prints. Where'd you go, then? To a bar. What bar? Oh, hello, Ben. Hi. I'm tired. Let me get some sleep. Hello, Bob. Hello. You're tired, eh, Bob? Who's that? Guthrie. Oh. I'm real tired, Lieutenant. Can't I rest for a while? You know, my case, Bob. I have to ask Quine. I've been asking him for the last hour. He won't tell me who else was in on the apprentice job. Oh, you know who else was in on it. Work on Trav and John. Mm. He's just blaming on Bob here. Hey, you nuts. You're just trying to work us. Look, Bob, six witnesses identified the three of you. For Pete's sake, lay off. I don't care if six dozen people identified us. I'm just tired. Bob. Yeah? Ben. Yeah, what is it? Sorry, but it's important. Oh, look, okay. Bob. If you're smart and you're acting that way, you better see We, uh, got a report on those prints from Green's room. 
You know who Green is? Benny Kirk. Holy. Oh, got an FBI kickback on him. They're really interesting. Oh, they should be. They're at Kirk number one. I'd like to nab him. Oh, who wouldn't? What about the woman? His wife, all right. They were married in Covington, Kentucky in 1938. She's got a minor record. Got an APB? A few minutes ago. Well, wait for me. I'll be right out. Don't believe a word of what you say, Bob. We know what you were doing. Then why keep asking? I've got to work on this 411 crime. I won't be able to stick around. Okay, Bob. Now, look, Bob. Take my advice. You're going to save yourself a lot of trouble if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Benny Kirk, Bob? I heard of him. Who hasn't? Yeah. He's the number one boy in your world. He just did a sloppy job of killing his wife. Kirk? Yeah, kickback. He stuffed her in the trunk and skipped. So what's that got to do with me? You're 28, aren't you? That's right. When Kirk was 28, he was probably a lot like you. About the same record. He's only around 33 now. Hey, look, what's this all about? Think about it, Bob. Now he's killed somebody. And I'll lay you eight to five, he's dead inside of a year. <laughs> If you catch him. We will. Think about it. Come on, man. Can't see over them, man. Look around the corner. <laughs> okay, base is high. Uh, nickel. Uh, here, Matt, uh, give me five whites. Five? Uh, four. <laughs> That's the way he wins. <laughs> wins? <laughs> you ready for him? Well, come on, come on. Throw one in. Okay, okay. Uh, six. Eight. A pair. Yeah, bet him. Little three. It's about time. Eight. Two bits. By me. You in, Quine? Uh, no. Everybody in? Run them. Three, seven, possible straight. Hmm. Ace. Oh, oh, again. oh, come on, come on, come on. You've seen aces before. Yeah, all night. Well, you're not in. What are you beefing about? I'm beefing, too. Yeah? Two bits. Everybody? Getting to be a matter of pride. Well, if you're so proud, why don't you raise me? Sit down. Oh, proud. Sure. Not stupid. Come on, run them. Everybody then? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Fine. Okay. Three. Three. Fair. Yeah. Nine, still possible. Yeah. Four. And a king. Okay. Fair. I was fugitive. What? Authorities in West Virginia holding Benny Kirk. They got him? They're sending him up. He'll be on tomorrow's train. Hey, yeah, that's a feather in our cap. We get the prosecutor. I'm betting a half. Any confession? No, they didn't say. Come on, come on, come on. A half, a half. You're sure proud of those two aces. They're worth a half. I'm out. Well, how about you, Dave? Oh, raise your half. That's oh. gone. Dave beat his brains out. Anybody want some beer? Yeah. yeah. How about you, Clint? Huh? Yeah, I'll have Pay your money okay. if you want to look. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll have one, Ben. Uh, let me see... You're 50 and 50 more. Oh, no. You think you're going to make us believe. I'm not trying to make you numbheads believe anything. (laughs) He's bluffing. Well? Well, what? Okay, if I take my time? He's bluffing. Well, why don't you call him? Oh, you you got to call him. No. What are you out of your mind? (laughs) Thank you, boys. Thank you. Did you have him? He didn't call. Come on, let's see your whole thing. Ah, no, 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 you mustn't speak. No, no. He was bluffing. Okay, deal me in. Uh, Will you look at that stack? (laughs) Uh, All right, now, uh, this is going to be low ball. Anything wild? Mm. One-eyed Jack. I know it. (laughs) What's the matter with Jack's? Thank you. 
It's nearly three. Yeah. Well, here comes the station agent. Well, she's coming in the yards now. Oh, thanks. Uh, you can go down this way. Pretty lucky for this late in the year. Good football weather. Huh, this ramp. You um, picking up anybody special? Benny Kirk. Hmm, Benny Kirk. That's special. Who got him? A rookie in Elkins, West Virginia. <laughs> Doesn't it figure? Guy like Kirk beats the best of them for years, and he gets careless, and a rookie kicks him out. Oh, I don't know. It's the conductor. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Police? Ben. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey. Yeah, what's wrong? Judy. The officer who was with Kirk is hurt. Kirk got away. Jumped off the train about 100 yards back. Uh, hey, where the officers come. Uh, where's the officer? In this coach right here in B. He needs a doctor. Well, I'll give him. It's all right. Say, Kirk jumped? Uh-huh. About 100 yards back. He was hurt, too. They must have had uh, Matt, put out a call. Surround the yards. All right, Ben. Can I do something? Yeah. Go stay with the officer. You going after Kirk? Yeah. Who slugged you? Some guy. You're looking for him. Tall guy. Had two guns. I'm looking for him. I'm a police officer. You better sit down. Uh, yeah. Oh, he sure bell at me. Look at all that blood. Now, which way did he go? Into the roundhouse over there. He was hurt. I just ran into him, and he slugged me when I asked him what he was doing. Okay, you you better take it easy now. I better get to a doctor. I'm getting dizzy. There'll be some men along in a minute. I better get to a doctor right away. I, I haven't felt it good, but never this good. Maybe I got a fracture. Well, you take it easy. I've got to get in that roundhouse. Well, watch yourself. He's hurt and he's mean. I'm just lucky he didn't shoot me. Okay, you take it easy. Uh, yeah. You better take it easy, too. He's got two guns. Anyway, I do it my way. 
If I can get Joe or any of that stinking cop to fuck in his chest. You're not even warm. You gotta come back to get me. You're gonna cross a lot of open ground. Go on, shoot the hell off. You won't pick me out. Kurt, there'll be enough guns in here in a minute. Blow up my sock, go on. I got three feet of concrete in front of me. Go on, bring it to I got six more left. You hear me, you stupid pig? I got six more left. I'm saying for you or anybody else. Then keep down. Where is he? On the other side. I can't spot him. Uh, there's a lot of ground between. Yeah, and he likes it. He's hurt and he wants to shoot it out. Ben, keep your head down. Yeah. What is it? Where is he? On the other side. If you come over, do it on your face. Ben. Yeah. Couldn't, uh, couldn't somebody get down that side? Well, how? Keep him busy. He says he's behind three feet of concrete. It's your guess. Get it. Uh, Why? Yeah, man. Bring a gas gun. Right. Bring a couple. Wait. Kirk? Come on out with your hands up, or we'll gas you out. Well, I guess he's not worried about it. Yeah. Here here they come. Here they come, Spotter? No. It's over there someplace. That's a big area. We got six shells. Well, then start dropping them over there. All right. Four bits, I find it. You got a bet. I'll take that side from the center track. Okay. Kirk! I'll give you one more chance. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Give it to him. the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb. Sergeant Matt Greb, I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. 
I'll call off the numbers and name charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoners that I call. Starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Howard McNear, Peter Leeds, Clayton Post, Dave Young, Sidney Miller, and Herb Butterfield. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Give it to you? Kid. Yeah. That's kind of nice. Got somebody in the line? Uh-uh. I thought I'd say our cargo is making out. How many do you have? Fifteen. Glad to see cargo get the chance. Been with you a long time. Yeah? Twelve years now. You really think my tie's loud? Hmm? May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you are sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him help. The officers who took your name will assist you. They are seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back in their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. All right, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn and face front. Hands at your side. Now, when I call your number, step out and talk up. It's a big room out there, and I want everybody to hear you. All right, number one, Louis Briskin, drunk and disorderly. Where do you live, Louis? 1608, what is it? You'll have to speak up, Louis. I got a talk to You can talk up louder than that. Repeat your address. 160847. Where do you work? I shot an upholstery shop in my own business. You caused a little trouble in your upholstery shop, Louis? Yeah. You beat up a customer. Got nasty. You beat up everybody to get nasty? You asked the fire, the shop was closed. You always close the fire? I close when I feel like it. I own the shop, I close when I want to close. I close. Had a couple of drinks, and this guy comes in to get his lousy love seat. Why did he get nasty? He said I put the wrong fabric on it or something. I say he's crazy. He said he ordered something else. I say he didn't. You know how those things get started. What did you hit him with? The love seat. <laughs> All right, Lloyd, step back. You know, the fabric he said he didn't order was better than the stuff he said he did. Step back, Lloyd. Okay. Number two, John Spat. Robbery. What do you live, John? Uh, 67 West, 157th Street. What do you do? I shine shoes and a stand. How old are you? I'm 32. Anybody arrested with you? Yeah. Fellow back. Uh, number seven, William Carpenter. Well, I don't know. I just told me Bill. I only met him yesterday. Any weapons? Yeah. Well, what were they? Two guns. Yeah. Pistols, rifles, shotguns. Oh, mine was a 38. Oh, come on now, John. Give us a whole description. Well, mine was a 38. Boom, deal, 38. Mendel Park, huh? Yeah, 670 East Reeves. Man called Lynn Bellows. Said his sister was a victim. Well, how bad is she? Said she was dead. Uh, Hello, 
Fine. Hi, Ben. Yeah, what are you looking for? Cartridge. Shot it through the window. Thought I might find it out here. Who's inside? The brother and Crockett. All right, keep looking. I will. Instantly, bullet entered behind the left ear. Uh, where's the brother? In the other room. Let's take a look around, Coin. Right. Brother's really taking it tough. Uh-huh. Mr. Bellows? This is Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh. Yes. Hello. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you think you can answer them right now. Well, I guess I can, and i kind of numb, kind of stunned. One minute you talk to somebody you know, and, and that's the end of it. That's all. I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm so mixed up. I'd... Well, you can help by just telling us everything you know, everything you can remember. I don't know. I, I was just sitting there reading papers. Marge is out in the kitchen. She was, you know, one of those silly things. Marge and her girlfriend or something like that. I think they were shopping and something happened, you know, with the clerk. Well, it reminded me of a story, I guess. I, I said something that was funny. We laughed. Kind of silly because we were tired. You know how you do. Yeah. She's got a real... What were you going to say? I was going to say she's got a real wonderful laugh. But I'm sorry. Take your time. You got a cigarette, Lieutenant? Well, sure. Thanks. There's one. Thanks. Thanks, I... What was I talking about? Uh, your sister was in the kitchen. Oh, yes. You were laughing about something. That's what... She came into the room and sat down... I guess we laughed some more and started to talk. There was a shot. Not a loud one. I, I remember I didn't pay any attention to Marge. The window broke and it made me jump. I didn't look at her. I think I jumped up. Yeah. And I said something. I, I don't remember just what I said, but I turned to Marge. She was falling over. It happened so quick. You know, between the time you jump up and turn, she was still falling. I didn't get it. It wouldn't go in my head. She fell out of the chair on the floor, and I still just kind of stood there. I kind of knew what had happened, and I didn't. And I saw the blood. Oh, gosh, I, I don't remember too much. After that, I tried to do something. I called you. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, just a second, Clint. Do you know anybody who would want to kill your sister? No. You think about it. All right. Stay with him, Crockett. Sure. I don't know why. Corner, sir. Uh, hello, Sam. Evening, Ben. Found a slug. Oh. 22. Made it too flat and out to be much help. That's where it went in. Mm-hmm. Right in line with a woman. Went through the window, through her, and stuck. She must have died pretty quick. The slug ended right behind the left ear and passed through. Small slug. Well, I can't tell you much more until I get her downtown. Well, go in and take a look at her brother, will you? He's pretty shaken out in the casing there. 22. Oh, where? About 15 feet from the house by a hedge. All right. Let's go take a look. Just a spot over there. You can see where the was heading is right in line. Right over here. Uh huh. Slug was right here. It's a clear shot. Well, now all we need is the gun and the motor. Just gave me the rundown on this fellow's killing. Yeah, this is a tough one, Pete. Checked and checked. Yeah, that's what Asher was saying. Can't find a motive. How about the brother? 
It's possible, I guess. But I don't think so. No later. Just a slug in the casing. If we can find the gun, we can match the casing. Well, that should be easy. Only about 50,022s in the city. Mm, I said it was tough. You checked the neighborhood? Yeah, a couple of 22s, but they aren't it. Had the brother staked out for a week now. I swear he's not in. Uh, insurance? Yeah, he's got a policy, but she hasn't. All the friends and the neighbors say they were inseparable. Neither one was married. No family. Lived alone for about 15 years. What's he do? He works in a garage mechanic. Want some coffee? Yeah, yeah, I'd love some. Let's get out of this office. I'm getting a headache. Peanut butter? Well, haven't you ever had a hamburger with nuts on it? A nut burger? Sure, peanut butter does the same thing. <laughs> Just coffee for me, Jerry. You want onions on it, too? Sure, the work. Oh, no. No, these are great. I'll give you a bite. Huh? Don't do me any favors. Uh, give me some coffee, too. One peanut butter burger and two coffees. There's an order. Uh, give me two nickels, huh? I don't know if I got them. Here. Jerry. I only got one. Oh, yeah, nickel. Yeah, he's here. Sam, for you. Okay, thanks. Hey, Jerry, is this jukebox out of order? But the sign says, doesn't it? You sure you just didn't hang it there when you spotted Cogger coming? No, it's really out of order. <laughs> Hello, this is Gessing. Another shooting, Ben. Where? Corner Jefferson of Adams, 4673 Adams. Another woman. I'll be right over. There on the bench, I was just sitting there on that end. Yeah, nobody else? Well, not at first. No, not at first. The woman, when well, she came up later. Anybody else around? Well, I didn't see anybody. No, I'm just sitting on the bench, and this woman, that's all. Now, what time was it? Well, I don't know now. I don't see it was about 15 minutes ago, I guess. And from the time she was shot until the time the officers arrived, I guess. I guess it was just about 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Go on. Well, I must admit, I'm very nervous. Nothing like this has ever happened to me. I was just sitting there, not paying attention to her, of course. And and there you are. Somebody shoots you. There you are. You're sitting next to a dead woman. That's just a terrible thing to go through. And you didn't see anyone else? No, no, I didn't. I heard the shot. I saw her topple off the bench. Just toppled right over in her face. I didn't tire the shot and her falling together right away. And then when I saw the blood. Oh, my goodness, when I saw that blood, I knew. I crawled right under the bench. Now, here's the coroner. But the coroner... Oh, my goodness, the coroner. Hello, okay. Gert. I'll see you in a minute, Sam. Oh, I'll find something to do. Oh, my goodness, what kind of a remark was that? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you were waiting for a bus. Huh? Waiting for a bus? Well, cautious. I was sitting right on that end of the bench. Now, uh, where were you going? Well, I was going home. Where do you live, Mr. Why? Well, I, 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 5477 Adam. Now, uh, where were you tonight? Well, I was visiting a friend. Who? George. Uh, George Wells. He doesn't live far from here. You could ask him. He's just around that corner, and he's up about two blocks. It's 2347 Jefferson, and on the second floor. Check that, Asher. Right. Well, you don't think that I... No, sir. Just checking everything. Oh, gee, I should hope so. Well, you go and talk to George, and he'll tell you all about me. Such a terrible thing. I never been mixed up in anything like this. We'll have to ask you to come down to the station and sign a statement. Come down to the station? 
Oh, oh goodness, but I've got to get home. I, I have a mother at home, and she'll worry. Yes. Really? Hey, that's yes, Walt. <laughs> Take a look at this. Oh, oh that's a good one. 22 rifle. Now, where'd you find it? Right around the corner on Jefferson in the gutter. Look at this. Old breach has been blown apart. Oh, my goodness. Mr. Toomey. Yes? You said you heard the shot. Oh, yes, yes, I heard it. How loud was it? Loud? Bang! Very loud. That's an old rifle. It probably blew up right in this face. It must have. I found some blood leading away from the corner. Now, well, let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, keep him back here, will you please? Let him through. There's some of the blood. He could have shot it from here. Mm, this is where he did it. Look at the wall. Yeah, splattered. Now keep your light on the side, Walt. How far did you follow this blood? Just where I found the rifle. Hey, where? A couple of yards up. Right here, I marked it. Mm. And the blood crosses the street. Yeah, come on. There's some more. Hurt pretty bad. Now go up that way, Pete. Don't see any more. See? I can't find any more up this way. All right, go back. Yeah. Runs here. Think he got into a car? And that's what it looks like. Blood stops about four feet from the gutter. Well, he's hurt. We know that. We'll have Sam get a sample of this blood. Still pretty fresh. He'll get the type. He'll probably look for first aid. Put out on all points. Tell the newspapers and get some radio bulletins out so the private doctors will be on the lookout. They'd have to report a gunshot wound. Well, it won't necessarily look like a gunshot wound. Could tell him he was playing with a shotgun shell or, or anything. <laughs> are seeking a suspect who is believed to be responsible for the slaying of two women. A week ago, Miss Ethel Bellows was shot while sitting in the living room of her home, and early this evening, another woman, Mrs. Sophie Gillette, was killed in the same manner while she sat at a bus stop on Adams Drive. The police say the suspect used an old .22 rifle that exploded when he fired the it's shot that killed Mrs. Gillette. Uh, turn it down when you call it. Yeah, where the killer could. They can't possibly match those cases we found with what's left of that rifle. No, I didn't think they could. The crease is too damaged. Firing pin and ejection were blown to pieces. Mm. Mm. Gosling? My name is Leo Bishop. Uh, wait, uh, hold it a minute, please. Hey, uh, turn that thing off. I'm sorry, uh, what were you saying? Uh, my name is Dr. Bishop. Yes, doctor. I just heard a broadcast about a man you're looking for. Uh, yes, uh, but we don't know if it is a man. I think it is. You treat somebody? Yes. He said he'd left the gas on in his oven. It exploded in his face. I treated him some for some very serious cuts in the brain. Uh, you know him? Yes. I've had him as a patient before. Uh, what makes you think his story isn't straight? Uh, after he left and I heard the broadcast, I examined the swabs I cleaned his wounds with. There was gunpowder on them. Dr. Bishop? Yes. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. Come in. Uh, this is Sergeant Carter. Uh, how do you do? Hello, Doctor. Let's go into the other room, gentlemen. Say you've treated this man before? Yes. His name's Devers, Peter Devers. I checked his file while I was waiting for you. Sit down. Thank you. There was enough blood, so I got a smear for you. Well, that'll be a big help. You have the address on this, Peter Dealer? Yes, I wrote it down. Here, 658 North Bender. Oh. How many times have you treated him in the past? Oh, four or five, according to the record. Well, you know what we want him for, Doctor. Do you think he's capable of shooting two women? Well, I don't know him very well. I'll show you his case history, but it won't tell much. He's a nervous person, quiet but impatient. I've taken care of a few bad colds for him, and he has something the matter with his back. I can't find much, but it will work probably. Do you know what kind of work he does? Well, I asked him when he started complaining about his back, and he told me he was an accountant. Did he say where? Yes, the Enright Insurance Company on Madison. I have to have that information for my files. Well, and... Uh... You have no particular opinion on whether he could have committed these crimes? I'm a doctor, Lieutenant. 
I'll answer that question by saying I believe any one of us can commit a serious crime under the right conditions. What's he done? Is he in his room now? Well, I don't know. I thought I heard him come in, but it could have been Mr. and Mrs. Pyle. They live right over me. And Mr. Devers lives in the apartment next to the Piles, but I can hear him sometimes. And you think maybe he's in? Well, I thought I heard him, but I don't know. What's he done? Well, we'd just like to talk to him. Uh, he's in 206. Oh, I told you that. How long has Mr. Devers lived here? Oh, nearly six years. What kind of a person is he? Well, he's a nice person. He, he's been a very good tenant. He's quiet and doesn't go out at night much. Do you know whether he was out earlier this evening? Oh, yes. I know he went out, but I'm not sure whether or not he's come in yet. Has he got a car? Yes. Now, what in the world do you want him for? Well, we'll know better after we talk to him. Uh, show us where his car is, please. Well, certainly. The garage entrance is at the end of the hall. I'll just... Get something to put around me. I was just getting ready to go to bed. You better put something on warm. It's pretty cool. I'll just be a second. This guy sounds like an ideal citizen. You better go up and wait by his door. Yeah, right. All right. I got this heavy. Oh, where's the other officer? He went upstairs to wait. Oh, well, the garage is this way. Mr. Devers is really an awfully nice man. I don't know what in the world he could have done. Is he speeding? No, uh, which one is this car? Uh, the uh, gray one. The sedan? Yes. Does Mr. Devers have a stove in his apartment? Yes. You've been in all evening? Yes. Then you'd certainly hear an explosion from Mr. Devers' apartment. An explosion? Yeah, if his stove blew up. Oh, my, yes. His stove didn't blow up. I would have heard it. I think I'd better go up and see him. What's that on the seat of the car? Blood. <laughs> Some men, just in case. Yeah. Who is it? Dr. Bishop. Doctor? Oh, just a minute. I was just by. Who are you? Uh, we'd like to talk to you, Mr. Davis. You said you were Dr. Bishop. We're police officers, Mr. Davis. Police officers? Yeah, my name's Guthrie. This is Sergeant Cargan. But why did you say you were Dr. Bishop? I don't understand. Can we come in? Well, I'm not feeling very well. Yes, you had an accident, I understand. Yes, we'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind. Well, come on in. The place is a mess. I didn't even bother to clean up. I didn't feel well, so I laid down. The doctor said your stove blew up. Oh, well, it wasn't my stove. I was over at a friend's house. This evening? Yes. About what time, Mr. Davis? Earlier, I guess about 8. I don't know exactly. What's this all about? Do you live here alone? Yes? Who's the woman in the picture? My mother. She died ten years ago. Tell us about the accident. Well, like I told the doctor, the gas must have been on, and I struck a match. The stove exploded. I hope your friend wasn't hurt. Oh, no, no. You have to excuse me. It's a little hard to thank the doctor. He gave me some pills to stop the pain. You were hurt pretty badly. Oh, it's not so bad. Who was your friend? You mean where I was? Yeah. Oh, well, his name is Colin, Paul Collins. Where does he live? But what's this all about? 
What do you want with me? We'd just like to know where you were around 7.30 this evening. Well, I told you. You're sure you weren't on the corner of Jefferson and Adams? Jefferson and Adams? Did you know a Miss Bellows who lived... No. I haven't given you the address. Well, I don't know any Miss Bellows. How about a Mrs. Gillette? No. We found the rifle. Rifle? It matched the empty shell casing. Shell casing? You can identify shell casings as easily as bullets. We'll check with your friend, Paul Collins. Uh, wait a minute. There's no sense in going on with this. I don't know how to explain it. I shot both of them. Why? Well, can I answer you? I, I can't tell myself. I had the twenty-two, and I don't know. I, I thought about turning myself in before I did it, but I couldn't. You didn't know either of these women? No, I, I'd never even seen them before. I thought about doing it a lot. It was like I couldn't help myself. I shot a pigeon one time when I was a kid, a pet pigeon. I used to raise him. He was just sitting there looking down at me, and I shot him. My folks never found out about it. I burned him in the incinerator. Oh, it was like that. Look, I, I can't explain it to you, but I feel better now that it's over. You just had to kill these people. I couldn't help it. I I can't possibly explain how I felt. I, I just couldn't help it. Why women? I don't know. Well, you better come with us. Okay. I'll get a coat. Photograph of his mother. You know, she looks a little like an older edition of that first woman he killed. Miss Bell? Starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie is written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Conrad as Sergeant Pete Carter with Dave Young, Harry Lang, Howard McNear, Clayton Post, Jim Nusser, Vic Perrin, Parley Bear, Virginia Gregg, and Francis X. Bushman. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. <laughs> Just looking. Dull upstairs. Yeah, it's dull every place. Only got 15 in the line tonight. Huh? Well, say, uh, here your kid brother passed his final exam. Yeah. You're going to be pestered with quine. Let's see. What'd he put in for? Motors. Oh, I think I'll grab a seat. Okay, I'll see you later. May I have your attention, please? Uh, you people on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter. Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you'll see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner to the call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers, as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. All right, boys, move it to the end of the stage. Now turn and face front. Hands at your sides. Now, when I call your number, step out, look straight ahead, and talk up. Talk up loud enough so the people in the back of the room can hear you. Okay, number one, Harry Connors, robbery. Where do you live, Harry? 6514 Maryland Avenue, South. 
Where do you work? I don't. What was your last job? A stevedore. What? I was a stevedore, stevedore. Who'd you work for? The Black Star Shipping Company. How long ago was that? Oh, about two months ago. Louder, Harry. How long? Two months, two months. Why'd you quit? I had to. Why? Oh, bad back. Quit my back. Any weapons when you were arrested? Yeah, I had an automatic. What kind? Hey, Army 45. Who's it belong to? Hey, the Army. I guess the Army. Okay, step back. Number two, Peter Sanchez, assault. Where do you live, Pete? Me and my wife and kids. Where? Delaware Avenue. What number? Uh, 618 North. Why'd you hit him? Well, he's still my kid. I can hit him for a while. Answer the questions, Pete. Why'd you hit him? Cause it's not good. What'd you hit him with? My arm. What'd you have in your hand? A palm. Where'd you get it? From his mother. What was she doing with it? Well, she was going to hit him, too. Any other arrest, Pete? Yes, sir. What for? We're hitting his mother. <laughs> Lose your temper pretty easy, don't you, Pete? Well, only when I get mad. Okay, step back. Number three, George Donnan, drunk and disorderly. Step out. Where do you live, George? A427 West to Highland uh, 6th Street. Huh? Where do you work? Oh, I work for myself. Uh, sure. I'm sorry. Can I talk to you? Yeah, yeah sure. what kind of work? A plumbing contract. Where were you arrested? I don't remember. What do you remember? Yeah, what's up? Just got a call from Jones's pawn shop. There's a kid down there trying to pawn a $5,000 necklace. Hmm? How old a kid? Jones says he can't be more than 10. Go in the back way. Jones said it would be open. Okay. You are the police? Yeah, I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Asher. Where's the kid? That's him out there playing the piano. Mm. Uh, does he suspect anything? I don't think so. I told him I would have to wait for my wife before I could give him any money. He seemed to believe me. Hmm. He looks like a nice kid. Seems nice. But the necklace... You have it on you? Here. These are all perfect diamonds. The center one weighs one and three quarter carats. That's 2,000 right there. Mm. You stay here, Mr. Jones. Come on, Ashen. Let's have a talk with the boy. Right. Hello, son. Uh, hi. What's your name? Bobby. What's yours? Ben. What are you doing here, Bobby? Waiting for Mrs. Jones to come in so I can get my money. Your money? What for? I sold Mr. Jones a necklace. Where'd you get the necklace? Why do you want to know? Bobby, I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Asher. We're policemen. I didn't do anything. Uh, Bobby, where did you get the necklace? I found it at home. Why? Do you know who it belongs to? Yes, sir. It belongs to my mother. Does your mother know you have it? No, but she wouldn't mind if she did. Is your mother home now? No, I... Don't know where she is. Uh, what's your last name, Bobby? Mercer. Where do you live? 2116 Stamper Avenue. Do you have a phone there? Yeah, Park 90874. Asher, call his folks and let them know where he is and what happened to the necklace. There's nobody home. Only my little brother, and he's too small to answer the phone. Well, give it a try anyway, Dave. Right. Have you ever taken anything from your mother before? Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't have taken Mom's necklace, only I know I could get some money for it. Do you know how much the necklace is worth? Five dollars. Tell me, Bobby, uh, what do you want a lot of money for? I just want to get some food for me and Danny. That's your brother? Uh-huh. Mom wouldn't mind. She wouldn't? Mom would want us to have enough money to get something to eat. That's all you wanted the money for? Well, sure. Nobody home. Do you know where your mother and father are? No, sir. Well, maybe they're out looking for you and the necklace. Well, they're not looking for me. I'm looking for them. What do you mean, son? I haven't seen Mom or Dad for a long time. Well, is there someone watching after you while they're gone? No, Danny and me are all alone. He's been crying because he's hungry. You mean that your folks just up and left you two kids to just take care of yourselves? I guess so. We got up one morning and they're both gone. Well, how long ago was that? We all went to the movies last Saturday. That was the last time I saw them. They didn't leave you any money to buy food with? 
No, sir. I guess they had to stay away longer than we expected. That's why I don't think Ma would mind if I sold her necklace. Uh, where does your father work, Bobby? He sells used cars at Opportunity Corner downtown. Asher, got to check on the father. See if he's been around the car lot in the last week. Mm. Do you have a gun? Sure. Big one. Ever shoot anybody? What's your father's full name? Uh, same as mine. Bobby, I mean, uh, Robert Mercer. Is your brother all right at home alone? I don't know. I didn't want to leave him, but he was crying. I wanted to get something for him to eat. Well, when was the last time you had anything to eat? Yesterday morning. We had a candy bar. Well, where did you get it? Well, that's all right. It wasn't like stealing. Danny was hungry and so was I. Come on, Bobby. Let's go over to your house, huh? What about Mom's necklace? I sold it to Mr. Jones. Well, wouldn't you rather find your mother and father? Are you going to find them for me? I'll sure try. <laughs> Open a couple of windows. Yeah. And where's Danny? Up here. Well, let's go up and see him, huh? Sure. He must be asleep in crying. How many days have your folks been gone? Three, I think. Oh, I got a stomachache. All right, we'll get you something to eat as soon as we see Danny. In here. I guess he's asleep. Where's your phone, Bobby? Downstairs by the stairs. I took a look around downstairs. Call an ambulance. Is something wrong with Danny? Yeah, he's sick, Bobby. Oh, maybe it would be better if we got him right into the car. Yeah, it might be a good idea. We'll wrap that blanket around him. Oh, gosh, I guess it was my fault. You go along with Sergeant Asher, Bobby. Come on, Bobby. Well, where are we going? Oh, well, to take care of Danny and get you something to eat. Well, what if Mom comes back if she doesn't find us? Well, I'm going to stay here, Bobby. I'll tell her where you are if she comes back. Come on, Bobby. We've got to hurry. Okay. I'll check with the neighbors. Right. I'll call and tell them you're coming. Okay, then. Come on. You'll tell Mom, won't you? Sure, Bobby, sure. Emergency hospital, please. Hi. Ash, you get to the hospital yet? Yeah. The little boy's pretty sick. Uh, I've been checking with the neighbors. You two go on in and see what you can turn up in the house. You know, there's got to be something wrong. Parents wouldn't go off and leave two kids to starve. Well, I can't find out much. None of the neighbors seem to know anything about it. I'm going to check that house now. I called where the father works. Opportunity Corner? Yeah. He hasn't been to work in three days. Well, uh, let's see what we can find in the house. And there's no car in the garage. I've got traffic checking that now. I'm going across the street. Okay. Sorry to bother you. I'm a police officer. Yeah, I've been watching you going around to the other houses. Something wrong at the Mercer's? Uh, we're, we're checking on them. They seem to disappear three days ago and left the children alone. Left those two little kids? That's right. I didn't know the kids were alone. I, I've seen the oldest one going out of the house now and then, but I had no idea that the family wasn't there. Now, do you know the Mercer's very well? Uh, no. They just moved in about a month ago. You think something's happened? Well, we don't know. Both the kids are hungry. The little one's pretty sick. Gosh, if I'd known... Now, what I... kind of people were the Mercers? Well, like I said, I didn't know them very well. They seemed like nice folks, I guess. Well, what kind of a car did they drive? A kid. It was a sedan, black one. I think he's in the used car business. They ever have any arguments? Yeah, they had a couple of good ones. Well, who doesn't? And when was the last? Gosh, I don't know. Did you see them leave the house three days ago? Three days ago? Yeah, Saturday. No, I don't think so. They took the kids to a show. Well, maybe my wife did. Oh, well, where's your wife? Having her hair done. Crazy deans get all their hair cut off. I'll call her if No, you... no, that's all right. I'll check with her later. Did you find anything in the house? Not yet. I hope nothing's happened to them. Well, uh, thank you, Mr... Uh, the Bishop. Stan Bishop. I work at the Fidelity Insurance Company on Spring. Stayed home to figure out my income tax. Playing a little hooky. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. I'll stop by later to talk to your wife. Yeah, sure. I'll tell her. Ben. Yeah? 
We were working in the basement. Yeah? There's a woman's body in the laundry bin. She's been strangled. Yeah. And bruises on her neck. I'm dead at least a couple of days. Think the husband did it? Possible. He sure isn't around to say he didn't. Well, and here's Mr. Bishop. Yeah, this officer said you found Mrs. Oh. Is that Mrs. Mercer? Yeah. Yeah, that's Mrs. Mercer. How'd we think she's been strangled? Oh. Who did it? We don't know yet. Her husband? We don't know yet. Do I have to stick around? No, no. Thank you for the identification. Sure. Well, you may want to talk to you again. Sure. Now she's on his way over. The lab boy's in the car. I should be here, too. Mm -hmm. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, They're downstairs in the basement. Sounds like Asher now. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Uh, Who are you? Uh, I'm a neighbor. Asher? Yeah, coming right down, Ben. Uh, Lab boy's right behind me. Should be here in about five minutes. Neighbor just identified her. Strangled? Looks like it. And I took Bobby over to the juvenile authorities. What about the younger one? No, he's going to be all right, but it's lucky we found him when we did. Oh, I checked at the used car lot. Mercer was part owner. Made pretty good money. Mm-hmm. Well, that counts for the expensive necklace. Mm-hmm. Boys on the lot say they haven't heard from him in three days. What about his car? Oh, it's a black Cadillac sedan, 1950 Series 62. You get a license number? Mm-hmm. 77J8843. It's one of the cars from the lot. I put out an APB for Mercer in the car. Uh, come on, Pete. Where are we going? I want to talk to Bobby Mercer again. What are you going to say to him? I don't know. What do you say to a kid whose mother's been killed? Uh, shut the door, Pete. Come on in. Well, I have to get down there. Come on in. Okay. Don't you want to come in, Pete? Sure, Bobby, sure. Well, how do you feel? I feel good. Well, Danny's going to be fine. He was just uh, a little sick. Where's Mom and Dad? Did they come home? Well, we, uh, we can't find your father. Oh, but you found Mom. Did she come home? Why didn't she come see me? Can I go home? Uh, Bobby, uh, look. How'd you, uh, how'd you like a candy bar, Bobby? Okay. Where's Mom? Uh, Bobby, uh, do you have any idea where we might find your father? No, but why don't you ask Mom? She'd know. Well, uh, she didn't know, Bobby. Have you lost or something? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. You know, that I'd like to be a policeman when I get grown up. Bobby. Uh, yeah? Bobby, you, you, you can't go home right away. Why not? Well, you, your mother, she's... Uh... What's wrong with Mom? Pete. What's something wrong with Mom? You, you see, Bobby, sometimes things happen. What's happened to Mom? She's sick? No, 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 she's not sick. Well, uh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Come on in. I got the lab report. Hey, Bobby, you're a big boy. I wasn't half as big when I was your age. I want to see Mom. Your, your mother's had an accident, Bobby. Bobby, listen. No, no. Come on, Bobby. You've got to be a big felon. Let me this. go. I want to go. Wait. Oh, I can't do it. Your mother's... Your mother's dead, Bobby. Oh, no. Climb. No. Climb. You better take him back. Sure. Come on, Bobby. No, no, let me go. I want my mother. 
come out, Bobby. No, please, please. You better pick him up. No. Off you go. No, please, let me go, please. Get a cigarette? Yeah. Thanks. How long you been with the force, Ben? Fifteen years. Twelve for me next month. I don't know. Think it's because we can't do anything else? I don't know. Guthrie. Is this homicide? Yes, ma'am. This is Genevieve Blake speaking. I just heard about Mrs. Robert Mercer's death on the radio. I, I'd like to talk to you about it. I know Mr. Mercer. Can you come out here? Of course, Miss Lake. What's your address? 752 West Palm. 752 West Palm. That's in Forest Park? Yes, that's right. At the end of Palm. Thank you, Miss Lake. I'll be right out. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh, come in. Thank you. This is Sergeant Cargan. How do you do? Hello. Sit down. Oh, thanks. Hi. Are you the one I talked to? Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know quite how to start. You said you heard a news broadcast about Robert Mercer. Well, yes. You know Robert Mercer? Yes. Yes, I know him. Well, you wanted to tell us something about him. I didn't know he was married. You didn't? I didn't know he had a wife and two kids. We'd like to question him, if you can help at all. I met him about three months ago. He sold me a car. I see. I didn't know he was married because he didn't say anything about it. He never said anything about it. We understand that. I saw him quite a bit, maybe a couple of times a week. A couple of times a week for three months? Yeah, well, maybe not always a couple of times a week, but... Well, you know. What did you want to tell us about the Mercer murder? Well, he came back here three days ago. Saturday. Uh, Saturday? Uh, Yeah, it was Saturday. That was the day his wife was killed. He wanted me to go away with him. He said he was going out of town. He wanted me to go with him. Why didn't you? Well, the way he was acting. He he was acting kind of funny, strange. He was real nervous. What did he say to you? Just that he wanted me to go away with him, that he had to leave town on business, and that he wanted me to come along. Just because he was acting funny wasn't the only reason I didn't go with him. It wouldn't look right. I told him it wouldn't, you understand? Yes, ma'am. Did he say where he was going? Just out of town. I wouldn't have gone with him even if he'd been acting all right, you understand. Yeah. He used to go up to a cabin sometimes on the weekends. I I thought maybe that was where he was going. Cabin? Yeah, the cabins at Horseshoe Lake. And you know he's been up there before? Oh, yeah. Just where is this cabin? Horseshoe Lake. Well, what part? What's the location? Well, I'm not sure. It's off the highway. I remember there's a general store just before... That's all right. I really didn't know he had a wife and kids. If I'd have known... We understand. If you go to the general store, they can tell you where the cabin is. Does Mr. Mercer own the cabin? No, he rents it. I doubt if he'd be there with his name on all the newscasts. Oh, he uses another name when he rents the cabin. What name, Miss Lake? Smith. Robert Smith. If he's up there, you won't tell him I told... No, we won't tell him. You understand? Yeah, we understand. Good afternoon. Afternoon. How are you? Hello. What can you do, sir? Uh, We're looking for a man named Robert Smith. Yeah? Is he in his cabin? Well, I couldn't say. Well, we were told you could tell us where to find him. Yeah, I'll tell you where to find the cabin, but uh, he ain't in it. <laughs> I can't help him. Uh, we're police officers. Uh-huh. Is Mr. Mer- uh, Smith living in the cabin? Well, he has been. For how long? What you want him for? We'd like to talk to him. Oh, come on. What you want him for? What's he done? We didn't say he'd done anything. Oh, <laughs> now, you don't have to play cagey with me. You fellows are from the city, ain't you? That's right. Well, now, I sure don't figure that city cops would come all the way up here just to talk. Uh, what'd you say your name was? I didn't. Sam Fisher. Mr. Fisher, it's getting dark. 
We'd like to find Robert Smith before it gets any darker. Might have a hard time shooting if it gets too dark, huh? We're not planning on shooting anybody, Mr. Fisher. Oh, no, for land's sake. You two fellas are treating me like I don't know nothing at all. Mr. Fisher, how long has Robert Smith been living in the cabin? Since Saturday. I rented it to him Saturday. This isn't the first time he's rented it. He's rented up lots of times in the past couple of months. He started coming up around, let me see, last January. When was the last time you saw him? Uh, about four this afternoon. He came in to buy some groceries and things. And he's been up here since Saturday? Mm-hmm. Saturday night, to be exact. Got me out of bed around 11. Uh, oh, now, come on, fellas. What's it all about, eh? Uh, what do you want him for? Huh? Where's the cabin, Mr. Fisher? Oh, you fellas. Well, it's up the road about three miles. You come to a turn-off that has a sign. Paradise Villa. That's it. Up the road. Mm, about three miles, about that. Turn right. Paradise Villa. That's right. That's the name of his cabin. Ain't nothing like a villa, but that young fella I hired to paint the signs. <laughs> he got real fancy. Well, thank you, Mr. Fisher. <laughs> you don't want to tell me what this is all about? Sorry, Mr. Fisher, we can't. Oh, say, look, uh, fellas. Yes, Mr. Fisher. We're in a hurry, Mr. Fisher. I didn't know as how I ought to tell you this before or not. But seeing as how you just want to talk to Smith. Tell us what, Mr. Fisher. Well, when Smith was in to buy the groceries, he bought himself a box of 30-30s. I guess he must have a rifle. I guess he must. Thanks, Mr. Fisher. You know, I still can't believe it. What? That a guy would kill his wife and leave two children to starve. It looks like this guy did. Oh, there's a sign. Yeah, that's it. Paradise Villa. Want to drive right up to the house? No, we'll walk up and take it easy. Hmm. Yeah, it's snow and I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uh, it's funny how you miss street lights. Yeah. I can't see two feet. There's a line. How do we take him? Well, there's probably a back door. You'll find it and cover it. I'll just knock at the front. So there's a car. Black cab. Uh, okay, go ahead. I'll give you about 30 seconds. Good luck. Somebody out there? Anybody out there? Put down the rifle, Mr. Mercer. Who are you? Police. Put down the rifle. I thought I heard somebody out there. I better come inside. Hey. Someone else? My partner. I wondered how long it would take you to find me. Jimmy, tell you? This is my partner, Sergeant Cargan. You better both come in. It's too cold to stand out here. Get the rifle, Pete. Sure. Come on in. You'll have to come back to town with us. I heard the news broadcast this afternoon, but I didn't think it'd be up here this soon. I was thinking last night about going down and turning myself in. Did you kill your wife, Mr. Mercer? Yeah. Don't ask me why. I killed her, and I guess I had a lot of reasons, but I can't seem to think of any good ones right now. We better go. The broadcast said the children were all right. Yeah, they're all right now. I'm not their real father, you know. I married Lucille... Oh, what difference does it make? That much. I don't know. Maybe you do. Why does a man kill somebody? I guess it depends. Yeah, I guess it does. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you'll see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number of the
transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Two boys. Mm-hmm. Where's Quine? Just got called upstairs. Didn't you run into him? Mm, didn't see him. Anything interesting in the line? Here's the sheet. Take a look. Mm-hmm. Mm, the Albert brothers. The second bunch, I think. Yeah, it's the second bunch. May I have your attention, please? Oh, I'm going to sit down. Oh, the wire see you later. Right. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you are sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Okay, bring on the line. All right, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn and face front. You, back it up a little. Back right up against the wall. Okay, hands at your sides, face front. Now, when I call out your number, step out and look straight ahead. Keep your voice loud enough so everyone can hear you. Okay, number one, Ernest Fletcher, robbery. Stand up straight, take your hands out of your pockets. Don't look at me, look straight ahead. Okay, where do you live, Ernest? 553 West 109th Street. Hotel, house, or what? Hotel, I guess you'd call it. What do you call it? Everything I can think of. <laughs> How long you lived there? How long? Just about three years. Yeah, about three years, maybe a little more. Were you arrested with anybody? Yeah. Who were you arrested with? Girl. Name's, uh... I don't remember her name. Holt? Holt? Lisa Holt? Lisa, yeah, that was it. Lisa. She was with me when I got picked up. She didn't know nothing about it. She turned her loose. You have any weapons with you? Just Lisa. <laughs> Any weapons, Ernest? No. How about a car? No, I don't have a car. You picked me up before I had a chance to get a car. You own a car? No, I don't own one. Where are you from, Ernest? Detroit. I've been here about four years. Okay, step back, Ernest. Number two, Jack Casper, assault. <laughs> Where do you live, Jack? Washington Avenue. Talk up. Washington Avenue. 107 West Washington Avenue. Who do you live there with? Another guy. Well, it's Keith. I live with him. Is he the guy you hit? Yeah, he's the guy. Why'd you hit him? I don't know. I guess I just felt like it. He had it coming. He's in pretty bad shape. Might turn into manslaughter. I hit him hard. He had it coming. What'd you hit him with? The shovel. I was digging out back, and I hit him with the shovel. You just hit him? Yeah. I turned around and bullet him in the face. He had it coming. You keep saying he had it coming. He did. Well, why? Why? Yeah, why'd he have it coming? I've been living with him for seven months. He's a terrible guy to live with. Anything you do, he's got something to say about it. You take a bath, he tells you you're doing it all wrong. He's been telling me I've been doing everything wrong for seven months. The other day, he told me I wasn't using the shovel right, so I bumped him with it. Why didn't you leave? Why didn't you stop living with him? For a while, I thought maybe he was right. Okay, step back. Number three, Stanley Phillips, robbery. Where do you live, Stan? Idiot, 76 and a half South Adams. How long you lived there? Oh, I lived there, I guess, about a couple of years, I guess. Bad. Were you oh, arrested with anybody? No. Uh, can I see? Weapon? Oh, sure. Yeah, automatic. Describe it. Well, it was a 45. I don't know. Come on, son. Just got a call from General Hospital. Twelve people have been carried in in the last hour. They were poisoned. Three more a few minutes ago. Well, that's that's fifteen people. 
What did it? Bad booze. What? Somebody sold them some bad liquor. They're going blind, having convulsions. Did it uh, talk to any of them? Not yet. They're all too sick. They're actually going blind? According to one of the doctors. Who? Oh, there he is. Well, let's talk to him. His name's Archer. Uh-huh. Doctor, this is Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Quine. Oh. Hello, boys. How are you, Doctor? Hi. I was just called in, Doctor. Maybe you better brief me. Well, Lieutenant, there isn't much to brief you on at the moment. Fifteen or sixteen cases in already, and most of them are in very serious condition. Mm-hmm. Poison? Wood or methyl alcohol, probably. Huh. Four or five are already blind. Any of them well enough to talk to? Well, there's one that came in a short time ago. I, I don't know his name. Mm-hmm. And he's well enough to be questioned? He was when I looked at him. He's pretty sick, but he seemed much better than the rest. This is pretty terrible. No telling how many people have gotten hold of this stuff. The bad liquor? Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's homemade. Every one of the people who've been brought in are from the poorest section of town. We got some addresses from them, but the rest you can tell. Mm-hmm. Someone sold it for less than the government price, on that. Yeah, well, that's why I'm worried about this turning into an epidemic. It's bigger than just a party making it in a bathtub. Whoever brewed this stuff was planning on making some ready cash. If they've sold it to 15, they probably sold it to a lot more. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Doc, uh, I'd like to talk to this one man. Sure, sure. Just come this way. Gonna need more space. The wards are already pretty full. Is, uh, is this man in the ward? No, no. He, he was for a while until he got better. Mm-hmm. He's on the cot in the hall. We need all the beds for the really sick ones. Uh, tell me, Doc, uh, any of the victims say where they got the stuff? No. Well, in fact, I haven't asked them. Well, there's a ruddy man, yes. Oh, oh, I just want to talk to you. Now, listen here. Uh, uh... How do, uh, how do you feel? Well, I felt worse. I felt much worse. His name is Toomey. Uh, Stanley Toomey and I feel good enough to leave. Uh, what are all these guys? Well, Mr. Toomey, I'm Lieutenant Guthrie, and this is Sergeant Quine. Lieutenant? That's right, Mr. Toomey. This is Sergeant uh, Quine. Law? That's right, Mr. Toomey. Oh, I'm a very sick man. Doctor, I feel very sick, and I think I should rest for a while. I thought you wanted to leave. Well, I simply drank something and didn't agree... I haven't done anything you can throw me in the pokey for. You've been thrown in before, haven't you, Toby? I want a lawyer. Oh, I feel very sick again all of a sudden. You'll excuse me. I have to be getting back to the water. Well, sure. Go right ahead, now. Well, look, I said I was very sick. I'm very sick. You can't just leave. You'll be all right, Mr. Toby. All right. Doc, I'll tell you, I'm very sick again all over again. I'll be like the rest of those rummies in there. Well, you're well enough to talk. Well, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm very, very sick. If you go walking off... Mr. Like this... Toomey, I, I think that I'm the best judge. Well, mm-hmm. then trade me stomachs. You talk to these men, I'll be back. Mm-hmm. Oh, now, fellas... Now, you... just a minute, Mr. Toomey. Well, We're not going to call you in or if we just want to talk to yeah. you. You got a cigarette? Cigarette? No. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. I just want to tell him. That's right, Mr. Toomey. Now, tell me, uh, where did you get the stuff you were drinking? Mm, which stuff? Well, the stuff that made you sick. Well, I guess i got to confess to you. I've been feeling pretty bad lately. I've been awful low. Troubles, you know, depressed kind of. I've been drinking on occasion. Just an escape. Oh, right? come on, Tommy. You've been escaping ever since I first knew you. Well, lately more than usual, I guess. Well, what's that got to do with the stuff that made you sick? Well, last night and yesterday and, you know, this morning, I was drinking. It's kind of hard to tell what stuff I got sick on. Mm. Now, what were you drinking? Oh, various things. It's kind of hard to keep track. Oh, I was very depressed. Yeah. Yeah, just to pick out just which one of the... Now, uh, when did you first get sick? Well, I remember when I woke up. Mm-hmm. Where did you wake up? Well, I was lying down. In a particular alley. Oh, well, I mean, shelter that I was in. Well, it's a little vague. You know. That's when you first got sick? Yeah, well, I had a bad stomach ache. I knew it was something unusual because i have been drinking various things for some time. And I generally get by. Oh, maybe an occasional lapse of memory or a slight headache or something. But nothing like this stomach ache. Well, I got pretty sick. And, oh, and then I had a most disgusting thought. What? Ulcers. Ulcers? Oh, I'd be a laughing stock. So I went directly to the hospital to find out. Mm-hmm. 
Well, tell me, uh, what time did you wake up in the alley? Well, I have no idea. Uh, well, what time did you go to sleep in the alley? I have no idea. Where were you before you went to the alley? Where was I? Yeah. Where was I? Before I went in the alley, huh? Well, just give me a second on that one now. I kind of think. Um, where was I? You have no idea? Well, I remember going into Lemke. On River Street? That's it. What'd you drink there? Well, I spent my last 15 cents on something that Lemke was advertising at a very reasonable fee. Where were you before, Lemke's? Oh, oh no. Now, fellas. look, the sooner you answer, the quicker you can take it easy. Well, fellas, I was in so many places. I was in the Bleach Cat. I was in the Barrel. Uh, oh, no, the Barrel I wasn't in. I have given that place up. Max is not at all sociable. He forgets the people who kept his barn going during the tough days. But the last place you remember before the alley was Lemke's. Yeah, that's right, it was Lemke's. You know, all those bums they've been bringing, they might have gotten into some high-test gas. I knew a guy once named Wadley who drank 97 octane with orange juice. Holy cow. Well, it was very fatal. Did you drink any gasoline last night? I have no idea. Customers know you. You're going to ruin business. If we make them nervous, let's go in the back. Who's going to run the place? Let's go in the back. Come on. Uh, okay. What's wrong? Just want to talk to you. Huh? Want to go in the back room? Mm -hmm. All's good enough. All right. Now, come on. What's the beef? A bunch of people were carried into the hospital today. Yeah? They were all poisoned. Well, yeah, the guy did it. They've been drinking bad booze. Ah, my booze ain't the best, but it don't poison nobody. You been selling any illegal stuff? Illegal? What alcohol? Oh, stop. A methyl? Oh, now you've been here before. You know what I sell. What did you sell it to me last night? That rummy. What did you sell to him? I don't exactly remember. I sold him wine, I think. He said it was something cheap. Sure, everything's cheap. You guys know the trade I get in here. You know, to me, he couldn't buy nothing except wine or maybe beer. He says it wasn't wine or beer. Oh, look, boys, I don't care what that rummy says. He don't know what he's saying anyway. He's one of the biggest lushes. Some the... of those people they brought into the hospital have already gone blind. Blind? Yeah, some of them might die. Uh, look, I got to get back out in front. I can't leave the place with nobody to look after. It's Saturday night. I got a big crowd out Let's there. Let's see the bottle you served the wine to two me out of. I told you, I don't know what I served him. Let's take a look at your stock. My stock? Yeah. Show us your whole stock. Oh, Lord. Show us. Okay. Ah, see what you guys do to my business? Everybody's beating. Well, as soon as we leave, they'll all be back. Go on. Show us your stock. Uh, you guys have got to believe me. I, I didn't sell nothing illegal. Okay, here's the stuff. Take a look for yourself. An awful lot of stuff, then. Mm -hmm. I'll start with anything that doesn't look up. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, will you? Yeah? I sold it. Okay, where is it? Here's the last one. Yeah. Where is it? I don't know. I bought it for four eighty a gallon. <laughs> Take a whisper. I didn't know it would make anybody sick. Didn't you sample it? No. Oh. Hi, Small. We found it. I don't think you found all of it. Hello, Empty. Small. We were able to talk to some more of the victims. I got a list of four more places like Lemke. I didn't know it was dangerous. You should have thought about it. They brought in seven more people. That makes 20. Where'd you get the stuff, Lemke? From a guy. I don't know. I saw a chance to make a quick buck, so I bought six gallons from him. It's methyl alcohol, all right. They analyze it. Okay, Lemke. Let's go. I'm in a lot of trouble, huh? Yeah. You're in a lot of trouble.
Well, here's a lab report. Methyl alcohol, mostly. Some artificial flavoring, some other things, but nothing important. How do you get methyl alcohol? Oh, you can get it. Anybody back here? Uh, should be. Yeah, but... Uh, those bars were checking. Anybody back here? Roger. Got a call from Crockett, and he said he was questioning one of the owners, and he'd be in as soon as he got something. Mm-hmm. All right, Lemke, find anything in the mug file yet? Well, not yet. He's still looking. I've got the artist coming down to see if he can make a drawing from Lemke's description. Lemke doesn't find anything in the mugs. Okay. Lemke didn't know the guy who sold him the stuff? He swears he didn't. What some guys will do to make a buck. Yeah. Well, it's been four hours since the first victim was brought in. Last report made it 33 people. Six of them blind. Half a dozen not expected to live. Hi, Pete. Hello, Small. Hospital called. Said they stopped coming in. No, that's something. Said three of them have died. Talked with Doc Archer and he said it was a good bet two or three more would die before evening. Well, who are the dead ones? Here's the names and addresses. Uh, how about families? Only one had a family. Arthur Jones. Wife and three kids. Wife was at the hospital when he died. Well, whoever made that stuff couldn't have done better with a gun. Mm. Yeah? Crockett's coming in with the owner of the riverfront bar. Called in and said the owner, a man named Brennington, admitted selling the stuff. Did the owner say who sold him the stuff? Said he didn't know the guy. Uh-huh. How about the other places? I haven't heard anything yet. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, just identify him, huh? Okay, thanks. A uh, band. Yeah? Asher just called from the margin. He says Lemke has found the man who sold him the stuff. Well, have him bring Lemke up here. Right. And check and see how those other guys are doing, and when Crockett gets here, have him bring his man up. Okay. Oh. Boy, I'm a little tired. It's kind of stuffy in here. I'll open the window. Good idea. Thanks, Pete. Uh, hey. Why? Look at that sunset. How about that? Yeah. You know, I've lived here all my life. You really don't think about how great your own hometown looks till sometimes when you see a sunset like that. Even the south side looks kind of like a painting. Hey, uh, Paris is supposed to be the most beautiful city in the world. Think it is? I don't know. I've seen it in pictures, but I guess it's beautiful. Let's go be French cops and find out. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see Paris sometime. Yeah, I'd like to see a lot of other places. Huh? What places? Oh, Italy. You know, Rome, Venice. I like to see India. India? Yeah. I was a real good history student in school. I like to read about places. I always like to read about India. Here's Lemke. Okay. This is the mug you called out. Oh, Roger Peterson. Quite a record. Yeah. Are you sure this is the man, Lemke? Sure, that's the guy. Came into my place, asked me if I wanted to buy this stuff. Said five dollars. I said four and a half. I paid four eighty like I told you. That's the guy that sold it to me. And last address, 9108 South River. I got to check on it. Uh, let's what, go over and see for ourselves. What's going to happen to me? How, how about going a little easy since I picked this guy out for you? Asher. Yeah? Crockett's coming in with another guy who's been selling the stuff. Show him the pictures and see if he bought it from Roger Peterson, too. All right. How about you, Lemke? I helped, didn't I? Three of those people who drank the stuff just died. Well, did, they, did they say I was the one that sold it to them? They didn't have a chance to say anything. Officers. Okay. Is there a Roger Peterson living here? Yeah, what'd he do? I just want to talk to him. Well, sure. What's your name? Bivin. I run the place. What room is Peterson in? Second floor, number 12. Hey, there's going to be trouble. Not if we can help it. Then you don't mind if I leave the place for a while. Uh, we might want to talk to you. I'll just be down the block, staying out of the way of the trouble. You're going to try not to help. Hey, uh, you better stay in your room. Well, what if there's some shooting? We'll try not to aim at the floor. Okay, I'll stay in. 12? Yeah. End of the hall on the second floor. He's probably sleeping. Always does in the daytime. Wakes nights. Doing what? All night garage. You got a key? 
Yeah. This one. I'll bring him right back. Okay. <laughs> Bet he collects his rent right on time. Nine on this side. Twelve on that side. Think we ought to go right in? Mm, give him a knock. Knock again. If he's in, he's really sleeping. Well, let's find out. Where's the bedroom? Peterson. Come on, Peterson. Huh? Come on, come on. Wake up, wake up. Uh-huh. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, police. Get out of bed. Police? Get out of bed and get your clothes on. Well, let me wake up, will you? Let me wake up. <clears throat> what's going on? What right you got busting into my room? I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. What, what are you talking about? Get up and put your clothes on. We'll tell you all about it. Murder? You guys must be nuts. Now look, I told you to get up. Okay, okay. I'm up, I'm up. Okay? Where are your clothes? On the chair. But if you don't mind telling me, you guys come busting in here and tell me you want me on suspicion of murder. Yeah. And where's your warrant to come busting in here like this? Right here. Oh. Well, let me in on it. Who'd I kill, huh? Three people. Three? <laughs> Maybe more by the night. Me? Kill three people? You're nuts. Get into your clothes. What three people? Tell me what three people I'm supposed to have killed. The people who drank that stuff you've been selling. I don't know what you're talking about. We'll tell you all about it at the station. Oh, wait a minute. I haven't got my pants. I told you to hurry up. Well, let me at least get my pants on. And move. Okay, let's go. Watch it, then. I've had it. Leave me alone. All right, get up. I sold the stuff, sure. But I didn't make it honest. Who did make it? My boss. The guy I work for. Who is the guy you work for? Name's King. Dave King. We know Dave King. Yeah? Well, I work for him. At the garage? Yeah, at the garage. He bought the stuff and mixed it. I just peddled it for him. Where is Dave King? If he ain't home, he's at the garage. Honest, I didn't make the stuff. You believe me, don't you? Sure, Peterson. Here's your hat. <laughs> on your mind. Who are you? What do you guys want? He asked you who you were. Maybe I don't feel like telling him. I think you better. We're police officers. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you say your name was? Fisher. Sam Fisher. I'm a mechanic here. Now, when did you say Dave King would be in? He said I should be in any minute. Just called from the house, said he was coming right over. What's it all about? When did Dave buy six gallons of methyl alcohol? Methyl alcohol? Yeah. When did he buy it? I don't know. I don't know nothing about Mr. King's business. I'm just a mechanic. Well, you just wait around for Mr. King. When he comes in, I don't think it would be a good idea to tell him who we are. Well, he'll see you. We're just customers. We've got a car stalled down the block. You understand? Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look around, Pete. Oh, uh, by the way, Sam. Yeah? If you decide to take a walk, don't. There's a dozen cops around the building. You gonna try to find the methyl? Even better if we find a mix. Any garage owner might have methyl. Yeah. There's the door. Sam? Yeah? What's in here? Startle. Ben. Yeah. Take a whip of these barrels. 
that's that. Still enough in the bottom to hang him higher than that. The car just came in. That's King. Sam's gotten to him. He's getting out. Hold it, boys. Put away the gun, King. Sam tells me you're unhappy. We just found your mix. Too bad you weren't a few minutes later. You're going to dump those barrels and get out of town. Put down the gun. Place is coming. I didn't see nobody when I come in. King, the whole place is covered. There's a cop in the door right now. Oh, come on, Guthrie. Hey, drop it! You okay, Quinn? Sure. Better take Sam down to the station. Let's go, Sam. Diane? <sighs> you know it. Ben? Yeah? Why India? Like I told you, I read about it and liked it. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief. The murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of a suspect, have him help. The officer's Ladies and gentlemen, by transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city. For under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. in the shop. I thought maybe you'd give me a lift home. Well, I gotta wait for Pete, but you're welcome if you want to stick around. Yeah, thanks. I'll see you later. Yeah, time. see you later. Hello, Miss Green. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Been here long? Do you think you have the man? Well, I don't know. If you see anybody that looks familiar at all, I want you to speak up. Will there be many people to choose from? Mm, there'll be quite a few. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? That's Sergeant Carter. Thank you. Mm-hmm. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you see will be numbered. I'll call up a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Okay, bring on the line. All right, keep it moving right over to the end of the stage. Okay, now turn and face front. Hands at your sides. Number three, take your hands out of your pockets. Now, when you answer my questions, talk up so the people in the back of the room can hear what you have to say. Okay, Leroy Morris, open charge. Step out, Leroy. Where do you live? Uh, two, uh, 37 and one quarter, North Jefferson. Is that a house? It's a hotel, the uh, Jefferson Arms. It's a hotel. Where do you work? Well, I'm not working. How long since you had a job? Well, I guess about three months. Where'd you work in your last job? The uh, Berkshire Baker. He's too small. He's too small. Uh, no. When you worked at the bakery, Leroy. Uh, the Berkshire Baker. 
Yeah. You work at the main plant. Yes. What was your job? I, uh, I cleaned up. Janitor? Well, I guess you could call it that. What would you call it? A cleanup man. Okay, Leroy, step back. Yes, sir. Number two, James Hamilton, open charge. He's about the right size. 9078 East Waterfield Street. But that doesn't sound like his voice. Uh, that's a boss. Sure. Yeah. What's your business? Handyman. I'm afraid I don't know what a handyman is, Jim. You don't? Why don't you tell me? No, no, no that's I not his voice. The what other mean, one was much higher. Well, he could have raised it. Yes, I guess he could. Uh, Sergeant Cargo. Yes, Lieutenant. Have the suspect raise his voice. Talk higher. Raise your voice, Jim. Higher? Yeah, higher. Like this? Higher. A uh, higher, Sergeant. Higher, Jim. How is this? Well, that's more like it. Now, say something. What do you want me to say? <laughs> I feel silly. State your name and address again. James Hamilton, 9078 East Waterfield Street. That's not the man, Lieutenant. Okay, Sergeant. That's fine, Jim. Is that all? You can speak naturally. I hope I still can. <laughs> step back, Jim. I'm a surprise. All right. Uh, all right, uh, step uh, back. Uh, okay. <laughs> Number three, William O'Brien, Grand Theft Auto. Come on, step out. Take your hands out of your pockets. Where do you live, Bill? 211 South Juanita. Where's that? That's a new development over near Marview. He's not the one that's the, too uh, short. That's the new thin. veterans development, isn't it, Bill? Yes, sir. What's your business? Carpenter. I've never been arrested before. Just answer the question. I'm sorry. You employed? Yes, sir. Where? Clearfield Construction Company. Anyone with you when you were arrested? No, sir. What kind of a car was it? It's a foreign car, huh? I don't know what kind it was. I'd been drinking. You drank much? Well, not much. Had a fight with my wife. Oh, I'm sorry. For what? Just supposed to answer the question. You had a fight with your wife? Yes, sir. You got drunk? I sure did. Then what'd you do? Well, I don't remember much. I guess I just got in the car and drove it off. Guess I was feeling sorry for myself and just wanted something to happen. It happened? Yes, sir. It sure did. How long you been married? Three months since I got back from overseas. Where overseas, Bill? Korea. You didn't hold up a bakery while you were feeling sorry for yourself, did you? Hold up a bakery? I sure didn't, huh? Okay, step back, Bill. I'm sure he isn't the one. No, I'm sure he isn't either. Coffee? Yeah. No identifications, huh? No. How's Miss Green going to identify anybody who walked into a store with a silk stocking over his head? Pretty tough. You ever try it? I've seen it. Here. Mm, thanks. Sure can change your face in a hurry. Yeah. You know, whoever this guy is, he's smart. He's done all three jobs on Monday morning. That's smart? Well, he gets the take for two full days. These bakeries are open on Sunday. Sounds like he might have worked for the bakery. Yeah. Or knows somebody who works for them. He wouldn't know how to find those floor safes unless he was well informed. About 6'1". Yeah. Weight around 180. Mm-hmm. Wears brown hat and leather jacket. And a silk stocking over his face. Hey, it's good coffee. Carries a gun, revolver. And I hope we get him before someone scares him and he starts using it. You got the rest of the bakery staked out? Yeah. Our men will cover from Sunday night till Tuesday morning. Can't spare them any longer than that. Mm-hmm. Godfrey. That's Quine, Ben. Silk stocking boy at the Excelsior Bakery and shot a guy. Kill him? Don't know yet. Waiting for the ambulance. Excelsior Bakery, huh? Okay, Pete and I will take it. Something hot? The guy with the silk stocking just held up another bakery, shot someone. Ben. Yeah? This isn't Monday. <laughs> Quine. Hi, Ben. Pete. Any witnesses? No, just the girl in the store. Who's the man? Checker for the bakery, just making the rounds. Talk to the girl yet? No, I've been too busy getting you in the ambulance down here. Well, let's see what she has to say. Oh, Miss Beatty? How is he, Sergeant? Uh, take him to the hospital. We'll know more after he gets her. Uh, this is Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Carter. They'd like to ask you some questions. I hope I can help. Uh, did you get a good look at the man, Miss Beatty? A good look? Yes, it was horrible. He looked like... 
Well, I can't describe it. His face was all pushed out of shape under a silk stocking. Same guy. How did it happen? It all started after I'd given him the money. He made you open the safe? Yes, the floor safe. He made me go into the back of the store with him. I was scared stiff. Well, we got into the storeroom and he made me open the safe. And then he told me to put all the money into the bread bag. I did it as fast as I could. I just wanted him to leave, get out of the shop. Mm-hmm. And what happened then? Then he made me lie down on the floor. Just I'd done what he said, the bell on the front door rang. It was the checker from the bakery, Mr. Burns. Go ahead. Well, the bell rang and this robber made me get up and go out to see who it was. He told me to wait on them as though nothing had happened. Said he'd have his gun on me not to make any slips. I've never been so scared in my life. How did he know it was Mr. Burns? How did he know? Well, I, I guess when I started talking to him, Mr. Burns, that is, I almost fainted when I saw who it was. Why did you try to warn him? Mr. Burns? No, I was so scared that I just stood there. If I'd only done something... Well, now, just relax. Try to take it easy and take your time. Yes, sir. I knew that Mr. Burns had come to check the store, and they'd go into the back of the store. All I could do was stand there. I tried to talk, but nothing would come out. Finally, I asked Mr. Burns to go away and come back later. And what did Mr. Burns do? Well, he just laughed and made a joke about my having a boyfriend in the back of the store. The robber must have gotten scared when Mr. Burns laughed, because that's when he... Oh, my gosh. I'm getting the shakes. Look at me. Yeah. Sit down. I'll be all right. It's funny, yeah. I was pretty good till I started telling you about it. You want to tell us the rest? Yeah, sure, I'll be all right. Well, Mr. Burns was still laughing when I heard the first shot. It all happened so fast, and I was so frightened. Hey, you said first shot. How many shots were fired? How many? Oh, three, I think. I was looking at Mr. Burns when the first one hit him. He stopped laughing. I'll never forget his face. Did he shoot at you? I don't think so. He fired two more times, as I remember, and Mr. Burns spun around and fell on the counter. Right over there. The doc found three holes in Burns. Mm-hmm. And what happened then? And then the man ran out the front door. I ran after him and yelled for the police. The man on the street called in. That's when I got the call. Miss Beatty, can you remember if the hold-up man touched anything? Or if there was any place where he might have left fingerprints? Let me see. Oh, I don't think I'd remember if he did. Get all the information on Miss Beatty. We want a statement. Right. I hope you catch him. We will. Yeah, this guy isn't going to be easy. He'll slip. They always do. Yeah. And in the meantime, he's liable to fill up this hospital. Well, there's the doc. Hope he has something good to say. I hope so. Hello, Guthrie. You look as tired as I feel. Yeah, I'm tired, all right. How about Burns? Can't tell yet. He's still out. Just wheeled him out of surgery. Took three slugs out of the center abdomen. Mm-hmm. What were they? Looked like 38s. Sent them over to Charlie in the lab. I'll check. They were steel jackets. Otherwise, Burns wouldn't have any stomach at all. Must have been fired at close range. Powder burns on his shirt. According to the witness, he was about 10 feet away. I sent the clothes down to Charlie in the lab. Charlie's going to be tired, too. Have any leads on who did it? No, no, a thing. What does he look like? You ever see a man with a silk stocking pulled over his head? Oh, you're kidding. Not a bit. Makes identification almost impossible. Silk stocking, huh? Thinking about trying it? Might not be a bad idea when I want to sneak out of the house. <laughs> well, take care of yourself, Ben. Get some sleep. I'll try. Send you over some vitamins. Thanks. Don't man. Nice guy. Yeah. We think we've got a tough job. He probably won't show himself for a while after using that gun. Mm, he might. So far, he's been taking nothing but chances. He sure crossed us up. Pulling a job on Wednesday? Yeah. Pretty smart. Yeah. Two days take again. How do you figure? Bank holiday yesterday. Hey, you're right. I'll be done. Now, let's see what the lamb's got. Hi, boys. What do you got for us, Charlie? Got these, 38s. Uh-huh. Find anything in the bakery? Yeah, nice little girl. Gave me some coffee cake to take home. Anything official? Nothing yet. The victim was shot from about ten feet. Yeah, we know that. Hey, you want some coffee cake? No, thanks. You shouldn't be eating that stuff, Charlie. You're getting too heavy. 
<laughs> I'd want to die if you really would. Well, let's know if you find anything. Don't I always? Honest, Charlie. Can't stay healthy with all that weight. My mental attitude. I escape by feeding my neurosis on coffee, cakes, and bonbons. <laughs> Well, I'm going to stake those bakeries out on a 24-hour schedule if it's just one man. Well. Yeah, what's up, Clint? man I got shot in the bakery, Mr. Burns. Yeah, what about him? Doc Gerson just called from the hospital. Burns died. Mm. What about his family? I'm going over there now. Well, I've got a killer to catch now. <laughs> Big Town is where mystery and action await you every week. CBS Radio's Big Town, Wednesday nights on most of these same stations, is where editor Steve Wilson and his staff of fighting newsmen and women come to grips with criminals and killers. And there's action-packed listening every minute. Don't miss the latest Big Mystery Extra in Big Town. It says here that meat's going up another four cents. Yeah? Mm. Remember when you could get a hamburger for 15? <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should be vegetarians, huh? Mm, vegetables are up, too. Why don't you read the funnies? I uh have. -huh. Food keeps going up. We'll have to give up eating. Sure. I can just see you. Let's say anything about Burns getting shot? Yeah. Silk stocking killer. Mm, that'll sell papers. Police baffled. Always were baffled. Why don't they say anything about the ones we wrap up in a hurry? Police not baffled. Mm -hmm. oh, come on, don't hog it. All right, here. Read the funnies. Better than this menu. What's the matter with the menu? You read it lately? I make it up. I didn't think it looked real. <laughs> Jokes. <laughs> here. Two hamburger steaks in a hurry. I'd sure hate to wait around when you were taking your time. How do you put up with him, Lieutenant? Ignore him. Benny, I really love you. Oh, it's your food I'm mad at. Ah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, look, I hate huh? to bust this up. All right, then don't. Some guy just called him. Yeah? Yeah, he's out walking his dog, saw a guy bury a sack, dug up the sack, and found it full of money. We're on the bakery job. Yeah, well, that, that's what this is all about. What do you mean? The bag the money was in came from the Berkshire Bakery. man's name? Uh, Davis. Arthur Davis. Oh, 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 oh. Quiet, William. Quiet, boy. Hey, eh? Oh, 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 stop it, will you? <laughs> Get back. There. Mr. Davis? Yes, yes, what is it? Uh, we're police officers, Mr. Davis. Oh, come in, come in, come in. Thank you. Uh, this is I Sergeant... thought you were coming right over. I called a good 15 minutes ago. Thought you would be right over here. Well, we were having... The dinner. money's in the other room in the sack. Oh. <laughs> William! Oh, now, what's the matter with you? You like policemen? I guess you don't like policemen. I guess not. I guess he ain't a police dog. Oh, oh there's the money. Uh, do you mind telling us how you found it? Well, I dug it up. I told one of your men on the phone. Didn't he tell you? Well, he was a little vague. He just said... I that... saw some fella burying it. I was out walking with him. Oh, oh. oh. No, William. I was out walking him, and I saw this fellow burying something. Uh, what do you fellas call yourselves? Well, I'm Guthrie. Uh, Davis, Arthur Davis. Uh, how do you do? Uh, this that's is some... William. <laughs> oh, he's quite a dog. I'm sure he is. I saw this fellow out burying something. He was looking mighty suspicious. Oh, yes, he was looking around like he was expecting to see a ghost or something. You think you'd recognize him again, Mr. Davis? Recognize? Oh, no. It was, too... it was way too dark. Well, didn't he see you? Well, how could he? Well, if you saw him... Well, I was on the road above him. He couldn't see me, but I could sure see him. And William, he didn't open his mouth, not once. He's a good dog. Mm. You mind if I look at the bag, please? Hmm? Oh, go ahead, yes. Yeah. $432. <laughs> that's what I found, and that's what you got. Would you mind showing us where you found this, Mr. Bates? Why, certainly, certainly. $432. I didn't touch a bit of it. <laughs> Come on, William. <laughs> Let's show the fellas where we found the... Oh, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Who? No, my name is Davis. Uh, Guthrie. Must be quiet. No, 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 no. This is Davis. Uh, that's for me, Mr. Davis. Uh, oh, yes, wait a minute. 
Why didn't you say who you wanted? He asked for some fellow named Guthrie. Well, I'm Guthrie. I told my office to call. <laughs> ah, will you now? You can shut up now. You know, it's not polite to make all this racket yeah. when someone's trying to talk on the telephone. Well, Now, if I've told you one time, I've told you a thousand okay. times. Okay. Might... I'll get right over. <laughs> yeah, nice boy. Yeah. Boy with a silk stocking. Boy with a silk stocking. Another bakery? Yeah. You stay here with Mr. Davis. Well, ain't you going to come along while I show you? Well, you show Sergeant Cog. Who? I'm Cogger. Oh! Oh, well, you sure me. Come along. I'll show you. <laughs> yes, you can come with you. After he shows you, send him back to the house. Quine said our boy's wounded, so maybe he'll come back to dig up with the money. Right. You fellas coming? I want to leave this door open. Uh... Be right there, Mr. Davis. <laughs> oh, hold your horses, will you, boy? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Not far now. Just up ahead, and then you turn right. Just up ahead. All right, Mr. Davis. I left Sergeant, uh, what's his name? The cargo. I left him up there. Oh, it's cold up there. Turn right. Better slow down there. Uh, wish you'd let me take William with me. He won't like me going out without... Stop right here. Yeah. That, uh, what's his name? He should be around here somewhere. Hey, up, Heath. Now, the place where he buried the money is right down below the uh, road. You don't have to get out, Mr. Davis. Well, don't you want me to show you where? Well, you showed Sergeant Carger, didn't you? I... Well, sure I showed him. Well, but... then you better go back to your house. Oh, I wanted to stick around for the fireworks. Take him back, Quine. Right. Well, look, I showed you where I dug up the money. I'm sorry, Mr. Davis. Uh, come right back, Quine. Give us a whistle. Right. Oh, boy, I don't think that's very nice of you. I find you the money in the... <laughs> There's a character. Yeah. Now, where's the spot? Oh, off the road and down the hill. Watch your step, though. Front steep. Yeah. Kind of. Right over here. Over here. What was doing at the bakery? Uh, I was small stakeout. A boy with a silk stocking came in and small covered him. Here's a spot. Uh huh. Well, if you're back here, a man must have gotten away. Yeah. Let's get out of sight. I'll tell you about it. Uh, trees over there, pretty good. Right. Small and the suspect shouted out. Small hit him, but doesn't know how bad. Chased him, but there was a lot of traffic in that district. Uh, yeah, how's this? Uh, okay. Now, which way does Stocking Pace come up here? Davis didn't see him come up, but he says he left down that way. Mm. There's a golf course over there. Must have come through it. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's not hurt too badly, he may come looking for his money. And if he is hurt badly, he might save us some trouble. Uh, that a lot. We're pretty sure he had a car parked over on Adams. A couple of people saw a man run up to a car and take off. They all said it looked like he was hurt. Any license number? No. Guy sure got a lot of nerve. Pressed his luck too far this time. After killing Burns, you'd think he'd stay low for a while. You'd think so. Well, no telling about some people. Uh, wish I'd brought a heavy coat. <laughs> wish you'd brought two. Your step. I parked the car down the hill. Yeah, we heard you. It's off the road in case he comes up that way. He came through the golf course last time. Over that way. Oh, it's cold. It sure is. Hey, what time is it? Yeah, about nine thirty. Golf course, huh? Yeah. You playing? Yeah, not for a long time. Used to be pretty good. I never could get interested in that game. Oh, it's a great game. <laughs> Look, I pounded a beat for a lot of years. I had enough walking. Oh, but it's, it's great exercise. This is all the exercise I'll ever want. <gasps> Boy, I'm freezing. Ben? Yeah. Uh, no, 
I don't think he's going to show. Hey, I just thought of something. What? Funny if they already got him. When I told them where we were, they'd let us know. Uh, I'll bet you a good dinner. Hold it. You hear it? No. I didn't hear anything about it. It's a dog or something. That's no dog. Keep it down. You see him? shoulder. He's hurt. He's a boy. Let him get to the hall. What's with that dog? Yeah, it sounds like it's coming up here. William! Oh, no. William! Come back here. Look out. A man's running. Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Look out, Ben. He's down. Everybody okay? Yeah. Shut up, William. Now, let's take a look. William. Stay where you are, Davis. Uh, William, get out. Yeah. You got the fellow, huh? How about it, Quine? He's dead. Shame on you, William. You dog, you. Uh, Mr. Davis. Yeah? Come here. Well, sure. Take it easy, Pete. Uh, what do you want? Has that dog got a license? Huh? Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? Uh, you people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure, the suspect, have him held. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, was written by Blake Edwards and Robert Wells, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, with Joel Samuels, Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, Harry Lang, Jim Backus, and Dave Light. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Approximately 228,000 crippled children and adults were served by Easter Seals during 1951. How? Through 2,000 affiliated societies in every state, the District of Columbia, and in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. These societies provided medical care, therapy, home teaching, camping, and workshops. They established employment services, cerebral palsy centers, and rehabilitation centers for persons of all races and creeds. Still, there remain in this country thousands of crippled children who need care. You can help reach more of them by contributing generously to Easter Seals. If you know a crippled child or adult who needs help, call the Crippled Children's Society in your county. Remember, to help crippled children and adults, contribute generously to your Easter Seals Society. Give to Easter Seals and support this work. <laughs>
Next week, the lineup will be heard 25 minutes earlier. Be sure to listen to The Lineup next week, April 1st, immediately following Life with Luigi and The Luella Parsons Show. That's next week, April 1st. Take one healthy jigger of jollity, add a heaping round of madness, mix in liberal portions of Willie Lump Lump, Dead Eye, The Mean Little Kid, and other assorted creations from Red Skelton's Scrapbook of Satire, and you have the complete recipe for CBS Radio's one and only Red Skelton Show on Wednesday nights. If it's fun you're after, don't miss Red Skelton every Wednesday night over most of these same CBS radio stations. Speaking. And remember, Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night on the CBS Radio Network. now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Good size. Uh, about 24, I think. Any news on the other men in the bank job? No, not yet. I'll see you later. Right. I don't know. I think it's possible. Now, you take Bill hello. Ryan. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Here, you want to sit here? No, no, this is all right, thanks. Oh, we were just talking about people, about criminals. Oh? We were just discussing how you really can't say a person looks like a criminal. No, you can't, you're There's right. There's a young man who works in the bank, Bill Ryan. He looks about as mean as they come, real so-called criminal type. You know, narrow eyes, usual things that people automatically identify. Just as sweet and nice, very timid, as a matter of fact. No, yeah, you can't tell. Do you think you've caught them? May I well, not all of them, and maybe two. Oh, well, that's there, very good. The two of them. Room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him help. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Okay, keep it moving. Right over here at the end of the stage. Come on, come on. Now turn and face front. Hands at your sides. Look straight ahead. Straight out through the screen. <coughs> That's right. You, number three. Me? Yeah. Don't take your glasses off like I tell you. Uh, okay. Now, you see, a lot of those now, boys up there don't look a bit out. like criminals. Yes, but some of them sure do. Everybody can hear you. Big room. We got a lot of people here tonight. I want all those people to get a good look at you and be able to hear what you say. So stand up and talk up. Okay, number one, William Skinner, robbery. Keep your head up, Bill. Okay, where do you live? Over on the east side, River District. What's the address? No address. It's down by the river. The shack. How long you live there? Oh, I don't know. I guess close to six, eight months. What's your business? My business? What do you do? Oh, I don't do much. I don't work much anymore. Jobs are getting pretty tough. Were you arrested with anybody? <coughs> no, I was alone when I got picked up. I wasn't with nobody. Have any weapons on you? Weapons? Yeah, I guess so. What were they? Uh, it was more than one. All right, describe it. Uh, a gun, 
Dirty Avery Barber. Was it chrome, blue steel, or what? It was blue steel, I guess. You have a car? I don't own one. Were you driving a car? Yeah. Describe it. What kind of a car? It was a sedan. Chevy, I think. What color was it? I don't really remember. It was dark. I don't remember it because it was night, and I wasn't in it long enough to notice the color. They picked me up pretty quick. How long have you lived in this town, Bill? A couple of years, I guess. Okay, step back. Number two, George Cosgrove robbery. A lieutenant. Oh, yes, Mrs. Monroe. That man. Oh, yes, he looks like one of them. And the man next to him. Yes, he looks like another one. 107 South 90. That looks like one of them. Yes, uh, sure does. Clerk. What kind of clerk? Uh, that's sure, one of them, Lieutenant. I work at Farm Machine. Yes, that's one of them. Uh, and the next one. Yes, absolutely. Hey, Sergeant Cogger. 78 North Adams. Yes, Lieutenant. Uh, have number three step out beside that man, please. Number three step out. Move up right next to him. Okay. Well, how about it? Oh, there's not the slightest doubt. Oh, I swear that those were two of the men. Yeah, we thought so. We arrested them together. Sergeant Cogger. Yes, Lieutenant. Hold number two and number three for interrogation. Cosgrove first. Okay. It'll be tough, though. Well, maybe with the identifications we can get something. I'll bet you a dinner, Cosgrove or Santley. Don't say a thing. <laughs> I owe you a dinner. It's a bet. Yeah, that. Cosgrove. Okay. Cosgrove and Santley have worked together before. Uh, did a stretch together. Cold in here? Yeah, a little. Their ammo show they never worked with anybody else. Well, they haven't been out long. Whoever those other two guys were, they probably contacted Cosgrove. Mm. Cosgrove, what's up? No. Sit down, George. Hey, B. Uh-uh. George, you were identified in the line. Yeah. Gonna save everybody a lot of time if you tell us who the other two men were in the job. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't on no job. Now, look, I don't want to go over all that again. All right. We know you and Santley were two of four men that held up the First National Bank. I told you before, I'll tell you again. We found some money in your place. I didn't put it there. Two of the bank employees identified you. That's crazy. A guard was shot. He may not live. I'm telling you. I didn't have nothing to do with the job. I guarantee you, a jury won't believe it. Uh, You and Santley have pulled off a few jobs before in the past. Yeah, we did time. Going straight now. The money we found in your place figures about half of what was taken from the bank. Ask Santley. I'm asking you. I'm telling you. I had nothing to do with it. Maybe Santley didn't. Ask him. We're asking you. If Santley had something to do with it, he didn't tell me. Three men walked into that bank. One man in the car. Yeah, I know. I read about Three it. Three men walked out of that bank with $173,000. You and Santley were identified as two of those men. Look, you can talk all night. I didn't have nothing to do with Who it. Who were the other two? Look, I tell you, I didn't. Yet. Yeah? Can you come out here, man? Important? Very. Be right there. Talk to him, Pete. Glad to. Okay, what's the hunt? You know Stan Holt? Oh. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Yeah, I know Stan. Been a long time. Yeah, uh, I've been going straight. Tell the Lieutenant what you told me, Stan. Well, like I said, I, I've been going straight. I, I got a job, and I haven't gotten mixed up in nothing since I got out. Just tell him what you told me. Well, I will, but I'm just worried about getting into trouble. What is it, Stan? Well, you done me a favor once. About a week ago, a guy came to see me. A guy I did time with. He wanted to know if I wanted to drive for a job. What job? A bank job. He didn't tell me what bank. He just asked me if I wanted in. Who was the guy? My name's Castro. Benny Castro. Mm, we got a record on him? Yeah, it's coming up. Well, he never worked this territory. He's a Detroit boy. He was pretty big time before he got sent up. I, I got to know him pretty well in stir, but I hadn't seen him till the other day. I didn't even know he was out until he showed up at my place. How do you know where to find you? Well, I said George Cosgrove gave him my address. You know Cosgrove? Uh-huh. I've seen him a couple of times in the last couple of months. He always wanted to get together, figure out a job. He was always with a guy named Santley. Well, I read the papers this morning, and I put two and two together. Well, what do you mean? Well, if Castro shows up at my place and says Cosgrove told him where to find me, I figure he must be working with Castro. And when I read about the First National job and how you already got Cosgrove and Santley... Where can we find Castro? Oh, I don't know. There were four men in on the job. Well, Castro was the only one I saw. 
There's a package on Castro. Uh, give it to Ben, Asher. Okay, thanks. Well, hello, Stan. Oh, oh, hello. I don't remember your name. Asher. Oh, yeah. 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 Castro's really got to reckon. Yeah, do you work with anybody special? I work with a lot of boys. A lot of special ones. He was a pretty big boy. He pulled off some fancy jobs before they sent him up. And he came to see you about a week ago, huh? I think it was on a Saturday. It was a Friday or Saturday of last week, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Quine, put out a pickup for Castro. Right. Oh, I'll get it. And you don't know who the other man is, eh, Stan? No, I don't know who it could be. Why? Well, you'll have to testify. Yeah. Uh, I will. We'll give you plenty of protection. Okay, thanks. That was a hospital. The bank guard just died. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, this Castro's a nasty guy. Yeah. He'll kill me if he finds out I came here. Uh, relax, Stan, relax. You'll get protection, and when we catch Castro, he's not going to be in a position to kill anybody. Cosgrove and Sandley sure don't feel like talking. Well, then we'll work on them until they do. And Pete, you and Asher work on Santley. Quine now, I'll take Cosgrove. Okay. Uh, Santley's in that one. See you later. Well, let's get to work. Papers have got the story on Castro. Yeah. It's a little dangerous. Okay, we won't need you, Phillips. Don't you guys ever get tired? Yeah, you should be a little tired by now. Yeah, I'm a little tired. Cigarette? No. Okay. Uh, we're going to work in shifts, Cosgrove. We're going to just keep talking to you until you tell us. I've already told you. How's Benny Castro? Who? Castro. Benny Castro. One of the guys you held up the bank with. I didn't hold Destroyed up. Destroyed boy. You did some time with him. I don't know. Him. Contacted a guy named Holt last week. Wanted Holt to come in on the job. I don't know any guy named Holt. Stanley Holt. I don't know him. You did time with him. You say I did time with him. You say I did time with this, uh... Castro. Yeah, well, I don't know him. I did time with a lot of guys. <laughs> was he, Sandley? I tell you, I didn't have nothing to do with that bank job. You and Cosgrove and Cass. No. Who was the other guy? How can I tell you if I don't know who you're talking about? First national bank job. I know that. Thought you said you didn't know what we were talking about. I mean, these other guys. You sure you didn't pull that job off by yourself? I didn't pull it off at all. I didn't know nothing about it. I told you guys a dozen times. Now tell us again. I didn't have nothing to do with it. You'll go to trial and they'll convict you. I didn't have nothing to do with it. We know Castro was in on it with you. Castro was the other man in the bank with you and Cosgrove. I wasn't in the bank. Now, there's no use getting excited, sadly. I'm tired. You guys have been pounding on me all day and half the night. I want some sleep. Now, let's take it real easy and start again. Again? Again. From the beginning. Who was the other guy? I don't know. I tell you for the hundredth time, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we got a long time until you change your mind. I don't know any guy named Castro. I don't know anything about the bank job. A dozen people say you do. And I say I don't. You hear me? I say I don't. We hear. I don't know. Come on, Sandley. You sewed up. Tell us and make it easy for yourself. You and Cosgrove are a cinch to be convicted. We know Castro was the third man in the bank. Who was the guy in the car? Where's Castro? Where can we find him? Oh, please, lay off. We get tired, just like you do. Then lay off. Tell us where we can find Castro. I don't know. Do you like some dinner, Pete? Yeah, yeah. Get Bishop and Evans in here. Here you are. Two roast beef rare. What's the matter with you guys tonight? Oh, we're beat. And I thought something was wrong. You ain't making wisecracks. Yeah, bring me some milk, eh? Sure. Hi. Hello, Charlie. Thank God I have some milk, too. That's yeah, two milks. Yeah, where's the menu? Here. You guys look like you've been to a funeral. Uh, Charlie, how's the roast beef? Mm. It's pretty good. I can give you a nice outside cut. Okay, some coffee. Yeah. And two milks, two beefs. No, uh, make mine rare. Mm, two coffee. Uh, my mouth tastes awful. I must have smoked a whole pack. Nothing, eh, Ben? No... These guys are tough. You know, I, I can't understand it. No, what? Sandley and Cosgrove, they know we've got them. Charlie. They're afraid of Castro. Yeah. Yep. They'll give it up sooner or later. Yeah, wait a minute. Well, the way it's going, I don't know whether they will or not. Huh? Yeah? For you. Oh, someday that phone isn't going to ring. You know, hey, we ripped Charlie a lot. Yeah, but he really does have good beef. 
Yeah. I'll know how he does it at these prices. Where? Yeah, a plate this size uh, would cost... All right. Car can get right over. a place like yeah, that. Right. Joey's, you know. Yeah, I gotta break it up, Pete. Oh, Ben. Come on. What's up, Ben? You guys get back over with Santley and Cosgrove as soon as you can. Holt, a witness that identified Castro was just killed. What? S- small and leads? Uh, small's okay. He got one of the two men who killed Holt. Leads is hurt pretty bad. Well, let's go. They're small. Yeah. Hello, Ben. Pete. You're all right, huh? Just barely. They were waiting in the hotel lobby. Hey, come on. Let us through. Who's in the ambulance? Leeds. Got two in the chest. There's the guy I got. Leeds and I were right behind Holt. And yeah, where's Holt? There, by the elevator. Yeah. Really nailed him. I didn't even see it coming. The guy I got was standing over there behind that pillar. Castro. You sure it was Castro? Looked like his mug. I only got a quick flash. Leeds took Castro and I took the guy they hauled off. Well, who was he? Identification in his wallet said Paul Williams. I've never seen him before. Castro was in the hall. Yeah, he blasted Holt. Yelled something about no good squealer. I started to go for him, but the other guy opened up. Castro cut down Leeds before he could get his gun out. By the time I went after him, he was out the back way. He had a car. I heard it pull away. I didn't see it, though. No. I'm sorry about this, Ben. Oh, don't be ridiculous. But I should have spotted it. How? I should have. I should have been ready for it. I know darn well Leeds has had it. Yeah, a rotten shame. Sure is. You know his wife? Uh-huh. I've met her. I know the whole family pretty well. Oh, he might pull through? Not a chance. Jack said he was nearly gone when they drove off. <sighs> well, I'll go over and see the family. No. Let me do it. Okay. Come on, Pete. We're going back and show Santley and Cosgrove how to talk. I can't talk anymore. I'm beat. I just can't You're talk. You're going to talk until you tell us where we can find Castro. The bank guard's dead. Holt's dead. Paul Williams is dead. And the good cop's close to it. I swear, Cosgrove, if you don't tell us where we can find I Castro... I told you. I told you I don't know. Where were you two days ago? Oh, no. Where were you? I told you. Where were you? I was at home. All day? Yeah. You just stayed in all yeah, day? Yeah, yeah. What'd you do? I don't remember. I just stayed in. You don't know Castro? No. You were in stir with him? No, well, maybe I met him. We're going to book you for murder. Book me? Look... You guys have been working on me like this for nearly two days. Now, get satisfied, will you? We're trying to. I mean, lay off. Where'd you meet Paul Williams? I don't know a Paul Williams. He drove the car. I don't know him. He was the man waiting in the car while you held up the bank. While you held it up with Castro and Santley. A cop's dying, Okay, Castro. okay. I held up the bank. I pulled off the job. Where can we find Castro? I don't know. Where does he live? I don't know. Where'd you meet to plan this job? Look, please, I told you I was in on... Where did you meet in a garage. Where? What garage? On River. I, I don't remember the name. Remember it. I don't know. It's in a garage in the 1100 block. You never saw Castro except in that garage? No. You're lying. No. That's the truth. How'd you meet him? In stir. Where did you meet him after you got out? In the garage? No. You told us you never saw him outside that garage. Okay. Okay, I saw him, I saw him once when I met him. He, he told me to meet him at the garage. You gave him Stan Holt's address? Yeah. Where does Castro live? I told you I don't know where You he... know. You're afraid he'll pay you off like he paid off Holt. Where is it, Cosgrove? Okay, he lives at the West Side Hotel, but you ain't gonna find him there. Where else would we find him? Well, he might be holed up in the garage or at his girls. Where's his girls? Uh, uh, 650 East Sycamore. Name's June Bender. Okay, house, hotel, what? It's a house, a little white dumb. Look, please, don't tip him what I told you. You don't know that guy. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves. <laughs> Lights on. You two cover the bank. Right. Okay, let's go. Uh, Asher, you better stay out of the way and cover us with the Thompson. Okay, then. Yeah. 
Yeah? I'm a police officer. Police? Hey, what do you think you're doing? I've got a warrant. What's Pete? going on? Hey, what do you think you... Where's Castro? What? I'll uh, check the house. Okay. Castro, Benny Castro, where is he? I don't know no Benny Castro. You know him. Where is he? You ain't got no right. He's wanted for murder. I don't know him. You ain't gonna find nobody here. No, not here, Ben. Now get out of here. Let's go, miss. What do you mean? You're under arrest. What for what? He's not in the house. Better try the garage. Is he in the garage? You ain't got no garage. I mean the one on river. Why don't you go look? We are. You can't do this. Gee, what are the neighbors gonna say? <laughs> Take out. Three at the sides. Three at the back. Okay. Come on in with us. Okay. Uh, there's a gray sedan parked in the alley. Oh, it wouldn't be Castro's. If he's in the garage, his car's in with him. I wish there was a window. Yeah, there's one around the back. It's high, but it's blacked out. We can use a gas gun on it. Yeah. yeah heavy lock. Heavy door. And give me the shotgun. Get out of the way. I'm going to blast the lock, then push my way in. Come in after me. Right after you. Okay. Go on. Hey, somebody's in here. Left the light on. He was behind that car. Yeah, move away from me. Move away. Castro, come on out with your hands up. Okay, blast him. Castro, all right. Yeah. You know, I'm a little tired. Come on, let's get out of this garage, huh? It's damp. the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call off the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him help. The officers who took your name will assist you. The date is August 17, 1942. The place? Enemy installations in France. Down from the skies sweep 12 American B-17s in deadly accurate attacks. The first American heavy bomber attacks from England. The historic 8th Air Force is making its bid for immortality, the beginning of its long and noble tradition. This was the start of America's superb air effort in the European theater during World War II the beginning of the greatest air power the world has ever known. Remember that date, August 17th, 1942, a day to be proud of, one of many great historic moments that make up the unforgettable saga of the United States Air Force. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, is written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstutter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carter, with High Everback, Raymond Burr, Virginia Gregg, Herb Butterfield, Stacey Harris, Howard McNear, and Peter Leeds. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
ladies and gentlemen, by transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Just came in. I put him over on the end. No, oh, there he is. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you didn't meet Burke yet, did you? Oh, hey, I heard you were coming with us. Glad to see you. Same here. Hmm? How'd you leave him at University Division? Oh, I said they'd arrest me for impersonating a police officer if I ever stepped in the precinct. <laughs> hey, is uh, Carney still holding down the desk? Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, we went through the academy together, Dick and I. Yeah, so he said. We better get out. Yeah. Well, I'll uh, see you upstairs. Hey, and uh, congratulations. Thanks. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Oh, Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Mr. Winston. This is Sergeant Burke. He'll be working with us from now on. Glad to meet you, Sergeant. How do you do? Fine, thanks. Well, we picked up a couple of people that might be possibilities, Mr. Winston. At least they fit the general description of the man who held you up. I sure hope so. Uh, How many do we have to look at? Mm, 25 or 26. Oh. Uh, Do you smoke, Mr. Winston? Oh, thanks, Sergeant. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and the charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Come on, boys, keep it moving. Let's hurry it up there. That's it, all the way over to this side of the stage. Now spread out and stand facing the audience. Hands at your sides, keep looking straight ahead. It's a long way to the back of the room, so when you answer the questions, talk out so the people back there can hear you. Number one, William Alexander, burglary. Up to the circle, William. Yes. Hands out of your pockets. Oh, I forgot. Where do you live, William? 418 Race Street. How long you been in this city? About uh, six months, I reckon. Come here last September. Oh, may- make it seven months. Where you from? Beaumont, Texas. Were you arrested with anybody, William? No, sir. You have a car? No, sir. I was walking. Any weapons? One. Well, pistol, knife, what? A little old 32. Revolver, automatic? Revolver. No count, though. Firing pins all rusted down. That the weapon you had in the grocery store? You hear me? Yes, sir. Well? Don't know nothing about no grocery store, Sergeant. All right. Slide on down the end. Number two, George Vince, Grand Theft. Where do you live? In New York City. Last address you slept before you were arrested. Monaco Motel. Where's that? Well, down the know. It's on some highway somewhere. Stand at attention just like you're in the Army. I wish I were. What? Uh, well, nothing, nothing. Look, all of you, pay attention. I don't want any clowning around up there. Just answers to the questions and nothing else. You got that? You own a car? Yeah. What make? Caddy. You mean a Cadillac? Yeah. Well, say it. I own a Cadillac. The year? Uh, 51 convertible. Color? Blue. What kind of work do you do? Nothing. Come on, talk up, George. Well, I'm out of work right now. What kind of work did you do? How'd you live? I dealt cards over in Vegas for four or five years. Dealing cards, huh? That's your profession? Yeah. Any weapons on you when you are arrested? No weapons. According to the report, you were picked up at the Broadmoor Country Club. Is that right? Yeah. Who was with you at the time? A girl, Susan Wright. She told us her name was Marjorie Kennedy. Well, she's allowed to tell you anything. I ought to hear some of the things she told me. Okay, okay. Number three, Harold Sorrington, robbery. Over to the circle. Ah, the light hurts my eyes. Then close them and tell us where you live. 6644 East Hoover Street. What's your business? Die cast operator. Where were you arrested? On Alameda Street. When? Night before last. Anybody arrested with you? Yeah. Frank Jensen. I seen him in the other room when I was changing my clothes. 
Frank Jensen, number 12. How long have you known Frank Jensen? All my life. What's funny? Nothing. Why the smile? Nothing. You have a permit to carry a gun? No. What about the cold automatic? Didn't get that, Sergeant. The 38 automatic. Weren't you carrying it when the officers arrest you, Harold? No. You know where it came from, then? I found it somewhere, I guess. Did you see him find it? Yeah. Well, where'd they find it? Sort of lying on the ground. Did you throw it there? I told you I wasn't carrying any gun. How old are you? I asked how old you are. Nineteen. All right, Harold. Number four, Roger Weinberg, breaking and entering. Where do you live, Roger? Sorry, I couldn't identify any of those men. Yeah, so we... I sure like to get this bird, Mr. Winston. He's held up three other bars in the past month. Mm, got a match? Yeah, here you are. Oh, and I pulled some cards that look good. You got time to run down to the mug files? Yeah, it's a little late right now, Lieutenant. My wife's waiting. Uh, how about tomorrow? Could you come in tomorrow morning? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Sure would appreciate it. Maybe you'll be able to spot him there. I'd know if I saw him again, all right, even on a picture. Yeah, I'll be in tomorrow. Fine. I uh, have a card for you to fill out. Don't take a minute. Okay. Well, I'll see you later, Burke. I'll be in Captain Waldo's office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Weston. Oh, don't mention it. 32, 4135, North Maricopa. This is the man. 77, 459, 625, East Fuller Place, Department. Hi, Ben. Bill? Relax. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you think of the kid? Burke? Yeah. Mm, fine. I'll keep him with me a couple of weeks and then let him pair up with quine. Ash is due for vacation. Sounds good. Cigarette? Oh, thanks. I put out this supplementary after I went over Winston's statement. Oh? His complaint might help a little more than Shannon's and Vigran's. It's worth a try, anyhow. Yeah. Same guy held up all three places. No question about the M.O. or the description. Winston has one of those record players in his place where you put in a nickel and call up the girl. I see. Now, Winston remembered hearing the machine play Poor Butterfly just before he was held up. The place was crowded and lots of noise going on around. Normally, he wouldn't pay any attention to what was being played, but he claims he remembers that song pretty well because it's an old one. He's pretty sure it was played more than once that night. I mentioned it to the other victims, and all of them remembered hearing the same song just before they were knocked over. They have the same kind of music systems? Mm-hmm. And the uh, people at the jukebox company gave me some help, too. One of the girls who makes those calls remembered somebody throwing in a quarter and asking for poor butterfly, one that played five times. I've got a man covering down there in case the request comes in again. They can spot where it comes from? Well, the area, anyhow. There's 157 of those systems in bars and cocktail lounges around town. All the beat patrolmen got the sheet this morning. Might be nothing, but... And again, he's picked on a place using that kind of machine all three times. Funny, huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, Crocker sent this up on the gun. Mm hmm According to the description, it sounds like he's using a 763 Mauser. Hope it doesn't go off in somebody's face. And this M.O. gets me, Ben. He picks himself a bar, has a couple of drinks, and listens to the record machine. When the crowd thins out, he shoves a gun in the bartender's face, hands him a paper sack, and tells him to fill it up. Mm, this baby's been around, all right. Plenty cool. He's had good luck so far. It'll be our turn pretty soon. Well, we'll keep on it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Ben. Hmm? You go down to the jukebox company yourself? Yeah, why? How about it? Those girls who ask you what number you want to hear, they as pretty as they sound? Yeah. Yeah, I guess they are, Bill. I always wondered about them. Hello, Lieutenant. Hi. Hey, Ben. Hi. Why the grin? Take a look here. <laughs> well, I'll be done. <laughs> well, what do you think of it? Made of myself? Oh, it's some bad. What's it made of? Tin. Yeah. <laughs> Burke said he didn't feel like a policeman when they took him out of uniform. 
Nobody can see his badge. Well, anybody can sure see this thing. Yeah, that's what I figured. Gonna give it a burke for a gag. <laughs> you know, back at OCS, we used to make bars out of cardboard, and guys would wear them around all day. Yeah. Well, uh, wait a minute. Hello, Mr. Guthrie. Yeah. Wait. <clears throat> yeah, that's better. 1410. Right. Got a break, Pete. Burke was with Winston on the files this morning. He picked one. Hey. Name of Dallas Kenyon. Record a mile long. Released three months ago. Registered? Yeah. Got a place out on Humboldt Street. Hmm. Huh. I guess I'll wait to give Burke his badge. has got the alley. Kenyon's apartment on the ground floor, 102. Walk by the window. Somebody's stirring around in there. Mm-hmm, okay. You take it here, Pete, and I'll go in and get him. Yeah, right. Oh, I was just thinking. No, uh, what? If this is the right guy, Burke might think he's got the soft end of things. What do you mean? Isn't this his first case? Uh, 102. Yeah. Music lover. So they say. Hello. Well, hello. Uh, we're looking for Dallas Kenyon. Uh, this is apartment? Yeah, that's right. He lives here. Well, is he home? No. Are you Mrs. Kenyon? <laughs> no, I'm just a friend of his. I live across the hall. Well, when do you expect him back? I don't know. Well, uh, we'd like to wait for him. Police. Oh. Come in. Thanks, thanks. What's the trouble, officers? Dallas isn't in any trouble, is he? Mm, just routine. Take a look, Pete. Yeah. Hey. What's your name, miss? Rita Fisher. It's out there on the box, but my apartment's across the hall, 104. I don't think you have any right to come in here and start looking around, even if you're policemen. We'd like to know what you're doing in his apartment. I just come to use a record machine, that's all. Just to play his machine. Hey, what is this? How long have you known Dallas Canyon? Oh, just a little while. Two months, maybe. Can't you tell me what this is all about? Has he done something? We don't know. You sure you don't know when he'll be coming back? No. He brought the keys to my car and said he'd be back later on. Told me I could use his record machine if I wanted to. He does that lots of times. Look, I'm not involved in anything with him. He's too old for me. I hardly know him at all. But he let you use his apartment. I let him borrow my car. Just friends. I don't want to get involved in anything. You've got a nice set there. You can see for yourself. I bought some new records. Have I... you ever been in trouble, Miss Fisher? No, you can check that, too. Never been in trouble of any kind. Mm-hmm. Where do you work? Richburger Drive-In. You can call there. They'll tell you I'm okay. Hey, Ben. Hmm? Be careful. Dallas would hate to see anything happen to that record. It's his favorite. Yeah. I bet it is. Well, what is it, Pete? Poor butterfly. <laughs> I'd like to look at your apartment, Miss Fisher. Will you take us over there, please? Yeah, I suppose so, but I still don't see why you're so interested in me. Lord, I just happened to be here when you showed up. If I hadn't been here, you'd never even known I knew him. Well, we have to check into everything. It won't take long. What's he done? Can't you tell me what he's done while you're so anxious to get a hold of him? Don't I have a right to know something? We'll let you know everything. Hey, that's up front. Let's go. Gunman Burke went over to the car, headed out on 14. You head? Yeah, just nicked. Burke needs help. Yeah. Did Dallas do that? Uh, do what you can, Pete. Yeah. Uh, you come right. with me. Any of you people back there? Come on. Eleven A, request ambulance. 1410 Humboldt Street. Ambulance, 1410 Humboldt Street, eleven A. Are we clear? All clear. Stand by all units, frequency four. 11A, go ahead. Code 3, suspect proceeding west on 14th from Humboldt. Uh, what kind of car do you have? The black Ford, 49 sedan. Black Ford sedan, 49. 
And license number? Uh, it's a uh, uh, 2J4572. Two James, four, five, seven, two. This state, 11A out. All right, you stay here. All right. All right, let me through here. Let me through, please. How's Burke doing, Pete? Not so good, then. Huh? He just died. How's your Army IQ? To be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving peace. These words reflect our current military policy of power for peace, of an army always ready. But do you remember the great American who made that remark? The occasion was a speech to Congress outlining this man's thoughts about the future of our country. And the date, January 8th, 1790. The man... President George Washington. Today, the men and women of our modern army are proof of the first commander-in-chief's wisdom. Only strength can ensure peace. Get to know your army. It's a proud heritage. Captain Waldo's car. Yeah. Sam? Yeah? Got the hutch out of my way home. How many cars were there? Well, the regulars and public anyways. 37 and 18 were right in line when you call one out. Car every intersection along the park front. Alley's all covered. We're using the command car. You'll have to cross the viaduct to get on any highway. Yeah, men at both ends. Stopping everything. Go house to house if you have to, Ben. This rain isn't going to help much. Well, I hope we get him before it gets any worse. Yeah. Ben. Yo. Just came over. Wine found the car. Burke must have hit him. Yeah. Anybody see anything? No, well, Murph and Prescott are covering from 10th Avenue. Three other cars in from the viaduct side. May turn up somebody. Pretty lonely place, mostly warehouses. Well, they aren't going to be easy. Well, he's got them on the open street. How far do the warehouses run? We got four blocks straight across. Cars all along 11. Well, he can't move very far unless he jumps in the drink. Yeah, he might do it, too. Want to get Harbor Division to get some boats along here? Yeah, sure. Now, let's see. Ten men to a street. Five men to a side. Work it toward the water. No shooting if you can help it. Right. Now, wait a minute. Did that thing hurt? No. Now, how do you feel? Mad. Okay. Get going. Yeah. All right. All right. How's it look, Ben? The whole area's surrounded, but it's not going to be any cinch. I'll get some lights over here. Almost five now. Yeah. You gonna stick around? I'd like to, but I have to get over to the west side. Oh? Yeah. Burke's mother. Somebody has to tell her what happened. It'll take us a month if we have to go over every one of those warehouses. We'll spend a month if we have to. Oh, nuts. What? Well, my cigarettes are all wet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Hey, somebody's waving. Yeah. Well, he's all dressed for the rain, anyhow. Yeah. I get the window. Hey, uh, hey, you fellas are police officers, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Well, my name's Charlie Adam. I live up over that building there. Seen all the commotion on 10th Street. What's it all about? Mm, just looking for somebody. That uh, fellow in the black car? Did you see him? Sure, about 15 minutes ago. I thought there was something funny about him. I was going to report it. He uh, pulled up in that car and jumped out and fell like maybe he was drunk. Then he got up and ran. Uh, where'd he run to? Which way? Over there, out on that dock. Ain't supposed to be using it, though. Company property, you know. Okay. Jump in. Uh, sure. What's he done? Kill somebody? Yeah. Police officer. No. Well, he ain't going to get far. He'd have to come back along here or go on down the ramp. And I know he ain't come back this way. Now, where does the ramp lead to? Under this here dock. There's a little big landing there for loading when the tide's out. At high water, we load the right from topside here. Where does it come out? 
No worries. It runs back maybe, oh, 100 yards to the street. Solid concrete landings on that side. Some pile retainings over there. Just muck and mud. Lots of rats. All right, so well, thanks a lot. Uh, you better wait here, Mr. Adam. You okay? No, oh, it's slippery. Watch out. All right. Well, what Mr. Adams says is true. The only place he could run to would be back under the pilings. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Sweet smelling place. Get back. I'm okay. All right, cover it. I'll get the others. Yeah. Yeah, you were right. Did you hear anybody? No. Klein? Klein, this is Ben. Yeah. He's under the dock. We're going to have to get him out. Right. You don't have a chance to get away. We know you're hurt. There's a doctor up here waiting to treat you. You better come up before it gets any worse. Is this thing carrying? Well, the speaker's hanging over the side. Put your hands above your head and walk straight toward the light. You've got five seconds. Well, I guess he doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, maybe he passed out. He wasn't passed out five minutes ago when he threw those slugs at us. One more chance, Kenyon. Are you coming out? I'm coming out. Okay. Right toward the light. With your hands up. Okay. Lower the rope. Okay. You see him? Yeah. You better stand back. Everybody okay? Here's another life. Huh. Okay. Let's get him out of there. Hey, Ben. Look. Huh? Stop raining. Starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger with Joel Samuels, Scott Douglas, Ed Begley, Virginia Gregg, Dick Ryan, Sam Edwards, Howard McNear, and Bert Holland. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, 
the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Hello, Ben. Hi. Mrs. Dempsey show up yet? Not yet. May I have your attention, please? You people out there well, on the other side of the wire... Let me grab a chair. Room. May I have your attention, please? Let me know when she comes in. Huh? Yeah, sure. Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Keep it moving, boys, all the way to the end of the stage. That's it, all the way. Now turn and face front. Speak right out so the people in the back of the room can hear you. Number one, Francis Gilligan, open charge. Step out, Francis, right to the circle. Where do you live? Toledo. Last place you slept in town? 219 Balance Avenue, apartment 10. That on the east side? Yeah. When were you arrested? Night before last. Where? The Golden Gate. At an eating place? Yeah, it's a restaurant downtown. What's your business? Plumber. You'll have to speak louder. I'm a plumber. That's more like it. Anyone with you when you were picked up? I was alone. You have a gun? No. Any weapons at all? No. How about the sap? Yeah, I had that, that a weapon. <laughs> what were you going to do with it? Nothing, just carrying it. Where'd you get it? Found it. Where? Lying on the ground in the park. Okay, Francis, slide on down the line. Number two, Russell Pollard, Grand Theft Auto. I didn't steal nothing. It's all a mistake. We all make mistakes, Russell. Tell us your address. Elliott Hotel. It's on Glen Arm or Tremont. I don't know which. How long you lived there? A couple of days. Where'd you come from, Russell? Cheyenne, Wyoming. Anyone arrested with you? Guy named Dale. Ben. Dale Craig. Yeah. Mrs. Something Dempsey like that, called. Yeah. She's Dale at the 69th Craig, Street Station. No, what's she doing there? On her way What's here, she work, got Russell? picked up for Not drunk and driving. Now. No, no. Working, you won't say anything to leave her. She wants you to get her out. We get her out. Mm. You own an automobile? Oh. I'll see you upstairs. Right. Yeah, Ben. Number three. Hi, Ben. Hi. Anything on the book? Chicago wired about Phillips. Extradition papers ought to be in the mail tomorrow. Mm. Well, I don't mean to change in the night watch. Who have we got? Kennedy and Gomales can stand in for two days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll take it in here. Right. John Guthrie. Lieutenant, this is Bob Tasker. You know, I reported a burglary the 5th of last month. Oh, yes, Mr. Tasker. Now, what can I do for you? Well, I think I have some information that might help you. You know, it's been over a month you fellas have Yes, done. Uh, I know, Mr. Tasker. It's been slow. Uh, would you like to drop in here, or do you want us no, to... No, there's no time for that, Lieutenant. I'm going out on another selling trip tonight. As a matter of fact, my train leaves in 45 minutes. Can you meet me at the station, say the cocktail lounge in 15 minutes? Well, certainly, Mr. Tasker. We'll be there. Thanks. <laughs> That's the one he means, Ben. Uh, it's the only one open. Yeah. <laughs> no. no. I've got to catch the show. Hey. Hey, hello, Lieutenant. Oh. Now I'm looking for you. Got a table over here. Come on. Oh, thanks. And this is Sergeant Asher, Mr. Tasker. Glad to meet you. Buy you a drink? Uh, no, thanks. How about you, Sergeant? Yes, uh, thanks. Sure? Yep. The train leaves in a little while. I travel, you know, on the road most of the time. I hope this isn't a lot of trouble for you coming down here. No, no, not at all. I had to drop by the station myself, but I just didn't want to until I thought about it a little more than I already had. 
But what to cause you any trouble? We pulled the report on the burglary of your apartment, Mr. Tassie. Nothing been recovered yet, I suppose. Well, we're still working on it. Yeah, I'll bet. What does that mean? Things stolen out of my place over a month ago. After I called, it took the police half an hour to get somebody out there. A couple of police were not dry behind the ears yet. Nobody down there cares. No skin off their nose. A man's been robbed. Things taken from his place. And then, uh, yeah, I know the setup. Well, then you know it takes time to work these things out, Mr. Tasker. Sure, Tasca. sure. I know. Typewriter, camera, thought a lot of them. They're gone now. Police don't care. Well, the robbery detail has a description of everything stolen from your apartment. It's on the bulletin every day. Yeah. Every second-hand store and pawn shop in town is being covered. Yeah, sure. I know how it works, I told you. Yeah, well, every day we recover stolen property. When we find your things, we'll let you know. Yeah, sure, you will. I get it. The brush on. Now, uh, look, Tasker, do you have anything to say when you asked us to meet you here? Sure, I did. Now, don't get the idea I had a couple of drinks and just called up to talk to somebody. I got something on my mind. I've been on my mind for a month or so now. I've been around. Your train leaves pretty soon, Mr. Yeah, Tasker. Well, maybe we all ought to have a drink together. Thanks, no. Yeah, thanks again. Okay. I want you to know there's nothing personal in what I said a second ago. You probably are a pretty good couple of guys. We are a pretty good couple of guys, Mr. Tasker. How about it now? Well, look, that place I live in, there's some darn funny things going on in and around there. You know that? You're talking about 1720 North Raft Avenue? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean, funny things? Funny things, people. I guess I noticed them before my place was burglarized, but I never connected it before. I always pay attention to my own business, you see. I don't even know the name of one person living in that building, and I've been there two years. What do you think of that? Well, how does this tie in with the burglary? These people going in and out at all times. That's how it ties in. They're funny, I tell you. Well, how's that? Well, they're... They dress funny, you know what I mean. Big shoulders on their suits, pants all cut big at the knees and tight around their ankles, long hair. I know people, decent people, right people. The kind that I've seen around there lately aren't what I'd call the right people. I've seen them in the hallways, the lobby, and cars parked in front of the place, and it doesn't look right to me. I think one of them did it. You think one of them broke into your apartment? Yeah, I do. Well, any particular one? Oh, well, no, I couldn't say about that, but I think one of them is our man. But you don't know which one? Well, any one of them. Well, uh, tell me, do these people live in the building? No, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Then they visit someone who does live there. Yeah, sure, they must. Do you know who they visit? No. Nope. Why do you think one of these people might have something to do with the burglary? Well, uh, funny, I tell you. You ever have a feeling about something? You know what I mean? Well, sure you do. You two been in the police department and all that. You've got to know. Yes, Mr. Tess. Well, a week ago, I got in from Asheville. See, about eight at night, and three of them were sitting there in the lobby, all slouched down on the couch. A couple of guys and a girl. They all just stared when I walked across to the elevator. Not a word. You see what I mean? Yeah, I see. All of them youngsters, 22 and 23. That little place cost me 145 a month furnished. People like that draped around the lobby make it look like a dump, huh? Yeah. Sure. Hey, sure you want to have a drink? No, thanks. No. And when I was leaving there tonight, a fella standing in the lobby. Funny looking guy. When I passed him, he said something to me. I stopped and I asked him what it was, and he just looked at me and says, You uptown, man? Does this man live in the building? No, no. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Sure. What did he look like? Well, tall, about your height, maybe 150. Had on a dark suit, red hair. How old? 40 or so. Any idea who he might have been seeing there? Oh, yeah, the manager. Oh, what's his name? Uh, it's a woman named Walters, Mrs. Walters. She runs the place. I don't see much of her. Well, how do you know this man had been visiting her? Came out of her apartment. She was arguing with him in the hallway when I got off the elevator. That's when he came up to me. Have you ever seen him around there before? Yeah, a couple of times. Never knew who he visited before. Mm. Were you alone? Yeah. Was he alone? Just with her. Well, did you hear what they were arguing about? No. Mr. Tasker, what was it he said to you again? I I'd like the exact words. You uptown man? That's what he said. You're positive? Yeah. Positive. <laughs> Some kind of zoot talk or something, I guess. I wonder what he meant by it. I've been around, but I never heard anything crazy like that before. Have you? Yeah. Huh? He was asking you if you had any marijuana. I'm the manager here. What is it, officers? A couple of hours ago, you were seen talking to a man. Tall, red-headed man. Is that right? A couple of hours ago? <laughs> no one's been here all night. I've been alone all evening. We'd like to talk to this man, Mrs. Walters. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Why do you want to talk to him? I want to clear up a few things, that's all. Tall, red-headed man. Dark suit. Oh. 
Oh, yes, there was a man here. I guess you mean him. What's his name? Well, I don't know that. He came here looking for an apartment, that's all. I don't have any vacancies, so he left. Uh-huh. Uh, we got the impression that you had an argument with him, Mrs. Walters. <laughs> for heaven's sake, where'd you get that idea? A man who lives here in the building said he saw you arguing with the red-headed man. Who told you that? Mr. Taskin. You know Mr. Taskin? Yes, 308. Well, he shouldn't say things like that. It isn't true at all. Why would I be arguing with the man? Mr. Tasker told us he'd seen the man in the building a couple of times before. We thought he might have been a friend of yours. I never saw him until tonight when he came and asked about renting an apartment. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Have you ever seen him around here before? Not that I know of. Well, maybe he visits someone here in the building. He might have. I can't answer that. What's this all about? Why are you so anxious to talk to this man? Just trying to get a little information. Was he here long? No, he just came to the door. I told him I didn't have a vacancy, and then he left. Did he come inside your apartment? No. Mr. Tasker told us he saw this man leaving your apartment. Then you walked out in the hall with him. I don't know why he'd tell you a thing like that. It isn't true. It isn't true at all. You didn't argue with him? No, of course not. What was it to argue about? Is your husband home? I've been divorced for seven years. Well, we sure like to get this straightened out, Mrs. Walters. Mr. Tasker says one thing, you say another. Well, go back to Mr. Tasker. Don't bother me. What's this man done? You're so interested in him. Well, we only want to talk to him. Uh... He didn't happen to leave a card or anything? No. Well, doesn't he want you to get in touch with him when you have a vacancy? No. Well, here's my card. If he happens to come by again or phone you, do you mind letting me know? All right, but there's not much chance I'll ever see him again. Well, thanks for your help. Sorry to bother you. Good night, Mrs. Wallace. Good night. Nice-looking woman. Yeah. You got a line? Oh. Yeah. Nice. Keep him. I want to look at the mailboxes. Dan. Yeah? She's got two vacancies. Excuse me, Ben. Hold on just a minute. All right. Records and identification, Alexi. Yeah. Booking number? Okay. Half the place is out with a cold. Working kind of short-handed. What you got, Ben? Oh, I like a make and one on this one. Let's see. Margaret Marion Walters, huh? Yeah. Grab a stool. I'll see if we have everything. Okay. I want your cigarette. Oh, get on you? No. Oh, I'm getting hungry. I could go for some of Charlie's ham and eggs myself. Me too. Guy can sure grill a piece of ham. <laughs> Ben? Yeah? You and Pete want to come in here for a second? Sure. Take a look at this. Uh, that's her, all right. It'll take a while to get a package on her. Want me to send it up later? Any convictions? 1938, child stealing. Oh, here's another one. May 1947, narcotics violation. Check through for us. No complaints, no activity reported in that neighborhood. Brainerd or one of them will be up later on. I sent through Tasker's description of the redhead and they're checking. Any coffee around this place? Oh, ran out yesterday. Don't look at me. I bought the last pound. Yes, you did. The apartment building's owned by a man named Shaborn, retired lawyer. He hired Mrs. Walters to manage the place for him a couple of years ago. Asher talked to him this morning. Oh. Shaborn says she's always done a good job, tends her books, keeps the place running like a clock, thinks she's just fine. She gets 75 a month and her rent. 10% bonus for every 12-month lease. Mm. Not bad. Good enough to be driving that for Caddy? Mm, who knows? Shaven gave me a list of all the tenants in the building. Mm. Well, better run it through before we ask any questions. You got a chance to get out there and look at the place? Yeah, nice place. Nice residential neighborhood. Everyone minds their own business. No one bothers anybody else. Mm. Was that all? You think it'd be a good spot to work for? The best. Anything from Kramer and Murph? Uh-huh. Still staked out across the street. No callers so far today. Okay. 
Quine and Asher can follow them. Uh, we'll go on at six. If she's up to her old tricks, if she's selling again, we're bound to recognize somebody who comes along. Right. Well, I'll check back. Well, where are you going? Coffee. Want some? Sure. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll go with you. You stay here and drink that pound you bought. Brinsdale Road, see the woman. 73, a 480 proceeding north on North Randall Boulevard, Lexington, 62 yeah. Edward, 4568, 62 Edward, 4568. Hi, Ben. Hi, Asher. She been in all day? Hasn't stirred. 315, a man and a woman went in to see a state 10 minutes, checked the license tag with DMV, people name of Robinson. 1105 North 8th Street. R and I didn't have anything. It looked like apartment hunters. Two hours early, a man from Columbine Laundry Service, another one selling brushes. Both of them working the whole neighborhood. Anything else? Yeah, 20 minutes ago, a tall guy in a brown suit went in to see it. Drove a gray Ford coupe. I looked at the registration. Thomas P. Jepson, 11691 Bell Avenue. It might be what we've been waiting for. I called R and I for a make on him. A dozen arrests, two convictions, petty theft and possession. Want to go out and get him? Yeah. Don't have to, Ben. He's still in there. What time's it, Ben? Mm. Five after eight. I'm freezing. Wish it'd start getting warm. Hate these kind of nights. Uh. Want to wrap this up? Well, maybe we can do it now. There he is. Yeah, come on. Uh, just a minute there. You talking to me? Yeah, hold it just a second. What is it? What do you want? Police. I'd like to talk to you. Well, I haven't done anything. Got a driver's license? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, just the license. You keep the wallet. Mm hmm. Thomas Jepson. That's your name, is it? Yeah. 11691 Bell Avenue. That's still your address? Yeah. Right here. Now, who do you know lives in that apartment building? Hmm? You've been in that building visiting someone for the last 45 minutes. We saw you go in. We've been waiting for you to come out. Who'd you see in there? Oh, but just a friend of mine. No harm in a guy visiting a friend, is there? What's your friend's name? A girl I know. Walters, that's her name. Mrs. Margaret Marion Walters? Yeah. How long have you known her? Oh, a few months. Do you have any business with her, Tom? I don't get you. When you were in her apartment just now, did you buy anything from her? I don't know what you mean. Did she give you anything then? No. You ever bought anything from her? Hey, you must be on the wrong track. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. She's a friend of mine. I went to see her. I got a right to see my friends. Don't you think so? Yeah, that's right. We're just trying to clear something up. Somebody give you a wrong tip. Nothing to clear up. Well, we have to look into everything, Tom. Did you buy something from her just now? All right, Pete. Hey, stand still. Wait, what is Come it? Come on, Tom. Hold still. I don't get this. I don't get this at all. What are you shaking me down for? Nobody's shaking you down. Don't you have to have a reason for something like this? Hey, Ben. Yeah. Now we have a reason, Tom. Did you buy these things from Mrs. Walters? Did she sell them to you? Okay, you better come with us. name? Thomas Paul Jepson. When were you born, Tom? August 7, 1911. Blue, pale, medium. Turn your head. Now the other side. Okay. Well, Tom? Well, what? What are you booking me for? I haven't done anything. We were hoping you'd be smart about this. What do you mean, be smart? I don't know what you're talking about. This will make your third trip. Aren't you getting tired of this kind of thing? You're in pretty serious trouble, whether you know it or not. Look, book me, jail me, do what you got to do. I'll be out tomorrow. We don't think so. Well, you got nothing on me. I think we have. I went to see a friend. I can do that. Why do you want to go through all this? I don't want to go through anything. Not very smart. Yeah. All right, sit down. Tom. What are you doing for a living these days, Tom? I work. Where? Selling tip sheets at the track. Doing pretty well, are you? Okay. 
Uh, about my car. You just gonna let my car sit out there on the street all night? They'll tow it into the city garage. It'll be okay. What are you gonna do with me? We're just gonna sit here? Don't you like it, Tom? Now, look, you guys, I know a little something. I've been in a squad room before. Tom. Yeah? It's her we want. Well, go out and get her. Nobody's stopping you. Well, we can have both of you. But it's her we want most. Possession's one thing. Peddling's another. Well, Tom? Okay. She's been peddling. Yeah, Ben? You can bring Mrs. Walters in. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the person. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Clayton Post, Victor Perrin, John McIntyre, Peter Leeds, Virginia Gregg, and Tyler McVeigh. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Delvay. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city. For under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Ketchum? Yeah, I'm Mr. Ketchum. Uh, Lieutenant Guthrie. Uh, glad to meet you. Any trouble finding the place? Oh, no. Got booked here once for being drunk a year ago last Christmas it was. I know the place all right. Ain't changed at all. Too much disinfectant. Smell it everywhere. Uh, think you got him, huh? I don't know for sure. And the license number I gave you. I was right, wasn't I? Yeah, we'll see. Want a smoke? Oh, thanks. May I have your Let attention, me. please? You people out there on the yeah, side thanks. of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him mailed. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. All the way to the end of the stage, boys. That's it. Now turn and face the front. Eyes straight ahead. Talk up in a good loud voice so the people in the back of this room can hear you. Number one, Gerald Vanek, assault. Up to the center. Where do you live, Gerald? In 3756 Mariposa Street. What's your profession? I drive a truck, huh? I'm a trucker. Don't look at me. You look out there. Oh. Any weapons on you when you were picked up? In... No. You own a car? Yeah. What make? Coupe, sedan, what? A 47 packet black sedan. What's the matter with your ear? It got cut. How? In a fight. Somebody clouded me with an ashtray. You taking good care of you, Gerald? Oh, sure, sure. All right, slide on down. Number two, Robert Prey, burglary. Robert Prey. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Come on, hustle it up. Where do you live, Robert? Uh, Ashland Avenue. It's 913, I think. Haven't you lived there very long? No, I just slept there the one night. It's a hotel, sort of. Where'd you come from? 
Well, Topeka, Kansas. What kind of work do you do? A painter. Sometimes I do a carpentry. Any weapons? Oh, yes. Gun, revolver. What's the caliber and make? Come on, Robert. Well, you make me kind of nervous. I'm just trying to think. It's, um... 38? Uh, yeah. Smith and Wesson? Uh-huh. Well, is it chrome or blue steel? Can you remember that? Blue steel. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you're welcome, sir. Go on, move. Number three, Edward Franklin. Open charge. Give us your address, Edward. 213 West 18th Avenue. Your business? Construction work. I do steel work, mostly. How long you been in town? Just a week, ten days, maybe. You own a car? Yeah, 46 Buick Cedar Net. It's maroon, but it's back in Pittsburgh. I haven't got it here. Any weapons on you when you were picked up? No, no, nothing like that. What's your weight? 238. Get back against the wall, then. I'm six, three and a half. Just against the wall, huh? Lieutenant? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's the big boy standing right there on the glasses. stage. Uh, Get sure? Take it, you sure? Am I taking them uh, off? Sergeant Cogger. Uh, yes, sir. Number three, hold for interrogation. And uh, tell us what you were doing out at the quarry last night. What was I doing? You know what I was doing out there, Lieutenant. Tell us again. I rented a car to take a look at this town. I thought I might like to work around here, so I just drove around yesterday, that's all. I happened to turn the car around when I got out by the quarry. That was about 8 o'clock, was it? No, it was almost 10, you know that. Where'd you drive? Oh, just around, all over. Uh, do you remember any of the other streets you were on? No, not by name. One of them, a lot of driving theaters along the way. Uh-huh. You uh, rented the car day before yesterday, is that right? Yeah. About three in the afternoon? Yeah. Why'd you rent a Cadillac in? Huh? You could have rented a Ford for $10 a day. Cadillac costs 15 Why? What do you mean, why? Well, $15 a day to look around a new city when you could do it for 10 Seems funny, that's all. I just wanted the caddy, that's all. Nothing funny about that. You had the Cadillac last night and the night before. Where'd you go the night before? Nowhere. I stayed home. And that cad was sitting out there costing you 15 bucks? Yeah, I can afford it. You didn't go anywhere that night? No. But you went out last night? Out looking around, yeah. What time did you leave your apartment? Late in the afternoon, four or five. Why didn't you look around in the daytime, Ed? Because I wanted to look around at night. Uh, after you finished driving around, did you go right home? Yeah. You didn't stop in anywhere? No. How about a drink? You have a drink somewhere along the line? No, I just said no. You're driving around town for five hours. Did you meet anybody? Talk to anybody in that time? No. Now, let me see. You've told us that you came in town from Pittsburgh ten days ago. You took a fairly expensive apartment, and later on you rented a pretty nice car. That's right. What are you doing here, Ed? Looking. Just looking. I might want to live here. You don't know anyone here? No. Nearly everybody has some kind of reason for pulling up stakes and starting in another place. Well, I didn't. I just grabbed a plane in Pittsburgh and came here. Left my car and all my things there. If I decide to stay, I'll send for them. Why'd you leave Pittsburgh? I got fed up. You got fired, didn't you? Huh? You worked for the General Mayor Construction Company there, didn't you? Yeah, for five years. And they fired you two weeks ago. Isn't that the story? That's not the story at all. I quit. Look, Ed, a witness saw you drive up to the quarry edge last night and take a body out of your car. He says you threw it in the quarry and then drove away. Sure. You were identified as the driver of the car. Now, we want to get all the facts we can, clear this up one way or another. It's going to help you and it's going to help us. Now, what happened in Pittsburgh? Well, this guy was working for me. I was foreman, you know. He had a lot of lip. Big man. Not as big as me, but big. Full of talk. Real good with the ladies. He got on my nerves one day, and I let him have it. You mean you hit him? Yeah. Five teeth right across the front. Cost me $600 for dental work. The man didn't press charges? He knew better. Hmm. Your wife living in Pittsburgh now, Ann? I haven't got a... Oh, my ex. Yeah, I guess so. I didn't see her much after we broke up. She charged you with assault once, is that right? I didn't hit her, just slapped her. We never got along. Ed, do uh, you have any idea why our witness would tell us what he did? Why he'd say he saw you dump a man's body in the quarry? Why he'd take your license number and tell the police? No, he must be crazy seeing things. But you were alone in the car all that time you were driving around? 
All alone. All alone. For six hours or better. That's right. <laughs> okay, Ed. Go through? For the time being. All right, Pete. Come on, Ed. Yeah. Yeah? Quine phoned in from the quarry. Anything in? Yeah. They found the body of a man. What do you say, Doc? Use the crane belonged to the sand company for the grappling hooks. After they found the body, the track slipped off. Now it's stuck. They're trying to dig it out. Looks like a mess. They'll get it out. He's over here. Found these things on him. Driver's license says his name's Alfred P. Hansen. 1132 Race Street. A ring, a watch, dollar fifty-three cents, cigarettes. Uh-huh. Hang on to him, Pete. Yeah. All right, Don, take it back. Oh. Pretty young. License was issued three years ago. He says he was 20 at the time. How long do you think he's been in the water? Mm, can't tell right now. Roughly 30, 40 hours. The rock was tied on just like that. A pretty good job of wiring. Yeah. Uh, look up here. Mm? I figure he came over the side. No bruises on his body, no cuts or lacerations. You can see for yourself. Tell more when I get him downtown. Uh, any idea why? Mm, he's drowning all right. He was still alive when he went in. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah, but somebody broke his back before that. Hello. Hello. Uh, does Alfred Paul Hansen live here? Yes. Yes, he does. I'm his sister, Mrs. Kelly. Well, we're police officers, Mrs. Kelly. We'd like to police? talk... Police? Oh, Lord... Is Al in trouble? Uh, my name is Guthrie. This is Sergeant Cargo. Uh, may we come in, please? How do you do? What? Well, oh, well, yes, but I... I don't... Uh, is your husband in, Mrs. Kelly? No, he's in Buffalo. He travels. I don't expect him back until Wednesday. I see. Uh, but... we'd, uh, we'd like to check on a couple of things with you, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, when did you see your brother last? Last night at dinner. And uh, did he leave the house after dinner? Yes. Please tell uh, me. What was he wearing? Why, uh, his tweed suit, I think. Has Al done something? Uh, did you report him missing? No. <laughs> no. Well, he's liable not to come home for two or three nights in a row. He stays with friends he has. That isn't it, is it? It may not be him, but uh, we'd like to have you come downtown with us and look at a body. We've... A body? Oh, no. All right, officers, I'll go. I know how hard it was for you to come down here and do this, Miss Kelly. I understand it had to be done. I know you had your job to do. Thank you, Miss Kelly. Now, uh, you last saw your brother at dinner time yesterday? Yes. At uh, what time was that? About six, I guess. He went out right after dinner. Did he walk or take the car? No. He walked. Can you remember if he had a phone call or made a date to meet someone? No. Any idea where he went? Did he say he was going to a movie or to a friend's house? Oh, he just said... Bye. Now, whatever you can tell us is going to help us, Mrs. Kelly. I I, I suppose you know some of his friends. Mm-hmm. He brought girls over to the house now and then. Boys he'd gone to school with or been in service with. Yes. Well, we'd like as many names as you can give us. Oh, Al had so many friends... Let's see. I guess one of his best friends is a boy named Bud Chisholm. Mm -hmm. You know his address? He lives with his family in Evanside. They have a big home there. And there's another boy, Borden Copeland. He lives in Evanside, too. With his family? Yes. I don't know any of the addresses. I suppose they're in the phone book. Yes, we'll take care of that. Now, who else? Oh... Jack Didis. He lives quite near us. 
on Lafayette Street. D-I-D-D-I-S? Yes. That's all I can remember. If you contact uh, them... You, uh, you mentioned a girl. Oh, one he had over last week, Lucille. Uh, Lucille Malcolm. Sweet kid. Mm -hmm. Any other girls? And Nancy Follett. But she's in the West somewhere now. Uh, did your brother ever work or live in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? No. Did he ever mention a man named Ed Franklin? Ed Franklin? No. I don't think so. He might have a... Mm -hmm. Last night at dinner, did Al have a drink, maybe? No. Well, the medical examiner tells us he had a drink or two somewhere last night. We thought maybe he had it at home. No. Well, uh, uh, do you know some cocktail lounge where he'd go to have a couple of quiet drinks? You'll have to ask somebody else. I, I couldn't say. Sure, sure. Okay, Asher. Right. Inside it. And Mr. Kelly, have you ever seen this man before? No, I don't think I have. He drives a Cadillac convertible. Do you ever come by the house? No, I'm quite sure. Okay. All right, Franklin, that's all. What's this all? Never about? mind, never mind. Well, thank you, Miss Kelly. Sergeant Cargo will take you home. Morning, Ben. Hi. Peter around? Down the hall, talking to some people he rounded up this morning. And some kids' friends? Yeah. We're checking them through R&I right now. Quine and Crockett covering the beer joints and taverns in the neighborhood. Mog sent over a picture. Nothing so far. Mm -hmm. Franklin's still sticking with him? <laughs> Harder than ever. <laughs> he doesn't know the kid, never saw him. Well, if we don't get something today, we'll go to work on him again. Yeah, isn't going to be a cinch. What is? Okay, Jack. Hi. Morning, Pete. Ben, this is Jack Dittis, Lieutenant Guthrie, Jack. Hello. Sergeant Asher. Hi. Jack talked to Al on the phone the night he was killed. Oh? Well, tell us about it, son. Well, he called and asked me to meet him at a place we used to go to now and then, uh, the Midget Cafe. Yeah? I was right in the middle of dinner. Now, what time was this, do you know? Oh, about 8 o'clock, in and around there. He was talking from the phone booth. He'd been drinking a little bit. You mean he was drunk? No, no, just drinking. You know, a friend has a drink and you can tell it. Uh, why did he want you to meet him, Jack? Oh, well, he said he'd met a girl there. He didn't say who, and he only had a few dollars with him, and he didn't have any wheels. Um, he didn't have a car. He wanted me to come by and bring him some money and chauffeur them around. Well, I couldn't go, and I told him so, but well, he called again a little while later, and this time he said I had to come over, and I asked him why. Well, he, he said he thought he could get me in a good fight. You can see how big I am, and well, the guys are always doing that to me. Mm -hmm. A fight with who? Oh, I don't know. He, he said it was a guy he'd met there. Did you go over? Yes, I did. I got there about 10.30, but he wasn't there anymore, so well, I came on home. You say the name of this place is the Midget? Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to find. Just go out 43rd Street, about half a mile past the stone quarry. <laughs> It's nice to be friendly when you find yourself in a strange country. But do you know where in the world you wouldn't walk up to someone on the street, say, got a light bud, and offer the man a cigarette? One place you most definitely wouldn't do that is in Saudi Arabia. In general, Saudis observe the customs of their religion, which forbid smoking. They are also forbidden to dance or to drink alcoholic beverages. If you are stationed in Saudi Arabia or are visiting there... You'd do well to remember something else if you happen to be a smoker. Tobacco is not used in government offices, nor in the presence of members of the royal family. By observing the customs of other countries, you make a friend for yours. Well, what's up, fellas? Routine. I'd like to talk to some of the people who were working here the night before last night. Well, I was on from six to closing. Well, what's your name? Uh, Dave Chrysler. 
<laughs> but they call me Fritzy. Uh, do you know a man named Al Hansen? No, I can't see I do. Edward Franklin? No. Here. Here, this is Hansen. Take a look. No. Hmm? Well, we heard he was in here night before last. Well, he might have been. I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I take it back. I, I served this guy myself. What's wrong with him in the picture there? Uh, what like time he... did he come in? Well, I don't know, but he... he sat right over there. Yeah, I remember that. Tell us what you can, will you? Well, there's nothing to tell. He come in, he had a few drinks, and he laughed. Oh, 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 oh. Thelma sat with him for a while. Yeah, yeah. You want to talk to her? Uh, sure. Where can we find Thelma? Well, she's the bar girl. Night before last, she was off, so she come in and she had a drink. Hey, you want her? Yeah. Yeah, well, wait. Oh, Thelma! Yeah. Thelma! All right. Yeah. Hey, Thelma, these two gentlemen are police officers. They, they want to talk to you. Oh, well, sure. Uh, you can go ahead with what you're doing. Oh, oh yes. Now, what's your full name, please? Thelma Lacey. Mm-hmm. Where do you live? 135 East 16th. Hey, what's the matter? Am I in trouble? Now, we're investigating a homicide. I understand you had a few drinks with Al Hansen night before last. Is that right? Al Hansen? <laughs> oh, Al. Is that his last name, Hansen? Yeah. This is Al Hansen, Miss Lacey. <laughs> oh, sure. He was killed night before last. His body was dumped in the stone quarry down the road. That nice kid. That nice kid. Um, would you like to go outside in the car and talk? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be better. Come on. Okay. Oh, how long have you known him? Well, I, I just met him the other night when he was in here. Mind telling us how you met him? Oh, he was just sitting there drinking by himself. He kept looking at me. I was talking to Fritzy, and, well, I went over and sat down, and we began talking. Made a couple of phone calls, trying to get a friend of his to come over with his car. Did this friend show up? Well, I don't know. I I don't think so. Somebody I knew spoiled it. Well, how's that, Miss Lacey? Well, I... I know this man, sort of. I met him just the other night before. Ed Franklin's his name. He'd been wanting to take me out, and I wouldn't go out with him. He said he'd keep trying. Ed Franklin was in here that night? Yeah. Looking for me, I guess. Uh, Pete. Is this him? Why, yes. But what... How long did you say you've known him? Just one night when he was in here before. What happened? I mean, when he came in and you were sitting with Al Hansen. Well, he saw Al was just a nice kid, and Ed began throwing money around. Told us he was a big stock and bond man. <laughs> night before, he told me he was a lawyer. Neither of us believed what he said. He could tell we didn't believe him either. Al finally called him a phony, and Ed said he had a big Cadillac out in front that wasn't phony at all. Well, I took Al to one side and told him I'd like to have another drink with him, but he'd have to get rid of Ed somehow, or he'd ruin our whole evening. Al told me to pretend I had to go, and he'd meet me here later. The idea was that Ed was only buying drinks and hanging around to try and get me to go out with him. You wanted to be with Al? Sure. He wasn't any phony. He was real nice. Well, so I waited about five minutes, then I said I had to get home. Ed wanted to take me, but I said I had my own car. Instead of leaving, I just went around to the side and waited. Pretty soon, I saw Ed come out. Oh, was he alone? No, Al was with him. He was showing Al the Cadillac. Well, he had it all right, but he still looked like a phony to me. They both got in the car. You saw them clearly? Yes, I, I was in that little room right off the kitchen there, see? But where was the car parked? Oh, right about here. Mm hmm They sat there and talked for a minute, and I saw Al start to get out, but Ed grabbed him. He's pretty big. They talked a little while after that. Yeah, and then what happened? Well, that's it. What? They drove off together, and Al never came back. <laughs> The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Harry Lang, Peter Leeds, Howard McNear, Hal March, Jeanette Nolan, Jack Carroll, and Paula Winslow. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime. Ladies and gentlemen, we took you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American.
darkened city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Portland. Ben, 
And as they have announced, I'm just going to come in. Sure. See you later, Klein. Well, nice yeah, to meet you, Mr. Barnes. Well, sure thing, Lieutenant. Well, real nice to me, so I think it'd be nice very tough for him. Huh? What's up, Asher? Safety drug store, 23rd and Slauson is held up. No, just one person did the job, woman. She got excited and shot the cashier. Doc Gerson doesn't think there's much hope for him. Mm. They get a good description of her? Well, the clerks thought he recognized her. Now, where's the clerk now? Out at the drug store. I was working over in the liquor department right over there. This girl comes walking by, and you know, when you think you met somebody before, you kind of smile and speak. Mm -hmm. Well, she gives me a real cold stare. Uh, are you positive you've seen her before? Well, yeah, I'm 95% sure. Well, where was it you saw her before? Well, I was out in Garden Grove. If it's the same dame, and I'm pretty sure it is, she was a stripper in a nightclub. Uh, how long ago was this? Oh, about a year and a half ago. What was her name? Well, I don't know what her real name was. They call her Babs a Brunette Bombshell. Did anyone see how she got away from here? Yeah, Ed. He works in the candy department. It's up front, right by the door. He said she ran out and jumped in a blue 47 Ford Coupe. He didn't get the license number or anything. Ed gets real excited when something happens. Uh, well, we'd like I don't blame you... him much. I was excited, too. Yeah. Well, uh, we'd like you to come down to headquarters with us, Mr. Wells. See if you can find a picture in the mug file. She may have a previous record. Oh, sure. I'd be glad to. I guess the manager will let me off. I think he will. We'll talk to him. Uh, you stick with uh, Wells, Dave. I'll pick Cogger up and take a run out to the Blue Grotto. Are you the owner here? Yeah, yeah. Nun Roselli. Uh, we're police, Mr. Roselli. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Cogger. What do you want from me? I ain't done nothing. We want some information on somebody we think used to work for you. Oh, well, that's different. Come on back to the office. Very glad to help. Well, a nice day, ain't it? Sure is. No, I wish I had time to play golf or something like that. You know, they ought to build a golf course with floodlights so people like me with school hours could play the game. <laughs> Isn't that a bad idea? <laughs> Well, sit down, fellas. Uh, how about a drink? No, no, thanks. You? No, thanks. Okay, fellas, what can I do for you? About a year and a half ago, you had a stripper working for you. She was called Babs the Brunette Bombshell, remember? Hmm, can't say that I do. year and a half ago, huh? No. Well, you know, I, I hire a lot of them dames. Got two working now. Well, wouldn't your payroll record show it? Well, sure, fellas, I ain't got nothing to hide. Let's see, a year and a half ago. Now, that would be, uh... October 1950 through January 51. Yeah, that's right. I got the records right here. What'd she do? Well, we... I'm not sure she'd done anything. October, November, December, January. Well, you, uh, think she's about to do something? Here, Pete. You take these. Pull anybody with a first name, Barbara. Right. I don't keep any description of the girls. Uh, this must be something big, huh? Excuse me, boss. I got a call out here for Lieutenant Gutley. Oh, thanks, bartender. Come <laughs> on. Gutley. This is Klein, Ben. Dr. Gerson called. The cashier at the drugstore just died. Oh. Do you have a family? Yeah. Wife and three-year-old kid. Asher went out to see him. Right. Do anything you can for him. Thanks, Klein. Something big, Mr. Roselli. The girl we're looking for held up a drugstore and killed the cashier. Gee, what do you know? Well, it don't surprise me too much. Like I said, they're a funny bunch, these strippers. Well, nothing here, Ben. Clean as a whistle. Okay, Pete. Guess that's all we can do here. Thanks, Mr. Roselli. Yeah. Oh, say, if you don't mind a suggestion, I, I just got a great idea. Why don't you check with my booking agent? Now, where is he? Over on 14th Street, 743. Jerry Gold, nice guy. He knows every stripper in town. Well, how do you do, gentlemen? What can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Gold? That's right. And uh, Mr. Roselli over at the Blue Grotto Center. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. A good friend of mine. What kind of talent do you need? Well, we're looking for information right now. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Cargo, Police Department. You're the... Oh, 
Well, we'd like some information on a girl that bills herself as Babs, the brunette bombshell. Well, sounds like a stripper. Yeah, that's right. She worked the Blue Grotto about a year and a half ago. Uh -huh. Well, there's a big turnover in that kind of an act. Might have something in the file. Yeah, I'll take a look. See you Check with the records and see if there's a warrant on her. Right. Uh, 
When would she get these headaches, Mr. Haynes? Oh, no particular time. She'd get them, and then she'd take the car and go for a ride. When she came back, she'd be okay. Mm -hmm. Do you ever go with her when she did this? Oh, no. She wouldn't let me. You never knew where she went, eh? No. Well, okay, Mr. Haynes. Thanks a lot. Well, I sure hope you fellas are wrong. I still don't think Bob would do anything like you fellas said. I, I never could understand some of the things she did, but I sure don't think she'd kill anybody. You know where she is? No. Did you see her go out today? I never pay attention to what goes on around here. I'm just the manager. I ain't no cop. Well, we checked and she isn't in her room. We'd like your passkey, please. What for? You guys ain't supposed to go in her room. What do you want from her? What did she do? We think she held up a drugstore. No feeling. You sure it's her? We think so. How about that? A criminal living here. Did she get away with much? Not much. But she shot and killed the cashier. Oh, my goodness. Wait till my husband hears this. He never did like her. Uh, couldn't we have your pass key, Mrs. Reed, please? Well, I guess in a case like that, it'd be all right. Wait a second. Think she's moved up? Yeah, I doubt it. Hey, uh, think there'd be any shooting? Not unless she starts it. What are you going to do? Wait in her apartment and hope she comes back. Oh, my goodness. I'd stay inside the apartment, Mrs. Reed, just in case there is trouble. Don't you worry, I will. All right, let's go, Kim. Oh, my goodness, wait till my husband hears this.
blue. What's all this about? Did you meet anybody at the beach? No, I don't have to put up with this. From here, you drove straight to Cypress Cove? Yes. Did you go out to Slauson? Yes, if you think I'm going to put up with your... You said a little while ago that you weren't in the neighborhood of 23rd and Slauson. I just drove to the beach and went out Slauson. Did you stop anywhere on the way? No. You didn't stop in a drugstore? No, I told you I didn't stop anywhere. You said you weren't in the neighborhood of 23rd and Slauson, too. Your car was seen leaving the safety drugstore at 23rd and Slauson. Well, somebody made a mistake. I'm not in any trouble. I don't... I, I haven't done anything. Okay, have it your way. Let's go down to the station. What's who? Suspicion of robbery and murder. <gasps> Why, you must be off your rocker. You mean I'm under arrest? That's right. You're under arrest. Do you ever work at the Blue Grotto, Mrs. Haynes? No. What's the Blue Grotto? Oh, you ever in the entertainment business? I was a dancer for a while. This is crazy. What are you guys after? Why don't you tell us what you really did today, Mr. Oh, Payne? Leave me alone. I don't feel well. I've got a headache. You have a lot of headaches? I didn't do anything. Why don't you let me go home? Well, if you have a lot of headaches, maybe you ought to go see a doctor. Tell me, Mr. Doctor. Well, then. Mr. Wells, is this the woman you saw in the store this morning? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's her. All right. You want to tell us about it now, Mrs. Haynes? All right. I did it. I had to have money. It takes a lot of money. Get a stenographer, Quine. <laughs> transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Just any of those empty seats. Uh, Quine. Oh, hello, Ben. Uh, which line are you the boys in? Mm, first line, I think. Let's see. Yeah. Tommy Young, number one. Ernest Conway, number two. George Holstapp, number three. Mm-hmm. All in the first bunch. These all the witnesses? Yeah. Hope they can do us some good. May I have your attention, please? <laughs> People out there on the other side of the line of the audience room, may I have your attention, please? My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. <coughs> Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call out the number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspects, have him out. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, swing on the line. All right, keep it moving. Walk right over the end of the stage. Turn, face front. Hands at your sides. Look straight ahead. That's right. That's a big room out there. A lot of people in it. So you'll have to talk up so everybody can hear you. All right, number one, Tommy Young, murder. Take your hat off, Tommy. Don't look at me. Look at the people. Where do you live, Tommy? Regency Hotel. You'll have to talk up. Regency Hotel. Thomas Young, 16 arrests, two convictions. Grand theft auto, narcotics violation, served eight years and three months, Leavenworth. Year and a day, state prison. Who are you arrested with, Tommy? You know them. Better talk a little louder. You know them. A little louder. 
You know them. Ah, who were you arrested with? Ernest Conway and George Halstamp. They're right back there, standing against the wall. Just keep facing the front. We can see them. Well, good for you. You boys work for Lester Udo, don't you? We don't work for nobody. We don't even get along. I guess we're what you call anti-social. That isn't what I'd call it. Oh, that's pretty funny. Uh, I hope you have a pleasant stay with us. <laughs> well, that's even fun. Next, number two. Ernest Conway murder. All right, Ernest, come on. Move up the front of the stage. Yes, sir. And take your hat off. Yes, sir. Ernest Conway, 22. <laughs> two convictions. Assault with a deadly weapon, breaking and entering. Served five years at Sing Sing. Who are you arrested with, Ernest? Tommy Young and George Halstead. Any weapons? Uh, yes, sir. I kind of think there was. What were they? Well, near as I can remember, two knives, probably six guns. Any of you three boys ever been in a cigar store on the corner of Lucas and Jefferson? Couldn't say about the other two boys, but I don't smoke. You work for Lester Udo, don't you? Who? Lester Udo. Don't believe I know the gentleman. All right, thank you. My pleasure, Sergeant. Next, number three, George Hawkstamp, murder. Get your hands out of your pocket. Where do you live, George? Fine Park. Where? 119 Sutton Drive. You boys sure don't like getting arrested, do you? Depends on who. What's your business, George? Keeping my nose out of other people. And what were you doing in a cigar store last night? Who says I was in any cigar store? Well, you know Ernest Conway. Yeah. Wait till I ask the question. I knew what you were going to do. You'll wait anyway. Oh, don't yell like that. You scare me to death. Stand up straight. I'm tired. Asher, show him how to stand up straight. Okay. Okay. How's this? Sloppy, but it'll do. Forget it, Asher. He gets the idea. George Halstamp, 28 arrests, three convictions. Grand theft auto, served six years state prison, narcotics violation, served a year and a day county jail. Assault, served three years in state prison. How old are you, George? Three. You don't work for Lester Udo, don't you? No. All right, step back against the wall. Are there any questions or identifications from the audience? Sergeant. Now look, folks, you don't have to worry about any of those men. They can't see you. They don't know who you are. If any one of those men have come into your shops and intimidated you, just tell us and we'll see that they don't bother you anymore. Any questions or identifications from the audience? Well, how about it? Uh, uh, uh. Mrs. Fisher? No. I don't think I've seen any of them. No, no I, don't, I don't know them. Mr. Henderson? Did one of those men come into your shop the other day and try to push you around? I don't know. I don't, I don't think they did. Well, look, if you recognize one of them, or even all three of them, please tell us. I promise you nothing will happen. Uh, no, no, I, I don't think I've seen any of them before. No, no, I don't... None of you? No. No identification, Sergeant. Folks, I can assure you that these men can cannot... Sergeant, no. run on the next bunch. Okay, run them off. You want to see me, Ben? Yeah. This one's got me a little salty. Uh, you, you didn't expect the witnesses to make an identification, did you? Well, I had hopes. None of the others have. Why should these be any different? Because this time somebody's been killed. All the more reason for not saying anything. They're scared, scared stiff. No. I'd probably be just as scared. I got families to think about. I know it. What do you want to see me for? Because uh, it's going to be a little while before I cool off. Well, if you're not going to take it out on me. Mm-hmm. Unless to you, though. I'm going to tell him what I think of him. He knows what you think of him, Ben. I haven't ever told him. What do you mean? Sure you have. Not all of it. You better cool down. After I tell him. You think that's a good idea? No. Well, then forget it. He knows it won't do any good. No. Okay. I mean, no, I'm not going to forget it. Then. I know I'm not using my head, but doggone it. Okay, he... okay. You want to come along? Wouldn't miss it. You think it's a mistake, though, huh? Uh-huh. You wouldn't do it, huh? What do you mean I wouldn't do it? Sure, I'd do it, but I still think it's a mistake. If it was up to me, I'd do just what you're doing. But I can't see why you should be as stupid as I am. Well, I haven't pounded a beat in a long time. 
I could use the exercise. Thanks, Hudo. All right, what can I do for you? Got three of your boys down in the tank. Three of my boys? Young Conway and Holston. Young Conway and Holston. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd still like to know what I can do for you. I got them booked on a murder rap. Young Conway and Holston. That's right. So what's that got to do with me? One of those boys beat up a man named Goldberg. Beat him up bad. Goldberg died. One of those boys did it? That's right. Who says so? I don't. That isn't much good, is it, Lieutenant? I can't hold him on that, can For 72 hours. Sure I can't buy you a massage and a drink? I didn't come down here to play with you, you know. Well, fine. So just what did you come down here for, Guthrie? You've been running numbers free and easy in this town for a long time, you know. You've got every small businessman intimidated up to this his eyebrows. This is a sermon, Lieutenant. You pushed him around, scared him to death, and made yourself about four million a year. You say that, too. Now a little guy named Goldberg doesn't want your lousy racket in the shop, so one, two, or three of your gorillas try to change his mind. Wait, you sir. listen to what I have to say, you Not know. Not when you're running off at the mouth. You'll listen and like. Not that kind of libel I won't listen to. You go chase yourself out of here. Come back with some proof before you start calling names. You don't like something, then get out. You're out of line, Guthrie. I don't have to sit here and take anything from you. You know. Yeah. Why don't you have us thrown out? No, oh, that's not a bad idea, Sergeant. I think it's a fine idea. I'd love for you to start something. If I did, you'd be back pounding the beat. Might be worth it. You're trespassing without a warrant. That's right. Then get out of here. I swear if it's the last thing I'll do, I'll have you both busted right back to directing traffic. You know something, you don't? I don't think you can do it. I'd like to see you try, though. So would I. Which one's it going to be, you know? Have it thrown out or have it busted? Well, one thing's sure, Guthrie. You and your muscle-bound friend are out looking for trouble. And very honestly, I'm not a bit worried. So try and start all the trouble you can. There's no law says I got to sit around while you do it. Oh, you go somewhere. Now, look, I put up with an awful lot. The lieutenant's got something to say, and you're going to listen to it. Boy, you two-bit flatfoot. Who do you think you're trying to cross? I don't think you understand. You're darn right I don't understand. Who put you up to this, huh? Who did? You're both too smart to pull off a stunt like this. Who wants to ride me? You just don't get it, do you? No, explain it to me. The lieutenant's in a nasty mood. That's it, huh? That's it. Now, you were going to call your boys or have us busted or walk out of here. We say you're going to listen. Well, what's it going to be? Shoot off your face. Go ahead. Get it off your back. You've got a lot of people scared, you know. A lot of people worried about what you might do if they point out one of your boys. One of your boys went a little far this time. I'm going to get him, and I'm going to get you. That's all of it? For a while. Then get out. You get it now, don't you? Get what? We just wanted you to know how much you scare us. anything on him. He's still a citizen. He's got a barrel of ink. A rotten barrel. I don't care how rotten it is. It causes trouble. And you're a cop, a servant of the people. 
You can't go pushing people around just because you're a hothead, no matter who they are. Okay, okay. Oh, what am I talking to you for? Get out of here. Pick you up in the morning? If you get out on the right side of bed. Seven o'clock. Yeah. Ben. Yeah? You have fun? <laughs> yeah, Charlie. A lot. I couldn't identify any of the men who had come into my store. I lied. Two of those men been in my store. They made me sell the numbers. They pushed me around. Which two men, Mr. Anderson? Tommy Young and George Holstein. Get a stenographer, Pete. even make one of them crack and implicate you, though. But we still won't nail anybody for the murder. And the rap isn't tough enough to scare it out of them. No, not these boys. But Udo will be plenty worried if he knows that we've got a witness that'll send two of his boys to stir. All right. Then keep up we've got quiet until the trial is set. We just pick up Young and Holstamp and say nothing about Mr. Henderson. Well, he pick up Mr. Young and Mr. Holstamp, yes. But I want Udo to know who our witness is. And have no witness at all? And Henderson has agreed to help us out. He knows just what he's up against. Now, look, Charlie, all he wants is his family to be out of the way in a safe place. Well, we can do that, but then you know how tough it is to... Look, so does Henderson. I'll have three detectives on him 24 hours a day, but I want it to look like he's alone. You know no dummy. He knows uh, you wouldn't let a witness out on the streets without protection. Well, I'm going to put an obvious man with Henderson. When we think one of Udo's torpedoes are ready to go to work, we'll pull the man off, make it look like he's got lazy... I want somebody to try for Henderson. It's the only way we'll get any of the Udo crowd to tell us about the Goldberg murder. Okay, but how are you going to know when Udo's boy gets ready to go to work? I've got somebody on everybody Udo knows, even his mother. Want some coffee? Oh, I've had seven cups already this morning. No. I think I'm catching cold. Well, everybody's got one. Anything on Udo? Uh, he's laying low. None of his boys have even gone near Henderson. Who's with Henderson today? Ames Fisher and McCarthy. Coins playing it out in the open. Yeah, I think McCarthy's wife's supposed to have his baby any day now. Shouldn't you want to give him a shower or something? Oh, what's the matter? Oh, thanks. I just tried to gun Henderson to bring him in now. That Udo tagged in case Conway wants to talk. Okay. Well, morning, Lieutenant. Oh, Ernest. You don't look so happy, Ernest. Too darn early in the morning, Sergeant. I hear you tried to take a shot at our witness. You know something? I should have known better. I must be getting plum feeble in the head. Knew you had one cop on him, spotted him right away. Then when he went outside for a smoke, I never figured you had more boys on Henderson. Big stupid me just thought how lucky it was that cop went off and left Henderson like that. Well, we all make mistakes, on it. Yes, sir, I guess so. But I sure do feel silly. And we're going to try our best to see that you get life. Yes, sir. So you'll have company. Hall, Stamp, and Young will get five to ten. Now, that ain't much company. Look, fellas... 
I'm just a country boy, and I put my foot in it, but I figure you got something on your mind or you wouldn't be down here. We want to ask you some questions. Yes, sir. We want to make a deal, huh? We don't have to make a deal. You mean if I was to tell you who done that killing, you wouldn't help me out of prison a little earlier? Life's a long time. You turn states, and it's bound to be easier. How much easier? Well, maybe ten with time off for good behavior. We don't know. Well, ten's a lot better than life, fellas. I don't mind doing time because I got plum careless. But just being a country boy who likes fresh air, I don't think I could stand it for the rest of my life. George Holstein killed that fella. Who was with him? You got him locked up. Tommy Young? Yes, sir. Where were you? With Mr. Udo. You can ask him. I'm going to. Boy, I sure did make a mistake, didn't I? You sure did, country boy. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before you the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Ben. Yeah, hello, Asher. 
Interesting? Yeah. Anything interesting? Oh, not much. Robbery, assault, nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah. I'll stick around for a while. See you later. Uh huh. May I have your attention, please? You people on the other side of the wire yeah. in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when asked for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among them. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get the natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Okay, keep it moving. Right over here at the end of the stage. Come on, come on, move it. Turn her face front, hands at your side. Okay, now when I call your number, step out and speak up so everyone can hear you. Number one, James Philman, robbery. Where do you live, Jim? 3829 South Anchor. That's on the south side, isn't it? Yeah. Is that a house? It's a hotel. How long you lived there, Jim? How long? Uh, I guess... Maybe about a year, maybe. I'm not quite sure, but I think it was about a year. Where'd you live before that? You remember? Yeah, but I can't think of the name of the place. Seaside Hotel? Yeah, 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 that was the name. That's on the south side, too, isn't it? Yes, in Washington, near Belmont, I think, down near the river. Were you arrested with anyone, Jim? Yeah, two guys. What two guys? What are their names? Bob and uh, some... Uh, I didn't know the other guy. Bob Myers? Yeah. Number 10. Yeah, he's in the line. Other guy is, too. Point him out. Bob? The other guy. I'm sure. Him, number uh, seven. Eight. Oh, yeah. I forgot to count myself. Number eight, Stanley Quig. I, I just didn't remember it. Okay, face front. You have any weapons on you, Jim? Yeah, a gun. What kind of a gun? Describe it. 38. Any other weapons? Not on me, just a 38. How about the other two boys? Oh, yeah, sure. They both had a gun. I think maybe Bob had two. Bob had two guns? He did when we left. He said he liked to carry two guns. Some guys are funny. You have a car? On the job? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of a car? Describe it. Some kind of a sedan, big one. I think it was a Buick. Pretty good car. What color was it? Dark. I don't know exactly. You don't remember much about it at all, do you, Jim? I was pretty busy, Sergeant. I'm sorry if I didn't stop to remember what color the car was we swiped. <laughs> okay, step back, Jim. <laughs> yes, sir. Number two, Arthur Davis, assault. Step out, Arthur. Mm -hmm. Where do you live? On Sherborne, 8865 West Sherborne. What's your business? I'm a physical culture instructor. You're working at it? Sure, I've got my own gym. What do you do, exactly? Get people in shape. You know, lose weight, get a good build. I got the best gym in the city. You're a pretty big boy. <laughs> 230. Oh, you can let the air out. Huh? Relax. I am relaxed. What'd you hit the man with? My fist. Why'd you hit him? He got nasty. He was one of the customers in your gym, wasn't he? No. He was in your gym. Yeah, but he wasn't a customer. He just came up to find out about the place. He was thinking about working out. Did you know him? No, never saw him before. Ben. Oh, yeah, Clyde. Uh, Can I see you? Say, sure. Nasty, huh? Yeah. A little load of the muscle, man. Yeah, yeah. big boy. 2.30. Marks. marks about... Uh... Now, what's up? Just got a call from a woman. Waitress working in a bar on Lincoln. Said there was a guy in the bar with a gun. What do you mean, a holder? No, this guy's just sitting in the bar with a gun. Just sitting? According to the waitress. Says he just went nuts and pulled a gun. Won't let anybody in or out. We better get over. Yeah, the waitress said she thinks the guy's liable to kill somebody. Some guy trying to get in the door. What's the matter with this place here? Hey! Something wrong? Yeah, the door's locked. I can't understand it. All the lights are on and everything. Well, let me try it. Yeah, it's locked, all right. I don't get it. Come to this bar much? Oh, sure. I just live around the corner. There. Maybe Tim don't know it's locked. He knows it. Huh? You know the place very well? Oh, yeah. Hey, who are you guys? Police. Is there another way in? The cops. What's wrong in there? No, we're not sure yet. Is there a back door? Well, I don't know about a back door. I guess there must be, but I, I've never used it. Who's Tim? Hey, Tim? You said maybe Tim doesn't oh, know... Oh, Tim's the guy who runs the place as a bartender. Come on, Quine. Let's see if there's a back door. Now, there's a window. Oh, there is? Yeah, men's room. It's down the alley. Thanks. Ben. 
Yeah. If there's a guy in there with a gun, how'd the waitress phone out? He wouldn't let her, would he? Oh, I wouldn't think so. Yeah, there's a couple of windows. Second story. That guy was a big help. Hey, here's the door. Ah. Hmm. Now, that window's not too high. If you give me a boost. Let's try it. Make it. Yeah. Hey. Uh, are you the police? Yeah. Who are you? Oh, I'm the girl who called you. Ben. All right. Can you grab my hand? I think so. I... <laughs> Who's she? Girl who called. I, I've been hiding in here. I locked the door. How'd you phone? Well, there's a phone in the hall. I was in the hall when the guy pulled the gun and started yelling. Where's he now? Well, I guess he's still in there. I don't know. I haven't been out of here. I was just going back in the bar when this guy started yelling. Yelling? Yeah, I don't know what he was saying. He was just yelling crazy-like. I looked through the curtains, and there he was, standing by the bar and waving his arms and yelling. He's nuts. Well, the front door's locked. Yeah, he did that. That's when I went to the phone and called you and came in here and locked the door. Uh, Tim went around the bar to shut him up, and that's when he pulled the gun and told everybody not to move or he'd start shooting. I've never seen anything like it. Didn't he see you? I was in the hall looking through the curtains. When he pulled that gun, I ducked and went right to the phone. Couldn't you hear him yelling when I was talking to you on the phone? We didn't take the call. He stopped before I got in here. I'm scared. I think that guy's going to shoot somebody. Well, you'll be all right in here until we get him. Yeah, I was going to climb out of the window, but I thought I might break my leg. You'll be all right in here. Come on, Quinn. How are you going to get into the bar? Just walk in, I guess. But he'll shoot you. Well, we'll be careful. Okay, now uh, lock the door again. Yeah, I sure will. If we want back in, my name's Guthrie. This is Quine. Uh, Guthrie and Quine. Now, don't open it for anybody else. I sure won't. Watch yourself, fellas. I don't hear anything now. Oh. Good thing there's not too much light. Bar must be on the other side of those curtains. See him? Yeah. He's sitting on a bar stool by the front door. Yeah, he's got a gun, all right. Can we get him from here? The room's full of people. If we missed, it wouldn't be nice. Can we just walk in? Well, two of us might scare him. One of us might get away with it. What if he doesn't go for it? I don't know. I'll go in and you stay by the curtains. Okay. <clears throat> hey! Huh? What? Who are you? Oh, me? Yeah. Who are you? What are you doing in here? Well, what are you talking about? I've been in here. Who do you think you're kidding? Well, I've been in the men's room. I was sitting right over there at the bar. Don't, don't move. Uh, hey, what's the, what's the idea of the gun? Don't move or I'll kill you. I got six shots and I'll shoot six people. Well, now, look, look, I, I don't want to cause any trouble. You weren't in this bar before. Well, I was, but I'll be glad to leave if you want me to. Stay right there. But is this a holdup or something? No, this isn't a holdup or something. Who are you? Well, my name's Guthrie, Ben Guthrie. Now, I don't want to cause any trouble, mister. Now sit down and shut up. All right, all right. <laughs> shut up! Honey, honey. Every one of you better be quiet from now on. I don't want any more crying like that. Is it all right if I have a drink? Go ahead. Uh, can I serve him? If he wants a drink, go ahead. Expect him to get it himself? Dumb bartender. Uh, what'll it be? Serve him. Okay, I am. I had the same to him. Huh? The same. He was here before, wasn't he, bartender? Yeah, sure he was. Then give him the same, you stupid bartender. Don't! Don't reach in your pocket. Well, I was just going to pay him. You don't have to pay him. Drink your drink. Maybe your last one. Drink it. Okay. Who are you? Police. Stop that talking. Well, I was just saying... I don't I... care what you were saying. Now, you listen to me, every one of you. I don't want anybody talking unless I can hear him. I don't want anybody talking at all unless I say so. First person that talks again unless I say so, I shoot him. I don't think you were in this bar before. Me? Shut up! I don't think you were in this bar before. Were you? Answer me! Well, sure, sure I was. Was, Wasn't I, Tim? Uh, Sure he was. I'll ask the questions. Who are you? Well, I told you. No, you didn't. Who are you? My name is Ben Guthrie. What do you do? I'm a fisherman. I don't think so. Well, I show you my commercial fishing license. I don't want to see it. You know who I think you are? No. I think maybe you're a policeman. I think you came in here to stop me, but you haven't got a chance. Well, I, I'm not a policeman. You came here to stop me, and I'm going to kill you. Don't do it! Shut up! 
You're a policeman, aren't you? No. No, but I'm going to get out of here. Sit down. He's not a policeman. I know him. You shut up, you stupid bartender. I'm going to walk right out that door. Try it. Go ahead and try it. I'll kill you before you open the door. You kill me and you'll hang for it. Go on. Just try to go to that door. I'll shoot you and then that stupid bartender and a few more people. You'll hang if you do. Just me. I'll kill six people and I'll hang just me. You know anybody else who'd have that much guts? You think I'm afraid? Drop it. Oh, you stupid. I got Hold it again. Hold it now. Hold it, everybody. Hold it down. Take it easy. It's all right. It's okay, folks. Take it easy. All right now. It's okay, honey. It's okay. Well, you had me worried. Well, if I hadn't have walked for that door, he wouldn't have put his back to you. Thanks for the help, Tim. Sure. I need a drink. Uh, it's okay, folks. It's okay now. It's okay. Uh, how is he? He's coming around. Whatever made you tell him you were a fisherman? <laughs> I don't know. I guess when he pointed that gun at me, I thought, where would I like to be right now? I thought about fishing. Well, I guess that's as good as anything. This is Alfred Hotkick speaking. About eight centuries ago, when armies of crusaders were clanking their way to the east, they took pains to avoid one particular sheik. He was popularly known as the Old Man of the Mountains. This sheik and his fanatical followers made a practice of slaughtering any crusader within reach. To work themselves into a proper frenzy for their efforts, these forerunners of murder incorporated chewed an eastern variety of hemp known as hashish. The intoxicating effect of the hemp made the sheik's followers almost irresistible fighters. For obvious reasons, these warriors were called hashashin, that is, hashish eaters. The Indian word hashashin entered medieval Latin as assassinus and later, of course, became our word assassin. The murderous implications remain the same through the years. The frenzy of the hashish eaters is found in an assassin. Going. Oh, hi, Pete. Gone up the police ward. I just heard about it. You had quite an evening. The third floor, please. Yeah, we had quite a time. Guy's crazy, huh? He sure went off his nut in that bar. Who is he? Name's Charles Williams, according to the identification in his wallet. Lives at 107th Street. After we took him, he shut up like a clam. Uh, what's going on? Went over to Williams' house to see what he could find out. A doc. Oh, hello, Ben. Okay. Hi, Doc. I'm a little tired. How's Williams? I got him in B under restraint. Yeah, you're not bad, huh? No, but I think he could be. He won't talk to anybody. I called him the psychiatrist, but what I know, I'd say the man's a definite paranoid. Hmm. Uh, Pete, uh, call and see if Quine's back. If you just tell him to meet us over here, I want all the information he might have gotten. Right. <clears throat> Williams definitely isn't all there. Well, you should have seen him in the bar. You pulled a gun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we are. I don't know whether he'll talk to you or not. Mr. Williams? Mr. Williams? I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Williams. We don't want to keep you strapped down like this, Mr. Williams, but unless you talk to us, we have to. Well, nothing's going to happen to you, Mr. Williams. I'd just like to ask you a few questions. I don't think he's going to say anything. Uh, Mr. Williams... We'd like to be able to notify your family that you're here. Mr. Williams, try and understand. Oh, ben. Okay. Ben. Yeah, what's the matter with you? Small talk to Quine. Quine's over at Williams' apartment. And what's happened? Quine says Williams has got a brother. He started to bring him down here, and the brother pulled a gun. What? 
He made Quine call and say if we didn't let his brother loose, he'd kill Quine. Small. Get Quine up on the roof. The roof? When Ash and I got here, we went right up to the room. Couldn't find him, and nobody in the building saw him come out. And we searched the whole place and found him up on the roof. We got Quine lying on his face, and he's sitting behind a ventilator right on the ledge. Have you talked to him? Yeah. He swears he'll shoot Quine and then jump if we don't get his brother over here. Ash is up there now trying to talk him out of it. What good's it going to do him if we do bring his brother over here and he lets Quine go? We can't turn his brother loose anyway. But if we can get Quine out... We can't bet on that. And by law, his brother's in our protection. Brother has to give his consent before we can move him. Well, he'd certainly do that if he thinks he's getting out for good. Well, he can't even talk at this point. What's the other brother's name, Small? John. All right, let's go up. You have to walk up one flight. All right. Get everybody out of the building? Yeah. You think this guy's serious? I don't know. He sure acts like he is. He's down there, behind that vent to the left of Asher. I'll wave Asher over here. Now, where's Quine? You can't see him from here. He's around the corner of that wall. Uh-huh. Williams don't even talk to me now. Quine all right, Asher? Yeah. There's just some way we could get a shot at him. How about from another roof? I don't think you could spot him. He's wedged between that big vent and the wall. Maybe if you talk to him, Ben. Yeah. Well, there's Quine. John? Yeah? Lieutenant Guthrie's here. Has he got my brother? No. Better get him. I'll give you another half hour. Ben, you shut up. Don't listen to him, Ben. I told you to shut up. Relax, Quine. It'll be okay. It won't be if you don't get my brother up here. I'll give you half an hour, and then I'm going to shoot Quine and jump. Hey, John. Yeah? I can't get you, brother. You better. I can't get him because he's too sick. Who are you trying to kid? He's in the hospital, right? You've got right? a half hour. If you don't have Charles up here by then, I'm going to shoot Quine in the head. Ben. You keep your mouth shut. Now, you better go get Charles, Lieutenant. What are we going to do? I don't know. Can't get at him from here. How about a guy coming up from that side of the roof? If someone stood here and kept his attention... How do you get up that side of the building? No fire escape, no nothing. It's ten feet from the top floor to the roof. Call the fire department. They'll figure out something. You better get him, Lieutenant. You got 25 minutes. Get going, Small. All right. What if the fire department doesn't do us any good? We'll get the brother over here. We may be breaking a few rules. Those rules. But I'm not going to take Look, a chance John, with Quine. Why don't you give this thing up? Get the brother, Probably. Asher. Right. Throw out your gun. You won't get away with it. You just keep lying right there. Move an inch and I'll kill you. John. Yeah? We're bringing your brother over here. You better hurry. I'm going to see how close I can Come on, John. Watch yourself. You'll never get away with it. I am getting away with it. That's far enough, Lieutenant. Well, I want to talk to you. Do it right from there. Well, now, look. What good's it going to do to get your brother up here? I said don't come any closer. Listen to what he says, John. You'll never get off this roof. Ben. I'm okay. Next time, I'll hit you. Now, turn around and get back. I mean it. Now, listen, John. Come on, talk. Turn around and walk back. Get my brother up here, I'll do just what I said I'd do. You got 20 minutes. What's going on, Ben? Hello, oh, Doc. William's brother has Quine on the roof. Says he'll kill him if we don't let his brother loose. Well, I won't be responsible. He's gotten violent. I've got him in a jacket. Well, I just want to get him up on that roof. On the roof? Oh, Ben, I tell you, Williams is in bad shape. What are we going to do? With it has to be done, Doc. It'll be tough, but that's what we're here for. Okay, Ben. What's your plan? Chief Parkinson has rigged one of his ladders on the side away from Williams. Asher here will go with one of Parkinson's men and come on Williams from the off side while we try to keep him occupied with his brother. You said, Asher? Yeah, Ben. Okay. Now, look. Give us five minutes and then start up. I'll try to keep him talking. Don't kill him unless you have to. All right. Okay, Doc. Let's get Williams out of the ambulance. All right. Open it up, boys. Pete and I will carry him. All right. There we go. I've given him sedation. He's out, but I don't know for how long. He's liable to start raising a fuss. That's good, boys. All right. Grab an end, Pete. All right. You want me up there? Yeah, but don't come out on the roof until I call you. Might be some trouble. I hope this will be all right. Yeah, so do it I. It sure sounds crazy. Well, you hear that guy on the roof...
Okay. Yep. <clears throat> How much time we got? Uh, not too much. Asher should be starting up about now. Oh, I'd hate to climb up that ladder. Oh. Oh. Hey. Oh. Yeah. He's coming out of it. All right, get the door. How long do you think it'll take at you? Uh, I don't know. That's a long climb. Okay. Set him down. Uh. I see. Uh. Hello, Charlie. Uh. Uh, he's not around yet. Uh. John? Yeah? Here's your brother. You got him? Right here. Charles? He can't talk to you. What do you mean he can't talk? Charles! I told you he's sick. He can't what talk. What did you do to him? We didn't do it. Charles! Charles! He's on a stretcher. I told you he's in the hospital. What's wrong with him? What did you do? We didn't do a thing. He's very sick. Bring him over here. Bring him closer. Okay, let's go, Pete. You stay here, Smith. Uh... Right. Bring him over and leave him so I can see. Come on. All right. We're coming. That's fine enough. Put him down. All right. Charles. Uh, uh, I can't see him. Go on, get back. Get off the roof. Uh, John, listen. Go on. If you've done anything to him, I'll kill Quine. Go on, get out. Your brother's... Get off the roof. Uh, There's Asher. Charles. Charles, say something. Uh, Go on, you two. Get off the roof or I'll start shooting. Charles. Robert. Quiet down. Oh, cow, what a session. Yeah, he's had it. Couldn't help it. Started shooting. Yeah, that's probably better. I nearly swallowed my gum when I looked up and saw you stick your head over that roof. I thought I was losing my mind. I'm beat. You ever climbed a ladder this high? I don't think I'd like it. Take my word for it. If you ever decide to leave the force, forget about being a fireman. That's a dangerous job. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, is written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Lineup has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Chicago. And chewing gum. The refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment the lineup. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment we will take you by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. 
Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment, plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Thought I'd walk in right in the middle of it. Oh, starting late. Pete's got a full house tonight. Sixty-five. Sixty-five, eh? Yeah. More coming in every minute. Forty-two since three o'clock. University and Highland Division picked up ten. <laughs> three from Harbor Division. Uh, two gunmen don't walk into Siemens National Bank and hold it up every day. You know, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything on the gun? Uh, serial numbers filed off. Haven't been able to bring them out so far. The car wasn't any good at all. Lab's been going over it since three o'clock. It's clean. Ah, uh, maybe something will turn up here. Well, I hope so. All the witnesses show? Uh, yeah, all but two. The, the tall man with the glasses in the first row is Jeffries, the head cashier. A mm-hmm. uh, man beside him is a bank guard. No. Yeah. On the right there are the seven tellers who are on duty. The Strickland, Ollinger, and Voorhees sitting with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it kind of messes up Ollinger's vacation, huh? Yeah. Uh, Crockett and Murphy were the other guard and the three customers who were there when it happened. I spread them around. Uh, over there, there. Uh-huh. Well, that'll be a long session. Yeah, so it seems. Now, here we go. Yeah, I'll be with Asher. Right, Ben. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention? Uh, hi. Hi, Ben. Thank you. Warm night, huh? You My said name it. Is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications... Please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Got a match? Uh, Keep it moving, Mm -hmm. boys. All the way to the end of the stage. That's right. All the way across. Now turn and face the front. Keep your hands to your sides and your heads up so the people can see what you look like. Speak right out when I ask you questions. Okay, number one, over to the circle. Thomas Alexander, Grand Theft Auto. Get your hands out of your pockets, Thomas. Oh, okay. Where do you live? 216 Race Street. How long you lived at that address? Eight months. You own a car? Not anymore. Finance company. Any weapons when you were arrested? Huh? Any weapons when you were arrested? Well, No. Stand up straight. What's your business? I'm a cook. You're cooking a restaurant? Is that what you mean? Yeah. What restaurant? Pioneer Grill, 42nd and Pioneer Boulevard. How long you worked there? Uh, two years. I never been in any. Is that, is that where the officers picked you up? Yeah. When? Last night. You speak Italian? Huh? Can you speak Italian? Understand it? I. No. Any other language besides English? No. Slide on down. Number two, Frank Bernard. Murder. Give us your address, Frank. That's 2325 Longmont Avenue. At a hotel, apartment, or what? No, it's just a friend's place. He put me up. (coughs) You own a car, Frank? Yeah. What kind? Color? Well, it's a 51 Buick. It's a Roadmaster. Uh, It's convertible. It's green. Any weapons on you when you're arrested? Do you hear me, Frank? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, yes, I was carrying a thirty-two automatic. It was a Webley. Pretty nice gun, Frank. Have a permit to carry it? <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. What's so funny, Frank? <clears throat> nothing, Sergeant. Nothing. You don't have to look down at the floor. Nothing to be bashful about. Let the people see your face. Sure. Who was with you when you were arrested? Nobody. What about Anthony Vincent? Wasn't he with you? Well, not exactly. He was dead. Were you at the coroner's office this morning? Did you see Anthony Vincent's body? Yeah. 
Anyone else there you know? No. What about Robert Custer? Oh, I don't know anybody named Custer. He was a police officer, Frank. A patrolman. Oh, him? Oh, yes. I saw him. Yeah, but I didn't know him. We think you killed him, Frank. I didn't know him. Number three, Brooks Knight, assault. Number three, Knight. Okay. Sleepy, are you? No, no, no. Where do you live, Brooks? Queens. The last place you slept? Jasmine Hotel on Gilbert Street. Where do you work? I don't. What kind of a car do you drive? 39 Merck sedan. Anybody with you when you're arrested? Yeah, my wife, Mary Jane. Mary Jane Knight? Yeah. Those are the clothes you were wearing? When? When you were picked up. Yeah, I guess they are. Don't you know? I guess I didn't pay too much attention. I had a couple of drinks. Yeah, so they tell me. Well, I don't see why I land here if I want to have a drink or two. You're in for assault, Brooks. Well, you guys met my wife. What else could I do? <coughs> Got a mouth down to the size of a boxcar. If only she'd keep her mouth shut once. Just once. That's all I asked her to do, but no. She had to go on and on and on and on. It was embarrassing. Yeah. Well, Wasn't it pretty embarrassing to get picked up for slugging her in a public place? Too, I was yeah. so mad I could have killed her. I mean, you nearly did. Some I'm turn out. Yeah. Well, you'll have a chance to cool off. Carl Smiley called me ten minutes ago, Ben. Wanted to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Said it was something you'd be interested in. You've been helpful for poor. Talked like it might be the Seaman Bank thing. Here's a number. It's a booth somewhere. No. Said he'd wait for you to call him back. All right. Use that one. Okay. You see the file on Becker? Yeah, there's an FBI kickback there, too. Narcotics? Two counts, possession and peddling. Federal men will be in tomorrow to talk to them. Got a supplementary on it. Yeah, you better shoot it in before you leave tonight. I will, Captain. Hello? Hello, Carl. Yeah. Who's this? Uh, this is Lieutenant Gus. Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. Sorry I didn't recognize your voice. Uh, uh, say, Lieutenant, can I see you right away? Well, sure, Carl. Come on down. I'll be... Uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, how about meeting me someplace? This is important. Uh, how about the corner of 10th and Vallejo? Vallejo and 10th. Okay. Be there in 10 minutes. Said he's got something that's going to help. He wants me to meet him at 10th and Vallejo. Got any money, Ben? Yeah. Uh, 20 bucks. Oh. Well, then you better take this. <laughs> Better wait here, Asher. Right. Oh, Carl. Hello, Lieutenant. How you been? Oh, fine. What do you have, Carl? Well, I hate to talk here, right out the open. No. You want to sit in the car? No, no, no. It wouldn't be good. Uh, let's duck up the alley, huh? Sure. Well, this far enough, Carl? I guess so. Y- you know, I'd get it pretty quick if, uh, if I was seen with you, don't you, Lieutenant? Well, nobody's going to see you here. All right. How's this? Oh, it's a big risk I'm taking. How about that other one, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the city pays for it, doesn't it? No. No. Well, y- you want to wind this thing up, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you ever hear of Don Smiley? Well, who's that? Guy I know, Ron. Met him at the parole office a month or so ago. How long has he been out? Oh, just a few weeks. I think maybe he can help you. Why, Carl? Uh, had a drink with him the other night. You know, talked about something big he had coming up. Bank job. I I didn't figure he was making too much sense being on parole and all, but when, when I heard about this Siemens thing this morning and, and then read the descriptions in the paper, it, it sure sounded like Don Smiley to me. You don't know for sure. No, I, I'm just telling you what I know. The paper said two men. One of them lost his hat and his gun. They said he was tall and bald-headed. It sure sounded like Don Smiley to me. Hmm. You know anything about his partner? Uh, just Smiley. Uh, no idea who he was working with. When he told you he had something big in mind, didn't he mention any names? Oh, no, no, no. Did you ever see him with anybody? Just saw him around. Never with anybody. You sure? Well, sure. Just, just, just saw him around. Where can I get in touch with you if I need you? Yeah, well, uh, I'll phone you if you like. Say, uh, tomorrow morning. All right. Stick around, Carl. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. Uh, you just look up Don Smiley, Lieutenant, and ask him some questions. He won't have the right answers. Mm-hmm. 
Well? You done, Smiley? Yeah. Police, I'd like to talk to you. Well, what about? My name's Guthrie. This is Sergeant Asher. Hi. Come on in. This place don't look so good. Wife left me a couple of weeks ago. I'm not very good at keeping house. What are you doing these days, Smiley? What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm working. That's what I'm doing. Where do you work? The Corwin's driving. I'm second cook there. Mr. Frankly got me the job. Now, who's Mr. Frankly? My probation officer. Oh, he's real good to me. What hours do you work? Uh, most of the time, I wake uh, 11 in the morning, 7 at night. Sometimes I wake 7 to closing. Uh, it's pretty nice, though. I make 48 bucks a week. Who's your boss? Mr. Kerr. He manages a place. Uh, hey, look, fellas, I'm not in any trouble. I had enough of that. We didn't say you were in any trouble, Smiley. This is just routine. You tell us what we want to know, huh? Oh, sure. But I hope you don't think I'd be dumb enough to take any chances of going back there. Oh, six years is about all a man can do. Okay, Andrew. Yeah. Oh, you, you ain't going to find nothing in there. That's j just this room, see? There's it's a bath over there. The bed comes out of the wall. It's not much, but it's better than up there, I'll tell you that. What's on your mind, officers? I'd like to know if you worked this afternoon. This afternoon? Oh, no. No, I didn't, know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's after nine right now. You going to work tonight? No, this is my day off. I get one day off every two weeks. What'd you do today, Smiley? Well? I'd like to know what you've been doing all day. Well, I'm sleeping mostly and waking on my model here. I learned how to make these things a long time ago. They're pretty nice, huh? Yeah? I'm going to paint it red as soon as I sand it down a little more. Mm -hmm. You've been in here all day? Yeah. Eat here? Yeah. I got a little icebox. But now I'm just fixing to go out for dinner. I'm pretty hungry. Can you prove you've been here all day, Smiley? Mm, I don't know. I haven't talked to anyone. Anyone phone you? Uh, no, nobody. But I've been here. Took me all day just to do that one wing. How could I you go You want a brown suit, Smiley? Huh? Brown suit. Do you have one? Oh, you were in a closet. You saw I didn't have one. You, you, you fellas really got something wrong. I haven't broken parole. I haven't done anything. I wouldn't do anything. You know that. You, look, you can talk to, to Mr. Franklin, my parole officer. He knows I'm working hard and I'm keeping my nose clean. You, you ought to talk to him. He, he'll tell you. Hey, where's the phone? Uh, just out there in the hall. Okay. Right. Hey, please, well, what's this all about? A man answering your description held up Siemens National Bank today with another man. About your size, coloring, wore a brown suit. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Oh, no wonder you're checking around. Well, I ain't going to get help you about this. I know you got your Thank jobs you. to do. I'm sure glad I'm not in any of that kind of thing anymore. Yeah. Landlady know you? Yeah. Okay. She see you here today, maybe? Yeah. Well, I don't know if she did or she didn't. Mm -hmm. By the way. I emptied the garbage cans once. I went out... Smiley, they pulled your package downtown. The people from the bank recognized your picture. Huh? But they must be crazy. I've been here all day. All 13. They're still down at the lineup. Okay, Smiley. Well, look, you guys, I told you. I don't do things like that anymore. Come on, Smiley. I won't go back. Now, don't try to make me do something I didn't want to do. Come on, Smiley. No, don't, don't take me down. I, I've got to be the white tomorrow. Come on, now. No, no, look, I've got to finish my model. And no, don't. Don't. <laughs> Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying outdoor sports or other activities. Wrigley Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, back to the lineup. <laughs> Oh, 
Hello, Smiley. Feeling better? It feels terrible. Maybe you'd feel a little better if you told us all about it. But there's nothing to tell you. I don't care how many people looked at my picture. I didn't help no one hold up no bank. Where'd you get the $4,000? Hmm? The $4,000 you had stashed in the radiator in your apartment. I saved it. Bundles of 500? Seaman National Bank wrappers. Come on, Smiley. It'll be better for you, better for us. Who'd you work it with? Jack Shannon? Who? Jack Shannon. I don't know anybody named Shannon. Oh, that's funny, Smiley. Warden told us you were in the same cell block with him. I don't know anybody named Shannon. Who was it, Smiley? I don't know. I, tell you, I don't know. You worked the job with him. No, I didn't. I didn't work no job. And I'm tired. We're all tired, Smiley. We've been up half the night. You know, we have to keep on this. I'm hungry, too. We'll all have something to eat when you finish telling us about it. Smiley? I got nothing to tell you. Well, we're going to find out sooner or later. You might as well tell us what you know now. It'll help when you're arraigned. Now, what do you say, Smiley? Uh, did you talk to Mr. Frankly? Your parole officer? Yeah. Oh. Pretty disappointed in you, Smiley. He went to a lot of trouble for you, getting you the job at the drive-in and all. But I haven't done anything. We to don't pr- need a confession to get an indictment, Smiley. There's enough to put you right back where you started from. And that's what we're going to do. Now, how about it? You want to make it easier? I tell you, I got nothing to say. Okay, Smiley, that's it. Take him down and book him, Pete. All right. Yeah, hey, Quine. Frankly's here, Ben. Can I see Smiley? Hold it, Pete. Mr. Frankly's here. He wants to see Smiley. I don't want to see him. He's right outside the door, Smiley. You'll have to see him. I don't. Can, can you send him away? I'll, I'll see him later. You afraid of him? No, oh, no, I ain't, I ain't afraid of him. I, I just don't want to see him, that's all. Look, um, do me a favor. I'll tell you all about it. And not now, Quine. Tell him tomorrow morning. Right. Oh, uh, send in a stenographer. Yep. Uh, sit down. Yeah. Jim Sanchez. He's from Michigan. You people don't know him. Oh, we'd like to meet him, Smiley. Where is he? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You worked it with him, didn't you? Yeah, but I wouldn't know where to start looking for him if I had to find him. How'd you meet him? What does he do? I've known him for years. First time at the correction school. Then I ran into him a couple of weeks ago. It was his idea, the whole thing. The idea was we pulled the one job and, and divvy. That's the way we worked it. Mm-hmm. You talked it over first, didn't you? Sure, we talked it over. Well, how'd you get in touch with him? He came around to the driving. How many times? Just once. You mean you planned it all out in one sitting? Hmm. We talked on the phone, too. He called me a couple of times. Did he have a car? No. Nothing except the one we picked up for the job. Didn't drive a car when he came over to see you? No, he took a bus. He must have mentioned where he lived. No, he didn't. What uh, kind of a guy is he, Smiley? It's a guy, just a guy. Hard, tough, what? Good with the ladies, maybe? I didn't ask them. Good dresser? Yeah, yeah nice clothes. You know if he worked around town anywhere? I don't know that. But I'm sure he didn't go out of town. He's too smart to go anywhere for a while. What'd you do after you left the bank? We took the car over on 42nd and split up the money and left the car. Where'd you go? I hopped the bus. Where'd Sanchez go? He started walking up 6th Street. Is that the last time you saw him? Yeah. Well, how about it? Didn't he uh, phone you later today? Not today. But he phoned before? Yeah. What were you going to do with your part of it, Smiley? Well, I thought I'd just sort of save it and try to find a little place for myself. I didn't like living in that apartment. Now, how about Sanchez? You ever say what he was going to do with his money? No, he didn't talk much. Oh, yeah, he said he wanted some new clothes and a new car, and that'd use up practically all he got out of the job. No, it wouldn't, Smiley. Huh? He's got $20,000. But I only got four. We were splitting 50-50. Were you? Another game, Ben? Okay. Deal him. Yeah. That's midnight already. Hmm. Nine, nine. I have to get somebody out yeah. there to relieve Asher pretty quick. Yeah, you start. Okay. Oh, don't need it. Neither do I. Oh, this one either. Oh, thank you. Well, what do you know? 
Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, anybody would say freeze. <laughs> well, come on, Ben, give up something. Oh, you're impatient. Uh, and thank you. Welcome. This is from Michigan, Ben. Selling a package on Sanchez Airmail Special out of here by morning. And this picture came over on the wire. Okay, let's see. Mm, pretty young looking. Yeah, it was taken when he was 19. It would make him 32 today. Three arrests, one conviction. Fall from Lansing on car theft, 1933. Uh-huh. You want a supplementary now? I can wait till the rest of it comes. No, I'll get it out there. Okay. Well, I've had enough. Well, don't you want to finish the game? <laughs> it is finished, Pete. Huh? <laughs> Jim. Let me see. <laughs> Look. Oh, no. <laughs> that was Asher. You run across something. Yeah? Yeah, about 10 o'clock tonight, a man who gave his name as Paul Dorsey bought a new car at Exchange Motors over in Highland. The manager says he paid all cash for it. Description fits Sanchez pretty well. Hey. Dorsey gave a 10th Avenue hotel as his address. Asher checked it. No one like him registered there under any name. Exchange Motors? Uh-huh. Well, they only sell foreign cars. Yeah, he bought a nice little Jag. Mm, shouldn't be too hard to spot. Not hard at all. The car has to be serviced before he can take it. He tried to talk them into staying open and working on it for him, but they wouldn't do it. Said he'd be in to pick it up first thing in the morning. He, uh, he might go right uh, back to the garage and not even come in the front. Uh-huh. Um, what do you want me to do if he does come in here? You don't have to do anything, Mr. Zeman. That's well, the first all-cash customer we've had in three months, and he turns out to be a bank robber. No, we aren't sure about that. He might not be at all. Well, I hope you're making a mistake. I can see your point. <sighs> Wish you'd come in right away and get this thing over with, one way or the other. Well, relax, Mr. Zeman. Nothing to worry about. Yes, well, I certainly hope you're right. I suppose you fellas know what you're doing. Well, we like to think so. Hi, Pete. Ben? Sergeant Cargill, Mr. Zeman. Mr. Zeman, the manager here, Pete. Oh, yeah. Uh, fine. I want you to stick by him here in the offices, Pete. Yeah. Coin on the street? Yeah, all set. Crockett and King in the alley. Asher's out back. Well, that about covers it. See you a little later, Mr. Zeman. Uh, uh, uh wait. Uh-huh. Um, will there be any shooting? No. How can you be sure? This man you're looking for carries a gun. Carried a gun when you robbed the bank, didn't he? Mm, there won't be any reason for it here. He's coming here to pick up a new car. It's already paid for. Well, uh, sometimes there is shooting, isn't there? Sometimes, yeah. Well? We'll handle it, Mr. Zeman. We've done these things before. Well, why don't you and I go back in the office? I'd like to see some of your catalogs in these cars you're selling. Uh, well, oh, yes, I suppose so. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. You know anything about these things? <laughs> I'm learning. A sweet job. Yeah. Don't you think you'll pick it up? Then nobody could pass up coming in for this. <laughs> What's funny? You in coveralls. <laughs> phone in and get a new detail down here. Think it's worth it? Two men will be in there. Uh, it's a long day. Yeah. How's Zeman? Yeah. Couldn't stand the suspense. Went home with a headache. Hmm. We still got ours. Yeah. Wonder why he didn't show. Uh, search me. Hold it, Pete. Huh? Taxi out front. Uh, could be him. Sure could. He's coming in. Yeah. That's him, all right. A quine spotted him. He's covering the entrance. Okay. Let him come up. Hello? Hello. Mr. Zeman around? Well, he's out right now. You, Mr. Dorsey? That's right. My car's supposed to be right. Re- hey. We're police officers, Dorsey. I'd like to talk to you downtown. What? Hey, take the hand. Oh, I mean... You have a permit for this? Well, uh, yes, of course. Let's see it. Well, I don't have it with me. I left it home. And where's home? Yeah. What? Where do you live? I have a hotel room on 10th Avenue. 1935 10th? Yeah. 
You aren't registered there. I tried to find you there last night. What is this? You people don't have any rights. Is your name Dorsey? Yes. Have your social security card with you? No, who, who carries a thing like that? Driver's license? No, I, I don't carry a billfold. I use a clip. What do you want with me? I don't understand this. We'll straighten it out downtown. Come on. Uh, you can take me down, but you aren't going to straighten anything out. I'll tell you that. This way. I don't get this. I don't get it at all. What's it all about? Aren't you going to tell me that much? Sure. Don Smiley told us all about you. He signed a confession last night. Oh? Huh? Don Smiley. The man you pulled the seaman's job with yesterday. I don't know anybody named Smiley. Know anybody named Sanchez? No. You don't know very much, do you? Uh, just a minute. No, yeah, what? You really got Smiley? How do you think we got you? Okay. I'm Sanchez. We know it. I'd like to see my car before... I mean... You're looking at it. Huh? Get in. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant mm. Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect... The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by E. Jack Newman, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Peter Leeds, John McIntyre, Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, Joe Duvall, and Benny Rubin. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, The Lineup. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, we will take you by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city or under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment, 
plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Ben? Hello, Quinn. How many tonight? Oh, a bunch. Uh, 43. Mm-hmm. Anything interesting? Usual. You want to stick around? Yeah, quiet upstairs. Oh, um, Ash has got a birthday. Oh, oh, yeah. Tuesday, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You ought to get him something, huh? Sure. But what? Mm, I don't know. Hadn't thought about it. He's got a watch, hasn't he? Uh, yeah. May I have your attention, please? Maybe a sweater or something. <laughs> yeah. The I'll get with you later. The side of right. the wire in the audience room. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you'll see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. <laughs> okay, keep it moving right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn and face front, hands at your sides. Now when I call out your number, step out and face the room. I want you to talk up so everyone can hear you. It's a big room, there are a lot of people out there, so talk right up. All right, number one, Warren Gilman, robbery. Keep your head up, Warren. Where do you live? Main and Broadway. What is that, a hotel? Yeah, it's a hotel. What's the name of the hotel? Uh, the Fillmore. Well, they've been there a couple of days. How long have you been in town? A couple of months. About, yeah, two or three months. You with anybody when you were arrested? Yeah, the guy I was sticking up. Oh, Any weapons? What do you think I was sticking them up with, my finger? <laughs> I'll ask the questions, Warren. Sorry. Any weapons? Yeah. What were they? Just one, just a gun. Okay, what kind of a gun? What caliber? What? 38. What make and color? Chrome or blue steel? Make, uh, Smith and Wesson, I think. It was blue steel. You uh, always wear glasses, Warren? Yeah, except when I go to bed. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest you be quite so funny in court tomorrow. Sorry. Step back. Number two, Barney Babbitt, robbery. Stand up, Barney. I am. Well, raise your head a little. As far as it goes, I got arthritis. Better see a doctor. Right now? <laughs> we got nothing but comedians tonight. No offense. Pardon me. You arrested with anybody, Barney? No, I pulled it along. Any weapons? You ever heard of a shoplifter carrying a gun? Just answer the question. I didn't have no weapons. Where do you live, Barney? East side, River Street. Where on River? The Atlas. Hotel? I guess so. What do you mean, you guess so? Well, some ben. of the folks who hmm? live there... Oh, the hi, Asher. Can I see you? I'm oh, sure. Signs says hotel, but I can't guarantee you. What's up? Small just called in. Hit and run. A woman. Hmm? How is she? Dead. Hi, Doc. Hello, Ben. How long do you think? Oh, I'd say she was killed instantly, about 45 minutes ago, maybe 50. 15? Well, had to make it around 7 o'clock. She was hit over there and dragged here. 58 feet exactly. Well, then the car was driving on the wrong side of the street. Yeah, then the car backed away. See those tire marks? Mm. Made a U-turn, went in the opposite direction. Uh, any identification, Small? Uh, stuff in her handbag scattered all over the street. Here's a sales slip for some kind of a green dress. Maybe the one she's got on. Name an address on her. Uh, Mrs. Albert Lobdell. 1984th Street. That's only a couple of blocks away. Okay, Doc. You can take it away. Right. Anything else? Several pieces of glass from broken headlight. That's about all. Any witnesses? Nobody saw or heard anything, but a woman over here says she knew the victim, Mrs. Judson. Uh, this is Miss Judson, Ben. 
She discovered the body and made the report. I was How never so shocked in my born days. Like to thought I was going to faint. Tell the lieutenant what you told me, Mrs. Judson. Well, I was on my way home from the drugstore when I saw her lying there all. Well, I got so scared, I almost ran all the way back to the store and called the police. We don't have a phone. I didn't know who she was then. It's dark around here. Uh, you her neighbor, ma'am? Well, I tried to be. What do you mean? Well, Mrs. Lobdell wasn't a very sociable woman. There aren't many houses around here, as you can see, and the few of us that live here ought to be friendly. Uh, what do you think Mrs. Lobdell was doing here? I tried to make friends with her, like a good neighbor should, but she wasn't much for being sociable-like. Uh, what do you think she was doing out here two blocks from where she lives? Well, going to the drugstore, same as I was, likely. Mm. You always use this route? All of us out this way do. It's a shortcut. I see. The bus stops at the drugstore, too. Maybe she was going somewhere. She was all dressed up in a new outfit. She told me only yesterday, well, that's when she bought it, that it was the first new clothes she bought since she got married. Has she just been married? Oh, no, no. They got married about six months ago. Oh. They should do something about street lights here. It's well, just... thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll report that. Give you the creeps around here. He wouldn't think you lived in a big city. Well, thanks very much. Your poor husband. He's the one that gets my sympathy. Yes, ma'am. Kind of liked him. He was more friendly yes, than she... Yes, thank you very much, Mrs. If there's Ch anything else you want to know... Uh, we'll get in touch with you. That officer has my address. We don't have a phone. Yes, thank you again. Again. Small, as soon as you can, get those pieces of broken headlight down to the lab. Going over to see the husband? Yeah. This is the place. You check in with Central. I go tell him. Right. Yes? Mr. Lobdell? Yes. What is it? I'm Lieutenant Guthrie, police department. Police? Uh, may I come in? I'd like to talk to you a minute. I don't understand. Please. It'll be easy to talk inside, Mr. Lobdell. Oh, all right. Please sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Let me clean this place up a little. I have a bad habit of scattering the paper all over the floor when I'm reading. <laughs> Alice, my wife, raises the roof. Uh, that's why I'm here, Mr. Lobdell, about your wife. Uh, my wife? What do you mean? She's had an accident. Alice, in an accident? When did you last see her? Well, I imagine it must have been an hour ago. What is it, Lieutenant? What's happened? Do you know where she was going? Of course I know. She went to the drugstore to, to, to get some medicine for a cold. Was she wearing a green dress? Yeah, I think she was. I, I still don't see... I her. just want to be sure. Well, where is she, Al? Your wife's dead, Mr. Lobdell. I'm sorry. What? Hit and run, two blocks from here. Dead? We found a handbag, and your neighbor, Mrs. Judson, identified her. Oh, no. No. I hate to tell you like this. Uh, Mr. Lobdell. Yes? Is something burning? Burning? It smells like something's burning, maybe in your kitchen. Oh, oh yes, I... I guess she left the fire on. She she was coming right back. I'll get it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's all right. Burn yourself? I should have known better. I'm going to use something to pick it up. The soup. She put on the soup for dinner. You better put some butter or something on that hand. That's all right. Oh, oh. Can I see her, Lieutenant? We want an identification. They took it downtown. Uh-huh. Yes? Oh, it's uh, Sergeant Asher. He's with me. How do you do? Uh, ben, I just got a call. The hit and run was picked up. The person who killed? Only the car. We haven't got the driver yet. Headlights smashed and the fender Where? Was in the rear of an old shack near Harbor and Yoakum. Registered owner's a guy named Parkus. Lives on Dogan Street, about two miles from where he ditched the car. All right, we'll go over. What should I do? If you want to go downtown, you may. Ask for Sergeant Cargan. Sergeant Cargan? Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Lobdell. I... I'm sorry about this. Yeah, yeah. I better get my coat. Good night. Night. Good night. How'd he take it? Oh, pretty good. Ben, what did you do to your hand? I burned it on a pan full of tomato soup. You, you what? Uh, good deed for the day. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes your job seem easier. 
Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying outdoor sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, back to the lineup. I just got here. Uh, this is Mr. Parkus, Lieutenant Guthrie. Yeah. How do you do? Find my car? He claims a report of his car stolen, Ben. Did you check it? Yeah, I called in. Then you haven't found it. Whole squad of police. Not one of you guys knows anything about it. Well, it takes what? a little time, Mr. Parkus. Any old model like that, I suppose you people don't consider it important. Now, with one of those thieves there, things. We've you... found your car, Mr. Parkus. Why didn't you say so? You didn't give me a chance. I'll get it. Well, where is it? Look, I'd like to have my car if you don't mind. I'd like to talk to you about your car if you don't What do you mind. want to talk for? Just bring it over. I get it stolen, I want it back. What do you got to talk for? Thanks. Big deal. Car gets stolen, every cop in the city wants to hold a convention. Uh, excuse me, uh, that was traffic, Ben. Uh, Mr. Parker's reported it stolen, all right. Sure he did. I told you I did. Now, what time was it reporting? 7.35. You're satisfied. Now, can I have my car? Uh, not yet, Mr. Parkus. Where were you driving at 7 o'clock? I wasn't driving anywhere at 7 o'clock. I don't see that it's any old business anyhow. Well, it happens to be police business when a woman is killed by your car. What you getting at? About a half an hour before you reported your car stolen, a woman was killed by a hit-and-run driver. We have proof it was your car. You can't pin it on me. Mr. Parkus, we're not trying to pin anything on you. We'd just like to know what you were doing at 7 o'clock. Ah, uh, you... Somebody steal my car to report it to the police. They accuse me. Nobody's you... accusing you of anything. We just want some information. What are you looking at, Sergeant? This whiskey bottle. Oh, so. It's a whiskey bottle. Cool off, Mr. Parkes. And the man drinking his own house? Yeah, I had a few drinks. It doesn't make me drunk. Can you tell us what you were doing at 7 o'clock? You didn't ask me what I was doing. You asked me what I was driving. I answered that question. Okay, Mr. Parkes. What were you doing? Playing pinochle. The game was over. I went out to get my car. I saw it was gone. That's when I called the police. Who were you playing with? A friend of mine, Joe Bacicalupi. Mind if we call him? Go ahead, call him. Uh, what's his number? Northridge, 56. That uh, won't do any good. He won't be home. That's why we broke up the game early. He said he had to go to Calvindale. He won't be back till tomorrow. You know where we can reach him in Calvindale? No, he didn't tell me. I didn't ask him. Ah, it's too bad you didn't ask him. What do you mean? We're going to have to take you in, Mr. Parkes, until your friend can verify your story. Morning, Ben. Hi. What's the lab report on the Parkers car? Fingerprints all belong to Parkers. Lind on the seat matches the jacket he's got on. Mm-hmm. Morning, Quine. Uh, this is Parkers' friend. His name's... Uh, uh, what'd you say your name was? Bacicalupi. Giuseppe Giovanni Bacicalupi. Yeah. Well, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Well, everybody call me Joe. Uh, have a seat, Joe. Uh, grazie, grazie, Dante. You know Mr. Parkers? Oh, sure, sure, I know him. What's the matter for Parkers? He got a trouble? Well, we don't know him. That's what we're trying to find out. Oh, uh, Parkes has got a temper just like a 60 wild cat. Ma, he's a good man, see? Mm-hmm. Were you with him yesterday? Sure, Mike. We play Pinocchio. All the time I beat him, he get to so mad he, you know, kind of see the cards. <laughs> uh, what time did you start playing? Uh, well, it was uh, maybe, maybe five o'clock. Five o'clock. Uh, do you remember when you finished the game and left the house? Well, I think, uh, I think maybe half past seven o'clock. Uh-huh. Well, how did you know it was half past seven? Well, it's important I go to Calvin Dale. See, I tell Parkes, my, he get mad and he say we play one more time. 
I look, I look at my watch, it's half past the seven o'clock. He called me names, my laugh when I go juice to the cell. Well, thank you, Joe. I guess that'll be all. My, 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 my Park, is he, he's okay? Yeah, yeah, I think he'll be okay. Oh, that's a good, because uh, the Park is way, a nice Joe, one. He's Joe, a, I look at him. Joe. That seems to take care of Parkers, Ben. Yeah, sounds up the alibi. Think I'll run out and see Milliken. Who's Milliken? Lobdell's boss, Milliken Auditing Company. He's a bookkeeper there. Oh, you got something? I don't know. You want me to come along? No, uh, while I'm going, get out a warrant and search Lobdell's house. Take cargo with you. Okay. Oh, Nasher, on your way back, stop at the grocery store and get me a couple of cans of tomato soup. What? Get them, two cans of tomato soup. Oh, sure, two cans of soup right away. Lobdell's been with us for, oh, 20 years. Can't picture him getting into any trouble, Lieutenant. Oh, we don't know whether he did or not, Mr. Mulligan. I, um, uh, I wish you wouldn't tell him anything about our talk. Oh, yes, of course. Did he drink or gamble or anything like that? No, not to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. I'm sorry to take the time. Uh, wait a moment, Lieutenant. I do recall an incident that occurred about, uh, two weeks ago. Yes, sir? One day, Lobdell asked me if he could stay and work that night. Said he wanted to clean up some account that had been piling up. Now that I think that he seemed a little nervous when he asked me. Was it uh, unusual for him to work late? No, no, it wasn't that. He's worked late many times. I mentioned it only because of what happened later. Oh, what was that? Well, Mrs. Milliken and I went to the movies that night, and we got out rather late. Those double features run awful long. It was close to midnight, and we had parked near the Star Apartments. Mm-hmm. Well, just as I was about to drive away, I noticed uh, Lavadell going into the building with a woman. My wife's the one who really called my attention to them. She said, look, Henry, there's another woman with that sleeve poodle haircut. Mm, Ever see Lobdell with this woman before? No, no, I never did, Lieutenant. But I've seen the woman before. She's a secretary at Valentine Products, one of our accounts. Mm -hmm. I noticed her on a couple of visits I made there. Uh, Not a bad-looking woman. Well, thank you very much. What makes women go in for fads like that? Like what? Oh, those crazy haircuts. I wouldn't know, Mr. Milliken. I gave up trying to figure women long ago. Can I help you, sir? I'd like to talk to the manager. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie, Police Department. That would be Mr. Valentine. Good. Mr. Valentine, there's a Lieutenant Guthrie from the Police Department to see you. Let me go right in, Lieutenant. That second door on the left. Thank you. Ah, come in, Lieutenant. Thank you. Have a seat. What can I do for you? You, uh, have a young lady here. I don't know her name, but uh, she, uh, she has a poodle haircut. Sounds like Miss Parkinson. Uh, mind if I have a couple of minutes with her? Not at all, Lieutenant. Not in trouble, is she? No, but she might be a witness in a hit-and-run case. Oh? Is there some place where I could talk to her in private? Oh, Yes, indeed. You can use the office next door. That'll be fine. Uh, Miss Parkinson. Yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Guthrie from the police. Uh, he'd like a word with you. How do you do, Miss Parkinson? Hello. Uh, you can go in that office. Uh, please sit down, Miss Parkinson. What is this about? Well, there's nothing to worry about, Miss. You might help us get some information. Uh, do you know Albert Lobdell? Why, yes. For long? Oh, th- three, four months. Been seeing him often? Well, I guess so. Why? Was it serious between you? Yes. Well, he was serious anyway. Now, how do you mean? Well, we were going to be married and... And... And what, Miss Parkinson? Oh, we were going away. Maybe to Florida. And when did you figure on getting married? We had no date set. Pretty soon, he said, as soon as he had some important business cleaned up, but I still don't understand. What's this all about? His wife was killed by a hit-and-run car, Miss Parkinson. His wife? Didn't you know Lobdell was married? Certainly I didn't know. Why, the dirty little pipsqueak. Anything else you want to tell me? That cheating, measly run. Married all the time. He isn't anymore. He made a big play for me. Said he made some smart investments. Soon as he cashed in, we'd get married and go away. 
Well, you certainly got some information. Hello, Ben. Hi. Hello, Cocker. Hi, Ben. Here's your tomato soup. You owe me 36 cents. Oh, thanks. Empty the coffee pot, will you, Pete? Bring it in here with a hot plate. Yeah, right. How'd you make out at Lobdell's house? Oh, this is all we could find. Bank book, pink slip for his car, and this insurance policy. Uh, $60.14. Not much of a balance. He hit the ceiling when we slapped the search warrant on him. When we got through, he insisted on coming with us. Said he was going to make you explain. That was very accommodating of him. He's waiting downstairs. Uh, here you are, Ben. I'll hook it up over there. Then open these cans and put the soup on. Ben, take a look at that insurance policy. Lobdell got sore as a goat when I turned that up. Oh? Well, this is on her life, not his. $25,000 policy. <laughs> it's dated five months ago, soon after they got married. Hmm. Clause number six. In case of death by accident, the beneficiary to this part. <laughs> ah, they never learn. There's a double indemnity clause here that pays Lobdell $50,000. And about wraps him up? Yep, just about. Hello, Doc. This is Guthrie. That hit-and-run case, the Lobdell woman. Is there any way to tell if she had a cold? Yeah. Yeah, we can tell. I mean, it isn't too late? No, the symptoms will still be there. Thanks. Well, let me know, will you? Call you right back. Oh, the soup's getting hot, Ben. Oh, it's fine. Should I turn it off? No. Let it boil over. What cooking schools you learn that at? The Lobdell school. Guthrie. The boys had already made tests, and they found nothing to indicate a cold. Not even a sniffle? Not the slightest vestige of a cold. Incipient or otherwise. Sorry to disappoint you. Thanks, Doc. You're not disappointing me at all. Bring Lobdell in, Pete. Outraged. What's the meaning of having my home searched? Uh, please sit down, Mr. Lobdell. I insist on seeing my lawyer. Why do you think you need a lawyer? Only only to see that my rights are protected. You can see all the lawyers you want. Have a seat, Mr. Lobdell. Your concern over my welfare is very touching. Uh, Lieutenant, as a private citizen, I demand... As a you... private citizen, you're entitled to legal counsel. I'm very well aware of that. Sergeant Asher says you didn't want to call your lawyer. I decided against it. After all, I'm not under arrest. Or am I? Certainly not. Then how do you account for your high-handed methods searching my home, prying into my personal papers? I'm sure you're as concerned as we are, Mr. Lobdell, in finding the person who killed your wife. Of course I am. Uh, I thought you'd already found him. No. We found the car, but the owner of the car was not in it when it struck your wife. That's odd. It, it doesn't make sense. Oh, yes, it does, up to a point. The car was stolen. Stolen? Whoever stole the car might have either killed her by accident or... Something else might have happened. Well, what else could have happened? People have been known to commit suicide that way. Oh, I see. I hadn't thought of that possibility. Tell me, uh, do you think she might have wanted to do away with herself? Well, she was... There were times when she seemed morbid. Mm -hmm. Were you happy together? Oh, we certainly were. Well, your neighbors don't think so, Mr. Lobdell. You mean that nosy Mrs. Judson? Uh, what did your wife do before you were married? She worked as a waitress. Uh, a lieutenant. Yeah? Whatever's cooking on that burner is beginning to boil over. Yeah, yeah it is, isn't it? You want me to get it? Oh, let it go. Well, it'll boil over and run your rug, shouldn't you turn it off? It's tomato soup, Mr. Lobdell. It is? There it goes. Okay, turn it off. Now, watch your hand. Don't pick up the part you'll get burned like I did. Whew. Sure stinks up the office. Well, eight minutes, Mr. Lobdell. I beg your pardon? Tomato soup. Takes about eight minutes to boil. Oh? Huh. So what? That tomato soup I burned my hand on. When did you put it on the fire? Well, I didn't. My wife did. I told you that when you asked me before. Yeah? Well, hey, what's this all about? Oh, I got a little corny. Guess I've been reading too many dime novels. I wanted to know how long it took that soup on your stove to boil. I wanted to break your alibi. Break my... Well, you'd say... Your wife was killed more than an hour before that soup boiled over. I don't know anything about that. I'm not a cook. Your wife couldn't have put it on the stove before she went out. You're under arrest, Mr. Lobdell. 
On that kind of evidence... You said last night that Mrs. Lobdell had gone to the drugstore to get some cold medicine. Well, that's what she said. The coroner's report showed no sign of a cold. <laughs> so what? Asher, bring in the lady, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, how, how much longer does this go on? Not long. There's someone I want you to meet. Can I smoke? Sure. Go ahead. Helen! Hey, what are you doing here? What do you think, you lying little runt? Uh, take it easy, Easy, miss. my eye. That's the big shot. He was well fixed. We were going to be married. Oh, Helen, please. What about it, Lobdell? Yeah. What about it? All right. I killed her. Take him down to the stenographer, Pete. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number in the name of the show. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by Joe Steele and edited by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, John McIntyre, Dick Ryan, Peter Leeds, Dave Young, Jay Novello, Virginia Gregg, Bob Griffin, and Jeanette Nolan. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. When the bullets strike, you and only you can give a fighting man back his life by your donations of blood. Call your Red Cross Blood Donor Center tomorrow for an appointment.